Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Tonight's Gangbusters presents the case of the Cincinnati Narcotics Ring, whose deadly dealings in drugs spread across two nations until the Royal Canadian Mounties, the Federal Narcotics Bureau, and Cincinnati Police cornered the ringleader in a final duel to death. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable Clem W. Mers, Chief of Detectives of the Cincinnati Police Department, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. Chief Mers, I know the case you're going to tell us about tonight has an international flavor. Well, that's true, Don Gardner. But most important, it shows the effectiveness of cooperation between federal, local, and Canadian authorities, despite the handicaps of international borderlines. Well, it sounds as though you have quite a case for us, Chief Murs. Why don't you start right in? All right, Don. Suppose we begin just a few months ago in the city of Toronto, Ontario. Late one night, two men were in a room on the fourth floor of a second-rate hotel near the Union Station. One, a middle-aged, bald fellow, strangely nicknamed Sonny sat on the edge of the bed, while the other, Big Jim Labard, occupied the only upholstered chair in the room. After a moment, Big Jim got up and walked to the dresser to pour drinks to bind the deal they'd just closed. Okay, Sonny. We'll have a drink on it. Take it easy with mine. What's the matter, Sonny? Our Canadian whiskey bites a little hard? It all bites hard after you tease it too much. There you are, Sonny. May you make a fortune out of the deal. Yeah. Much obliged, Jim, for wishing me a fortune. You already made yours when a lick and I took. Nobody asked you to come here and buy. You want, you got to pay the price. Well, here's luck. Four hundred a piece. <clears throat> it's the first time I ever paid four hundred an ounce in the last. Here's the last. Look, Sonny. An ounce of heroin is just as hard to come by in Canada as it is in the States. Yeah. And I'm the hottest guy in Toronto just now. They got three king's warrants out for me. I should lay low. If there is a deal, I got to make. Okay, okay, you may. Don't beef. When do you deliver? When are you leaving? All you got to do is walk across the hall to my room. You can pick up the package any time. What do you mean, pick up the package? I ain't carrying 30 pieces over the border. You got to deliver to Cincinnati. You take it with you, sonny. Who are you kidding? My understanding of the deal was you deliver to Cincinnati. I ain't running no drugs across the border. That ain't my business. It ain't my business either, sonny. Not at 400 an ounce, it ain't. Okay, you won't deliver to Cincinnati. The deal's off. Sit Sorry. down there. What's the matter with you? You made a deal, you stick to it. Not if I got to run the border, I don't. It'll cost you an extra hundred apiece if I got to deliver to Cincinnati. Who do you think you're holding up? You. An extra three grand for running the border with a two-pound package? What do you think I am, crazy? You can run the border for nothing, Sonny. It won't cost you a dime. Okay, you robbed me. When do you deliver? You won't be in a hurry. It'll get there. Come on across the hall to my room. I'll show you what you bought. That's always a good idea, seeing what you buy. Have a look in the hall. It's okay. There's not a soul around. All right, you can go. Wait a minute. Uh, What? Back inside, fast. What's the matter? Somebody's in my room. You're crazy. Did you see that light over the transom? I didn't leave no lights. Hello? How should I know? We'll find out quick. Dope you, dope. Stick in here a while. I got about 50 pieces of heroin over there. I got to protect my investment. Because you sense you'll duck that gun, you'll stick here. Come on. You don't get me involved killing no I cops. I need help and you're rich. Look Shut you up my... and open that door. Go on. The door was unlatched. Walk across the hall. Open up and jump back. Now look. Go on. Hold it. Okay. Open. All right, don't move. Well, what are you after, sister? I'm sorry. I must have made a mistake in the rooms. Is that so? Yes. I must be on the wrong floor. Sonny. Yeah? Come in and shut the door. Really? It is a mistake. Mm -hmm. As long as you made a mistake, you figured you might as well take advantage of it, huh? I... Is that why you piled up my clothes, ready to go out the door with them? Take it easy, Jim. Maybe she's law. Law? 
She's a sneak thief. Ain't that right, sister? Please, I've never done anything before. Don't call the police, please. What's your story? I'm stuck in Toronto. I want to get back home to Montreal. I had to get fair somehow. So you picked on me, huh? I didn't know it was you. I didn't care who it was. I, I tried every door. Oh, please don't call the police. Jim, she didn't find the... You know. <laughs> don't worry. That'll take a good deal of looking. What's your name? Lucille. Lucille Beauvais. You won't call the police? No. I don't think so. You're a little too pretty to rot in jail. I think I'll give you your lesson myself. This is what you need. <laughs> a lot of it you need. <laughs> that ought to cure you. Get rid of it, Jim. All I wonder was fair to Montreal, that's all. Well, you can walk it. Go on, get out. Oh, all right. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank me. For what? For not calling the police. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Yes? Lucille, didn't you say? Yes. How'd you like to earn car fare to Montreal? Earn it? How? Are you off your nut, Jim? Get rid of Stick your head out of this. What's in Montreal? That's home. I'm broke. There's no place else to go. You got a job, Lucille. I have? Jim. Sure you have. Now go in there and get rid of those tears. I'll tell you all about it when you feel better. Okay. In there? Yeah. Go on. Thanks. Thanks ever so much. You know, you're really nice. How crazy can you get, Jim? Did you ever see such eyes? Black as the ace of spades. What do you want to get mixed up with a lousy sneak thief for? She was telling the truth. It's the first thing she ever tried. Who are you kidding? They all got the same story. She was telling the truth. Dreamed about running into one like her. How can a guy as hot as you take a chance? How do you know she won't crack the law the minute she finds out? You want your 30 pieces delivered to Cincinnati, don't you? What's that got to do with it? Not much. Except little Lucille is going to carry him across the border for me. Oh, well, I don't care how, just as long as it gets across. It will. Tomorrow you take a train to Windsor. And you? I'll drive with Lucille. You check into the Buckingham in Windsor. You'll hear from me by Tuesday night. So you've never been on a trip across to the States, Lucille. I've always wanted to go. There you have your wish tomorrow. First thing in the morning. Let's have a drink on it, huh? Jim, why do we have to lie to them? Why do we have to tell them we're married? Oh, says a lot of unnecessary questions, baby. That's all. How? Oh. No, if it's just a couple from Toronto going on a little vacation, there's nothing to it. We drive right across. Well, I suppose it's all right. Sure, it's all right. Only, um, I don't have the clothes to take a vacation. Uh, wait till we get across to Detroit. You'll get nice clothes. <sighs> Honest, I can't get over it all. Especially when I think I could have been in jail. How could I have done such a dumb thing? <laughs> well, at least you picked the right room. You've really been swell. That's because I want to be. Don't worry about it. You... What's the matter? Sit still and keep your mouth shut. There's two guys coming to cops. Cops? Mm-hmm. Why out for a good time, Big Jim? Yeah. Yeah, I like a good time as well as anybody. Oh! Right out of my way. You stay with her. Who's this, Jim? Yeah. Had some trouble? Plenty. A couple of cops maybe in the joint. I just did get away. He didn't lose the goods? No, I got the goods. It was in the car. They hauled in Lucille. So what? As long as they didn't get you with the goods. You got a pencil handy? Yeah, why? I'm going to give you the name of a lawyer. Get hold of him. Tell him to get a red or make bond for her. Anything. Are you kidding? I want her out, do you hear? You don't need her to get the stuff across, and you know it. Get hold of that lawyer and get her out. Get on a train and head for Cincinnati. I'll see you there in a couple of days. Have my dough ready because I'm going to need it. Don't forget the lawyer. If you don't get out, the 30 pieces stay in Canada. Showdown, the fugitive Big Jim Labard, a notorious Canadian dealer in narcotics, had a narrow escape from capture. 
The next time he was face to face with police officers, a shower of bullets closed the gap between them. You were telling us, Chief Murs, that the Canadian narcotics dealer, Big Jim Labard, narrowly missed arrest in Windsor, Ontario, the night before he planned to smuggle 30 ounces of heroin into the United States. That's right, Don, but the police did pick up the girl, Lucille Beauvais, whom Labard planned to use as an aide in the smuggling venture. There was no evidence against her, and she didn't even know the identity of Labard, so she was released shortly after dark the next night. She walked out of the house of detention for women. A stranger in town, Lucille had no particular place to go, and she headed toward a brightly lit restaurant, which was the first thing she saw as she walked out of the jail door. Lucille, keep walking. Keep your head straight. They told me who you are. I'm about to tell you myself before I had to leave. Meet me in an hour. Victoria Park. Bench under the Queen's statue. Make sure you aren't followed. Change cabs a couple of times. Yeah, here's some dough. I don't know whether I want to meet you. Be there. I'll see you. Hello? It's me. Back here in the shadows. I wanted to see if you had the place set up with cops. You know I wouldn't do anything like that. I didn't know. Mind if I come around and sit down? No. Well, what'd they tell you about me? I'm a pretty mean customer, huh? That's what they said. Would you still like to go across to the States? To help you smuggle dope? Do you care why? Cigarette? Yes, thanks. I didn't know what to think of you bringing me from Toronto, wanting to take me to the States. Especially when you caught me robbing your room. I thought maybe you uh, fell in love with me. Maybe I did. <laughs> you wanted to use me. You had a purpose. If I only wanted to use you, why should I take the chance meeting you tonight? If they caught me, it'd be ten years, baby, at least. That's what they told me. Come here. Please, no. I said to come here. Please, Chip. There. Does that look like I just want to use you? I want to go back home to Montreal. You think you're too good for me? You think a sneak thief is any better than I am? It's not that, Chip. Come to the States with me. No, I can't. You want to when you know it. All right, I want to. What are you waiting for? I... All right, Jim. I'll go with you. Sure you will. They're watching all the borders, Jim. I know. They've got the U.S. Customs and the lookout. Oh, you'll get caught. Yeah, plans have change, baby. We're not going as tourists anymore. Now, come on. All right. yourself, baby. Got to keep my eye out for the patrol. How much longer, Mac? Another 15 minutes, maybe. Get that voice down. Caddy's over the water. Oh, Detroit sure looks near. Looks like it could reach out for those lights. 15 minutes, baby. That's all. 15 minutes seems like a century. Get it done. Uh, what are you worried about? This isn't... Hey, turn around, Mac. At the patrol boat? Oh, Jim. Looks like it. Get to him. Jim. Oh, shut up. Lou. Jim, what are we going to do? Don't you know when to keep quiet? Jim. Oh, you're hurting me. Then keep quiet. Stay low on the boat. Maybe they'll pass us by. Jim, if one of their search. Shut up. Jim, drop the package overboard. Not on your life. Drop the package and I have us for nothing. I don't throw 15 grand overboard. I fight for it. Jim, please. It goes over, Jim. Watch out, Mac. You'll be the first to get shot. Very well. The boat's going away, I think. Aye, it is. It's, oh. it's a pleasure craft. Oh, Jim. That was a squeaker. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> let's get to the right. Yeah. Go on. Row. Captain Hoffman, 
Lead off, Captain. Agent Laney of the Narcotics Bureau of Treasury Department is here to see you. Laney? Laney, is he from the Cincinnati office? Uh, just a second, Captain. You from the uh, local office, Mr. Laney? No, I'm out of Washington. Uh, he's from Washington, Captain. Ask Mr. Laney to come in. All right. Right through that door, Mr. Laney. Thanks. Come in, Laney. Hello, Captain. Well, I'm glad to meet you. Have a chair. Thanks. I'm in Cincinnati on a special job, Captain. Well, how can we help? Did you ever handle a narcotics dealer, Sonny Wilton? Yes, we've handled him. Do you know where I can put my hands on him? At the moment, no, but I'll put a couple of my boys to checking with you. Well, we're more interested in a guy he's been dealing with lately, Big Jim Labard, a Canadian. You think he's in Cincinnati, too? Well, it's just a tip. Canadian Mounties have been looking for him on three warrants, narcotics cases. Mm-hmm. They picked up a boatman who's been running smugglers across the Detroit River. Their information is that Big Jim made a deal with Sonny and came to Cincinnati. Okay, we'll be on the lookout for them both. Mounties almost got their hands on this Big Jim last week. He saw them coming and ducked out of a bar. They couldn't shoot in the kind of the crowd. But they did get a girl he was with. Oh? How does she figure in it here? Well, they had no charge to hold her on. According to the boatman, Big Jim just took her along when he smuggled in the narcotics. I see. Uh, excuse me a second. Sure. Yes, Captain? Ask Mayor and Stutz to step in here right away. Uh, yes, sir. There are a couple of my best men on this kind of deal. Oh, good. We don't have too much to go on, Captain, but the Canadian authorities are doing a little further checking on the girl. If they find out anything, we'll hear about it. They want Labard and want him bad. Jim. What? I don't feel like going out and drinking and staying up all night again tonight. I do. Don't you think it's time we got out of Cincinnati? Sonny's friends are good people to know. Well, I don't care for them. Well, act like you care for them. This is business. Oh, Jim, I want to go home. I want to go to Montreal. You don't stop nagging me about going home. I'll give you something really to nag about. All right, Jim. Made a lot of doors, Sonny. A good chance to make more. We're not taking that boat trip again. Yep. And you're going to help with the load. More dope? No. No, something is just as hard to come by in Canada. Guns. Guns? Yeah. A lot of guys I know will pay a good price for a heater. And that's what we're taking back. A good stock of guns. Didn't you make enough money? There's never enough money. And listen, baby. Wake up when we get to that party. These are people I'm doing business with. I don't want them to think I got a corpse traveling with me. All right. I'll wake up. Captain Hartman. Laney, Narcotics Bureau, Captain. Oh, hello, Laney. Anything new? I think so. I just spoke to Washington. They got a message from the Canadian Mounted Police. They had a mail cover on the home of the girl's mother in Montreal. Oh? A letter showed up from her. Mail from Cincinnati? Yep. With a return address on Maple Avenue. I went by and looked at the building. It's a big apartment house. Uh-huh. I suppose we put a plant there and wait for them to come out. That's all right with me. Okay, uh, you come on by here, Laney, and we'll see what arrangements we can make. Hello, Laney. How's it going? You haven't seen a soul that looks like a bar to the girl, Captain. Well, a lot of people live in this apartment house. Stick here long enough and we'll spot them. Yeah, I suppose so. If we... Wait a minute. Hmm? Someone coming out. Yeah. No, it's not Big Jim. Like I say, if we... Oh, it's not Big Jim, but... Wouldn't you like Sonny? Is that him? I couldn't miss Sonny two blocks away. Let me handle this, lady. I know him. Right ahead. He's coming this way. Let's stop and light a cigarette. Mm. Have one? Thanks. Light? Thank you. Where do you think you're going, Sonny? Hey. Police officers. Uh, is that so? Where's Big Jim? I don't know what you're talking about. He lives in that building and you know it. Well, why don't you go in and get him? Okay. We're going to knock on every door. And you're going to be right in front of us. No, no, no. Look, you don't get me mixed up in this. Which is his apartment? He's got guns. He's got plenty of guns. He'll use them. You don't get me to knock on his door. Which is his apartment, Sonny? 
H5. Look, don't take me up there. Hold me in. He'll, he'll use those guns. All right, all right. We'll see that you get a nice seat on the sidelines. Good. That's where I want to be, on the sidelines. You keep your eye on him, Laney. Hmm? I want to call downtown and get a couple more men out here. We may need them. Yeah, I'll say you will. Go on, Captain. I'll watch him till you get back. What's him? What? Come on over here and give me a hand with his stuff. Oh, Jim, I'm busy trying to pack. What is it? Let me get the stuff out of that drawer and into the carton. Well, come on. Jim, I don't want to handle guns. Guns are the safest thing in the world when you know how to handle them. Come on, help me pack them. Are they loaded? Sure they're loaded. What good do you think they'd be if they weren't? I can't touch them. You want to go back to Montreal, you'd give me a hand. No. Listen, Jim. I tell you something, I mean it. Please, you're hurting. Ah. You hurt too easy. Now, give me a hand. Who's that? Expecting anybody? Well, I'll answer it. You'll find out. Yes? Who is it? Sonny, open up. I want to see Jim. Jim, it's Sonny. Well, let him in. He can give me a hand. All right, Sonny, just a minute. Sonny, I thought you were... We're police officers. No. One side. Jim. Okay, Jim, get him up quick. Yeah? Watch him, he's got a gun. Jim, no! Get him! Oh. Watch out! Come on. Jim. Jim. Well, looks oh. like he's through, miss. I owed him so much. I can imagine. Lead off. Call an ambulance. Yes, sir. All right, miss. Now let's have the story. From beginning to end. That down was how Cincinnati police and agents of the Narcotics Bureau Treasury Department dealt with James Labard, a dangerous fugitive from Canada. The girl, Lucille, was deported to Canada to face various charges. And Sonny Wilton, the Cincinnati narcotics dealer, was held on a charge of parole violation and returned to prison to complete his term. Well, congratulations, Chief Mers, to all the officers, Cincinnati, Federal, and Canadian, who showed such excellent coordination in bringing about an end to this dangerous criminal. <laughs> Tonight's case was dramatized by Stanley Niss and directed by William Sweets, with Frank Reddick and Susan Douglas in leading roles. Don Gardner speaking. <laughs> Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. <laughs> just going to cut you open and see if you've got a heart. See, I don't believe you have. And I just want to prove how a body can walk around without one. Mickey, don't! Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fear is the strongest. Our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gave open that death strike. How? Oh, you'll learn the answer in just a minute in the 13th floor. Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Winifred Wolfe is The Thirteenth Floor. Hotel corridors scare me late at night. They're too long and too creepy. I'm always afraid the walls like big, flat plaster hands are going to close in on me. I wish somebody was around. Any... No, 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 not anybody. Anybody might be Nicky. And his hands aren't made out of plastic. They're bone and they're blood. And they want to choke the breath out of me. I just better get down this corridor and close the door behind me. I'll lock it and hide under the covers. Till I turn on the radio and I hear that switch. Let's 
pulled in a little room. And Nicky's dead, full of hot sparks and his big hands hanging like putty. Then I won't have to be afraid anymore. It's what happened tonight, just just now. It's making the inside of me all curdled and sour and sick. Even if I live a million more days, I won't forget how I came into that lobby. Just like always. I walked over to the desk. Hi, Joe. What's a good word? Here. Got a rent statement from the hotel. No letters. Oh. Uh, still is hot out, isn't it? Sort of muggy and sticky. Think it's going to rain? Maybe. <laughs> you don't like me very much, do you? No, not very much. You'll excuse me, I'm quite busy, Miss Hey, Owen. you're a fresh little punk. I ought to tell the manager. It's a fine way to treat guests who pay their bills. Don't I always pay my rent on time? Sure. Why not? $5,000 lasts a while if you take care of it. Why, you. Hey, wait a second. Hold that elevator. We dreamed, Miss Owen. I said hold the elevator a second. What's the idea almost slamming it in my face? Sorry, Miss Owen. Yeah, yeah, I bet you are. Oh, Mr. Talbot. Good evening. Good evening. Sure is hot out, wouldn't you say? I was saying to Joe, muggy and sticky. Yeah. Um, I was uh, just at an awful good movie. It's a Franklin. Tomorrow night they're having Lana Turner. You like Lana Turner? Very much. Yeah, me too. A lot of women don't because they're jealous of the way she looks. Me, though, I got blonde hair myself. <laughs> I was uh, planning to see you tomorrow night. Uh, do you have plans? Sorry, Miss Owen. I have an appointment tomorrow evening. Oh. Ha, uh, uh, ha, uh. ha. You run the elevator, you fresh punk. That's what you're hired for. Oh, uh, by the way. Me? No, uh, Tommy. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Will you let me in with your pass key? I forgot mine. Yeah, sure thing, Mr. Talbot. The car stopped when I got out. I was glad to get out. Your floor. Yeah, thanks for nothing. That's when it began, right then. The light from the elevator looked like a lot of lemonade, only being poured the wrong way, up instead of down. I remember thinking that. I don't even remember it now. I looked at my watch at two minutes to midnight. I started down the hall. Feeling something's wrong. Don't be to get the jitters for nothing. Everything looked the same. Nothing was any different. My room was at the end of the hall. I took my key out and I shoved it in the lock. I'm open. I kept twisting it and twisting it. Yeah, I stick with my knee. Then, all of a sudden, I looked up and realized what was wrong. The number on the door was 1307. That's not 1407. Was on the wrong floor. That was it. That rotten little kid. I'll fix him. I was ready to bet he'd done it on purpose. Then. Give Nicky a kiss, baby. Aren't you glad to see me? Nick. Come on in. I've been waiting for you a long time. I said come in. I'm getting a draft. Nicky, let go of my arm. You're hurting <laughs> Sorry, baby. Maybe I don't know my own strength, huh? What do you want? How'd you get in here? One thing at a time. Don't rush me. What'd you lock the door for? I don't like interruptions. You never used to either when you were alone with me. Remember, Kitty? I don't remember nothing. Yeah, I know. you got a memory like a faucet. You turn it off and on, off and on. Wonderful. Take me, for instance. I have the kind of a memory you can't turn off. It keeps running all the time. The longer it runs, the hotter it gets. So hot now, Kitty, it'll straw you. Look, uh, Nicky. I am looking. It's still a nice looking number, you know. I always did like the way your waist curves and how white your neck you is. You didn't come here to tell me how I look. Or toss your hair over your shoulder like it gets in your way. Go ahead, Kitty. Toss your hair back for Nicky. What are you trying to do? Dangle me on a string? Know, you're still a good looking number. I don't look so hot, though, do I? You think maybe I lost a little weight? Uh, Nicky, please. My face let, looks let me... kind of pasty. 
That's because you don't get much chance for fresh air sweating what's left of time away in a death cell. If I scream, the police will come and get you. If you come near me, I'll scream. You won't scream. No, come one step closer now. You won't scream because there's not that much sound left in you. It's all frozen and sticking in your throat like an ice cube. Because you're afraid. You're afraid of me. Try screaming, Kitty. I... uh, You see? What'd I tell you? Nicky, I can help you. I can hide you here so they won't find you. Then I can help you get away, Nicky. Anywhere you want. I promise. I asked you before to kiss me. You still haven't, you know. No, 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 don't come near me, please. You used to like it. You never used to wait for me to ask you. Nicky, don't. No. Sometimes you used to come over to me without me asking. Well, what's the matter? Do I look as bad as all that? Oh, you afraid I'll get your pretty dress dirty? Well, you got to give me a chance. I can explain. I know I'm not clean. You know, I crawled for a half a mile in the mud until I couldn't hear the dogs chasing me anymore. If I'd known you were going to act like this, I would have said... you got to give me a break. I would have said, Warden, call me a taxi. A nice, clean taxi so I can go see my girl, Kitty Owen. A cheap little squealer who sold me down a river for five G's. Five thousand lousy Give me a little bucks. Hands off me. Oh, I like to hold your face like this. Such a little face. Such big eyes. Big green eyes like a small tiger. Kitty, kitty. Like a cat. A sly, sneaky cat with long blonde hair. Don't you remember how I used to kiss you? Oh, Mm. You act like you do remember. You remember too, don't you? You remember how it used to be with us, Mickey? Feel my hair the way it used to go and you like to do it. You said it was soft like silk. Feel my hair, Mickey. You're not mad at me, are you? I said I was sorry. I went crazy. I didn't know what I was doing. I help you now, Mickey. Come on, run your your fingers through my hair, Mickey. <laughs> you old lousy little tramp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't make me laugh. You crying, huh? Cat crying crocodile tears. Are you crying because you're sorry for me? You're sorry because sooner or later the cops will catch up with me, drag me back, and I'll burn to a crisp in the chair, huh? Are you crying because you know what I'm going to do to you? Remember how it used to be with us, Mickey? I know when I broke out they'd find me, but I wanted to say goodbye to you first. I wanted to kiss you. See if it still did the same things to me. I'll tell you something, Kitty. You leave me cold. Uh, that knife. What are you going to do with that knife? I'm going to cut you open and see if you've got a heart. I don't believe you have. I just want to prove how come a body can walk around without a heart. Just arms and legs stuck together with nothing to make them run. I'll get you through this to do it what are they going to do? Electrocute me first, then take me out and hang me? What's the difference? I'll tell you, Mickey, how it was. Just let me tell you. After you held up that, that jewelry store and, and the old dame was killed, when they put up the 5,000 bucks, I went crazy. Yeah? Honest, Mickey, I must have been clear out of my head. I've been sorry ever since, but I figured the cops would get you for it anyway. And that I'd be left with nothing. I didn't have a cent. So you didn't wait. You turned me in yourself. But I didn't I... know what I was doing. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to kill you, Kitty on. It won't help any. It'll help me. Stay away from me. The only prayer is Sam. It should be good for a laugh. No, no, please. Kitty, 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 like a cat. No, no. Yes, no. kitty, yes. I'm going to kill you. I'm <laughs> following me so like that he didn't notice when I backed up to the table, picked up the vase. Then after I hit him, he didn't know it then either. Just went down looking surprised. I knew he wouldn't be out long. So I bent over and took the key out of his pocket. He moved and made a funny little noise through his lips. And I stopped breathing all together. I had the key. I was free. The hall was empty. No one around. I started to run down the narrow little corridor of the 13th floor. I pressed the elevator button. And I waited. Help. That was the only way I could get it. It seemed like hours instead of seconds. Finally, I heard it coming. I felt like I was standing on hot coals. My insides wouldn't stand still. The hand of the clock above the elevator climbed slowly from five to six and to seven. I was going crazy to see up in there. And seven. 
pieces of dough, hardly able to hold my body up. The elevator had stopped at 12, and then went on to 14. 14! Then I remembered it wasn't going to stop. It couldn't stop. Because in this building, there wasn't any 13th floor. A man from the death house. And the girl who betrayed him playing cat and mouse on a floor that doesn't exist. The hand of the elevator indicator did not stop at 13. But the hand of the watch on Kitty's wrist have stopped at 12. All ready for... Murder! At midnight! <laughs> Now, back to Murder at Midnight and the 13th Floor. 13th Floor. Yeah, that's where I was, a floor that didn't exist, so how could I get out? How could I get away? What was I going to do? I didn't understand. I didn't understand anything. Pretty good little slugger, baby. Nick. You took so much trouble to unlock the door, you should have taken a little time to lock it again after you. Don't come after me with that knife. Please, don't. <laughs> I don't want to die. You think I did? Why don't you give me another chance? What chance did you give me? Wow. I didn't think you had that in you. Well, why doesn't somebody come, huh? Maybe it's because there isn't anybody besides us. Cozy, huh? Uh, uh. Try it again. Go ahead. Try it on again. Maybe you'll have better luck. (laughs) He was leaning against the door halfway down the hall, just leaning there and watching me because he knew he had me cornered. But I wasn't cornered. I turned and I ran the other way around the corner and down another hall. I didn't know if I'd really heard him running after me. But it was just the pounding in my head making a noise. I got to the end of the hall. Then I stopped out of breath and looked behind. He wasn't there. No sign of him. I sucked in my breath so even that didn't make any sound. And I listened. I listened to nothing at all because it was so quiet. It was so awful quiet I could hear it. The wall I leaned against was big and flat and gray, and the corners jutted out under the into the hall like dead fingers. I looked to the right side of me, down the corridor. Like he wasn't there. So I turned my head. I looked at the hall, almost hoping in a way I'd see him and get it over with instead of this weight. I wasn't there either. I tried to squeeze myself, my shoulder blades, into the wall so I could hide. But it was hard and cold. It wouldn't move. Nicky. Nicky. Nicky, where are you? For the love of heaven, say something so I'll know where you are. Don't just keep standing here. I can't take it. Nicky. I'm sick. My stomach's sick. So am I. Just, just make some noise. Nikki, where are you? I found myself back at the elevator again. I knew he was around somewhere. Around one of those corners that were jutting out like dead fingers waiting. The elevator was coming up again. The hand was up to 11. I had to stop. I pressed the button to throw all my weight against it. And it did. It did. The big door was sliding open. And I was safe. Going up or down, Kitty Owen. I'll take you wherever you want to go. Nicky. Oh, not again. I can't stand. I'll take you for a ride. No, I won't go. But didn't you ring me? I heard you ring. Come on. <laughs> Get in. Just the two of us. We'll go for a ride. <laughs> Only just one of us will come back. I said, get in. All the time he was talking, I was backing away, was backing away. 
And then all of a sudden I saw at a door with a bright red sign that said, Stairway Down. My last chance, I almost leaped to it. I opened the door and I flew down the stairs. It wasn't easy with high heels, but even so the sound of it was like music. Sweet, hot music from a clarinet, because I knew they were taking me down. Faster, faster. Uh, I fell a couple of times. I caught myself by clinging to the bandits. <laughs> out on the street again. Now I was really safe. There were always a lot of people on the streets. I didn't see any people, just a big policeman with a red face. Boy, he sure looked good to me. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Now, 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 take it easy, miss. Don't get excited. Hey, look, Nicky Carstairs, he's in that hotel. He's after me. Carstairs? Yeah. Sure, and who are you wanting the kids? It can't be. Look, he's out, I tell you. I... Saw him, he wants to kill me. But Nicky Carstairs is in the death cell. Don't you read the papers? Hey, I'll have you reported. What kind of a cop are you anyway? What kind of a woman are you without a heart? Just arms and legs stuck together with nothing to make them go. You're not a policeman. You're Nicky. You're still Nicky. You didn't look like Nicky a second ago. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. Why is the get up? How do I look? Nicky, please, no, not anymore. I told you we were playing cops and robbers, and this time I'm the cop. And I'm still going to kill you, Kitty Owen. It was no big. I had to run again. My last stronghold. My last hope, the hotel lobby. If there was no one there, I'd just give up. I was through. As I ran around the corner, I thought the war had ended all over again because... There was confetti coming out of all the windows, so much of it. Fallen. The sidewalks were beginning to look like it had been snowing for a long time. I ran over them like a carpet. I ran with my eyes down and I could see the headlines. Nicky, Carstairs, in death house, prison. No one had to tell me this. I ran into the lobby to find people, to tell them where he was. There was no one there either. Only Joe at the desk. Joe? How early the night, Miss Owen. Not quite midnight. Look, Joe, I know you don't like me, but you gotta help me. Reading the papers about Nikki Carstairs breaking out? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to Five thousand dollars should last you a little while if you take care of it. Hey, Joe, he's here. He's in the hotel. He's chasing me. That's a lot of money. Five thousand dollars? What's to kill me? You gotta help me. Sweet dreams, he's, Miss Owen. He's here, can't you understand? He's on the thirteenth floor. There's no thirteenth floor in the He's building. there. I tell you. Sweet he's... dreams, Miss Owen. I know there wasn't any use to arguing, and he wouldn't believe me. Even if he did, he wouldn't help me because he didn't like me. Going up. No one would believe me. There was only one thing left for me to do lock myself in my room on the fourteenth floor. Stay there until they caught Nicky. <laughs> I leaned against the back of the car, crouched in a corner. My eyes closed because I was so tired. I was so tired. I kept thinking of a bed, a big white bed, three white sheets to crawl between, and the door was locked. Sorry to have to bother you about that passage, Tommy. I just forgot to pick mine up at the desk. It's like a glass of cold water. It had been thrown on top of me. I opened my eyes. That Talbot guy was in the car again. No. I can't still. And he was talking about the pass key the way he had before. No, not before either. Because when I looked at my watch, it was still a minute to midnight. Then I suddenly knew I was so weak with relief I wanted to cry. Yeah, I heard him say it. Sometimes you can see your whole life pass by in just a second. That lifetime I lived in the elevator. All in my head. It was sandwiched in between a couple of floors. It never really happened. It was just that I had been dreading it for months coming back some night, finding Mickey there waiting for me. My mind had invented a 13th floor. 
when it never was there at all. And the cop and the newspapers that said Nicky was out. All a part of it. That crazy half dream. Of course he wasn't out. I told myself it was all part of it. I never got out of the elevator. I was there all the time. All the time. Your floor, Miss Owen. Fourteen? Sure, fourteen. Ain't that your floor? You're sure this time, aren't you? What are you talking about, this time? I mean... Never mind. 1401. That was on the first door. I was on the right floor this time. I was... I'm feeling better already. What a fool I've been. Started to walk down the hall. I had a feeling terrible, and the boy in the elevator was watching me. Wish they shut the door and go on. Say, Mr. Talbot. Yes? Did you read about Nicky Costas? No, what? He escaped. Got out of the death house. Is that so? He's on the loose. Good night, Miss Owen. <laughs> Yeah. Hotel corridors scare me. They're too long and too creepy. I'm always afraid the walls, like big flat plaster hands, are going to close in. Now I know it was more than just dreading it for weeks. Made me imagine. Nicky was out and after me. Must have known it all along. Had a feeling I wasn't safe. I'm going to go to my own room. I'll lock the door and hide under the covers till I hear they found him. Took him back. Till I hear he's dead, I won't have to be afraid anymore. Not anymore. Give Nikki a kiss, baby. Oh. Aren't you glad to see me? The 14th floor this time, a floor that does exist, but the hands of the watch on Kitty's wrist still stand at 12 for murder at midnight. <laughs> Shepherd and Paul Mann was Nikki. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Don't get so excited you stop pumping air to me down here. Keep 
your helmet on. I'll keep pumping. You sure it's the sunken ship we're looking for? We were looking for the Argus, weren't we? Yeah, but make sure it has the gold in it before we get too excited. Okay. Give me a little more line. Yeah. There's a big gap in her side I can look into and see right into the hold. Okay, but be careful. Don't get caught in the current and lose your footing. Just keep my lines tight, and I won't. Keep pumping air. I'll pump you enough air for a month if you find that gold. Just enough for now, I'll do. Well, Bill, what goes? You see anything yet? See anything? I can see everything. Larry, there's more gold here than I thought was in the whole world. You found it, huh? Sure did, Larry. We're rich. <laughs> you mean I'm rich. What are you talking about? You'll know in a minute. Pull on your tow line. Huh? Pull on it, Bill. Okay, but... <clears throat> hey, Larry, it's loose. Sure. <laughs> I got it loose. What's your idea? What? And here goes your airline, too, Bill. I'm cutting that. No, Larry, don't. No, no, you can't. You can't. I can't, huh? I already have. Oh, Larry, don't. I'm pulling out of here, but fast. As soon as I cut this phone line... Oh, Larry... So long, Bill, old pal. And now, on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Just how you feel, Sarah. Your brother was a swell guy. And believe me, there was nothing I could do to save him. I, I'm sure there wasn't, Larry. Honest, there wasn't. I was pumping air to Bill when all of a sudden the phone went dead. Then I saw bubbles on the water, and when I pulled on the tow line, it was limp. Something underwater must have cut the lines. Yeah, I'm afraid that's what it was. Sarah, I want you to remember that Bill and I were partners. And Bill's death doesn't dissolve that partnership. You're in if I ever find that gold. No, I I wouldn't want it. It'd remind me too much of Bill. I think you'd better go now, Larry. I think I, I'd rather be alone right now. Yeah, sure, sure. Anything you say. Uh, well, uh, so long, Sarah. And, and I'm sorry. It's all right. Bye, Larry. Hey, goodbye. Bye, Larry. I'll be seeing you. Yeah, sure, sure, kid. So long. <laughs> What are you balling about, sis? Bill! Yeah, me all right. Came in the back way so nobody would see me. Thanks for feeling so miserable when Larry told you I was dead. It's very complimentary. Bill, it really is you. You're alive. Yeah, I sure am, sis. And that was some story Larry told you about how I died. He thought you did die. What happened? What happened? Larry tried to kill me, and I'm alive now only because I'm a smart diver. I'm going to be just a smart killer. Bill, don't talk like that. Why not? As far as anybody knows, I'm dead. So I'm going to kill the guy who tried to kill me. I'm going to get away with it, too. Yes? Boston Blackie? Yes, again. May I come in? Yes, with a capital, why not? Thank you. Blackie, I... Uh, uh, Don't tell me. You're in trouble. Or you know someone who's in trouble, and you've come to me for help. Yes, Blackie. It's my brother. Well, what's he done? Swindled, embezzled, or murdered? He hasn't done anything yet. But he's going to kill a man. He is? When? As soon as he finds him. And he's going to get away with it, too. That's a popular misconception, Miss... Uh, Miss... uh... Bronson. Sarah Bronson. My brother's name is Bill. Bill Bronson the diver? Yes. Oh, now, wait a minute, Miss Bronson. Your brother died this morning. I heard it over the radio not an hour ago. My brother's very much alive, Blackie. And it's because everyone thinks he's dead that he thinks he can get away with murder. Well, I have a hunch he's right, up to a point. Who was he going to kill? Larry Matthews, his partner. That wasn't an accident under the water this morning. Larry tried to kill Bill by cutting his lines. Uh Uh-huh. So Bill wants to stay dead and get his revenge. I think you'd better go to the police, Miss Bronson. No, I don't dare. Why not? Bill's gone almost crazy after that experience this morning. He said he'd kill me if I went to the police. But he didn't say anything about going to you. I see. Well, I'll see what I can do for you. Whatever it is, you'll have to do it fast. Bill is... Excuse me. Hello. Hello, Blackie. This is Charlie Kingston. Oh, hello, Charlie. I'll call you back oh, in just a minute. I... serious, Blackie. I'm just keeping a promise I made to you. What promise? You know about never jumping into a new business deal without telling you what I've done. Well, uh, tell me about this one some other time, Charlie, will you? I've got to keep a man named Larry Matthews from being killed. Did you say Larry Matthews? Yes. He's 
going to be killed. Good heavens, no. I, I won't have anyone murdered in any of my offices. What? He's downtown in my manager's office right now, and they just closed a deal for $100,000. What kind of a deal? A salvage job. I bought half interest in $2 million worth of gold, Matthews and Bronson, that dead diver found. I saw the chart myself. Look, Charlie, phone your manager and tell him to hold Matthews there. Bronson isn't dead. Matthews tried to kill him, and now the diver is out to kill Matthews. What? Well, I don't understand. Never mind what you don't understand. Phone your manager, tell him the whole story, and tell him to hold Matthews there. I'll get there myself as soon as I can. So that's what the score is, Miss Matthews. We're... Oh, excuse me. Uh, sure, Mr. Walton. Walton speaking. Oh, Henry, this is Charlie Kingston. Oh, yes, Mr. Kingston. Look, is Larry Matthews there? Yes, he is. Good, keep him there. And don't let him leave your office under any circumstances. Well, what's the matter? His life is in danger. Somebody's looking for him to kill him. Boston Black, he'll be down there in a few minutes to take over. Now, wait for him. All right, but I don't understand. Now, don't try. Wait till Blackie comes and then get that chart from Matthews. I want that chart. Don't worry, Mr. Kingston. I'll get it for you. Bye. Goodbye. Anything wrong, Mr. Walton? You look a little pale. Nothing much is wrong, I hope, Mr. Matthews. That was my boss, Mr. Kingston. He wants me to keep you here in my office until Boston Blackie gets here. Why? Why? Because your life is in danger. Huh? Mr. Matthews, do you know of anyone who's trying to kill you? No. No one in particular. <laughs> but I'm not surprised my life's in danger. Yours would be, too, if you owned something as valuable as that chart of mine. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Well, we'll own it soon. Mr. Kingston asked me to be sure to get it from you. Well, you've given me your check. Come on down to my house at the waterfront and I'll give you the chat. Mr. Matthews, I can't let you leave this office. Mr. Kingston's orders. Well, if you want that chart, you'll come and get it now. I want to close this deal and get rid of that chart. Aren't you afraid to go out on the street? <laughs> I'll take my chances. I got a gun right here, see? Come on, I want to get this deal over with. All right. I'm going with you. Just a minute. Hey, what are you taking out of that drawer? My gun, Mr. Matthews. If you're in danger, I'm in danger, too. Here's my house. Wait till I unlock the door, Walton. Sure. Well, so far, so good. We haven't seen anyone who even looked as if he wanted to kill you. <laughs> that doesn't make me a bit unhappy. Now, come on in. Now, wait, I'll turn on the light. There. Now, come on in. I'll get you the chai. Okay. I never had enough money for a safe, so I always uh, hit anything valuable under the floor. I see. Uh, this loose board here is uh, my safety deposit vault. Here. Here's your chart right here. I'll see if they can get any... Anything else now? Uh, Let's see how do you turn out the light. I, oh. <laughs> you dirty double-crosser, Waltham. You, you got me, but maybe one of my bullets got you, too. Hi, Blackie. Hello, Mary. You know, I've been waiting in this office for you for one hour. Well, I got here as quickly as I could, but I wasn't worried. I knew Matthews would be safe as long as you were here. Well, I'm here, but Mr. Matthews isn't. What? I hope I won't have to tell you a dozen times. Mr. Matthews went out with Mr. Waltham. But didn't Kingston phone here until... Excuse me. Kingston Enterprises, good afternoon. Well, this is Mr. Kingston. Let me speak to Mr. Waltham again, will you? Mr. Waltham's out, Mr. Kingston. Oh, I see. Oh, did he leave with Mr. Matthews and a Boston Blackie? Boston Blackie? No, sir, I don't even know him. I'm Boston Blackie. If that's Kingston, I'd like to talk to him. Oh, Mr. Kingston, Blackie wants to talk to you. Oh, by all means. Here you are, Blackie. Thanks. Hello, Charlie. Uh, Blackie, what's the matter down there? Where's Waltham and Matthews? Well, that's just what I want to ask you. Didn't you phone Waltham and tell him to keep Matthews here? Yes, the minute I was through talking to you. Uh, well, what is he? He isn't here now. What happened to you? And I hate to think what's going to... Well, wait a minute, Blackie. Here's Waltham now. Good. Matthews with him? Uh, no. Uh, in good heavens, Blackie, Waltham's wounded. Badly? Uh, just a minute. Waltham, what happened to you? Here, I sit down here. I've been shot. What with Matthews? I got shot. Well, Charlie. Look, sit down. Uh, yes, Charlie. Blackie, yes. Uh, if Waltham can talk, put him on the phone, will you? Well, all right. Uh, just a minute. Uh, can you talk, Waltham? Yes, I think so. Good. Here, I'll hold the phone for you. It's Boston Black. He wants to talk to you. Waltham, can you hear me? Yes, Blackie. Where's Matthews? Dead, I guess. I don't know. It happened too fast. Who shot you? I don't know. I couldn't see. It was too dark down there. Down where? In Matthews' house. We went there to get the chart showing where the gold ship was located. We were in the house when the lights went out. There, there was...
were shot from the darkness. Matthews fell. I was hit, but I got away. Where's Matthews' house? On Wharf Street. Okay, I'll go down there and see what happened. Matthews still has the chart? Yes. Yes, he has. Well, maybe I can find it. Maybe I can find him. One thing, I promise you, I'll find something. Well, I can say one thing for Wharf Street, Mary. It's not pretty, but the sea hair is wonderful. Smells fishy to me. <laughs> so does this little situation we're in. Mm. Well, the man at the fruit stand said this is Matthew's house, 219. Hmm. I don't see any signs of excitement. Maybe Mr. Walsham dreamed up his story about being shot. If he did, he dreamed up a bullet hole, too, Mary. And that's awfully realistic dreaming. Let's go in and see if we can find anything. All right. Hmm. The lights are on inside. Let's have a look around. Okay. We've searched downstairs. There's nothing here. What's with you? Hey, Mary, that's Faraday. It's hey, who is that? Keep looking, Rollins. I'll go out and see who it is. Blackie. You. Yes, Inspector. Me. And me. Uh, don't remind me. Blackie's bad enough. Bad enough, Faraday. You mean good enough, don't you? Good enough for what? To tell you what happened here. A guy named Larry Matthews was killed. That's what happened here. We found his body inside. I suppose you know who killed him. Sorry to disappoint you, Faraday, but yes, I do know who killed Matthews. It was his ex-partner, Bill Bronson, the diver. Oh, hum. Want to hear more? Keep talking. You don't know how stupid you sound. Listen, Bill Bronson's sister came to see you today, didn't she? Yes. And you told her to come to see me, didn't you? Yes, but she wouldn't do it. Well, she changed her mind. Uh, women do that, you know. So? So, Blackie, you think Bill Bronson killed Matthews, huh? I know he did. How do you like that? Well, an hour before Matthews was killed down here, a cop arrested Bill Bronson uptown, and he's been in jail since. How do you like that? <laughs> And now, back to Boston Blackie. When Bill Bronson, diver, found the sunken ship with its long-lost cargo of gold, his partner, Larry Matthews, cut his air hose and lines and left him for dead. But Bronson miraculously lived and swore vengeance on Matthews. The diver's sister, knowing of her brother's plan, came to Blackie for help. But before Blackie could get to Matthews, someone else got to him with a gun. And it wasn't Bronson, because Bronson was in jail. As we return to our story, Henry Waltham, who was with Matthews when he was shot, was having a bullet wound dressed by a doctor. Still hurt, son? Ye yes, it does, doctor. Mm, you're lucky you're still alive. That bullet just missed puncturing your lung. Yeah. Huh? You'll have to take it easy for a while. Yeah. That dressing will do for now. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Doctor. Well, let's see how you respond to treatment before you thank me. Uh, here we are. Uh, what's your name, son? You... You have to know that? Yep. Okay. It's Waltham. Henry Waltham. Henry Waltham. Mm-hmm. And how did you get that bullet in you? I told you when I came in... It was an accident. I know. Now suppose you tell me the truth. Look, what's it to you how I got shot? You're a doctor, not a policeman. I know, but I have to report this to the police. You've got to report it. Oh, no. But it's the law. I'd lose my right to practice if I didn't... Well, you're going to lose a patient if you do. Lie down, son. You're still too weak. I'm to get... not too weak to get out of here. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, yes, I do. Here's something. <laughs> Instead of your feet. Come back here, you. Come back. Oh, no. Operator, get me the police. Wonder when that diver's going to signal us, Blackie. He's been down there long enough to have found ten million dollars in gold. Well, I wish he'd find Waltham while he's at it, Charlie. Blackie, do you think Mr. Waltham killed Mr. Matthews? I don't know, Mary. Oh, Mr. Kingston! Mr. Kingston! Yes, Captain Arnold. The diver's found something down there, Mr. Kingston. What's talk to you? Well, thank you, Captain Arnold. A couple of extra earphones, Blackie. You and Mary might like to listen in. Thanks, Charlie. Oh, I'd love to. Just wait till I get mine on. Uh, okay, then. This will be a great moment if he's found that gold. Uh, uh, hello down there. This is Charlie Kingston. Sorry, Mr. Kingston. 
used to no luck here either. But Captain Arnold said you'd found something. Yes, but not a ship full of gold, just the end of the sandbar. The drop-off so deep, my light won't hit the bottom of it. Well, I guess we're in the wrong place again. I'm afraid we are, Mr. Kingston. I wish you'd had a better look at that chart. I can't make many more dives today. I realize that. Well, come up and try just once more, will you? Sure. Once more. Oh, uh, Captain Arnold. Yes, Mr. Kingston. Uh, have your men bring the diver up. He, we still haven't found the right place. Yes, sir. All right, men. Let's bring the diver topside. If he only brings down there, worth bringing up. Come on. Ray, you'll have to wait until you get that chart to find your gold, Charlie. But I may never get in black here. Remember, I only had a quick look at the chart. Oh, look, they're cranking the thing that brings the diver up. I'm going over there and watching some out of the water. Well, don't try to help anyone, Mary, or they may have to pull you out of the water, too. Okay, I'll be careful. <laughs> I think we'll try looking for the gold over there a few hundred yards. You're just wasting your time looking for it without that chart, Charlie. And I'm wasting my time out here, too. I ought to be looking for Waltham. You think he killed Matthews, do you? Well, I'm not sure. I'd hate to think that Waltham killed Matthews. You know, he said a third person entered the room just as the shooting started. I don't believe that story completely. That's why I want to find All Waltham. All right, men. The time is brought to the surface. Come aboard. Come on, you better step aside, lady. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. You better come over here by us, Mary. Oh. I wanted to watch him take the diver's helmet off. Uh, he's going to go down again in another spot, Mary. Maybe you can watch then. Well, you can see him from right here now, Mary. Well, it isn't as good as being close, but... Oh, look, look. He's up on deck now. He looks like the man from Mars, doesn't he? <laughs> yes, he does. Woo! All right, men. Stop the pump. They got his helmet off. Well, Mary, you saw them take the helmet off. Blackie, he... look. Look, there's an awfully big launch, and it's heading right toward us. Good night. The fool doesn't see us. Oh, hey. Our engines in time to get out of his way. Hey. Captain Arnold! Captain Arnold! Hey. I see him, Mr. Kingston. He's going to crash into us. Hey. Hey. Hold on to me, Mary. Back! Blow the whistle! Tug! Hey. Grab that gun and take it to the train! What do we do? Get him, everybody! It's the last time to swerve off! Yes, he's not right here. Come here, Mary. Stay close to me. All right, I will! Is, is, is everybody all right? Well, I'm all wet. I think I'm all right. You all, all right, Becky? Yes, I'm okay, but, but look, we're five or six miles from shore. I, uh, I don't like this. See if anybody can grab a, a plank or something from the boat. Good idea. All your men all right, Arnold? Yes. Yes, Mr. Kingston. And here comes the launch. It looks like a police boat, too. See, it is a boat. Hello there. Hello. Save your breath, Charlie. They see us. They're swinging around to pick us up. Here come the lifelines. They're ready to grab them. Okay. Hey, Mary. You take this one. Oh, thanks. Well, look who's playing porpoise. If it isn't Boston Blackie. It's Faraday. <laughs> Call them in, boys. All but that good-looking one there. He looks undersized to me. Call me up, Faraday, or I'll haul you in here with me. What? When well, you know I can't swim? <laughs> That's why I'd like to have you in here. Here, Blackie. I'm aboard now. Uh, take this rope of mine. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, are you ready? Ready. Come on. Uh, up you go. Uh, there you are. There. Oh, wow. Thanks, Charlie. You all right, Mary? Oh, sure. Just dripping a little, that's all. Well, there's some blankets in the cabin there, Miss Wesley. Better get into one right away. All right, I guess I better, thanks. I don't know what brought you out here, Faraday, but I'm glad something did. Well, I came out here just in time to see that guy Waltham ram your boat. Well, how did you you know it was Waltham, Faraday? Well, because a doctor reported treating his wound and told how Waltham slugged him and skipped out. Then the next report I got on Waltham was that he was seen getting into a powerboat in the harbor. Oh, Inspector Faraday... Yeah, Rollins, what is it? Just got a radio message from shore, Inspector. Yeah? So what? So we don't have to look for Waltham anymore. He walked into the 18th Precinct Station and gave himself up. <laughs> so you think Waltham rammed us, Inspector? Uh, okay, okay, I was wrong. Uh, I suppose you know who rammed you. I have a rough idea, and I think if I see Bill Bronson, I can smooth it out. Bill Bronson? What could he have to do with this? He's still in jail. Good. Let's go down and see him before he's released. Uh, what makes you think he's going to be released? You're going to release him. He still doesn't know that his ex-partner Matthews is dead, and uh, Faraday 
before you let him out of jail, I'm going to let you in. I have some bad news for you, Bronson. I'm in jail, Blanky, and you say you have some bad news for me. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, but this isn't, Bronson. Hey, Faraday. You and Blackie got awful long faces. What's the matter? Your sister's dead, Bronson. Huh? Sarah's dead? Yes. Killed by the man who tried to kill you. Why, the dirty Matthews out. Wait, wait a minute. That won't do any good, Bronson. All we want you to do is give us all the information you can. We found your sister's bodies in Matthews' house. Do you know any reason why she would be down there? Yeah. Yeah, I know a reason, Blanky. I guess I'm it. What do you mean, you're it? Well, what am I in jail for? Because I said I was going out to kill Matthews for trying to kill me. Why? Well, I guess this went down there to kill him just to keep me from doing it. Only Matthew shot first. Yeah, the low down. And that's enough, enough of you. that, Bronson. Now, look. Your sister's dead just because you wanted to take the law into your own hands. Now, if you've learned your lesson, I'll let you go free. Yeah, I... I've learned my lesson, Inspector. All right. Go home and be a good boy. Because I don't want to have to teach it to you again. Who is it? Who's that? It's me, Sarah. What's the idea? Bill, they let you out. Sarah. They told me you were dead. What? Yeah. Said Matthews killed you. I told him you went down there to kill him for me. You idiot, you stupid... Now, look, you don't have to get sore. I had no way of knowing that. I didn't have to get sore. I ought to kill you for what you've done to me. What have I done? What have you done? Because of you, you stupid fool, the police are going to be after me for murder. And why did I kill Matthews for you? You did not. It was your idea to kill him for the money and the charge. All right, it was my idea. And it was also my idea not to get caught. But you aren't caught yet. And I was tricked into saying that... Saying enough to send me to the electric chair. And everything was perfect, absolutely perfect, till you had opened your stupid mouth. Now, look, don't blame me all for this. Your plan wasn't perfect. Oh, wasn't it? Who'd ever guess I killed Matthews? Didn't I go to Blackie and warn him that you were going to kill Matthews? Didn't I go to the police and have them arrest you to keep Matthews alive? I know, I know all that. (laughs) You know all that. Well, I know a lot more. After I took Matthews' chart, I risked my neck to keep Charlie Kingston from finding that gold. I rented a launch and rammed his boat. I did all that for us. And what did you do for me? Fall for a stupid trick. Now, look, I'll go back to the police and tell them I was lying about you wanting to kill Matthews. I'll... Let's well, just tell us now, Bronson. We're right here. Come on in, Blackie. Police. Stand where you are, Bronson. <sighs> uh, Rollins, go revive Miss Bronson. She's fainted. Yes, sir. Well, Faraday, happy now? Yeah, I'm happy, Blackie. I've got my killers. Sure you have. I made sure you would. Well, Inspector, you might as well take Bill Bronson downtown... He's so used to being underwater. Let's see if he's getting used to being under arrest. Uh, hello down there. Any luck, diver? I'm coming to the hull of a ship now, Mr. Kingston. I'll let you know in a minute. Good, good. Well, we'll know in a minute, Blackie, if Inspector Faraday got the right chart from Miss Bronson. Right. Waltham feeling okay, Charlie? Yes, fine. But he feels like a fool for losing his head and running out on that doctor. He he doesn't know what made him do it. Oh, I suppose he was afraid the police wouldn't believe his story about how Matthews was shot. Hello there, Mr. Kingston. Oh, it's the diver. Uh, Yes, diver? I found it, Mr. Kingston. There's plenty of it. Oh, you found the gold? You bet I have. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Uh, Blackie, Mary, he he found the gold. Wonderful. That's fine, Charlie. Well, aren't you excited? It's two million dollars in gold. I'm a rich man. You've been a rich man for years, Charlie. Just how rich can you get? After all, what difference does two million make to a man who already has 20 or 30? Do do you know something, Blackie? What is it, Charlie? I never thought of that.
Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. He leaned over the shining halo of her blonde hair reflected in the soft glow of the new moon. Oh, no, 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 not that. Holiday, my boy, why did you ever decide to write fiction for a living? You know, you could have gone into something interesting like being a truck driver. With the open road in front of you and a motorcycle cop in back. Hey, Susie, where have you been? Don't you remember, Mr. Holliday? I went down to Star Times' office. Oh. Oh, so you did. Tell me, what's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, what now, Mr. Holliday? What's new in Box 13? Yesterday, a man wanted to sell me a horse for $1,000 and a ranch to go around the horse for 25 times that much. The day before, my ad for adventure brought me a reply from a golf professional who simply wanted to drive golf balls off the tip of my nose. Mr. Holliday. Uh, oh, was that Susie? I said that when a nice young man like you runs an ad, he should get a whole box full of answers. Oh, well, thank you, Susie. He should get bushel baskets full. Well, thanks again. The, the place should be loaded with letters. All right, all right. Now, what did I get? One postcard. And from a kid at that. A kid? You mean a child? Sure, uh-huh. Here, let me see it. A postcard from a youngster. It's probably a gag. Some small girl selling ten cent packages of flower seeds for fifty cents. Sell five thousand packages and she gets absolutely free a St. Bernard dog. <laughs> well, let's see what really is on this postcard. Hmm. I wrote to you, care of box 13, because I thought you wanted it that way. I got to see you right away on a very important matter. I am still doing business at the old stand. Signed, Johnny Moran. Johnny Moran? Why, he's a little boy who sells newspapers on the corner. Hey, Susie, get Johnny Moran up here right away. Oh, I can't do that, Mr. Holliday. Why can't you do it? Because he's here already. Oh, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Johnny, how are you, my boy? Why didn't you just come up and see me instead of writing a postcard first? Well, I like to do things sort of business-like. Besides, it was fun to answer an ad for Adventure Wanted. Would you really do anything, Mr. Holliday? Sit down, Johnny. Tell me what your trouble is. Well, uh, I kind of wanted to see you alone. Sort of private-like. Oh, that uh, man-to-man stuff, huh? Yeah, that's it. Well, where would you like to talk? Well, I thought maybe you'd come down to the corner with me. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. A drink? You interest me strangely, Johnny. Come on, let's go. Okay. Oh, Susie, you'll excuse us, won't you? Well, I don't know. You better be careful, Mr. Holliday. Careful? I don't want Johnny teaching you bad habits. Johnny Moran is a very nice boy. Can't be more than 12, but he certainly seems to know his way around. Yes, Holiday, if you were ordering a small boy, this is just the model you would choose. But this drinking business... I'm worried about you, Mr. Holiday. You sure that lemon coke is enough? Lemon cokes are always enough for me, Johnny. Especially when I spike them with an ice cube. Say, how's your banana split? Well, this one's got a little too much chocolate. I like the last one better. Better finish it, my boy. You want to talk business, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you might have read about it in the newspapers. Of course, you could have missed it. It was way back on page five. What was on page five? Well, here. I got a clip in the story. Read it. The 
Police announced they'd recovered a portion of the jewelry stolen in last Tuesday's raid on Maury Jewelry Company. Held under suspicion of grand theft is John Moran. John Moran. Johnny, that's your father. Yes, and he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. I know he didn't. Just a second. A part of the loot was found in Moran's apartment. I don't care what they put in the newspapers, Mr. Holliday. He didn't do it. That's why I came to see you. Uh, what about your mother, Johnny? Oh, well, she died when I was a baby. Pop and I lived together. But he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. Only they won't believe me. Oh, you've been down to the police? Sure, I went there right away. I even offered them my 18 bucks for bail. You know what? What? The old DA just patted me on the head and told me to go home. Hmm. I'll bet you could go down and talk to that district attorney and make him let my father out. You can do anything. Well, not quite anything, Johnny. Yeah, but this would be easy for a guy like you. Besides, you're not afraid of anything. Not even a policeman. Well, that's very flattering, Johnny, but I don't know what I can do. Oh, you'll think of something, Mr. Holliday. You're a writer. You're smart. Oh, but listen, my boy, I... I bet you get my father out of jail in time for dinner. Okay, Holiday. The boy says you can get his father out of jail in time for dinner. But what day? The story in the paper makes it look like they caught John Moran cold. You don't find stolen jewelry in a man's apartment if he didn't do the stealing. But there's a small boy waiting. Waiting with all the faith in the world. So, Holiday, do something. Attorney, you'll see you now, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Holliday, haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, I know. I've been pretty busy. Huh, busy, huh? Well, then what brings a promising young author down to City Hall? Because he's a promising young author who made a promise. And I hope he didn't make a mistake. Hey, what in the world are you talking about? About a man named John Moran. You've got him locked up in your nice new jail. Yes. And from what we've got on him, he's going to stay there for a while. His son thinks Moran is innocent, Clark. Yeah. I feel sorry for that boy. He came down and talked to me, but what could I do for him? You've got the goods on Moran, then? Absolutely. The police found some of the stolen stuff in his apartment. Well, what's Moran's story? A woman who works in the same building with Moran asked him to stop in at the jewelry store and pick up her watch. While he was there, the stick-up artist walked in and held up the place. And that makes Moran guilty? Don't be in a hurry. The stick-up artist used him as a shield when he beat it. Moran claims the man forced him to drive the getaway car out into the country. Well, that still doesn't make him guilty. I think you've got the wrong person. This is where Moran's story went wrong. He walked into police headquarters and told it, but it sounded too good to be true. They detained him while the detective went over and searched his apartment. Oh? The detective found part of the loot. Moran couldn't explain where it came from. Well, to our office, it looks like he pulled a clever gag. We think he's in with a hold of men. What about the woman, the one who sent Moran after the watch? Grace Willard? We don't have a thing on her. She's in the clear. I see. So, Holiday, you better forget about playing Don Quixote. Day of fighting windmills is over. Go home. Forget about Johnny Moran. Sure, Holiday, just forget all about John Moran. Write for me to the story and take it out of the typewriter. But how are you going to write the dialogue for a man who has to tell a small boy that his father hasn't got a chance? And describe the look in that boy's eyes. I don't care what that old district attorney said. My father isn't a crook. And your father should have been able to explain the stolen jewelry they found at your place. I'll bet he could, too. They just wouldn't listen to him. Oh, now, Johnny, if your father's innocent, they'll let him go. So you won't help me either. But I'm trying, my boy. What else can I do? Oh, nothing, I guess. See you later, Mr. Holiday. Oh, Johnny, listen to me. I'm kind of busy right now. i got to earn a lot of dough, I guess. Johnny. Because lawyers come pretty expensive, I heard. Oh, look, kid. You better go home, Mr. Holiday. I should have handled it personally in the first place. Small boys have that knack, don't they? They can just vanish into thin air when they want to. You're quite a character, Holiday. Go home and write this on your typewriter. Write about the small boy who wanted you to get his father out of jail. And you didn't quite make the grade. 
Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Johnny. I'm up at the place where we live. Yeah, Johnny? There's something funny going on. What are you talking about? I'm afraid to go into our place. There's a man in there. You know him? Uh-uh. He's going through the place, though. He's looking for something. Johnny, listen. Run outside, find a policeman. I'll be right over. I gotta get out of here. Johnny, do what I said. He just walked out the door. He saw me. Get over to Moran's place fast, Holiday. You've got no time for fooling. He's not outside. Maybe he's upstairs. Oh, Johnny. Johnny! Where could that boy have gone to? Grace Willard. The woman who sent Moran up to the watch. If she knows Moran, she knows his boy. Yes? Oh, Miss Willard? Yes. Well, I'm Dan Holliday. Would you know where little Johnny Moran is? Come in. Now, what's this about Johnny? Well, he phoned me a few minutes ago from his place. There was a man going through it. He saw Johnny making the call. Johnny's disappeared? Yes. You phoned the police? Do you think he's been hurt? Well, the police knew nothing about it. I don't know what happened to the boy. That's why I came over here. I figured that if you knew his father, you knew Johnny, you know. Poor Mr. Moran. I feel so badly about him. You know, if I hadn't asked him to get my watch, this never would have happened. But that doesn't make it your fault, Miss Phillips. Oh, I feel terrible about it, just the same. And now, Johnny disappearing. He hasn't been here at all? No. Let me think of it. Oh, um, by the way, I was just having some coffee. Would you care to join me? Grace Willard is a very nice person. Really worried about the boy. Perhaps you'll come back with an idea. Here's your coffee, Mr. Holliday. Now we'll talk. Oh, thanks. Uh, did Johnny recognize the man? No, he didn't have time to say. Well, perhaps he found a policeman on the street. He might have gone back to the house. Well, maybe I ought to call back. Johnny's a cute little fellow. Johnny has a father who's in jail. Johnny's quite concerned about his father and would like to set him free. Grace Willard is stalling Holiday, waiting for something. I don't know if Johnny will get his wish or not. You see, his father looks very guilty to the police. Holiday, you idiot. That coffee was doped. The oldest gag in the world and you swallowed it. You look sleepy, Mr. Holiday. Are you feeling all right? She looks like a reflection in one of those amusement park mirrors. She's, she's long and skinny. No, no, she's short, short and fat. Holiday, Holiday, get up on How your feet. How do you feel, Mr. Holiday? Are you all right, Anson? Get on your feet, I said. Walk, Holiday. Walk. Walk this thing off before it's too late. You look very tired, Mr. Holliday. Let me get you a pillow. Come on. Come on, Holliday. One big How do you effort. feel, Mr. Holliday? I... I... I can't... can't make it. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh, take it easy, Holliday. Take it easy. Turn slowly now. Maybe your head still is connected to the top of your neck. That's better. Better? Hmm. What am I saying? Where am I? An alley. Oh, fine. Dan Holliday, author found lying in an alley. Between yesterday's newspapers and tomorrow's trash. What you need right this minute is a quick change, a fast bath, and a little chat with a district attorney. 
I've got a man going up to the Willard woman's place right this minute, Holiday. Thanks, Clark. This ties her up with the Moran case. Sure, else why would she give me knockout drops and have me dumped in an alley? I'll bet anything she's disappeared. But why just knock you out? Why not dispose of you permanently? I don't know, unless she was trying to kill time. Enough time to get something done. Well, you can't do anything now. If she's disappeared, she won't stay lost for long. My men will bring her in. Uh, don't let her give him any coffee. She'll be out again. Uh, pardon me. District Attorney's Office, Clark speaking. Yes? Where? When? How is he? Thanks. I'll see you later, Clark. I want to go over and see Johnny Moran. I don't think you'll find him at home, Holiday. Why not? That was a hospital who just called. Johnny Moran was brought in a while ago, the victim of a hit-and-run driver. And on top of that phone call about Johnny Moran is another one. Grace Willard checked out of the Wharton Hotel an hour ago. So, Mr. Holiday, they got you out of the way long enough to get to little Johnny. A small boy in a hospital. Me with an aching head and an aching feeling that something is very, very wrong. I think this is it, room 809. Johnny? Oh, Mr. Holiday. How do you feel, kid? Kind of banged up. Yeah, I know. The nurse said you want to do too much talking. So, just let me ask a couple of questions. It wasn't an accident, Mr. Holiday. He did it on purpose. You sure about that, Johnny? Yeah. I was walking down a side street. He had to swing way over to the wrong side to hit me. Johnny, did he look like the same man who was in your place? I didn't get a good look at him. He was bent down way behind the wheel. Well, could you give me just a hint? Was he tall, short, thin, fat? All I know is... Yes? Johnny. Johnny. Johnny passed out and won't be permitted to talk for a while. Well, that puts it up to you, Holiday. Come on, you're an author. You write hundreds of situations like this one. Think. The boarding house where Johnny lives. Maybe the landlady saw the man. I certainly hope so. Johnny Moran? Yes, I saw him come home, but it was quite some time ago. Oh, did you see him leave? Yes, he went upstairs. I heard him on the telephone, then he came running down. Who was the man chasing him? Chasing him? There was no one chasing him. Are you sure of that? Well, of course I've been here all the time. Oh, poor little fella. Don't know what's going to happen to him, what with his father and all. This doesn't make sense. I beg your pardon? Oh, nothing. You see, Johnny called me, told me there was a strange man in his place. The man saw him, he hung up the phone and disappeared. But I saw no man. Are you sure? Well, only Joe Coakley, but he's one of my rumors. That is, he was. Was? When did he move? Oh, today, just after Johnny left. Was he upstairs while Johnny was there? Why, yes. Yes, he was. Uh... Was he a friend of John Moran's? Oh, no, no. He never spoke to anyone. Stayed in his room all day and went out at night. Oh, one of those night flyers, huh? Uh, could I see the room he occupied? This is Coakley's room. But it's empty. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're on the wrong track. Track? Or are you? Dub from a dance hall ticket. I'd better talk to Johnny about this. Johnny, the man who came out of your room, was he about my height? Did he have grayish hair? Did he wear a brown suit? Yeah. Yeah, that's the man, Mr. Hardy. How come you never saw him before? He lived right across the hall from you. That guy? He only went out at night after I was in bed. Oh? Uh -huh. I'll see you later, Johnny. Hey, where are you going? Tonight, I'm going dancing. This is a very nice place, Holiday. 
Admission 60 cents, which includes an evening of dancing. And from the looks of the customers, they're trying to get their money's worth. You like to dance, fella? Uh, who, me? Hey, you ain't not twins, are you? No, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm a very bad dancer. Oh, you let me be the judge of that. Come on, kid. You look good to me. Oh, wait a second. Say, isn't that Joe Coakley over there? Oh, you know Joe? Yeah, and uh, and the girl with him. That's his girlfriend, Grace Willard. Oh, thanks. I'll see you later. Hey, where are you going? This is it, Holiday. Only what are you going to do? They're leaving, and if you stop to make a phone call, you'll lose them. And I wouldn't like to lose that man. He's the one who hits small boys with big automobiles. They're going into the department house. This begins to look like the final chapter. Now to make a fast telephone call to an old friend, then better to get to the payoff. Mm, this is a very nice door. You can hear quite distinctly through it. Well, Holiday, here's where you cease to be a wallflower and become the life of the party. Joe! No. It's Holiday. Put up your hands, fella. Sure. Sure. Close that door, Grace. Well, here we are. Aren't we? Can you reply, Mr. Joe? What are we going to do? You finish packing that junk, we'll figure out something. We can't let him stay alive. Finish the packing, I said. Too bad I didn't use poison in that coffee I gave him. Quiet. I uh, noticed you were packing. Going away someplace? What do you think? And get away from that bag, Holiday. Oh, that's the stuff that was stolen from the store, huh? None of your business. Oh, uh, going away together? You and Miss Willard? Maybe. Mm-hmm. You pull that, go down and pick up my watch routine in a lot of cities, huh, Joe? Make him be quiet, Joe. Hey, uh, Joe, who was the girl who worked with you before you met Grace? You know, the one who lived in Cleveland, or was it Chicago? I always forget. Come on, Joe, what happened Shut to up, her? you. What happened to her, Joe? Or the girl before. How do you know there was another girl, Holiday? Well, Miss Willard, you don't think you're the only one, do you? You're crazy. Yeah? Ask him where he was last night. Don't pay any attention to him, Grace. He wasn't with you. Know where he was? How do you know he wasn't with me? The stub of a dance hall ticket I found in the other room. It calls for only... One admission. You shut up, I said. Just a minute, Joe. Were you down there last night? Were you dancing with that blonde again? I suppose I was. So what? You've got a lot of nerve. You had me set up this whole deal. Had me find John Moran to play sucker for us. Had me frame the business of picking up my watch. I timed it out perfect for you. What do you do? You go dancing with a blonde. Grace, be quiet. This fellow's up to something. Me? Now, what would I be up to? What about that other girl he talked about? What happened to her, Joe? Why don't you tell her, Joe? Cut it out, will you? Did she plant stolen jewelry in a sucker's room like I did to Moran? Grace, listen. Yeah. I'm listening. Go on, explain. Hey, Holiday, where are you going? Just opening the door. You see, I'd like the district attorney to hear the rest of your explanation, too. <laughs> chapter to a story I was afraid might have an unhappy end. But Johnny Moran's father is free. The district attorney has Grace Willard, Joe Coakley, and the stolen jewelry. And Johnny? Hmm. Johnny is out of the hospital. Mr. Holliday. Uh, uh, what did you say, Johnny? I said you might have been killed going up to the apartment like that. No, I was safe for the DA just outside the door. Gosh, and you figured it all out by yourself. No, you helped too when you telephoned me. And I hate to mention this, kid, but uh, did you bring the $18 with you? Sure I did. I pay off, you know. Here. Oh, uh, thanks, kid. I, I was just a little worried. I was going to pay before, Mr. Holiday, but I didn't think you needed money that bad. I uh, needed it to put with this check. Uh, here. There was a $500 reward for recovering the jewelry, and it's going to a bank account for you. $500? Gee... Gosh, I guess I'm rich. 
Johnny, what are you going to do with all that money? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is take you out and buy you a drink. How about an idiot's delight? Uh, a what? Idiot's delight. It's got a pint of ice cream, three bananas, some oranges, and seven flavors. Well, Johnny, I, I don't know. I. M- Mr. Holliday, I just heard that Johnny got out of the house. Ho- oh, there you are, Johnny. How do you feel? I feel swell, Susie. I just invited Mr. Holiday out to have a drink. Well, he can't go out, Johnny. He's got some very important work to do. Well, gee whiz. Thanks a lot, Susie. Thanks? What are you thanking me for? You don't know it, but you've just saved me from a horrible fate. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Got an old corpse kicking around you want identified? Know of any good murders you want solved? We've got just the girl for you. Her name is Candy Matson. Mighty cute, too. She fills out a size 12 suit to just the right proportions. Soft blonde hair, two sparkling blue eyes, and all in all, she looks as though she might have stepped right off a Varga calendar. And what's more, she's a private eye. You scoff? You ridicule? I'll let you see for yourselves. Listen, she's talking on the phone right now. Hello, Candy Matson. Hello, Miss Matson. I'm afraid you don't know me. That makes it even. You don't know me. Let's go from there. I've read about you in the papers, Miss Watson. You handle confidential cases. That's right. However, there's a little matter of a fee involved. Yes, yes, I know. I can pay. That's item number one. Now to item number two. What's the confidential case? I can't possibly tell you on the phone, Miss Watson. I said it was confidential. Mm, Okay. Where do you want to talk? I am the proprietor of a restaurant, the Charlemagne in North Beach. Oh, yeah. I ate there once. Oh. That's nice. No, it wasn't. I didn't like the food. Oh. However, I'll overlook it. Do you want to talk in about an hour? That will be fine, Miss Matson. Good. And your name would be... Martinello. Carlo Martinello. Okay, Mr. Martinello. And uh, have some ink in your pen. It costs money just to talk. I probably sounded rough and commercial, but you have to be in this racket. Most people look in a private eye as a musician. They invite you to a party and expect you to bring your harp for free. But uh uh-uh. I learned the hard way a long time ago. So now they pay in advance and take their chances later. That's the way it was with this Martinello. I was at home in my penthouse on Telegraphy a lot on the porch taking a sunbath. When the phone rings and it's this Carlo character. That part was all right because I can always use new customers. But what made me mad was the fact that I had to stop listening to the 49ers belt the bejabers out of the Cleveland Browns at Kezar Stadium. But I followed through and uncovered a couple of very done-in bodies along the way. Do you like the grotesque in your whodunit? Then follow me and we'll tiptoe lightly through the tibbets, the ponds, and the baccalonies. Because part of the story unfolds at the opera house. Reluctantly, I dressed into something Charlemagne-ish turned off the 49ers Cleveland game and went down to talk to Martinello. His place was typical, located on Powell Street, a garish neon sign, and as you walked in, the air place was air-conditioned by eau de garlic. Yes, miss. You wish a table? I wish a table, yes. With the right party, I'm looking for the owner. I am the owner. I am Candy Matson. Oh, Miss Matson. Walk this way, please. <sighs> if I could walk that way, I'd revive vaudeville. Pardon? Uh, where is your office? Right over here. Allow me. After you, signorina. Thank you, senor. 
Here, sit down, please. Thanks. Now, Martinello, what's on your mind? Always, all my life, I have run a very nice, respectable place. Mm -hmm. Until this morning. What's with this morning? I go down to the basement. My icebox is down there. That is where I keep all my meat. So, you wanted some ground round. Oh, no, no. Perhaps I'd better show you. Please, you will come with me. Martinello led the way out of his office and down a flight of stairs. A cold blast hit my face. A musty aroma smothered my nostrils, and if I had had a phobia about darkness, I'd have ducked out then. But I followed the guy, and we ended up in front of a refrigerator about the size of an inquisition chamber. He opened the door, and it was the usual restaurant icebox. Choice legs of lamb hanging from hooks, potential fillets, and thick New York cuts. The box was cold, and I started to shiver. Not from the refrigeration, though, because over in the corner was a man. He looked like something out of a long-lost Arctic expedition. He had a long, flowing mustache, every bristle of which was coated with ice. He was quite frozen and quite dead. I slammed the door shut and reeled out. The sight had staggered my thought processes. Martinello reached over by a salami slicing table and turned on a Mazda. A weak affair that cast dim shadows about the damp basement. Is that your little surprise? Yes, Mr. Matson. That is what I was greeted with this morning. Have you notified the police? Oh, no, no, no. Why not? As I told you, I have run a very respectable place. And, too, that is why I am hiring you. You can get in trouble, you know. Yes, yes, that is why you must help me. Please, please, Miss Matson, say you will help me. I will pay you anything you say. I stick my neck out in the strangest places. Now it's a refrigerator. Okay, Martinello, $2,000. What? Make up your mind. Either I freeze your assets or the police find your frozen friend. Yes. All right. Come. I give you the money now. Now we're getting somewhere. What about him? Oh, he'll keep. He's on ice. Well, this was one for the books. Refrigeration the ugly way. I had to ask a few questions if I was to get anywhere. Such as like, do you know the guy? No. Had you ever seen him before? No. Who was the last one to close the icebox last night? I was. Does it lock from the inside? Unfortunately, yes. I was getting places like Wiley was with Hauser. It was inevitable. I had to take my courage in my hand and go down and look at that thing again. There it was, a male Mona Lisa etched in ice. This time I looked closer, I had to. And as I did, I realized I wasn't going to get any identification because this guy was a study in crimson. Underneath all that coating of ice, he was dressed in a devil's costume. I slammed the door once again and went upstairs. There I gave Martinello strict orders not to do a thing. Usually in cases like this, you have to wait for a break. They come along like a forcing hand in poker. So I went home to do some thinking. As I arrived, there was an old friend of mine, Rembrandt Watson. Hello, Dove. I'd almost given up. Rembrandt, how did you get in? Your door was open, dear. I took the liberty of coming in. Oh, sure, that's okay. How are things, Candy? All right, I guess. I'm kind of bush, though. I feel about as devaluated as a British pound. You look wonderful, Dove. What's wrong? I've got a deal, but I don't know where to start. Anything I can help you with? No, thanks, Rembrandt. If I told you about it, you wouldn't believe it. I've never doubted you in the past, dear. I know. Well, I was just called in by a minestrone merchant in North Beach. The guy is stuck with a corpse. That's about par for the course. The deceased had been sealed in the icebox overnight. I've never seen one like that before. That's the way it is, dear. Many are called, but few are frozen. Oh, get out of here. But, Dove, I just got here. I know, but I've got to change and get down to see Mallard. I'll wait for you, Candy. I haven't seen the gumshoe since before me vacation. All right. I'll be with you in a few moments. I did a fast change, and Rembrandt and I climbed into my car, and we dropped off Telegraph Hill on Don Kearney Street. The Hall of Justice, where Mallard hangs his star, is only a few blocks away, so we made it in about five minutes. Inspector Ray Mallard, Homicide, San Francisco Police. A lovable, shaggy dog type of character. 
very keen with the crime, but dumb with the dame. Me, for instance. If I want him to say yes, he says no, and vice versa. Well, my ever-loving candy. What's new in the private eye business? Very little. How's the legitimate flatfoot record? Oh, we're holding our archers up. Well, and Rembrandt. I haven't seen you since Pup was a Hector. Please, Inspector, you're making your mixapause. Who writes this dialogue? I'm pretty weak, I know. What's on your mind, Candy? A character named Carlo Martinello. Have you got anything on him? <laughs> What's so funny, Mallory? <laughs> nothing, except I eat lunch there about every day of the week. Well, answer my question. Well, there's nothing on Martinello. Arrested a couple of times during Prohibition. He was dabbling in grappa a lot under the table. Have you got a case against the guy, Detective Matson? Oh, cut it out. No, seriously. Why do you want to check on the guy, Candy? No reason. Just thought I'd ask. Uh-huh. Well, Martinello's okay. Just trying to make a living. Only thing I don't like, he loves to sing to his customers. <laughs> That'd be enough to bankrupt him right there. Anything else I can do? No, that takes care of everything. I tell you what, I'm through in about an hour. I'll take you up to Martinello's for dinner. You can see for yourself. No, 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 that, that, that's all right. Okay, Candy. Give. Why, Mallard, dear, what on earth do you mean? You know something about something. I want in. Mallard, and, and I want you to believe this. I mean it sincerely. If I knew something, you'd be the last to know about it. He's got something there. Come now, believe us a while. I hate to do things like that to Mallard. He's been of great help to me in the past. More than once, he's saved my life. But on a deal like this, you have to play it close. After all, a girl has to make a living. For the first time in a long time, I was completely baffled as to where to start. Something had to be done about that cadaver in the icebox, but what? While I was beetling my eyebrows, Rembrandt invited me up to his place for tea. He lives on California Street, just down away from old St. Mary's and only a bail bond broker's reach from the Hall of Justice. So I accepted. You do forgive the looks of the place, Candy, dear. I had a meeting my philatelist group last night. Philatelists? The stamp collectors, dear. Well, I know what they are, but I didn't think they could make such a mess. You don't know philatelists. Mm. Sit down, though. Make yourself comfortable. I shan't be a moment. That's all right. And Candy, dear, why the wrinkles? I've got cause for wrinkles. This chap in the icebox, Rembrandt, there's something I didn't tell you. He was dressed in a devil's costume. There, there, dear. Your tea will ready in just a minute. You'll feel better. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. What are you going to do, Candy? I don't know. I can't leave him in that refrigerator forever. Well, get him out, dear. I hate to think of a corpse catching pneumonia. Oh, excuse me, Candy. Help yourself to the tea. Mm -hmm. How do you do, Rembrandt Watson Enterprises? <laughs> Quiet, darling. Who? Oh, hello, Templeton. How are all your steamships? Oh, that's good. What? Could I use do what? To the opera? Of course I could. Right, oh, I'll pick them up at your office. Thank you, Templeton. Goodbye. Candy, dear, do you like the opera? I can take it or leave it. Why? It suddenly develops that I have two tickets tomorrow night for Tales of Hoffman. Oh, Rembrandt, I don't think I can... Come, go come, Candy. It'll do you good. You've been working too hard. You need a little relaxation. Tales of Hoffman, hmm? Okay. Who's the pal who gave them to you? An old friend of mine, Templeton Woodruff. He runs the steamship to Java and other places Ezio Pinza sings about. I finished the tea and left. Right then, the only opera I could think of was the one going on in an icebox at Martinello's. I've always tried to play straight with Ray Mallard, so I decided to tell Martinello my plan. Miss Matson, I don't think it's such a good idea. Good evening, to... Carlo. I want to talk to you. That's what I mean. There's a gentleman here who... Well, you've got a gentleman. That's fine. Three more and you've got a crowd. What I want to talk to you about is you this. You don't understand. The gentleman I'm talking about is from the police. The police? Yeah. Oh. Hello, Candy. Mallard. How about some scallopini? Well, up jumped the... Hello, Mallard, dear. I had an idea you'd like dinner here tonight. Uh, do you know my boy, Carl? Yes, yes, we've met. How do you do? How do you do? The signorina wish something to eat? No. No, thanks. I want to talk to you, though, Mallard. Sure. Come on into my booth. We'll share some salami. No, no, thanks. I want to see you downstairs. I don't think the food's as good down there. I agree, but it isn't the food. I'm talking about murder. 
Once again, I headed down into the catacombs of the Charlemagne. This time, the act was a double. Mallard was right behind me. Then I looked around. We were a trio. Martinello was right behind Mallard. This is it. This is what? This is an icebox. Inside, you'll find a body dressed in a devil's costume. Okay, Carlo, let's humor the lady. Open the thing, will you? I... Yes. I'll open it. Lovely view of the beef. It's gone. The body's gone. Okay, Martinello, start talking and make some sense while you're doing it. Please, Miss Matson. I don't know anything. I haven't been down here all day. Get rid of those arched eyebrows, Martinello. You know something. What is it? Wait a minute, Candy. I'll do the questioning. In the first place, Carlo, was there or was there not a body in here? I... Uh... Well, sure there was. He can't deny it. Here's a check for $2,000 signed by Martinello himself. Well, Carlo? Yes. There was a body, all right. Who was it? Friend of yours? No, Inspector. I never saw him before. Why did you call Miss Matson? Why didn't you come to see me about it? Well, you know, Inspector, the police... Uh, just because you were once arrested for bootlegging, Carlo, is no reason to be afraid of the police... Uh, well, I'll put a couple of my men on the job and see what we can turn up. What? Is that all you're going to do, Mallard? No. Right now, I'm going back upstairs and have some of Carlo's scallopini. Mallard, are you out of your head? Look, Candy, in order to have a murder case, you've got to have a body. Obviously, we're fresh out. And until your pal with the devil's costume turns up, I intend to live my typical everyday life. Don't forget the mushrooms, Carlo. There are times when I get so mad at Mallard, I want to scream. I didn't, though. I only scrammed. I hung on to the 2,000, however. I felt I deserved it just for getting my curiosity aroused, and it was aroused plenty. Corpses don't get up and walk out of ice boxes by themselves. But after all, Mallard had a point. There was nothing to be done without a body. So I went home and waded into a stack of dirty dishes that had been piling up. Then I fixed dinner and started a new stack of dirty dishes. Got in book and ducked into the bed. In the morning, I had an idea. After breakfast, I went down to the corner of Broadway and Columbus. That's where North Beach does a neat blend with Chinatown. On the corner was a Joe who sold newspapers. I'd known him for some time, and he seemed to like me. Hiya, Butch. Well, hello there, lady. How are you? Good. Can't complain. Who won the football game yesterday? Yeah, funny thing. I got all the news right inside here for seven cents. Mm, I get your point. Give me a chronicle, will you? Sure. Here. Thanks. Who do you like in the feature at Bay Meadows? A goat named Candy. What? What did you say? There's a pig named Candy running in the seventh. Take it or leave it. What a tip. I don't get it. Well, what's really on your mind, lady? Here. Here's a 20. You can play it on Candy all for yourself. Well... Do you know a gent named Martinello Butch? Mm. He owns the Charlemagne down the block. Sure. What about him? That's what I'm asking you. What about him? Oh, he's all right. A little screwy, but he keeps his nose clean. Is that all? Yeah. Should there be more? I don't know. Thanks, Butch. I hope Candy pays off. I was getting nowhere, that was for sure. And the rest of the day went the same way. Dead ends, blind alleys. I checked as many loose ends as I possibly could, but I was still stuck in a quandary. But the crusher claim late in the afternoon when I got a copy of the late paper and read where Candy came in at Bay Meadows and paid thirty-two twenty, And I hadn't had sense enough to get aboard. When I got home, the phone was ringing. Hello, Candy Matson. Oh, you're Candy Matson. I should play a fanfare. Oh, hello, Rembrandt, dear. How are you? Like an October morning. Every single one of the paws is breathing great, huge gulps of air. What? I just had a facial dove. Most invigorating. Uh, what on earth for? I loved your old pores just the way they were. Candy, you've forgotten. I have? Forgotten what, Rembrandt? We're going to the opera tonight. Oh, Ducky, I'm sorry. I had forgotten. I'm afraid I'll have to renege. Now, Candy, you promised. And I don't care what you're involved in. It'll do you good. But, Rembrandt, I'm working on it. Perhaps you're right. Okay, I'll get ready. Wonderful, dear. Pick me up about quarter of eight, will you? Pick you up a quarter of eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and another thing, Lamb. 
We may have to do some entertaining afterward. Uh, do bring some cash, will you? Mm-hmm. That's the girl. <laughs> That Rembrandt, always stony broke. I guess photography isn't what it's cracked up to be. I didn't mind, though. He's been a friend to me on more than one occasion. Then if I was going to the opera, I had to start thinking in operatic terms. I fished around in the closet and came up with something that would have done any woman's heart good. One of those strapless affairs that you can't stop breathing in for one moment, otherwise the opera is no longer the main attraction. I powdered perfume, pouted in rouge, and took off after Rembrandt. But just as I started to leave... Just a moment. Well, get a load of the Duchess. <laughs> it won't be Halloween for another couple of weeks yet. Oh, very funny. Come on in, Miller. What are you decked out for, Candy? Something you wouldn't understand. I'm going to the opera. Oh, I love the opera. Any horse opera with Tex Acuff in it. That's what I thought. What's on your mind, Mallard? I've got to pick up Rembrandt in ten minutes. Well, I was just driving by, so I thought I'd stop and tell you the news. News? About what? We found El Diablo. The guy in the icebox? Yeah. Martinello identified him. He was floating in the water off Aquatic Park. Any lead on him? The best. He was Salavini, the second baritone with the opera company. That's all, Candy. I hope you enjoy the performance tonight. <laughs> A baritone with the opera company. Well, that explained the costume, but it didn't explain a lot of other things. I walked down the stairs with Mallard. He got in his squad car, flicked on the flashing red light, and with a burst of his siren, rolled down the street. I had to speak to Mallard about that. All the neighbors had their heads out of their windows as I climbed into my car and followed. What an exit. I picked up Rembrandt, and we drove up to the Civic Center. I found a place to park. A minor miracle. The last time I went to the opera, I had to drive almost to Palo Alto and come back by train. Rembrandt's friend must have been very influential. We had seats in the Diamond Horseshoe. They were presenting Tales of Hoffman, and a friend of mine, Dorothy Warrenchold, was singing the role of Antonia. It was a fine performance, and after the last curtain, I took Rembrandt, and we went backstage to see Dorothy. <laughs> Hello, Dorothy. This is Candy Matson. I have a friend with me. Oh, do come in, please, Candy. Candy, how are you? Couldn't be better. Dorothy, may I present Mr. Watson? Rembrandt, this is Miss Warrenchold. I'm delighted. You're in magnificent voice tonight, dear, dear. Thank you. Sit down, won't you? I've only a moment. We're rehearsing some of the scenes in Faust tonight. Rehearsing after a full evening's performance? It has to be done, Candy. Our baritone disappeared. We've had to replace him with a new man. Yes, yes, I know. By the way, Dorothy, I heard you on your Standard Hour broadcast a few weeks ago. It was a wonderful performance. I'm glad you liked it, Candy. I always look forward to those. What are your plans, Dorothy? Well, the season closes here, and then we open in Los Angeles. Oh, yes, of course. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had guests. That's all right. Oh, Candy, I'd like to introduce Rolf Herbert. This is Miss Matson and Mr. Watson. Nice to meet you. Mr. Herbert is our new baritone. Oh, yes. That's why we're rehearsing tonight. I uh, won't take any more of your time, Dorothy. I just thought we'd save a few moments of rehearsal if I told you that I don't uh, move in that last scene. I sing upstage. That will leave you free to take as much stage as you like. Fine, Rolf. That will save time. Thanks. Oh, not at all. Glad to have met you, Miss Matson. Mr. Watson. Nice to meet you, sir. Yeah, see you on stage, Dorothy. Eh? Yes, Rolf. Rolf has a wonderful voice, and he's a good actor, too. You know, I think he'll be even better than Salavini. I've seen him before. Oh, yes, he's been in pictures and on the concert stage, and in opera, too. But he's, he's never really had a good break. This might be it. Uh-oh, that's it, Candy. I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave. Certainly, Dorothy. Say, why don't you stand in the wings? You can watch the rehearsal if you'd like. Oh, I'd love it. Come on, then. Follow me. All right, your places, everyone. Places. This is all right, Candy. You can stay right here. Thanks, Dorothy. Glad to have met you, Mr. Watson. Also, as we used to say in the theater, go out there and kill him. <laughs> See you later. Where is Miss Warren Show? Ah, there you are. Herbert, where's Herbert? I saw him just a moment ago in the dressing room. But it's late. We've got to keep moving. Please, somebody find Herbert. Ah! 
From way up in the heights of the stage, the opera house was pierced with a blood-curdling scream. That was no ordinary scream. It was the scream of death. You wait here, Rembrandt. Keep your eyes open. I'm going up to have a look. That scream wasn't in the score of Faust. I punched the button for the backstage elevator. It's a good thing they work fast and are speedy. Once inside, I pressed the button for the fourth gallery. I got out. This was the top of the opera house. The place was loaded with old sets, props, paper mache alligators, gold goblets. Then, over on the other side of the catwalk, I saw it. The body of a man all crumpled and distorted. I hit the catwalk and ran over. It was a hundred feet above the stage, and as I looked down, I could see a score of strained faces looking up through the darkness. I got on the other side and bent over the body. It was that of Rolf Herbert. Candy, down here. I think your man just stepped down underneath the stage. Again, I did a Mel Patton. The elevator shot me down to the stage level, and there was Rembrandt, wild-eyed. He came down the elevator on the other side, Candy. Then he cut across the stage and down those steps. Come on, Rembrandt, follow me. I may need help. We ran down the steps and into the bowels of the stage. It looked like a nightmare, a myriad of cross beams of steel for the rising stages. We cleared those and went around by the chorus dressing room. There was only one out. I remembered it. A door over in the corner, very seldom used, but it was open. It led into a long tunnel with giant steam pipes running overhead and to the right. This went underground over to the veterans' building. Down by your feet, there's a stream of water flowing in a trough. It's the old Hayes Valley Creek. Our killer decidedly knew his opera house. As we entered the tunnel, I could see him up ahead running like crazy, so we took off after him. We made the other side, and it breaks into a big engine room. As we came into the opening, I looked around. The engineer was lying on the floor out like a light blood spurting from his scalp. Then I glanced up. There was another door. This led into the veterans' building itself and an avenue of escape onto Van Ness. I ran up. Then as we got into the long corridor, I saw Martinello breaking for the door. Stop! Stop, Martinello! Stop! You think I am a fool? I do if you don't stop. Try and get me. Okay, pal. You ask for it. It was the first time I had ever shot a man. It didn't feel good. But he lived, and later the doctors of law gave him a little pill. The cyanide kind they dropped inside the gas chamber at San Quentin. Martinello paid his debt. Details? Sure, I'll fill him in now. Martinello loved to sing. Ray Mallard had told me that. For years, Carlo had been hanging around the opera house, hoping to step into a role. This season, a director had jokingly told him that if he ran out of baritones, he'd let Carlo take over. Carlo took him seriously. He lured Salavini down to his restaurant on a fake emergency call, costume and all, and did him in. But then he became frightened. That's when he called me. It was worth $2,000 to have me hush things up. But I don't operate like that. He had a hunch I was going to tip off Mallard. That's when he removed the body from the icebox and dumped him into the bay. Carlo had also been at the performance of Tales of Hoffman. That's when he learned that they'd wrestled up Rolf Herbert to sing in place of Salovini. By this time, Martinello was obsessed with the idea of singing in the opera house and wouldn't stop at anything. Right after Herbert left Warren Schold's dressing room, he managed to get Herbert into the elevator and up to the fourth gallery behind the stage. That scream was produced by a six-inch stiletto through Herbert's heart from the hands of Martinello. And that's when our chase began. I hope I never see that tunnel under the opera house again. That mallard and his sentiments... It was he who gave me that gun just a week before, for my birthday. He said I needed protection. Well, darn it, I do. But I can't get Mallard to believe me. Instead, he just gives me guns. Listen again at this same time next week. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 2A209. <laughs> Her 
heard tonight were Harry Bechtel as Ralph Herbert, Jerry Walter as Carlo Martinello, Henry Leff plays the role of Inspector Mallard, and Jack Thomas is Rembrandt. Dorothy Warren Schold, star of the Standard Hour and the San Francisco Opera Company, was heard as herself. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. With the exception of Miss Warren Schold, any resemblance to actual people in tonight's play is purely coincidental. Candy Matson comes to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Casey, I found this sheet of paper with typewriting all over it. What does it say? Well, it's funny. Just the same thing over and over. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Well? Is that a code of some kind? No, that's what beginners write for practice. Well, why don't they write something that makes sense? Like what? Ha! <laughs> like Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Our adventure for tonight, murder in black and white. morning, a wooded glen in a vast city park, and on the still frost-hardened ground there lies a dead man. Detectives move methodically about the body. Beside it kneels a police surgeon. Watching him is Captain Logan of the Homicide Bureau, Ann Williams' reporter, and the man with the press camera is Casey. Aren't you almost finished, Casey? Yeah, Annie. Thanks for letting me take these shots of the deceased, Logan. I'll do you a favor someday, too. You can do me a favor right now, Casey. You too, Miss Williams. Go back to your paper and let us cops get our work done. Hey, Doc, can you tell yet how long ago this guy died? About uh, 2 o'clock this morning, Captain. The bullet that killed him was fired at close range, still lodged in the skull. My guess is that it's a 32. The slug couldn't have been given to a more deserving guy. What do you mean, Casey? You know who this stiff is, don't you? Well, he has no identification on him. You should know him, though. He almost became middleweight champ a few years ago, yeah. fighting under the name of Tug Loftus. Say, you're right. I make him now. Yeah. A moment ago, Annie, this lug told us to go peddle our paper. Oh, mm-hmm. nuts. Hey, this Tug Loftus was a troublemaker, wasn't he? Always getting into jams. Yeah, he was an all-around heel. Tug Loftus' idea of a good time was to pick barroom fights with guys who didn't recognize him and then beat him to a pulp. Which means he had quite a few enemies. Yeah, that makes things just dandy. Well, that implies you haven't found any leads to the killer, Captain. Not a one, Miss Williams, except this book of matches. Book of matches? That was in his pocket. Hmm. It's got an ad on it for the... Briarwald Casino. And only two matches torn out of it, which may indicate that the Briarwald was the last place he was in before he came here and was bumped off. Where's the Briarwald? Well, that's a roadhouse out on Old Turnpike, run by Jake Salwood and his cousin Lou, Annie. Who do quite a little bookmaking in connection with their cafe business. Yeah, that's right. You know, we, we met the Salwins last year, and remember? We got a report that the safe in their joint had been robbed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they denied the report. To the cops, as well as to us. They said no one had touched their safe. Yeah, Lieutenant Schwartz of the robbery squad told me about that. He figured the two Salwins denied the robbery because the safe had contained a lot of horse betters, though they couldn't explain as cafe income. Yeah, the Briarwall Casino is just the kind of a joint Tug Loftus would patronize. Say, when are you going out there, Logan? Right away. There's nothing more I can do here. You're going to have company, pal. Annie, let's go. <laughs> Hey, 
Walter fix Mr. Snodgrass one of his specials. You know, with the little piece of pineapple in it? <laughs> oh, dear, that guy. Uh, tell me, Casey, what did you and Miss Williams find out at the Briarwald Casino? Nothing, Ethelbert, nothing. Except that Tug Loftus was in the joint only a few hours before he was killed. Well, nobody there remembers him leaving with anyone who might have taken him to Lake Sark Park and, and shot him. I wouldn't believe anything Big Jake Salwin said or his cousin Lou. And neither would Captain Logan. He questioned everyone who works in the place. They all agreed Loftus left there alone? Yeah, they just don't remember. Well, had he picked any fights there before he left? Nobody had on other nights. Hmm. Since that matchbook was the only clue, it don't sound like this murder will be easy to solve. Uh, how about that bullet that killed the guy? Doesn't match up with any gun that ballistics has on record. Well, we better get back to the office, Casey. Yeah, the city desk will be paging us if we don't. Uh Uh-oh, that may be them now. I'll see. Blue Note Cafe, Ethelbert, the bartender speaker. Yeah, Casey's right here. Uh, I knew it. It ain't your city desk, Casey. It's one of the photographers in your department. That fella, Shapiro? Shapiro. Oh, yeah, give it to you. Shapiro. Hello, Shap. Who? No, I don't know any Mrs. McCluskey. What? Oh, yeah, 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 I remember her now. A couple of years ago, she was a witness in a hit-and-run case. Yeah? All right, tell her to wait. I'll be right over. Thank you, Shep. So long. What is it, Casey? Oh, gal I met on a hit-and-run killing says she has something hot for me. Oh, you mean a tip? Yeah, it's probably about something unimportant, but come on, Annie, we'll see. I've got evidence of a murder, Mr. Casey. A murder, Mrs. McCluskey? In black and white. Oh, well, that sounds very interesting. Tell me what you got. First, Mr. Casey, what do I get? But you, you mean a... Since I described that hit-and-run automobile to the cops a couple of years ago and got nothing for it, I found out that newspapers pay for what they call scoops. You was nice to me, Mr. Casey, so I'm giving you and your paper first chance how much? Well, it all depends on what you have to offer. You interested in catching the murderer of that prize fighter, Tug Loftus? Tug Loftus? I got a picture of the killing, miss. What a picture? Casey. Is it worth $100 to your paper? Well, I'll say... Uh, <clears throat> well, City Desk sets the price for exclusive tips, Mrs. McCluskey, but uh, I'll guarantee you 100 bucks if you've got what you say you have. I've got it. Well, let's see. I get the 100 you get the hundred if. All right. This here envelope was in my mailbox this morning, so naturally I opened it. Later, when I put my glasses on, I seen the address is mine, but the name ain't mine. That's addressed to Mr. Max Treaty. Treaty, 121 Third Street. 121 Third Street is where I live, but no Max Treaty lives there. Now, well, go on. Well... Inside the envelope was just this here camera snapshot. Nothing else. Annie, look. Yeah, it's Loftus, as we saw him lying in that park. I knew that from the picture you had of him in yesterday's paper. Standing over Loftus is a guy with a gun in his hand. And he's just killed a fighter. That's the way it looks. It's a good profile shot of the killer, Ann. The face is clear even in this small print, and when I blow it up... It's worth a hundred, ain't it, Mr. Casey? It's Casey's? worth a hundred, Mrs. McCluskey. I said I had evidence in black and white. Now, who do you suppose took that picture, Casey? And why? That's something we'll think about later. But I'll bet it was taken with an infrared flash bulb. A black light? Yep. The guy with the gun didn't see any flash. He didn't know that somebody was taking this picture. We've got to find this skinny, long-nosed guy with a gun, you know it? Oh, the cops will do that when we show them this. Sure, yes, and probably crab our exclusive. Before the cops learn anything about this, Annie, we're going to try to find him. How? Well, the picture, the, the guy this picture was addressed to ought to give us a hint. Well, Casey, he may be the killer. This picture may have been addressed to him as the first step in a, a blackmail scheme. Now, Annie, you're cooking on all burners. Let me see that envelope again. Yeah. Addressed to Max Treaty, 121 Third Street. And the sender had the wrong address because Mrs. McCluskey lives there. And I live alone. Well, I'll look in the phone book. Yeah, do that, do that. Do. Uh, you, you said you got this in the morning mail, Mrs. McCluskey? That's right. I wanted time to do some thinking. How yeah, about whether to put the bee on us for that $100? Huh? You said yourself it's worth it. Oh, I'm not reneging on that. I've heard a 
$1,000 rewards being offered for murderers, but in order to get it, you had to capture them yourself. Yeah, that, that makes a difference. So I figured... Hey, Casey, Max Treaty is in the phone book. Well, let me see it. Yeah, he lives on 3rd Street, all right, see? But his address is given here as 727. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like 121 on this envelope because this guy writes sevens that look like ones. Yeah. That's something else for us to think about later. Eh? Well, let's call on Max Tree. Right now, Aunt. When do I get my hundred? There'll be a check in the mail for you tomorrow morning, Mrs. McCluskey, for two hundred. Two hundred? Yep, and thanks, and so long. Two hundred dollars. <gasps> Drat it. I bet I should have asked for more. <laughs> Max Treaty lives in a pretty good-looking apartment house, Casey. Yeah, it must be in the dough. Let's go in, Annie. Glass doors, no? <laughs> it's a funny neighborhood. Only a few blocks away where Mrs. McCluskey lives. There's nothing but tenements and little old one-family houses. Oh, there's the here. elevator. The operator may be able to give us a line on this guy. We're looking for Mr. Max Treaty. Uh, he's a top floor, apartment 12F. Yeah, take us up, will you, please? Okay. But he uh, may not be in. I haven't seen him this evening. Uh, we'll take a chance. Uh, we're not sure this Mr. Treaty is the one we're looking for. Can you tell us what business he's in? I don't think he's in any business, mister. Well, you mean he has an income and doesn't have to work? But I uh, really don't know. I, I'm not the kind who pries into the personal affairs of tenants. Oh, that's right. You don't look that type. How long has he lived here? Oh, about uh, eight or nine months. Took a sublease on a furnished apartment. Uh, does that tell you if he's the man you're looking for? Well, not quite, no. Is he a skinny guy, about uh, 35 with a long nose? That's Mr. Treaty. Yeah, we come to the right place, then. Well, here's the top floor. Apartment 12F is the last door to your right. Thank you, pal. Well, you're quite welcome. Casey, the man in that picture is skinny and has a long nose. Yeah, and the elevator guy says that description fits Treaty. All right, here's 12F. I'll buzz the bell. If he's the killer, he'll be dangerous. What do we do? You'll have no reason to think we're on to him, Annie. Yeah. Nobody answers the bell. The elevator man said he hadn't seen him this evening. I don't hear any sound from inside. I'll try the bell again. Ah, Casey. Huh? Look there, under the door. Holy... Yeah, it looks like blood. It is blood. Seep through from the other side. I'm getting into that apartment. Okay. Door's locked. This little strip of celluloid we burglars always carry. You can slip it? I think so. This is only a spring latch. There. All right, come in. Casey, there on the floor. I know, I see it. Let me close this door. We don't want any visitors here. No. It's the man in that picture, Treaty. Yeah. He's been beaten on the head. Uh, is He's it... been dead for a couple of hours, I think. Body's almost cold, and this pool of blood is dry around the edges. His clothes have been searched. And the apartment. I'll say. He and this joint have been practically ripped apart. Oh, isn't this just swell? We came here hoping to crack one murder, and now we've got another. Yes. There's no black and white evidence to show who pulled this one. But I tell you, you can't say that. It's a secret. Look, secret or not, I'm going to tell it even if I get fired. But look, uh... look... Now, look, look. Some secrets are too good to keep, and besides... Hey, we're, we're on the air now. Okay, here goes. Friends, I've just had a sneak preview of the brand new Ivory Fire King oven glass. It's terrific. For the very first time in history, they've produced oven glass that's beautiful, rich, warm ivory in color through and through. And it's even guaranteed against oven breakage for two long years. You've never seen such beautifully designed oven glass before. Classic lines, simple, dignified, as beautiful as any table china you could wish for. And rich, lovely, opaque ivory in color. Ah, uh, you've done it. The cat's out of the bag. <laughs> well, I'll uh, have to add that lovely new Ivory Fire King oven glass isn't on sale everywhere as yet. But it will be soon, and it's worth watching and waiting for. Mm. Well, uh... Haven't you something else to say? Oh, yes, yes. Friends, beautiful new ivory Fire King oven glass is a product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. We've 
got to call the cops, Casey. Take it easy, take it easy. We'll have a look around first. Well, you've already looked around. The murderer isn't hiding here waiting. No, he be... probably made his getaway right after he socked this guy for the last time. My friend Treaty took quite a beating before he was finally knocked off. How can you tell that? Look at the black and blue marks on him. The guy's got to be alive to bruise. Marks around his wrists and ankles. Must have been tied up quite a while. Yeah, I see. Apparently, the killer tried to make him tell where something was hidden. And he wouldn't or couldn't tell, so the killer searched for <laughs> And how he searched. All the stuffing's been pulled out of the chairs and the mattress has been ripped open. Treaty's clothes got it going over, too. Linings cut, the soles of his show, shoes all split. Hey, this must be the stuff that was taken out of him and examined. Look at that wallet, fountain pen... Cigarette case, revolver. No, don't touch anything, Casey. Don't Who's touch... touching anything? I'm only looking. Uh, it's a revolver. It looks like the gun in the picture. Yeah. Yeah, but this is a 38, Ann. Loftus was shot with a 32. Well, then, Treaty must have used another gun for the killer? Probably threw it in the lake after it. Say. What have you picked up? Look at that. A book of matches. From the Briarwald Casino. Well, like the one found on Tug Loftus. Yes was half hidden under the sofa. Well, that connects the two murders. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Well, Casey, we've got to get the cops here. Not just cops. We're getting Logan. I want him to get first break on what we know about that picture. And the phone's in that bedroom. You go get him while, while, while I go down to the car and get my camera. I want to take some pictures of my own. Well, did you see that camera in the bookcase? Maybe you can save yourself a trip. No, there's no film in it. I looked. It was open to search like everything else. Late Mr. Treaty went in for photography, apparently. Had his kitchenette fixed up like a dark room. Yeah. A lot of equipment there. Search erect all of it. All right. Call Logan while I go for my camera. Oh, wait a minute, Casey. What? Didn't he tell us he wouldn't be at headquarters till midnight? Yeah, well, call him at his home. Oh, uh, he has a new phone number. What is it? I'll write it down for you. Uh, that's where's my pencil. <laughs> Take mine. Thanks. Oh, well, I'll be. Oh, you've broken the point. I know it. Well, I use this fountain pen a treaty. He shouldn't touch anything. This pen isn't going to tell the cops who killed him, eh? Nice point. Right's easy. All right, here's Logan's number. Call him as soon as you finish with city desk. Yeah, I will. Uh, Casey, don't stick that pen in your pocket. Oh, I'll need it to make out my film sheets. Don't worry, I'm not stealing from dead guys. The pen will be put back later. <laughs> if you think of it, I'll go phone. Uh, Ann, Ann. Yeah? Give Logan the lowdown about that picture and about everything else. Except don't tell him about the matchbook we just found. Why not? Well, cops have no appreciation of the newspaper racket. We'll lose our exclusive. We'll go out to the Briarwald and follow it up by ourselves. My cousin Jake isn't here, Casey. Huh? Expect him later, Lou? He's sure to be in sometime tonight. All right, we'll stick around. Maybe you can give us some information. Information? About the Tug Loftus thing. Jake and I have already told the cops and you newspaper people all we know about that. <laughs> hey, you know, the last time I was in this office, Lou, you and Big Jake were telling the cops that that safe there hadn't been robbed. It hadn't been. We still don't know where they got that crazy report. Anyway, the tipster told the cops that he heard Big Jake squawking about the loss of 50 grand. The tipster lied. That safe's never had more than a couple of thousand in it. And that's a big take from a cafe business like ours. Yeah, from your cafe business. Lou, what would you know about a guy named Treaty? Treaty? Mm-hmm. Max Treaty. Why do you ask? We understand he's been a customer of yours. He was once a bartender here. A bartender? When did he tend bar here? Till about a year ago. Jake fired him. Jake, huh? After I'd caught Treaty holding out on the cash register. Huh? Jake only fired him for that? You know, Jake, the guy left here minus a few teeth. Uh, why are you curious about Treaty? He was murdered this afternoon. Murdered? Uh-huh. Was Treaty here the night Loftus was killed, Lou? Hmm. I think he was. Had he ever had any run-ins with Tug Loftus? Yes, about a month ago, Loftus slapped him around in the bar and Treaty said he'd get even that was just talk, of course. He knew he didn't stand a chance against that tough pug. We have reason to believe he made his chance. That he killed Loftus. You have? Yeah. We got a photograph showing him doing it. Casey. It's all right. Can't be any secret about it, Annie. It'll be on page one of this morning's edition. 
That'll hit the streets in a couple of hours. Where did you get such a photograph, Casey? Oh, we just got it. You and Jake both use this desk, Lou? Yes. Somebody scribbled some figures on a scratch pad here. Is that your work? Why do you ask? Oh, just curiosity. Can't make out whether some of the figures are meant to be ones or sevens. Jake makes his ones that way. Uh, Jake, huh? How about his sevens? There are no sevens among those figures. Show me how Jake writes his sevens, Lou. Why? Your nervousness about these figures makes me want to know. Here, take this pen and write. What? That pen? Yes, you recognize it. It's treaties. And this is a gun case. I see, it's a gun, Lou. All right. A thirty-two snub-nosed revolver. I'm not so sure how much you two know, but I think it's too much. You've reminded me of a bet I missed. What did you find in that pen, Casey? I didn't look for anything in the pen. Well, maybe I missed a bet. Look now. Pull the cap off and see if there's anything inside. Okay. Hey, there is some. What? I'd say it's a rolled-up film, a negative. Take it out. Okay. Yeah. It's a rolled-up negative, all right. Never mind looking at it. Give it to me. Well, I want to look Give at it. Give it to me. Right. You're the boss. Here. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks to you for reaching for it. I'll take that gat of yours, Luke. No. Let it go or I'll break your arm. I go. Thanks for the gun. Oh, Casey. All right, now I'll give the orders around here. Put your hands up, Lou. Keep them up and sit down. All right, all right. What's that negative, Casey? It's a nice, clear shot of Lou Solwyn here, taking dough out of an open safe, the safe in this office. That safe. Right, Lou? You're doing the talking. You took the dough, Lou, on the date it was reported stolen. And somebody caught you doing it with a camera. From that window where a slat in the Venetian blind is missing. And that someone was Max Treaty. And Treaty moved into that expensive apartment soon after the robbery and didn't work anymore. Because Lou here was paying him to keep this evidence undercover. Big Jake is the boss of your bookmaking racket, Lou. He owns it, and you're just a hired man. The dough you stole was Jake's, and if he'd found out that you... Okay, took Casey, it... you figured it. Get me out of here now. Take me to the cops where I'll be safe. Jake finds out he'll kill me. Yes, like you killed Treaty after your counter-blackmail scheme had backfired. Counter-blackmail scheme? Don't you get it, Annie? No. I get it. But Jake! Casey. Drop that gun case or I'll blow you to pieces before you can turn around. Drop it! Guy's at a slight disadvantage when his back is turned, Jake. Okay. Thanks. You, uh, you were outside the door? Yeah, listen. Jake, I swear. I said I'd been listening, Lou. I didn't say anything. Casey did the talking. And he dope things out swell. You took that 50 grand, you dirty louse. 50 grand of my dough. No, Jake, no. I'm going to pay you off, Lou. Don't, don't shoot me. <laughs> he shot him. Sorry, I had to do it, miss. You've done a crazy thing, Jake. You go to the chair for this. I don't think so, Casey. When the cops get here, they're going to find you and this lady dead, too. You're going to... Sorry, gonna... sister, but that's the way it's got to be. You and Casey will be shot with Lou's gun. My gun will be found beside Casey. The cops have figured that Lou tried to make a getaway, that you shot it out. I'll call the cops myself, start him on that theory. It won't work, Jake. I'm betting it will. Betting's my business. Oh, just pick up Lou's... I gun. got it first, Jake! Lou! <laughs> Lou wasn't dead. He, he shot him. Lou! Lou! He's passed out again. All right, I'll get their guns before either one pulls a second recovery. <sighs> Now, Ann, pick up that phone and call the cops while I watch these guys. Right, right, Casey. So much I don't understand. Where does Treaty fit in now? Treaty didn't kill Loftus. Well, that, that picture proves he did. The evidence is there in black and white. Black and white aren't true colors, Kit. Not true? No. And pictures themselves can lie. I don't get... Hello? Uh, headquarters, uh, connect me with homicide, please. Uh, Casey, tell me, what do you mean? Well, I'll explain the whole works, Annie, after I take some pictures of Jake and Lou that'll be really on the level. <laughs> We'll join the crowd of the Blue Note in just a moment. Here's some really good news for the millions of people in the United States who prefer their beer and ale in clean, sanitary glass, as Americans have preferred it for more than a hundred years. You can now buy your favorite brand of beer and ale in a new kind of glass bottle, a lightweight, compact glass bottle that requires no deposit and that never has to be returned. Think of it. No more piling empties in the corner. No more carting them back to the store. No more complicated beer bottle bookkeeping. When you finished your beer or ale, you simply discard the bottle as you would any other food container. And here's another thing. The new Anchor Glass one-way, no-deposit bottles 
are light in weight, easier to carry home, and they take up less room in your refrigerator, too. So next time you buy beer or ale, demand it in sparkling clean Anchor Glass, one-way, no-deposit bottles. Product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. There's a lot of things I don't understand, Casey. Well, all right, pal. We'll take it from the beginning. Now. Yeah. Lou Salwin did considerable talking before he died, Ethelbert. He's dead, huh? Yeah, both him and Jake. Tell me. Well, while Treaty was bartender at the Briarwall, he found out that Lou Salwin was stealing from Jake, his boss. Get and then Lou caught Treaty cheating the cash register and told Jake. Who'd knocked out some of Treaty's bridge work, which made Treaty very sore at Lou for snitching. So he laid for him with a camera and got that picture of Lou robbing the safe for a really big haul. Yeah, after that, Treaty sat pretty at Lou's expense. Lou got pretty desperate under the pressure, and finally he hit on a bright idea. He'd get Treaty in a worse spot than he was by killing Loftus. Lou killed Loftus? Right, he did. In Lakeside Park, where Treaty was to meet Lou and collect more blackmail. Lou shot the pug and then hid himself with a camera and waited. When Treaty suddenly saw Loftus, where he expected to meet Lou, his first instinct would be to draw that gun. And Lou got a very interesting picture of him standing over the body with the gun. And Treaty didn't know about the picture, of course. It was taken by a black light, an infrared bulb. When he realized Loftus was dead, <laughs> he lost no time in getting away fast. Sure, Lou developed his picture and sent a print to Treaty, but his, uh, his sloppy way of writing sevens... Got the print into Mrs. McCluskey's hands. Why'd he send the picture to Treaty? Well, to shake him up, to make him sweat. Oh. Then Lou went to his apartment, expecting to find him in a big dither, <clears throat> ready to trade the original negative of that safe robbery for the negative that made Treaty seem a murderer. But Treaty hadn't received the print, and Lou realized it might fall into the hands of the cops. Well, if they arrested Treaty for a murder he hadn't committed... <laughs> He'd tell everything he knew about Lou. Uh, Lou's big scheme had backfired. He had to had to get the negative of the robbery picture Treaty held over him. Treaty wouldn't tell him where he'd hidden it, even under the beating that Lou gave him. Well, you know the rest. And he was a bartender, like me. <laughs> Miss Williams, I, I'm going to report that guy to our local and have him thrown right out of our union. He's dead, Ethelbert. Yes, sir. I... Hmm? Dead, pal. Oh. It's like my sister Edna says, Casey. Quote, if you get your picture took, you're liable to get framed. Yeah, unquote. Crime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is written by Alonzo Dean Cole. It is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures. All products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Photographer is directed by John Dietz and is based on the fictional character of Flash Gun Casey, created by George Harmon Cox. Original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. Herman Chittison is the Blue Note pianist. This is Tony Marvin saying goodnight for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada. This is 
CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Hi, Commissioner. Steve, have a seat. Thanks. I suppose you know you're ruining my reputation around this town. Every time I get out on a date, you haul me back here to the office and send me halfway around the world. (laughs) Cheer up, Steve. They always keep a light burning in the window for you, don't they? Yeah, but if you're gone too long, that fire can die out, you know. (laughs) Steve, ever have on a diving suit? Diving suit? Well, yeah, once. You're leaving for the Caribbean on the next plane. Your destination is Trinidad. I'm going to fly to Trinidad in a diving suit? You're going hunting for pirate treasure, Steve. There's no Mm -hmm. time now to go into the background... Go to Trinidad and show up in dungarees at the Trade Winds Bar. Mm-hmm. You'll be contacted there, and the contact will fill you in on the deal. Just a minute. Part of the deal doesn't by any chance involve getting into a diving suit, does it? It might. Steve, this is a vital job. We're depending on you right down the line. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. In a moment, tonight's story of Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. But first, a message from the Ford dealers of America. The 1950 Ford has everyone talking. Here is what Mr. R.L. Bell of Georgia, one of more than 410,000 enthusiastic owners, said about his 50 Ford. I've had my new Ford Club Coupe for six weeks and have driven it 6,700 miles. This operation was over all types of roads and under varying weather conditions, from Key West to the Great Smokies. It holds the road better than any car I've ever driven. And in 19 years of traveling, I've owned eight makes of cars. For my money, it has more comfort than any low-priced car on the market. My car is equipped with overdrive, and up to now, my gasoline mileage average has been 21 and 3 tenths miles per gallon. Yes, Ford owners everywhere are finding out about the economy of the great new Ford. They're saving real money now because of Ford's low price. And they'll be saving real money for years to come because of Ford's low operating and maintenance cost. But see for yourself. Tomorrow, stop by your neighborhood Ford dealers. Get the facts on Ford economy. Then take the wheel and test drive the big new Ford. Well... This assignment tops them all. Usually, I have at least an inkling of what I'm supposed to do, but here I am heading for Trinidad, and all I know is I'm supposed to meet a guy in the Trade Winds Bar. It's a hot Tuesday afternoon when I get to Trinidad. I change into dungarees at the hotel and head for the Trade Winds Bar. It's a real keen joint. A bunch of rickety tables, a calypso singer, a battered-looking bar with a drunk sprawled on it, and behind the bar, a fat gent in a dirty apron. All right, name it, brother. Beer. Coming up. Hey, sailor, aren't you? Uh, yeah, but out of a job right now. Just drifting. Uh, yeah. Bartender! Hey, Bartender! Oh, I'm coming, I'm coming. Hey, mister. Huh? Buy me a drink, will you? You look like you've had too much already. You better go back to... Hey, wait a minute. Joe Wilkins? Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Commissioner told me I'd be contacted here, but he didn't mention you. I've been working on this case for six months now. Oh. I've managed to establish an enviable reputation as the leading drunk in Trinidad. Oh, my poor liver. What's the deal? Underwater demolition. You know what a job it did for us during the war, Steve. Yeah, the Navy frogmen. Yeah. Well, about six months ago, a group of civilians with government cooperation developed a revolutionary new explosive technique. Mm-hmm. They came down here, rented a boat, and made their tests. We're sure of that much because they radioed in that they were on their way back, and that's the last we ever heard from them. What happened? We don't know. The boat apparently sank. Mm. Any survivors? One. A deckhand named Griggs. He disappeared before I could get down here. It's either one of two things, Steve. Griggs got away with the data they compiled, or else it's at the bottom of the Caribbean. You know... 
If that falls into the wrong hands, none of our ports and harbors would be safe. You got any line on Griggs? Not until three days ago. And Griggs popped up here in Trinidad looking real prosperous. Throwing dough around. Well, maybe he sold the plan. I don't think so, Steve. He started out fitting a treasure hunting expedition. His outfit is shoving off tomorrow on a little boat called the Sea Witch. I've been trying to get a job on it. Hey, you could be walking into a lot of trouble. Steve. Hmm. See that babe over there in the corner? Corner table alone. Yeah. What about her? That's Griggs' girlfriend. I can't get any information from her. I, uh, I think she likes the more of your size. <laughs> okay. I'll give it a try. See you later. Hi. What do you want? To buy you a drink. Hmm. Why not? Matter of fact, I'll buy you two drinks. And then what? <laughs> then we quit drinking. I'll be broke. Oh? <laughs> Having it tough, huh? Yeah. It's pretty hard for a diver to get a job these days. A diver? Oh, why don't you get lost? What's the matter? Don't you like divers? Oh, sure, but they're never around. I know. I go with a guy who is a diver. Griggs. Oh. Hey, maybe this friend of yours, Griggs, could get me a job. I don't think so. It's some kind of a treasure hunting business. Teresa, button your left. Hello, Griggs. Who's this joker? A guy who is kind enough to buy me a drink. Shove off, bud. Now, don't you think that's up to Teresa? You heard me get lost. Oh, sit down, Griggs, and quit showing your muscles. And, mister, maybe you'd better sort them. Of okay, run. okay, sure. Well, see you around. Maybe we can have that drink some other time. Yeah? There won't be any other time. You keep your eyes to yourself after this and don't get any idea. How did you make out, Steve? Yeah. Not so hot. The boyfriend showed up too soon. Yeah. Well, I sure wish we could get some. What's the matter? A little gent who just came in, the one in the white suit. Yeah, what about him? His name's Jeremiah. You'll hear all about him in a second. Hmm. Byron's tuning up right now. Lord Byron? Yeah, that's the Calypso singer over there. Listen. Jeremiah is a fine man here. The best man in all Trinidad colony. He's a good friend of sailors whose luck's very bad. The best man in colony Trinidad. Arrest what's a ring or a curio. For this Jeremiah will lend much dough. He will find you a job for a modest fee. The savior of suffering humanity. Saves the sailors from a cold, cruel fate and charges a very low internet rate. Oh, Jeremiah is a fine man here, the best man in Trinidad colony. And now you know who Jeremiah is. Yeah. Hey, he just slipped that Calypso singer some dough. Sure, that's the deal. Hmm. Well, what do you know? Singing commercials in Trinidad yet. Wait a minute. That song said something about getting jobs for sailors. Sure, that's right. That's the angle I'm working on with him. You mean you're trying to get him to put you aboard the boat Griggs is sailing on? Yeah. Oh, watch it, Steve. Jeremiah's heading this way. Right. Oh, Joe. Huh? Joe. Oh, well, hello, Jeremiah. How can I help you start a new life if you spend all the money I'd lend you on cheap whiskey? Well, I try, Jeremiah. You know how it is. You must be firm, Joe. You must turn over a new leaf. No. The ways of sin lead but to the grave of a drunk tank. And then how could I ever get back all the money I've invested in you? Work. That is the answer for you, Joe. Work. Yeah. Nobody will give me a job. Ah, that's not true any longer, Joe. I have gotten you a job. Huh? On the Sea Witch. You sail tomorrow morning. Hey, are you kidding me? Of course not. Joe, I see in you a noble man who has been corrupted by evil companions and unfortunate experiences. I believe in you, Joe. I believe that you will straighten out and take your rightful place in the world. So, I have gotten you a job to help you. That's, that's pretty nice of you, Jeremiah. It was not easy, mind you. It is a small boat with a small crew, some sort of treasure hunting expedition, I believe. Uh, now, just sign this little slip of paper, if you will, please. What is it? Well, the customary agreement, which gives me a small percentage of your wages in return for the trouble I've gone to on your account. Hey, you called... 20% small? Why, Joe, after all I've done for you, how can you quibble about such a trifling amount? Um, oh, okay, Jeremiah, I'll send it. Uh, just give the skipper this card, Joe. That will identify you. Okay. 
Well, I must be going now. I have to meet this other deckhand, Nick, and give him a card also. Thanks again, Jeremiah. When a human being is in need, Jeremiah will not be far away. Steve? Yeah, I heard it all. Come on. What? Huh? We're going to follow Jeremiah. I'm cooking up an idea. If it works, you're going to have yourself a shipmate. <laughs> We follow Jeremiah to his office near the waterfront. We wait down the street. Pretty soon, the sailor goes into the office. He's walking like he had quite a few drinks under his belt. In a few minutes, he comes out again. He's putting one of Jeremiah's cards in his pocket. Come on, Joe. Here he comes. Start walking. Hey. Sorry. Why don't you look out where you're going? Same to you, bud. Oh, no, oh, look, look, now, you... break it up. It was just an accident. Hey, didn't you just come out of Jeremiah's office? Yeah, what's it to you? Oh, I was just wondering if he was there. I got to find out some more stuff from him about this boat I'm shoving off on tomorrow morning. Oh, the Sea Witch? Yeah, why? Uh, looks like we're going to be shipmates. <laughs> Are you selling on it too, huh? Ah, my name's John. Oh, Nick's mine. Oh, this is Steve, buddy of mine. Hi. Hi, Steve. Hey, this calls for a drink, huh? Yeah, I could use one. How about you, Nick? <laughs> sure, I can always use one. And this is our last day ashore, too. Come on, let's go. Two hours and five bars later, Joe and I managed to find out that Nick hasn't ever seen the skipper of the Sea Witch. Finally, Nick figures he's had too much. I, I got it. I got I got to get out. Get out of here. Sure, Nick. Sure. Here, give me a hand, Joe. Okay. Oh, easy, Nick. And then. I need some some fresh air. Yeah, yeah, that's where we're going, outside. Mm. Mm. There you are. Mm. Feel better now? Oh, oh, yeah. Fresh air. It's wonderful. Why? Uh... Catch him, Joe. I got him. Well, now what? Huh? Steve will have to take him to the police station, I guess. Yeah, it's right next door, too. Quite a coincidence, huh? Come on. I'll carry him. Okay. Brother. He's no lightweight. Here we are. Uh, Steve, set him down on that chair over there. Yeah. Hello. What's all this? We've got a package for you. He's it. Drunk? Slightly. My name's Mitchell, Constable. Steve Mitchell. Here are my credentials. I say, what can I do for you, child? You got a nice private cell where you could deposit this guy, Nick? Well, I suppose so. Ordinarily, we'd throw him into the drunk tank. Well, this isn't an ordinary occasion. I'll fill you in on it after you lock him up. I get Jeremiah's card off Nick. Then I make a deal with the constable. He puts Nick in a private cell and me in the drunk tank. And from now on, he's to call me Nick. Joe sends a message to the skipper that Nick is locked up. Then I roost there the rest of the night, watching a few assorted cases of DTs. Morning finally comes, and with it comes a visitor. All right, now. Look alive, chums. Which one of you is Nick? I am. On your feet, then. Here's someone to pick you up. Who are you? The skipper. We'll see your card. Here it is. Come on. Good moving, Nick. Okay, okay, let's go. Nick, if I wasn't short-handed, I'd let you rot in the drunk tank. Ah, simmer down, will you? We shove off in an hour. Be aboard. Sure, sure. I'll get my gear together and be down there in plenty of time. I'll see you later, Skipper. I start down the street in one direction. The Skipper goes in another. I wait until I'm out of his sight. Then I double back and head for Joe's rooming house. I turn a corner just in time to see the skipper going inside. But the skipper isn't even supposed to know Joe, let alone where he lives. That means just one thing. There's been a leak. I shift into high, but just as I get to the door... I head for the rickety stairs, but a door opens above and Joe staggers out into the hall. Joe! Here, let me... No. It's too late, Steve. The skipper? Yeah. He doesn't know about you, Steve. I told him I was working alone. Get aboard the sea witch, Steve. 
You're on your own. In a moment, you'll hear the second act of Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy, after this brief word from the Ford dealers of America. All over the country, folks are praising the beautiful new Ford, and no wonder. For this car is a masterpiece of sleek fashion styling. But there's more than style in the new Ford, much more. There's safety, too. Safety that's built into Ford features, into its dependable Magic Action king-size brakes, for example, into its sturdy all-steel lifeguard body, and into its advanced steering mechanism. And the new Ford brings you economy, too. It's low in first cost and high in resale value. It's thrifty on gas and oil and inexpensive to maintain. So before you buy any car at any price, stop by your neighborhood Ford dealers. Look over the new Ford for beauty. Check its many safety features. Get the facts about Ford economy. Then discover the flashing performance and big car comfort of this truly great car. Test drive the 100-horsepower V8 or its companion in quality, the 95-horsepower 6. See, hear, and feel why the big new Ford is the one fine car in the low price field. And now, here is the second act of Dangerous Assignment. Yeah, I'm really on my own now. Joe's dead. I know the skipper killed him, but I can't tip my hand yet. I have to play it close to the chest. So I go down to the waterfront and get aboard the sea witch. Get forward and help Griggs with the lines. We're ready to shove off and we're short-handed. Some rum dum named Joe didn't show up. Oh. Hey, just a minute. What's the matter, Griggs? You're the guy who was making a play for my girl at the Trade Winds Bar yesterday. So what? So what are you doing aboard? Same as you, Buster. I'm sailing on this tub. What? Look, Skipper, get this guy off. You look. I'm the skipper. I run this boat. Yeah. Well, don't forget, I'm the only guy who knows where to take this boat. Griggs, you're getting paid for this job, same as I. The boss says this guy goes. Now, shut up! Sorry, Griggs. Okay. Okay. But just remember, I don't like you. That's tough. Yeah. It could be. Now, break it off, both of you. Get busy with those lines. Hey, you, Lord Barn. Yes, Skipper? Hey, that Calypso singer going along, too? Yeah, he's a pretty good dickhead. Now, get that engine started. We're shoving off. I watch the shoreline at Trinidad fade away, and I wonder if I'll ever see it again. Joe and I had figured we'd be two against three when the showdown came, but now it looks like it's one against three. I can't figure out where Lord Byron, the Calypso singer, stands in the deal, so the third day out I'm on deck when I hear him oh, singing. Oh, the sea which you sail on the Carib Sea, the hunt buried treasure for you and me. If we don't find the treasure, then the hunt is done. Lord Byron don't care, cause he still have fun. <laughs> you sound like you don't care whether we find this treasure or not. Oh, many people seek treasure, Nick. Few of them ever find it. But it's fun looking. Mm. Hey, did you ever sail with Griggs or the skipper before? No. You know, I have a theory that you can trust a happy man. Well, you and me, Nick, we are happy people, but the Skipper and Griggs, they're not. It's too bad. Yeah. Look, uh, if you ever hear the Skipper and Griggs talking about me, I'd like you to come and tell me right away. Oh, sure, Nick. i come and tell you right away if I hear anything. Okay, Nick. This is it. Hi. Right. You're going to work. What do you mean, Skipper? Get into a diving suit. What? You heard me. I want you to go down and see if we're over that sunken ship. What's the matter with Griggs? I thought he was the diver. He's got a bellyache. Oh. Kind of hit him all of a sudden, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Look, I was told you were a diver, too. Well, sure. Sure I am. Then get into the suit. Lord Byron will tend your lines and man the pump. Get moving. <laughs> I don't like it. It smells like trouble all of a sudden, but there's nothing I can do. I get into the diving suit. They fasten the helmet over my head, and Lord Byron helps me over the side. On the bottom, it's cold and murky and quiet. I poke around for about 15 minutes, but I can't see the sunken ship anywhere. Lord Byron, you better hold me up. 
Lord Byron. He's busy, Nick. I'm handling your lines now. Oh. Well, uh, Skipper, I can't spot that hulk anywhere. Hmm. Can't be far. Well, it isn't here. How about hauling me up? You're getting enough air, Nick? Yeah, but keep it coming, huh? Sure, Nick. Sure. I'll haul you up now, but I want you to keep your suit on. We'll move on a couple of hundred yards, and you and Griggs will go down again. Griggs? I thought he was sick. He feels okay all of a sudden. Let's see. Look, uh, come on, haul me up. We're getting lonesome down here. Sure, Nick. Sure. I'm sweating plenty inside that suit on the way to the surface. For a couple of grim seconds when the skipper was asking me about my air supply, I figured he was onto me and playing cat and mouse. Yeah, it was good to get that fishbowl off of my head. Yeah, I thought I was in trouble then, but if I could have seen what was happening at the Trinidad jail, I'd have known how much trouble I really was in. Good morning, Constable. Oh, good morning. Down here to save a few souls this morning? I am making my usual visit to offer my services to any unfortunate sailors who may have fallen in with evil companions, yes. Well, the crop we've got in the tank this morning don't seem to have much of value on them. My good man, you do not seem to realize that pawning articles is but a minor thing with me. My larger aim is to serve humanity. Of course, of course. Clumsy of me to forget, Jeremiah. Well, you know where the drunk tank is. Help yourself. Thank you. Jeremiah. Uh, who called me? Jeremiah. Over here. Why, Nick. Nick, you're supposed to be out on the sea witch. Uh, two guys got me drunk and hauled me in here. Who were they? One of them's name was Joe. The other I don't remember. Joe was taken care of before the sea witch sailed. Do you still have my card? No. No, it was gone when I came to. I see. This friend of Joe's must have taken your place, Nick. I will get a message to the sea witch at once. <laughs> Set, Nick? Yeah, I guess so, Griggs. Where's the skipper? Up in the radio shack. There's a radio message coming in. Uh, Lord Byron here can let us down and handle the pump. Sure, Griggs. Okay. You go down first and wait for me. Don't do anything until I get down there. Okay. Screw his faceplate on, Lord Byron. Sure, Griggs. Okay. Lower him. This time we've got the right location. I land right on the sunken ship. It's lying on its side. Griggs comes down after me and drops into a hole in the side of the ship. In a minute he crawls out with a waterproof container. The underwater demolition data we're both after. Then he stiffens and seems to be listening to something. Diver's phones are on separate lines, so I can't hear what Griggs was listening to. But suddenly Lord Byron is singing into my phone. Oh, there were once too many in the diving suits, and one of them's in trouble, you can bet your boots. The bad man is holding a knife very tight. The good man had better begin to fight. Great time to be singing. Then, suddenly it registers. It's more than a song, it's a warning. I turn around just in time to see Griggs bringing his knife through the water toward my diving suit. From then on, it's like a slow-motion man- movie. I manage to get my hand around his wrist in time... And I start inching him back toward the hole in the side of the ship. We sway back and forth for a few seconds. Then I finally get my shoulder against him and shove. He topples over into the hole. There's slack in his cable. I take a turn around the beam. Then I fish my own knife out of my belt and cut his phone line. Lord Byron. Lord Byron, haul me up. He's a little unconscious right now, Nick. Whatever your name is. Huh? I just got a radio message about you from Jeremiah. Jeremiah? Oh, so he's the big boss. Yeah. It looks like that message came just in time. With you on the bottom and me on the surface. I got news for you, brother. You're not coming up. In a moment, the conclusion of Dangerous Assignment. Now, a brief message from the Ford Dealers of America. 
Owners everywhere are raving about their 1950 Fords. Here is what Mr. Clyde McNeely of Illinois, one of more than 410,000 new Ford owners, has to say about his 50 Ford. Being a metal plater, I naturally am interested in machinery and metals. I've realized for many years that Ford had a real power plant under the hood. Now that I own a 1950 Ford, I'm sold on it, particularly because of the engine and also because I like its style. It surprises me that the 100-horsepower V8 engine is so quiet. In fact, the mechanical features of the 1950 Ford are outstanding. Its power and quietness, the way it rides, the ease of handling, and its economy. Yes, ask any Ford owner how he feels about his big new Ford, and he'll tell you it's tops for performance and for comfort. But prove it for yourself. Drop into your neighborhood Ford dealers and test drive this great car. You'll be amazed when you discover how little it costs to buy, to run, and to maintain. Do it tomorrow. Test drive the big new 1950 Ford. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Yeah, I heard it. But if I'm not coming up, neither is Griggs. What did you do to him? He's out of commission right now. Ah, no wonder he can't talk to me. Well, you won't be talking much longer either, Nick. I'm turning off your air. Now, look. So long, sucker. Wait a minute. If, if you turn off my air, I've still got time to open this container and scatter these papers you're after. You'll never get them. Yeah, you're just bluffing, Nick. According to Griggs, those papers are sealed in there too tight for you to do anything about in a diving suit. I'm going to haul Griggs up and leave you there. Yeah? Well, just tell me one thing, Skipper. Yeah, what is it? You weren't on deck when Lord Byron lowered us. How do you know which liner is which? How do you know which one of us you're going to haul up? <laughs> Not good enough, Nick. I know which phone I'm talking to you on, and I can see which line it's connected to. Maybe I had Lord Byron switch the phone lines when he let us down. Not a chance. Like I said before, so long, sucker. I played my last card, and he trumped it. I stand there with a sick feeling in my middle as I watch Griggs' line tighten with a jerk, and suddenly I know there's only one thing more I can do. Well, so you did switch phone lines on me, huh? Thanks for the tip, Nick. I knew if I jerked your line hard enough, I could get a grunt out of you. Now I'm sure which line to haul up. If it worked, Griggs' line slackens, and the skipper starts hauling me up. Halfway to the surface, he turns off the air. That's good. There'll be less air in my suit and I can move my arms better. I let my body go limp and slump my head down below the face plate and the helmet like I'm unconscious. I surface. The skipper holds me up on deck and unscrews the face plate. Okay, Griggs. You'll be all right. You guessed wrong. Nick! Yeah, come on, skipper. Let's bump heads. Oh. Nick, you okay? I tried to warn you. Yeah, that warning came just in time. Thanks, Lord Byron. When I get out of this suit, I'll untie you, and we'll haul up Griggs and head for Trinidad and Jeremiah. Untie you? Jeremiah? You know, Nick, this almost sounds like a Calypso song. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, then, I might as well finish it. How, how's that thing go? Oh, Jeremiah was a fine man, he, until he sent his dad boys out to sea. They got all fouled up down near the equator. Now Steve and Lord Byron bring back the demolition dater. Okay. Uh, Nick, in the future, I had better sing the Calypso. Yeah, maybe you had better. You have just heard another episode in the exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Dunleavy as Steve Mitchell. Dangerous Assignment, written by Bob Reif, with music by Bruce Ashley, is directed by Bill Karn. Be with us next week at this time when Brian Dunleavy, starring as Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. Tomorrow, be sure to hear Bob Hope and Pepper McGee on NBC. Right.
Friday, the 13th, and the 13th dark fantasy story by Scott Bishop. Welcome to Cape Howell. You're just the medicine the doctor ordered. <laughs> and you're the doctor. How are you, Bill? Never better. Say, am I glad to shake hands with you again. You're the same old Jim. Five years haven't changed you a single bit. Well, I'm sorry. I can't say the same thing about you. You look tired. Almost sick. I say you aren't ill, are you? Ill? Oh, no. No, I've just been working hard. Not much sleep lately. Come on, I've got a wagon waiting right over here. Wagon? Sure, nothing fancy about us. We'll take the wagon to the boat landing, and then we'll row over to my island. Uh, it, uh, say, now, wait a minute, Bill. Are you trying to rib me? What, what do you mean, your island? Oh, didn't I tell you? I, I haven't lived in Cape Howell for three years. I, well, I, I find it more pleasant and comfortable out on the island. But what island? Folks around here have another name for it. But don't mind them if you hear it. I call it a chape. Hmm. Uh, uh, say that again, Bill. A chape. Uh, well, what's that, Scandinavian or Esperanto? French. Come on, here's the wagon over here. Young John's waiting on the boat landing. Why oh, say, how is young John? Jim, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm worried about him. He's having trouble with his studies. Doesn't seem to like books and hates company. Well, I, I'd say he's more lonesome than anything else. It's more than lonesomeness, Bill. Ever since Bill Jr. died, he, he hasn't been the same. Angela and I were sorry to hear about Bill Jr. It's pretty sudden, wasn't it? Yes, pretty sudden. That's the way it is in this country, though. So much fever, so few conveniences. Oh, by the way, you say Angela and the child will be along in a few days? Oh, yes. You got my wire? Got it yesterday. I didn't know your sister lived at Lawston. Oh, yes, she has for years. Angela wants to visit about a week, and then she'll come on down here to Cape Howe by steamer. Oh, incidentally, old man, do you think this country's all right for the baby? Had her shots, has she? Oh, yes. Yes, I did everything you suggested in your letter. You know, that letter you wrote almost scared Angela out of coming. Oh. She said if it's that dangerous here, she doesn't think we should risk the child's life by bringing her here. Well, there's no danger at all if the child's been inoculated against the three diseases I mentioned. Oh, I took care of that all right. You're sure there's... No other danger. I've taken care of any other danger there might be. Hmm? What do you mean? Just that. There's nothing in the world for your Angela to worry about. Please believe me, Jane. Well, all right, old man. All right. Huh. Angela and I are on the first vacation we've had since we've been married. And believe you me, we're here to make the best of it. <laughs> Good. That's fine. Come on. The, the wagon's waiting, see? Right over there. Fine country, eh, what, Jim? Oh, marvelous. We've enjoyed the whole trip so far. We didn't even get seasick on the way across. Not even the baby. And she only a year old. And say, I'm anxious to see that girl. How come you named her Sandra? Oh, that's one of Angela's favorite names. Pretty name, I like it. Oh, this is the blamedest means of transportation I've ever had to endure. I thought you would at least have your own limousine. No, Jim... I haven't been doing so well lately. I hope you'll be able to put up with what I have to offer you on the island. Rough and rugged, is it? Quite. I built the cabin myself. It's not much, but it's comfortable. Oh, by the way, did you bring the books I wrote you about? Books? Oh, yes, they're in the trunk. Oh, good. I must say, that's the strangest collection of books I've ever heard of. What kind of experimenting are you doing on that island anyway? It's pretty serious, Jim, I assure you. Well, it must be. I read your books on the way across. You you did? Yes, indeed. Dr. Helgen Woodward's book on lycanthropy and 
Henry Joseph McClure's pamphlet on the disease Lumpus vulgaris and Guy Ender's story, Werewolf of Paris, and two other books on werewolves. I can't for the life of me imagine, Andrews, what you want with books like that out here in this wilderness. All right, Jim, here we are. Oh, John, here's Jim Howard. You remember Mr. Howard, don't you, Johnny? Well, sure he does. How are you, John, old boy? All right. Glad to see you, sir. Oh, Oh, I see. Where's that old smile I used to see? Here, let me shake your hand. No, sir. I don't want to shake hands. Oh, come on now. We're old friends, aren't we? No, Mr. Howard. Oh, I say. Jim, just a minute. Let go, Mr. Howard. There. Jim. Oh, there now. Shake just like old friends. Let go. Let go my hands. Let go, Jim. Please. I say. The boy's handbill. Come on, Jim. Into the boat with you. Come along, Johnny. Johnny. Get into the boat, son. Yes, sir. Come along, Jim. All right, I'm... I'm shoving off. All right, Johnny. You want to take the oars for the exercise, or you want me to row? Well, son? I told him not to shake my hand. I told him, didn't I? Johnny. Can I help it? Is it my fault if my hand's off? Johnny! You want to row or not? Yes, sir. I'll row. Okay, son. Hop to it. Johnny. uh... Sonny. If I did something... Come on. Down to the other end of the boat, will you? Here. Sit here. I see, Andrews. That boy's hand. Quiet. He's, he's upset enough. But, Bill, the palm of Johnny's hand. Good Lord, man. It's all covered with a thick growth of hair. Okay, Jim, this is your room. Hmm, say, this is fine. You say you built this yourself, Bill? Yep, every bit of it. How do you like my island? Oh, I think it's perfect, but uh, pretty inconvenient. Oh, I don't mind. Sorry we had to arrive here so late. I'll show you around in the morning. Yes, I'm anxious to see the rest of your place, Bill. I want to talk to you more about your work. Yes, of course. Tomorrow... It's pretty late now. Yes, it is late. No, I'm, I'm afraid I rather bored you, old man, with my chatter at the dinner table. Oh, Jim, you heathen. You've never bored me a minute in all the time I've known you. <laughs> oh, that man Rayfield of yours is certainly an excellent cook. Yes. He's an excellent tutor for young Johnny, too. You'll find him quite helpful if you want anything. Fine. Oh, by the way, the people in this spot are a superstitious lot, Jim. Don't let them bother you with any of their nonsense. Nonsense? Yes. Yeah. There's silly rot about, well, uh, things in the night. What thing? Oh, there's nothing, of course. But they take all sorts of means to ward off, well, the evil spirits. Oh, oh I see. Here, I'll, I'll set this charm here on your desk. You won't be using the desk. Charm? Or... What charm? Well, it's just a simple thing that the people hereabouts always insist on putting in the room in which a person sleeps. Here, these three bits of green twigs, two of them standing upright like this. There we have it. Hey, what is this? One cross piece on the uprights like this, then a lakeshore pebble, this little bit of charred wood. There you are. <laughs> now you're, you're fully protected. Protected <laughs> against what? Why, those evil spirits I was telling you about. And now just forget about them, Jim. I just put the charm here in case Raphael comes in. He's very superstitious and he'll never rest until he's made a charm for you himself. <laughs> well, all right, but I still... Now, just forget all about it. Just a whim of Raphael's. Good night, Jim. Good night, old man. See you in the morning. Right. Right and early. You need a spare bracket. There's one in the closet there. Right, Bill. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Hmm. Oh, 
swim of Rayfield's, huh? Three bits of green twig, lakeshore pebble, and a piece of charred wood. Hmm. That's a strange combination. To ward off evil spirits, so Bill claims. But what evil spirit? Great horn toads, what's that? What in the world is that? Bill! Bill, I say, Bill, what's that howling? It is nothing, Mr. Al. Huh? Oh, you, Raphael. Nothing but a wild animal howling in the night. What? That sounded like a wolf. Uh, wolf, Mr. Al. Yes. It couldn't have been a wolf. There are no such animals in this country, you know. I know that, but... There. You hear it? It, it, it will be all right, sir. Did Mr. Andrews give you the charm? Charm? Oh, yes, the charm. It will go, thank you, sir, from anything. Wait a minute, Raphael, don't go. Just what is this? thing I'm being protected from. Oh, nothing. Nothing, sir. Nothing at all. People around these parts are curious about this all. Superstitious, you know, and all that sort of thing. So we humor them by always keeping a charm in the sleeping rooms of our homes. Yes, but I don't see why you should worry about humoring anybody. Way out here, alone like this, on this well, island. Well, sir, it is just the habit of Mr. Andrews Arako. But he said it was you he was satisfying by placing the charm in my bedroom. Yes, sir. That is, well, what, what I mean, sir, I'll best be going. Young John isn't feeling so well tonight. I hope you sleep good, Mr. Howard. And don't worry about the howling. Nothing will harm you. Hmm. Don't worry about the howling, eh? That's strange. That howl's coming from the east wing of this cabin. Right over there. By George, I'm going to skirt this place and have a look. Uh, quiet now. Sound. A light just went on in that room the sound's coming from. That window's heavily barred. And the window glass is frosted and curtained so no one can see inside. The howl is coming from inside that room. There's the door to the place. Oh, Bill. Bill, are you in there? Bill! Some animal in there, all right. Bill! Andrews, are you in there? Whatever it is, it's trying to get out. Bill! Bill, are you all right? Are you in there, old man? Bill, are you in there? Bill! Yes, Jim? What is it? I, I just wondered if you were all right. I heard that animal howling, and I thought that... Animal? What animal, Jim? Don't tell me you didn't hear it. <laughs> you weren't by any chance dreaming already, were you, old boy? But the howling came from inside that room. Say, you have been hearing things. I certainly have. <laughs> Just before you opened the door, I heard an animal sniffing and whining and scratching at the door. Oh, now, Jim. A joke's a joke. But I'm not joking. Well, come on inside and look for yourself, then. Does anybody use this room? Certainly, it's young Johnny's. He and Bill Jr. had the room together before... before we lost Bill Jr. Bill? I'd swear there was an animal in here a moment ago. <laughs> Normally, Jim, I'd be a little confused by what you're saying. Well, the long trip. Worry about your baby daughter. Look, look, there on the door. Long, deep scratches, like an animal's nails would make. Oh, oh those. Jim, those marks are ancient. The boys used to own a collie dog. We don't have him anymore. We used to shut him up in here sometimes, and he'd scratch on the door for someone to let him out. Now what's this? Bill, what is this? A long, heavy chain, securely fastened to the metal bedpost, and a huge leather collar on the other end. Yes, 
That was the collar's chain and collar. We, well, we've never removed it from the bed. We chain the dog here at night to protect the boy. But look here. Fresh blood stains on the collar. And little wisps of grayish fur. Jim, forget it. Those stains aren't fresh. That dog hair has probably been there for ages. Yeah. yeah I suppose so. But why the bars on the windows, Andrew? Just a protection for the children. Well, come on the living room, old man, and let me get you a drink. Call it a night, shall we? Yes. So I suppose we'd better. Maybe a little sleep will do everybody a lot of good. Angela, I can't tell you how happy I am to have you and Jim here to visit me. Oh, we've looked forward to this for six months, Bill. I envy Jim for having a week's head start on me. Oh, oh we really like it here, Bill. Uh, baby asleep, dear? Yes. And it's time we had some rest, too. And that's my hint to clear out. Oh, no. no. Oh, I forgot. I'm going over to the mainland. I'll be back by morning. Anything wrong, Bill? Oh, no, not a thing. Jim, may I ask a favor? Certainly. That watch charm you're wearing. Solid silver, isn't it? Why, yes, it is. Do you think you could give it to me? Give it to you? Why, of course. I have a very special reason for wanting it. I wouldn't ask for it if I didn't have. There you are. Thanks, old man. I... I hope I can return it to you. Well, good night. See you tomorrow. Good night, Jill. Jim, why does Bill act so strangely? I... I don't know, dear. Hmm. I wonder why he wanted that silver watch charm. Odd. Oh, oh, by the way... You said you had that wire for me. Oh, yes. It's here in my purse. I'll get it for you. Would you cover Sandra, dear? She's kicked her blanket off. Oh, sure. Here you are, darling. Thanks. I say, Angela. Yes, dear? Listen. In answer to your cable, I have been able to learn that the grandfather of William J. Andrews was shot in France almost half a century ago by an angered mob. His grave was recently opened. And instead of the remains of a man, investigators found the almost perfectly intact body of a strange beast, somewhat resembling a wolf. Jim, no. Just what I thought. Oh, oh Jim, what's that? Something's wrong. Come on, hurry. Oh, look. Look down the doorway of that room with the bars at the windows. Some animal running out there near the edge. Jim! I hit that creature three times. I couldn't have missed him. And yet the bullets didn't even slow him down. Oh, Jim. There, the doorway. It's Rafael. Look at him. Oh, his throat. Only an animal could have done a thing like that. Where's your Johnny? Look, Jim. That heavy chain hanging from the bedpost. The collar's gone. Chain snapped right in two. Angela, you and I have a job to do. I... I hate to ask you to do this, but... I think you've got the courage. To do what, dear? Come along with me. You will see. Ready to get the lid off the box now? Oh. Steady, Angela. Steady. Oh, this thing's terrible. Desecrating Bill Jr.'s grave like this. Digging up the casket. If I'm wrong about this, well, we see. Hand me that bar. That's it. Now, hold the light over here now, Angela. Just another nail or two. Jim. 
Just exactly what I thought. That's not a boy's body in that casket. It, it's what was Bill Jr. But look. Woolly fur all over it. And that head and face. Like a dog's. Like a wolf's. <gasps> oh, Jim. Young Bill Jr. died a wolf. His great-grandfather before him had the same disease. That's why Bill Jr. died so mysteriously. That's why Andrews had to leave the mainland to move out here. And all the while, he's been studying, trying to effect a cure. The hair on the palms of young Johnny's hands not wanting me to shake hands with him. Now I see why Bill was so insistent about the charm of twigs, stone, charcoal. My watch charm. A silver bullet. Jim. That howled again. That's, that's coming from our room, Jim. Come on, hurry. Hurry. Look. There's no light in the room. We left it on, didn't we? Oh, yes, we did. Oh, Jim, hurry. There. The light went on. Look out there. Let me in there. Oh, locked. This door's locked. Who's in there? Open this door. Open up. Oh, Jim. Jim. Open up this door. Open up, I say. Everything's finished now. Young Johnny is dead. Scott Bishop's 13th original tale of dark fantasy. W is for werewolf. Ben Morris was heard tonight as Jim Howard. Garland Moss was Bill Andrews. Eleanor Naylor Corrin took the part of Angela Howard. Fred Wayne was Raphael. And Don Stoltz played young Johnny. Next Friday night at the same time, Listen to the 14th in this series of dark fantasy dramas. An intriguing, exciting story called A Delicate Case of Murder. Written by Scott Bishop. A strange, weird tale of a spiritualistic medium who suddenly finds herself in the midst of a vicious and well-planned murder plot with herself the victim. Murder and fantasy combined to produce one of the most eerie adventures you have ever heard in A Delicate Case of Murder. Tom Paxton speaking. Dark Fantasy comes to you each Friday night from WKY, Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Listen to Defense Attorney next on ABC. Sir Walter Riley laid down his cloak so Queen Elizabeth wouldn't muddy her royal feet. We can show the same depth of feeling for the victims of the Midwest floods. Not with a cloak, but with disaster dollars. Houses must be rebuilt and refurnished, farm machinery supplied, vocational training provided. This long-term rehabilitation will go on indefinitely. And it will require more money than the American Red Cross has in its present disaster relief fund. Send a disaster dollar to help your fellow citizens fight their way through the Midwest flood disaster of 1951. Mail your contribution to the Red Cross in your town. Ladies and gentlemen, to depend upon your judgment and to fulfill my own obligation, I submit the facts. 
fully aware of my responsibility to my client and to you as defense attorney. The American Broadcasting Company presents Miss Mercedes McCambridge as defense attorney. When Martha Ellis Bryant chose law as a career, she accepted the challenge of defending the defenseless. Defenseless was Grady Daniels, who went hunting, and to use his own words, because he wore a beard and lost a knife, wound up in jail, charged with murder. Marty, I wouldn't touch that case if I were you. Why not, Judd? Well, for one thing, the police already have the ink on the solved stamp. The victim practically identified the killer before he died. But practically isn't enough. And what else? Well, the murder weapon belonged to Daniels. Has that been proven? Yes, he admits it. Is there any doubt about it being the murder weapon? None whatsoever. It fits the wounds, and it was found nearby covered with blood. What does Daniels say? He was picked up three miles from the scene of the crime and claimed he lost the knife while he was hunting. Well, that could happen. Yes, it could. Judd, but... his wife had just left my office when I telephoned you. And she asked... Well, she said... That Daniels could never kill another man. Another? Yes. She said he was overseas with the Marines for two years. He said he'd had enough killing to last him a lifetime. I want to talk to him, Judd. All right, Marty, but the dispatch covered the investigation and the whole story can be told in a half dozen lines. How? Uh, something like this. Vet goes hunting. Farms are all posted no hunting. Vet figures he fought for the country and should be allowed to hunt in it. Argues with Farmer. Stabs him. Is that what the police claim? Yes, and they've got the evidence to go with it. But it's all circumstantial. Yes, but it's all there. I don't like circumstantial evidence, Judd. Circumstance isn't above dealing a card from the bottom. This case could hurt you, Marty. Oh, how can it hurt me? Well, you're going to be on the losing side of an open and shut, small-time, unimportant case. It's a very important case to at least two people. The accused man and his wife. Marty, you've already decided to take this case, haven't you? No, I haven't. Well, not yet. Wait till I've talked with Grady Daniels. Then if I think he's innocent, I'll defend him. So that's Grady Daniels. He's still wearing his beard. Sure. They're not going to let him cut off the evidence. Are you Grady Daniels? Yeah. What about it? I'm Martha Ellis Bryant, an attorney, and this is Judd Barnes of the dispatch. Hello. Did Hester send you here? She asked me to represent you. A woman lawyer? Oh, great. The bar examination is the same for women and men, Daniels. And I haven't decided to take your case yet. Would you like to tell me about it? Why not? If I tell enough people, maybe someone will believe me. I didn't kill that farmer. I didn't even see him. Suppose you start at the beginning and tell me everything that happened that day. First, did you kill him? Look, I just went hunting... Did you kill him? No. All right. Now tell me what happened. And Daniels... Yeah? Don't change or withhold anything. There... There isn't anything to withhold. I drove out to this section to hunt quail. Some friends had told me there were a lot of birds there. I parked and crawled under a fence and started hunting. You see any signs forbidding hunting? No, not then. Besides, I met a couple of other hunters right after I got into this field. Were they together? Yeah. Did you meet anybody else? Yeah, about a half an hour later, I met a man hunting with a trained hawk. Did you talk to any of these men? Yeah, all of them, about the hunting. Whether they had found any birds. They hadn't. And nobody told you that the land was posted? No. Well, so I went on hunting for about an hour. Then I came to a fence that had a no hunting sign on it. And then what? Well, I walked the fence line and the whole place was posted. The land that you were on? Yeah, that's right. I must have missed them when I came on from the road. Uh huh. And then what did you do? Well, I went back to my car and started to look for a place where I could hunt. Did you meet anybody while you were leaving? No. No, but I sure did right after I left. Well, what happened? Well, I'd gone about a mile when I came to this roadblock. I slowed down and stopped. I thought maybe there was an accident or something and I thought... Go 
right, here he is, the man with the beard. Cover him, man. Hey, hey, what's all the artillery for? Keep both hands in sight, mister. Now, come on, get out. Slow, with your hands up. Now, look, Warden, why all the guns? I've got a license. There's no open season on farmers, mister. Hold out your hands. All right, but I don't... Handcuffs. Hey, what's the idea? Shut up. All right, what's your name? Daniels, Grady Daniels. Been hunting Daniels? Yeah, but... Where? Back there, about a mile. Mm-hmm. Search his car, men. Now, look, I've got a right to know why I'm handcuffed and why those men are searching my car. You don't know, eh? You find anything, men? Oh, this is gone. That's... All right. Leave it there. Put a guard in the car so we can have it towed to the car to garage. All right, come on, Daniels. I'm going to jail. I'm not going anywhere till I find out why. Oh, you're going all right, Daniels. I'll tell you why. I found a man down the road. They told me his name was Otto Peisner. He'd been stabbed. The knife was still there. A Japanese Harry Carey knife. A knife like should be in that empty scabbard in your belt. Where's your knife, Daniels? Why, it's... It's gone. Yeah. It was there when I went hunting. I I must have lost it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you lost it, all right. But you see, Otto Peisner wasn't quite dead when I found him. He lived long enough to tell me it was the hunter with the beard. You wear a beard, your knife is gone, and the design on that scabbard matches the design on the knife that killed Peisner. You're under arrest, Daniels. You may as well come quietly because they and that's all they told me, Miss Bryant. Just because I wear a beard and lost a knife, I wind up in jail. Charged with murder. Daniels, I'm going to take your case. Because I believe you. But we haven't much time. Less than a week. I wish your wife would come to me sooner. But I'll do everything that I can. <laughs> Marty, honey, why did you tell that man you'd take his case? He doesn't have a case. That's why I took on the job of building one. He needs it. I'll say he needs it. But what are you going to build it on? I don't know yet, Judd. But there's something in this case that doesn't fit. Like what? If Daniels did stab Peisner and left the knife there, why did he carry the empty scabbard around with him till the warden found it on him? He carried it right into the roadblock. Well, that's easy. He didn't know the roadblock was there. Or he didn't know that the knife was gone. Ah, uh, that's going to sound pretty thin to a jury. It's just thin enough to be true. Huh? I think you took on too big a load this time, Counselor. Oh, none of them looks good to start, Judge. Look, honey, everything is against you. The murdered man described the killer before he died. Daniels fits that description. Two out-of-state hunters have left sworn statements to having seen Daniels on Peisner's farm, and one local hunter will be a witness. They were all clean-shaven, and none had knives. Daniels was wearing an empty scabbard that the murder weapon fits. Yeah, it sounds bad. Yes, and if that isn't enough, Daniels admits that the knife was his. The police have motive, identification, and weapon. There's one thing that the police do not have. Well, I'd like to know what it is. A conviction. Huh? And I have. I'm convinced that Grady Daniels is innocent. I don't know why. Call it intuition. Is uh, intuition an accepted legal device? Well, they didn't mention it in school, but then the teacher was a man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. But, Marty, did you notice that Daniels was pretty cocky for a man in his predicament? Oh, that's a front, Judson. He wears a beard to hide a scar on the outside and a chip on his shoulder to hide a scar on the inside. Okay, Counselor. Where do we start building? I think I'd like to talk with that game warden, that... What's his name? Uh, Mac, McFarland, I think. Yeah. Jim McFarland. Yeah. Why don't you let me out at the next drugstore? Called the Fish and Game Commission. They can tell me where he is. All right. But what do you expect to find out from him? Mostly the viewpoint of the man who found the body. Cabin number seven, they said. Yeah, that would be over this way. It's a funny thing. Game warden living in a tourist camp. Well, what's funny? Lots of people live in motels. Yeah, I know, but somehow I just never thought of an officer as living in one. Now, here it is, number seven. Somebody's in there. I can hear him. Yes? Hello, we're looking for Warden Jim McFarland. 
Hi, McFarland. I'm Martha Ellis Bryant, an attorney, and this is Judd Barnes. He's a friend. How do you do? Yeah, howdy. Oh, uh, won't you come in? Thank you. I'm sorry I'm a little short of seating space here. You might try the bed. Might be comfortable to sit on. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, this is fine. Yeah. I suppose you're here about this Daniels case? Yes, I'm going to represent Mr. Daniels. I see. What do you want with me? Information, mostly. Well, as Daniels' attorney, you're entitled to know the facts. Yeah, but I'm not sure this is the time or the place for me to give them out. Of course, you're under no obligation to answer any questions concerning the case, but there are some things you could clarify and not betray any official secrets. Yeah, maybe. Like what? Like, was Otto Peisner alive when you found him? Yes. Conscious? No. Was he cut or stabbed? Both. Was he bleeding? Not much. Had he bled much? Well, there's a lot of blood under him. It was a messy job, huh? Sort of. Do you know that Grady Daniels was an ex-Marine? No, but it figures. Well, how does it figure? Yeah, when you see enough death, uh, life gets cheap. Oh? Did Daniels have any blood on him when you arrested him? Ask me that at the trial. Yes, maybe I will. Now, look, look, Miss Bryant. I, I'm just a game warden, see? Up till now, the most serious offense I've ever come up against was some tourist lucky enough to catch too many fish. I was sent up here from my regular section to cover the opening of quail season in this county, and, well, I run head-on into a murder. Now, I'll tell you what happened in my own words, but don't shoot questions at me. I, I get nervous. All right, we'll listen. Well, when I found Peisner, he was unconscious. Well, I poured some water from my canteen down his throat, and he opened his eyes after a second or two, and I asked him what had happened. Well, it took him a little while to answer, but when he did, I heard him very clearly. He said, it was the hunter with the beard. Well, that was all. I ran to my car to radio for help, and when I came back, he was dead. You didn't know who he was? No, no, I'm from the lower part of the state. Hmm. You were in charge of the roadblock that picked Daniels up, weren't you? That's right. Did you pick up anybody else? I mean, to question? Oh, yeah, yeah, several. But they were all clean-shaven. Three of them had talked to Daniels that day. Near Peisner's farm? No, on it. Peisner made them all three leave. Then he met Daniels. After that, I found him. Daniels claims he never saw Peisner. <laughs> I don't blame him. That's what I'd say. But his knife was beside Peisner. Daniels claims that he lost it. Well, he has to say something. How do you account for the fact that he was still wearing the scabbard? I don't account for anything. And I'm answering questions again, Miss Bryant. Now, I, uh, I'm sorry, but any further information from me will have to come at the trial. Well, thank you. Yeah. Peisner's farm is near that German settlement at Wesselhorst, isn't it? All right, I'll answer one more question, yes. And again, thank you. Come on, Judd. Uh, goodbye, Miss Bryant and Mr. Uh... Barnes. Huh? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, goodbye, Barnes. Uh-huh. Well, there wasn't anything world-shaking in that interview. I'm lucky to get any information out of him. Of course, he's not required to say anything to the defense counsel except from the witness stand at the trial. He didn't hurt the prosecution's case one bit. No, but I had a chance to size up the star witness before he gets on the stand. So right now, the state's entire case hinges on his testimony. So? What are you going to do now, Counselor? Well, I was going to ask a newspaper man friend of mine to drive me out to Wesselhorst. I'd like to get some local slant on Pisney. Huh. You drive me to distraction, I guess I can drive you to Wesselhorst. <laughs> See, 20 miles from town, and it's just like being in Germany. Yeah. I've been out here before. Everybody in the whole town is German. Well, they have to be to pronounce that name. Wesselhorst. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a wrestling program. The gorgeous Fritz will wessel horst. Oh, Judd. <laughs> Not on an empty stomach. Oh, are you hungry, too? <laughs> I'm starved. Hey, over there's a cafe. Uh, Heidelberg Gardens. Good food. Shall we see if it is? Right now, if it's food, it's good. All right. Boy, sauerkraut, pig's knuckles, maybe even beer. <laughs> There's a vacant table over there. Yeah, yeah. Hey, talk about atmosphere. Well, they've got it, haven't they? <laughs> sure have. Here comes a waiter. Look, get that mustache. That's not a mustache. That's twin beards. Welcome to the Heidelberg Gardens. Well, thank you very much. You order, Judd. Uh, sure. Do you want... Uh... Ah, just one minute. The Heidelberg Gardens... We do not patron serve. Then it's on the tablecloth. There. 
Excuse it, please. We get clean one. Uh, when you come back, bring two orders of sour broughton. Yeah, Bye. Well, what are you going to eat, Marty? Marty. Marty, what's the matter? Huh? Oh, nothing. I was, I was, I was thinking. Oh, look, honey, don't live your cases. Forget it for a while and enjoy yourself and me. <laughs> ah, this is better. Oh, yes, that's fine. Uh, danke schön, Freilein. The sour broughton will be here soon. Was there something else? Yes, maybe. Did you happen to know Otto Peisner? He lived outside of town near here. Yeah. I knew Otto Peisner. What about Otto Peisner? Well, I'm Martha Ellis Bryant, an attorney. This is Mr. Barnes of the city dispatch. The attorney? Mm. You helping that man what's dead, Otto? Well, I'm going to defend him. Why? Then, Fräulein, it is better if you... I tell you why. Well, who are you? Never mind who I am. I live here. We don't like people coming who snoop around trying to find ways to free someone who killed one of our farmers. We're not trying to free anybody who killed a man. We're just talking... You're that fellow Daniel's lawyer, ain't you? Yes, that's right, but we're not... Well, he killed out of... Look, fellow, that hasn't been proven yet. And in the meantime, we... It's proven enough for us. You're one of these people who figure because a guy is a veteran, he can't do no wrong. That's a ridiculous thing to say. Listen, you... You listen. That's a guy's figure that because the government taught him how to kill and give him permission to do it, they can keep right on after the war's over. Daniels is one of those men. Well, that's what we have courts for, to decide whether or not... Let the court decide, Dan, but you'd better get out of this town. Now, before you get hurt. Look, Junior, where I come from... It's where you better go back to. Now, wait a minute. Judd, we'd better leave. Come on. I thought you were never going to say that. Let's go. Whew. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of feeling in Wesselhorst about this case. Yes, I wonder who's in back of it. What do you mean? Well, somebody has to start stirring up that much feeling, Judd. Yes, yeah, that veteran taught to kill can't stop idea. I know it. It's pretty common, Marty. It's too common. And nothing could be more wrong. I'm a veteran, and I've never felt any desire to kill, even during the war. I sure hope we've got veterans on that jury. Marty, Daniels is an ex-Marine. Now, if he had stabbed Peisner... It would have been a neat job, and Peisner wouldn't have lived to talk to anyone. It's a good point, Judd. So, what do we do now? Well, will you take me to your office? I want all the newspaper reports on the case, and then we can take them to my office and go over them tonight. Sure, but look, honey, first let's go somewhere and get a steak. <laughs> I'd go for that. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, Marty. Yes, Judd? Just what is Sauerbraten? And that's all that I could find, Judge. Otto Peisner, age 43, bachelor. Came from Germany to the United States in 1938, settled in Wesselhorst. Bought a farm, well thought of by his neighbors. Although he didn't mingle much, he tended to his farm mostly in his business. His only known relative is a brother, Herman, who came from Germany with him. Herman Peisner now lives in Wesselhorst. Inherits the farm. Yeah. And there isn't a thing there that'll help Daniels. Yeah, but there's a flaw in this case. I can feel it. Did you ever meet anybody that you'd never, you know, you you couldn't quite get? Well, somebody that you had seen before and you knew, and yet you couldn't remember their name? Yeah, sure. And you feel that you can almost say it, and yet it just won't come out, it just hangs there? Do you feel that way about this case, Marty? I do, I do. The answer's there. It struck me in that restaurant in Wesselhorst. I was real close to it. And then all that trouble started. Well, honey, I can't help you with that kind of a problem. Look... Would you like to be left alone for a while? Maybe you'll remember. That might help. You mind? Oh, of course not, honey. I'll be at the dispatch for a couple of hours if you need any help. Thank you, darling. Night, Marty. Good night, Judd. Herman Prisoner. Brother. Of course, they'd be the same. What is that? Here it is, sir. Survived by his brother, Herman Peisner. 401 Linden Avenue, Wesselhorst. Hello, operator. This is Martha Ellis Bryant. Will you call the parking lot? Ask them to have my car in front of my office in five minutes.
Yeah, what do you want? Are you Herman Peisner? Yeah, I'm Herman Peisner. What do you want? My name is Martha Alice Bryant. Uh, the farm is not for sale. I've got nothing for sale to the newspapers. Oh, no, Mr. Peisner, it's nothing like that. You see, uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, what? I'm a lawyer. I represent Grady Daniels. Ah, oh, such no, swine. i got nothing for to say. Anyone helping him? Goodbye. No, please, Mr. Peisner, just a minute. Maybe he didn't kill your brother. When the police arrest him? If he'd not do it, why they arrest? He'd do it all right. And I'd be there if I hear him sent to prison and execute. Goodbye. Mr. Peisner, thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, uh, Red Star Delivery Service. Good, I want to arrange for a pickup to be made at the Cinema Props Rental Service at 2847 Cimarron Street. That's right. Yes, it's to be delivered to Martha Ellis Bryant before 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Room 14, Hall of Justice. Yes, they'll have the order ready. How long have you worn a beard, Mr. Daniels? Since a Jap sniper put a bullet across my face in 1944. You admit that you were trespassing on the land of the deceased on the day he was stabbed to death? Yes, but Do you I... recognize this knife, Mr. Daniels? Yes, it was mine, How but long I... have you owned this knife, Mr. Daniels? I took it from the body of the sniper that shot me in 1944. Then killing a man... It's not a new experience to you, yeah, is it? Well, I... That will be all, Mr. Daniels. Your witness, Miss Bryan. No questions. Marty, no questions? Mr. Wagner, you are a resident of the German settlement of Wesselhorst, is that right? That's right. Marty, that's the tough guy from the Heidelberg yes. Gardens. Yes, I think you're right, Jack. You must have known that Mr. Peisner did not allow hunting, and yet you were afield on his land on the day he was stabbed. I know he didn't allow shooting, but I don't use a gun. I hunt with a falcon. That's a, a hawk trained to catch birds. I see. Now, Mr. Wagner, can you identify the man you met on Otto Peisner's farm that day? Yeah, I can. Is he in this courtroom? Yeah. It's right there, that man. Grady Daniels. Thank you, Mr. Wagner, that's all. Your witness, Miss Bryan. No questions. Marty, aren't you going to do anything? The DA's doing fine, Judge. I'll say he is. He's hanging your client. Just a moment, Mr. McFarland. I would like to make a short resume of your testimony up to date. After finding the wounded man and speaking with him, you radioed for assistance. When you returned to the scene of the crime, the victim was dead. Is that right? That's right. You searched the immediate area and found a murder weapon nearby, a Japanese Harry Carey knife. Later, at the roadblock where the defendant was apprehended, he admitted it was his knife, but claimed he had lost it that day, correct? Yes, sir. And he still wore the empty scabbard on his belt? Yes, sir, he did. Now, Mr. McFarlane, I am going to ask you to repeat once more the last words of the victim as he lay dying. In your arms. Well, he said it was the hunter with the beard. That's all. Thank you. Your witness, Miss Bryant. No questions. Marty, honey, at least go down swinging. But if it please the court, I should like to call a witness from the spectator's gallery. The deceased man's brother, Mr. Herman Peisner. <laughs> Mr. Peisner, you and your brother came to the United States together. In what year? In 1938. Could either of you speak any English before arriving here? None. We study here in night school. Did you study together? Uh, we studied together. We quit together. Would you say that your brother spoke English better than you? No, he did not. Would you say that you both spoke about the same? Your Honor, I object. 
The line of questioning is irrelevant and immaterial. The calling of this witness is a flagrant attempt on the part of the defense to confuse the jury. Your Honor, the calling of this witness in this line of questioning is vital to the correct issue of this trial. I repeat the question. Would you say that you and your brother spoke about the same? Yeah, that's right. All right, Mr. Pastor. Now, you see the defendant, Grady Daniels. Will you describe him for me? Do what? Will you tell me what he looks like to you? Yeah, well, he's about five feet, eight inches tall. Weighs about 165 pounds. Uh, got blue eyes. And he wears brown whiskers. He wears brown whiskers, is that right? Uh, yeah, brown whiskers. Thank you, Mr. Peisner. And now, when I remove the cover, can you tell me what is the object in this cage? Here we are. What is it? That is a beard. That is right. A hunting falcon. Thank you very much, Mr. Peisner. Now then, Mr. Wagner, will you stand, please? Mr. Wagner, you are experienced in falconry. Will you hold this bird? Thank you. And now, Mr. Peisner, which is Grady Daniels? The man with the whiskers. And which is Mr. Wagner? The man with the beard. The, the man with the beard. And the dying man's last words identified his killer as the hunter with the beard. Wagner! Wagner, he killed my brother! Ladies and gentlemen, the defense rests. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, Judson, darling. What's up? <laughs> Don't ask me. I just print the news. You make it. Oh, did I make news? Yeah. Wagner just confessed. He nearly had to confess. He convicted himself. Yeah. You know, that was quite a brilliant piece of legal maneuvering. <laughs> How did you get started on that bird and beard track, anyway? Well, it started because somebody was very careless in his eating habits. <laughs> what? I don't get it. Remember when I said that circumstance wasn't above dealing a card from the bottom? Yeah. That works both ways. Somebody spilled food on the tablecloth at the Heidelberg Gardens, and the waiter wouldn't serve food when there was dirt on the cloth. Only he said, dear. Mm. Took me a little while to figure out the connection between dirt and dirt and bird and beard. Ah. But when I did, I knew I was on the right track. Yeah, and the rest is history. And Wagner being at the Heidelberg Gardens was just a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Judge, you know something? What? I hope it was Wagner who spilled the food on that table. <laughs> Just heard Defense Attorney starring Mercedes McCambridge with Howard Culver as Judd. Tonight you heard Jan Arvan as Daniels, Bill Boucher as McFarland, Herb Butterfield as the District Attorney, and Lamont Johnson as Peisner. Music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. <laughs> Defense Attorney was written by Jack Spears. The program is directed by Dwight Hauser. Next week, another exciting adventure with Mercedes McCambridge, defense attorney. Be sure to listen. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Shenley Laboratories presents The Doctor Fights, starring Van Heflin in a thrilling true story of a doctor in World War II. The Doctor Fights, starring Van Heflin. The Eternal Providence has appointed me to watch over the life and death of all thy creatures. May I always see in the patient a fellow creature in pain. Grant me strength and opportunity always to extend the domain of my craft.
This is the prayer of every doctor. It is ages old, and yet today it is as new as the heroism of tomorrow's battles. This is a doctor at war. Ladies and gentlemen, once again it is the privilege of Shenley Laboratories to bring to you this program based on actual happenings and dedicated to the physicians of America who are giving so unstintingly of their strength and skill in this time of crisis. In the ever-continuing battle against disease, your welfare lies with these men and the constantly increasing list of weapons with which they fight. Among the most valuable of these aids that help in their fight today is penicillin, the drug which last year was available principally to the armed forces, but which today, thanks to concerted effort by American production facilities, is available for use wherever indicated in civilian medicine as well. Shenley Laboratories is proud to have played a part in helping to bring this drug from the status of a medical rarity to a standard item in every physician's arsenal. Tonight, Burma Incident is the true story of Captain Henry G. Stelling, head of a surgical ward at Lawson General Hospital. Captain Stelling has the presidential unit citation. We will meet Captain Stelling in person later in our program. And now, The Doctor Fights, starring Van Heflin. They, uh, they ask you how it was, your wife and your friends and, uh, the people that you meet on trains, but you don't, you don't say much. Well, it, it isn't that you don't want to talk about it, it's just that it's, it's hard to tell how it really was. Nobody could have told us what it was going to be like as we flew the Pacific. Toward what, we, we don't know. Twelve doctors in the uniform of the United States Army. Twelve men who had volunteered for combat mission. Secret and highly hazardous, the War Department had called it. You passed those long flying hours remembering what you'd left behind and sort of wondering what was ahead. You asked the ATC pilots, but all they answered was Calcutta, the way you might say Pittsburgh or Oshkosh or, uh, <laughs> well, or Hutchinson, Kansas. Well, I, uh, I always wanted to see India. Uh, what makes you think you're going to see it? They'll probably lead us through blindfolded. No, we, uh, we weren't blindfolded. In India, you got a good look at how things were going to be. Thank hut! At ease, gentlemen. First thing we dispense with on this operation is military protocol. I welcome you into the 5307 composite unit provisional, but uh, don't let that number fool you. There's never been anything like it. You'll be going into jap hell territory with guerrilla fighters who will cut Jap communications and supply lines and harass them when they least expect it. You'll be going through some of the worst country in the world, and the fighting will be as tough as any you'll find in this war. For you doctors, there'll be no first aid stations, no field hospitals, no nurses. You'll have to carry all your equipment with you, your casualties as well, until they can be evacuated by air. Now, the mission of this team is to retake that part of the Lido Road now in the hands of the Japs. The commanding officer is Brigadier General Frank D. Merrill. Oh, wow. Any questions? Uh, yes, Doctor. Oh, well, Colonel, uh, what, about, uh, what about medics? Well, each doctor will get ten aidmen. They'll be your only medical assistants. Their training will be up to you. Bessie, that ain't no way to act. You volunteered for this mission, too. Come on, Bessie. Come on. Bessie, walk nice for this now. There. That's my Bessie. Hello, Sergeant. Oh, hiya, Captain. 
Don't mind if I keep walking this mule, do you? She needs special training. No, not at all. I'll walk with you. I'm uh, Captain Stelling, uh, the surgeon for the blue team. Oh, glad to make your acquaintance, Captain. I'm Albert Dittmar, your first medic. Got the men out working the mules. Oh, that's a good idea. We'll be depending a lot on them. Yeah, I guess we will. I'm a good man for this job. I got a way with animals. <laughs> I guess that's why they made me a medic on this shebang. Keep it up, Betty. Well, is this the uh, first time out as a medic sergeant? Oh, I had some experience down in New Georgia, Doctor. You've come up against the Japs before? No, 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 no. This will be my first combat. Hmm. Sort of a rugged beginning. I got a feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess it is. They'll be looking to you for a lot, Captain. This ain't New Georgia where a man knew there was a nice LST waiting to take him to a hospital ship. Well, I'll do the best I can, Sergeant, but I... I don't perform miracles. Well, maybe you better learn a couple, Captain. Because when we get out in Jap country, it'll be you or nothing. You or nothing. That was just about it. You've been to the newsreels and... You've seen a modern army on the march, the tanks and the half-tracks roaring down the road, the tremendous supply dumps and the, the beautiful communication system. <laughs> but not the 5307 composite unit provisional. The 5307 was just fighting men with their mules strung out single file through a Burmese jungle, waiting for it to happen. Things going all right, Dad? All packed secure, Captain. And Bessie's feeling fine. You smell anything, Doctor? <laughs> well, just the heat and Bessie. Same for the past two weeks. No, no, there's, there's something different in the air today. We're getting into the purple hot country, Doctor. Don't you smell it? <laughs> no, no, Dad, I can't. Well, you learn to before this shebang's over. I got a feeling. <laughs> You know, back home, I'd sort of look forward to nighttime. But here, it's just the other way around. No smoking a show of light. Pass it on. No smoking a show of light. Pass it on. No smoking a show of light. Pass now, that order didn't come just because they don't want to make the wooju boys noisy. Smell anything now, Doctor? Well, yes, I believe I do detect a slight odor in the air, Ted. It can happen any time, Doctor. I've got a feeling. <laughs> Out uh, here on the road, I almost miss the noise of the jungle. Yeah, I don't like it so quiet. Neither do the other guys. That smell getting awful strong. That I think your nose may be getting oversensitive. That's probably just a couple of Jap snipers our boys put away. <laughs> it's funny. When you're in the jungle, you wish you was out in the open. And when you're out in the open... Take cover! Dead. Dead, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right, Doctor. They were laying for us, letting the rest of the column pass and then cutting us in half. Oh, we'll stick under this tree, Dad. That's just about as good cover as we'll find. Yeah. It's shooting over our heads so far. Everything all right, Captain? Yes, yes. It's okay, Major. I was just going to check on the casualties. Uh, we were lucky. Only one. Brady here got a minor flesh wound, but I doubt if you can do much about it here. Oh, hello, Brady. Where is it? Mr. your shoulder? Nothing, Captain. Can't feel a thing. Dead. Give me a bandage. Coming. Keep down, Dead. Dead, keep down. Uh, it looks like those Japs wanted to keep us pinned down. They must have something in mind. We're not in a good spot, Captain. Most of our supplies are out in that road. Oh, well, Major, what, what's the plan? Try and contact the rest of our unit. If not, we'll have to put up into the jungle to the rear. But it's pretty rugged country. Here's a bandage, Doctor. All right, fine. Roll over on your side now so I can get at that shoulder, Brady. Right, Captain. Mr. Healy. Well, Burnett's missing. Missing? Yeah, just checked up. Nobody knows what's happening. Hey, wait a over. second. Down there on the side of that road, there, there's something moving. That's Burnett. He's trying to crawl up on the road. Get back, Roy! Get back! He can't hear you. 
I guess the Nips think he's dead. He got it bad. Really bad. Yeah, Ruiz, our first bad casualty. Are we just going to lie here and watch him die? Major, Major, let me take half a dozen men and go after that machine gun nest so Roy can be pulled to cover. We could do it. Knock it off temporarily anyway. Hey, look at Roy just 50 feet away and let's not even try. I think he'd have a chance if we got him, Captain. Well, that's, that's hard to say, Major. Out here, if you get it bad, I guess there's nothing nobody can do. You just die. Major, I think maybe you'd better let the sergeant go out to that machine gun nest. You lay flat on Burma ground, pinned down by the Japs. And you watch a crumpled khaki uniform darken with blood. You see it twist in pain. And watch life ebb out of a man. And and you wonder if you have the skill in your hands and your brain to bring life back to him. That is, if you get the chance. But you know that you, you mustn't fail because it's not just Roy Burnett lying out there on that road. It's every man in the outfit waiting to see what happens to a soldier in the Burma jungle who's plugged full of holes. One hour... Two hours, you wait for that signal from the sergeant. At the end of the third hour, every man is wondering if the signal's going to come at all, and then... That's it, Davis! Fuller, go to it! they got to make it, Doctor. Hey, look, they're picking them up. Here they come. Dit, Jordan, get two saddles under that tree. Plenty of blankets. Everything laid out? All ready for them, Doctor. Here they come. We got him, Captain. We got him. All right. Put him over on those saddles. Give me a hand ripping off his clothes here. What are the chances, Doctor? Oh, well, I don't know. It's hard to say. Not, not very good. Six-inch hole here in the abdomen. Machine gun slugs in the hip. Arms. Grenade fragments. No, no, no. Death, they're not good. Start giving him ether. But easy. Take it easy. Right, Doctor. Where's the alcohol now? All out, Captain. Cans were hit when it come in. Okay. Well... I'll have to do it with alcohol. What are Burnett's chances, Captain? Oh, about one in 5,000. I'm sorry to hear that. Not only for him, but... Well, it's our first casualty. Yes, I, I know. I know, Major. I know very well. Ready here, Captain. All right. All right, let's go, Fuller. Yes, sir. Start giving him plasma. About six units. He's in shock. How's that supply, Dick? Bessie was carrying the plasma. We're fine. All right, give me gauze soaked in plasma. We'll wash out the wound with that. Right. <laughs> All right, clear away the leaves and the bark there. Starting up again, heavier than before. More gauze, Dip, more gauze. Blast those leaves. Funny. I was thinking of the bullet. Dip, more ether. Jordan, you take over the gauze from dead. Right. Captain, how long will it take? Oh, I, I don't know. That's hard to say. At least three hours, maybe more. His intestines are like a sieve, and the slugs in his arms and legs. We may have to pull out before then. Well, that's impossible. Fuller, with the scissors. Right, sir. The scouting party just came back. The Japs are bringing up reinforcements. They're firing us to keep us pinned here until they're ready to attack. That's enough either, Dad. More gauze now and plenty of, plenty of plasma. Hemostats. Captain, did you hear what I said? Yes, Major, yes. I, uh, somebody wiped the sweat from my forehead. It's getting my eyes. Dit, he must have... Davis, Davis, get those leaves. You're getting lucky they haven't got a zero in yet. Captain, I want to save this man's life, but we can't withstand a Jap attack now. Scissors again. Major, look, isn't there any way that we can tell just how much time we've got? You know there's more at stake than this man's life. I'll see what I can do. Corporal Yoto. More gauze, did more gauze. Now keep that plasma going. Yes, Major. Corporal Yoto, I've got a job for you, but purely volunteer. We've got to find out what time the Japs plan to attack, so the captain knows how long he's got to work on Roy. Could you tap their communication wire and find out? Sure, Major. I'd try. Maybe Roy has a chance, huh? Boys say no bad casualty can be saved out here. Well, he's doing fine, Corporal. Dip, get the sweat. It's running again. How's a miracle coming, Doctor? Oh, Dip, the odds are against us. Way, way against us. All right, now. Knife. He's bleeding bad, Doctor. All right, give me gauze. Plenty of it. We're running low. Well, give me all you've got. You'll have to take a chance. 
Yodo just got back. Yeah? The attack is at 6. We've got to be out of here by 5.30. Five, what, what time is it now? 4. You've got an hour and a half, Doctor. Can you make it, Doctor? I don't know. I don't know. All we can do, did is try. Sutures and open needle it. Ten holes to sew up in the intestines. And it's very delicate, then. What's the time? 4.30. The boys are making bets. It can't be done now. All right, more ether, did. And maybe you'd better say a prayer. Time. Five o'clock. It's blowing up, Doctor. It looks like a storm. There. Well, now, that last stitch won't ever be written up in the American Medical Association Journal, but maybe it'll do the work. Check his pulse. It's low, but steady. Okay. Now the slugs. Pincers. Come on. Get the leaves off of him. Yes, sir. Things are going pretty good, aren't they, Doctor? Dead, listen, don't you understand what it means to have your intestines punched full of holes? I told you that I can't work miracles. This time you have to, Doctor. Blast those leaves, blast them. Time. 5.20. Are we going to make it? Are we? Start bandaging the wounds. Come on, Doctor. Uh, that's the last slug. All right, now the grenade fragments. What about it, Captain? Well, I'm I'm doing all I can. We're pulling out in eight minutes. Fuller, Davis, get Bessie and the other mule saddle. Knife, Dad. Coming, Doctor, coming. Jordan, watch that plasma. Plenty of it. Knife. Right. Now keep the morphine handy, Dad. He's going to need it. Is that... Is that rain? Afraid so, Doctor. I told you it was blowing up. Did you? There. All right, now the needle and suture, quick. Ready, Captain? Get a stretcher, dead, and, and blankets. Plenty of blankets. Captain Stelling, are you ready? Yes, yes, Major, yes, I'm ready. All right, come on now, let's get him on the stretcher. Easy. Easy now. How is it, Captain? Uh, he's still breathing, that's all I can tell. But, oh, what? What do you know? It's it's raining. <laughs> yes, Doctor. It's raining. jungle, wet, black, misery. The sky opened up and let go. It, it isn't rain, it's a wall of water. You slip, you fall, you curse, and and you pray. You go forward by inches, feet, not, not miles. Somehow you must get Burnett through. Somehow you, you must keep him alive. And then you wonder how anyone can stay alive in that black hell where you can no longer see... Only, only feel. Doctor! Doctor, where are you? Doctor! Keep hollering, Dad! Keep hollering! Here, 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 Doctor! Here! Where are you, Dad? Here, on the ground. We fell. The stretcher slipped. We can't find it. Well, all right. Easy does it now, Dad. Easy, easy does it. <laughs> get down on your knees in the jungle with a monsoon beating against you and you feel for the body of a soldier named Roy Burnett. Seven times in that one night. Seven times. Four days and four nights of it. Stumbling, crawling... Fighting your way through the jungle. Four days and four nights of mud and hunger. And Roy Burnett, 180 pounds wrapped in soaked blankets. Just, just breathing, no more. And finally, the jungle ends and the, the storm dies. But the job, the job of saving Roy Burnett, that isn't finished. All right, stand back now, fellas. Stand back now and give him some air. 
He's alive. We didn't think it could be done. That's because you don't know the doctor. Men, we'll have to be on our way again in a few minutes. Patrol reporter Japs in a village within a mile of here. But, Major, what about Burnett? He, he can't stand another march. If we contact the base and the cub lands here, we're telling the Japs just where we are. And we're in no shape for a fight. But if Burnett isn't gotten I'm ready out of for this a fight, Major. Maybe the Nips will think it's one of their own planes. Maybe they won't see it. You want a chance at men? Sure Just thing. Right, sir. All right, Sergeant, get a detail and start clearing that rice paddy field for a landing strip. Yes, sir. Johnson, set up the radio. Contact the base and give our position. Cats, get out the identification panels. Captain Stelling? Yes, Major. Prepare your patient for evacuation. Right, sir. Okay, Dad. Now left him easy. I got him, Doctor. All right. And he goes. Take him away. Well, Doctor, chalk up your first miracle. Every guy knows a few slugs don't mean the end of him. No. No, Dad, I... I don't think he's going to live to get to the hospital even. I, I don't... I don't think there's a chance. Well, now, wait a minute, Doctor. Wait a minute. You can't give up hope now. Why, hope's your strong point. From the minute you started working on Roy back there under that tree, you give us all hope. If you've lost it for a spell, it's only because you gave so much away. Just look at our fighting men behind you, Doctor. Look what you put in their faces. I looked at those faces, tanned, hardened, ready. And I saw something in them that that hadn't been there before. They They were faces that I'll never forget. I still see them, alert, squinting down the barrel of a gun. I see them twisted in pain, looking up at me from a litter. I see them in in shock, white against the black of the jungle. Always in those faces, I see the hope that was there that day in the rice field. And I like to think that a doctor operating under a tree by the Lido Road was in a way responsible for that hope. Because without it, a man is lost 10,000 miles from home. A doctor and a boy named Roy Burnett. A boy whose face I saw two days after I returned to Lawson General Hospital in Atlanta. Yes, Roy Burnett is alive, and he's well. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from Atlanta, Georgia, we present the man whom I had the honor of portraying tonight. Captain Henry G. Stelling. Captain Stelling will be interviewed by Hugh Whiteside. Good evening, Captain Stelling. It is a real pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you, but I don't think you can single out one man as the hero of Merrill's Marauders. Some of us were more fortunate than our comrades. We got through. How many of you did get back, Captain? The exact figures are still a military secret. But my own personnel records show that of the original 500 men in my outfit, 107 were killed and 205 were wounded. And you were the only doctor for those men? Well, the only one for the blue combat team. There were 12 doctors when we started, but only three lasted the whole campaign. Merrill's Marauders accounted for 9,000 Japs, didn't they? Yes, that is an approximate number. My own outfit, for example, fought five major battles and 45 minor engagements in the four months of the campaign. For the four months, you were entirely on your own? Yes. As you know, the mission of the Marauders was to open the Lido Road. We had orders to infiltrate and cut Jap communication lines, harass them in any way we could. How far did you march in those months, Captain? 750 miles, all told. We lived on K-rations, except when we could come to a friendly village and could barter for food. 
Captain, what experiences in past training do you consider contributed to withstanding such a rugged ordeal? Aside from a good start from my parents, Mr. and Mrs. H.B. Stelling of Augusta, Georgia, I graduated from the University of Georgia School of Medicine in Augusta and the University Hospital there. Also, I had excellent training at Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta, where I completed my surgery just before going into active military service in 1942. But I consider the greatest contribution to my ability to withstand the rugged ordeal of the Burma campaign the training I received as an Eagle Scout of the Boy Scouts of America. My scouting skills helped me to take care of the men in the Marauders. And now, Captain, what are you doing at Lawson General Hospital? I have charge of a surgical ward there. Lawson is one of the 60 general hospitals the Army has established to care for casualties requiring lengthy hospitalization, and it has received the Meritorious Service Unit plaque for superior performance of duty. Lawson specializes in the care of neurosurgical and amputation cases. Lawson uses the Army's famous reconditioning program, doesn't it? Yes, and while Lawson has a staff of experts in this field who devote their whole time to reconditioning these men, it is part of the doctor's job to do all he can to see that these soldiers are able to take their place in a normal civilian community and lead a normal life. The courage of these men is inspirational. And may I thank Van Heflin for his sincere, authentic portrayal of a small part of the story of Merrill's Marauders. Thank you, Captain Stelling. The way you doctors fight disease, illness, and the hazards of warfare right up on the front lines with our soldiers is an inspiration to all of us at home whose sons, husbands, or friends are in your care. We now return you to Van Heflin in Hollywood. This is Van Heflin, again adding my thanks to you, Captain Stelling. Shenley Laboratories, maker of penicillin Shenley, dedicates this program to the 180,000 American doctors overseas and here at home. Wherever, whenever it is needed, in quantities unobtainable little more than a year ago, penicillin is now available to these doctors to aid them in the cause of healing. It is a tribute to American manufacturing enterprise that so greatly increased quantities of this valuable drug are now on the market. Shenley Laboratories is proud to have played a part in the expansion of penicillin production and in closing makes this pledge. In the same spirit of research for ways to benefit mankind, the Shenley organization will continue to work toward new developments, new products, which may well mean for thousands a more abundant life in the years to come. This is James Wallington reminding you to listen next week over these same stations at the same time when Shenley Laboratories will present The Doctor Fights, starring one of Motion Pictures' young outstanding stars, Glenn Ford, in the thrilling true story, Captain Rame's Story. Mr. Heflin has just returned from the armed forces to resume his motion picture career, which was highlighted by his Academy Award for his performance in Johnny Eager. Tonight he appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor production, Anchors Away. Tonight's Dr. Fights was written by Donald Etlinger with music by Leith Stevens and was produced and directed by D. Engelbach. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hollywood, California, we bring you Chapter 7 in the story of The Doctor of River's End. The star of the show, Gene Hersholt in the greatest of all roles. The title of the show, Dr. Christian. The sponsor of the show, the Cheeseboro Manufacturing Company, owners of the trademark Vaseline. The makers of Vaseline preparations who bring you these programs each Sunday afternoon have been making these famous home remedies for more than 50 years. Each Vaseline product is the best of its kind that can be produced. All Vaseline products are made with the same scrupulous care, sterilized in the process of manufacture, and packed in sterilized containers. So when you buy, be sure to look for the trademark Vaseline on the package. If you don't see it, you are not getting the genuine article. We take you now to River's End, to Dr. Christian's reception room, where Judy Price... Dr. Christian's office. Oh, hello, Mrs. Tansy. 
No, Dr. Christian hasn't gotten back yet. All right, I'll tell him. What? Danny Barnes? Well, when did he get back? <laughs> I'll bet River's End looks kind of tame to him after New York. Oh, that's right. Goodbye. Good morning, Judy. Is Doc in? Mm, not back from his calls yet. Well, when he comes in, tell him I've got that thyroid extract for him. Oh, say, guess who was in the drugstore this morning? Danny Barnes. I heard he was back for the holidays. How is he? Well, you should have seen him. Spats and a punched-in suit and drove <laughs> up in a big, expensive-looking car. I guess all those things he's been writing to Eloise Miller have been true, all right. I never did hear what kind of business he was in. Oh, some big trading corporation. Cleaned up a couple of hundred thousand dollars, they Ooh, say. Oh, he has done all right. And he's only been away two years. Now, uh, how old do you suppose he is? Well, he was a year ahead of me when he had to leave high school, so he must be about a year older. That would make him, uh... Oh, don't be so inquisitive. <laughs> oh, say, Judy. Oh, hello, Roy. Say, hey, guess who's in town? Uh, I know, <laughs> I know. Danny Barnes is back. Have you seen him yet? No, but I've heard nothing else all morning. Yeah, they were going to welcome him with a brass band, but they gave it up when they saw the necktie he was wearing. <laughs> it would take too large a band to compete with. <laughs> well, anybody who can make $200,000 in two years is entitled to a little showing off. <laughs> well, we all show off, whether we do it with a loud necktie or a box of the opera. <laughs> in fact, I've come to the conclusion that the human race is divided into two great classes, those who are vain and admit it, and liars. Yeah. <laughs> But I wonder just how Danny made his money. Oh, bought some kind of stock, I imagine, and got a lucky break. Well, it was about his turn to get a break. He didn't get many breaks around here. On his own since he was 15 years old, working at the garage at night so he could go to school in the daytime. Yes, I guess he's got the right stuff in him at that. I never paid much attention to him when he lived here. Just seemed to be an ordinary young fellow. Judy! Oh, hello, oh, Eloise. Oh, 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 Judy, I've got the most exciting news. Danny Barnes is back. Danny Barnes? Uh, who's Danny Barnes? Why, don't you remember? He left here about two years ago and went to New York. Well, what's so exciting about it? Well, well, nothing, only... Only he's come back to River's End. And Just to show off, more than likely. Don't you think so, Doc? Sure, he's probably got such a fat head he can't take his hat off. He hasn't. He called at our house last night. And did he take his hat off? Of course he took his hat off. I he... was just telling Judy about the get-up he's wearing. Looks like Mrs. Whatchamacallum's plush horse. That's all you know about it. His clothes are the latest New York style. Mm, everything for show. Yeah. Now, I bet his socks have holes in them. They have not. Why, Eloise, he didn't take his shoes off, too, did he? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Well, never mind, Eloise. We're only kidding you. Danny's a fine boy. We know how it is, Eloise. And we're all for him. Well, just the same, there are a lot of people around here who aren't. When he left River's End, they laughed at him. Said he'd be hitchhiking back. Now they're jealous because he's been successful. Oh, no, it is. Oh, but they did. You know they did. They made fun of him. Sure, but now everybody's just as glad about his success as you are. By this morning, a half a dozen people stopped me on the street and... Listen, I might be mistaken, but I... No, I couldn't be. There's nobody else in River's End who'd have the nerve to own an automobile horn like that. It's Danny. That's right. Local yokel comes home. Hello, Dr. Christian Howie. I'm fine, Danny. Just fine. You're looking pretty fine yourself. Well, as the steeplejack said when he hit the pavement, it's a hard world, but at last I've landed. Oh. Judy! Oh, hello, Danny. Welcome home. Say you look sweet enough to eat. Oh, I do eat. Three times a day. Oh, you're lucky. Lots of people are so hungry that if they don't get something to drink, they won't have any place to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you say the funniest things, Danny. Oh, I think nothing of it, kitten. Quick-witted Willie, they call me. Well, Dr. Christian, what's all the latest scandal around River's End? Oh, nothing much. Things are about the same. Well, tell us about yourself. I've been hearing all kinds of fine things about you. What have you been doing? Oh, one thing and another. Right now, I'm a director in a corporation whose product is pushed all over the world. Well, you don't say. What do they make? Baby buggies. Oh. <laughs> well, Dr. Christian, I just got in last night, and, well, there are a lot of people I want to say hello to. I'll see you again, huh? Yes, sure, and come in any time, Danny. Oh, how long are you going to be in town? Well, just over Christmas. I have to be back in New York by January 2nd for a director's meeting. Oh, did you drive out from New York? Mm-hmm. Uh, how was it? Did you find good meals along the road? No, nope, only in restaurants. Come on, kitten. Oh. I've got an extra seat in the car that'll just fit you. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye, Danny. Wait a minute. I almost forgot what I came in for. I'm giving a party for Danny Tuesday evening. For me? Well, say, gee, that, that swell of you, Eloise, but... 
Well, you don't have to do anything like that. I want to do it. And I want you all to come. Will you? Why, of course. Sure, sure thanks. To. I may be a little late, but I'll be there. Oh, that's swell. I'll see you all Tuesday. Come on, kitten. Say, Danny. Yeah? You didn't make your money pushing those baby buggies personally, did you? Oh, no. A fellow couldn't make any money that way. Our buggies are freewheeling. Ouch! <laughs> I guess Danny is in what they call an infant industry. <laughs> <laughs> Before we take you to Eloise's party, I have a word for the girls who like to set the pace. The smart hairdo this season is high and close to the head. Hair brushed off the face and upwards from the neck, even in back. And every lock ending in a sleek sculptured curl placed just right to emphasize the shape of your head or the line of your jaw or the set of your ear. That's all very well, I hear you say. But how do you keep it that way? Fortunately, we have the answer for you. When your hair is ready to be dressed, Brush a little Vaseline hair tonic on it, lock by lock. Then shape each curl and fasten it in place with a bobby pin. Vaseline hair tonic is an ideal dressing for this purpose. It is clear as crystal, completely colorless, and so can be used on blonde or white hair as successfully as on dark hair. Basically, however, you need to do more than use Vaseline hair tonic as a dressing. Give your scalp a thorough massage with the tonic at least once a week before your shampoo. Vaseline hair tonic comes in two sizes, priced at 40 and 70 cents. The 40 cent size will give you six to ten massages, as well as daily hair grooming, so you see how economical it is. Let us join the crowd at Eloise's party for the return hero, Danny Barnes. Yeah. Well, here I am, Judy. I hope I'm not late. Not too late, anyway. People are still coming. Yes, my goodness, it looks as if everybody in town is here tonight. Have you learned your speech? I think I know it. I've got it right here in my pocket, and I thought maybe there'd be time for you to run over it with me. Mm, that's a good idea. Let's go out in the hall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me have it. Let's see. Hmm. What did I do with it? Oh. Oh, I, I know I've got it here someplace. Oh, here. You just take it, and if I make a mistake, tell me. All right. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how does it start? Friends of... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, friends of River's End. I have been chosen this evening... This evening... Mm, uh, oh, uh, to present to Danny Barnes a little gift representing... A... Oh, hello, Dr. Christian. Enjoying yourself? Oh, hello, Louise. Yes, having a fine time. You haven't forgotten about... No, 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 I... I'll be there when the time comes. All right. I'll let you know when we're ready. Sure, that's what I thought. Uh, give me that start again, will you, Judy? Friends of River's End. That's right, End. that's right. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, friends of River's End. I've been chosen this evening to to present to Danny Barnes a little ah, gift. Quite a of... turnout in Danny's honor, eh, Doc? Yes, it's a, it's a little different from the old days. They're um, hanging on his words like the man on the flying trapeze. Now, come on, let's go outside and have a smoke. Oh, I'll be out within a little while, Roy. Okay, now, where was I? Just being chosen for the third time. Oh, yes, yes, sure. Uh, I have been... Oh, wait a minute. Here's Danny. Oh. Well, how does it feel to be important? Oh, this is nothing. Wait till I really hit my stride. By the time I'm 40 years old, I won't take my hat off for any man. <laughs> how will you get your hair cut? I won't. I'll be bald. Oh. <laughs> Why did you go back and settle down in River's End, eh? No, Dr. Christian, I don't think so. New York's my town. I love it. Oh, not that I've got anything against River's End. It's, it's a nice little place for a trip or something like that, but... But to live here? Nah. Nah, I'll never come back. There's nothing here to interest me. What about Eloise? Oh, well, Eloise is just a friend. Well, that's not her idea. If I remember, it wasn't yours either before you went away. Oh, Judy, now, Eloise is a swell kid, but... Well, well, there's some things I can't explain now, and i got to get back. Well, 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 good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Judge Coburn. Oh, hello, Judge. You remember Danny Barnes? Oh, to be sure, to be sure I do. And, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Barnes, I don't need to say that River's End is proud of you. Well, thank you. Oh, not at all, not at all. Uh, oh, uh, uh, 
Uh, I've been looking forward to asking you for a bit of advice. Now, as a man in touch with industrial and financial conditions, what is your opinion of Eureka Gas and Electric? Well, uh... In, in other words, if you were a man of modest means, would you consider a safe and profitable investment? Well, now, Judge... I'm going to give you a hot tip. Hmm? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, wait, wait a moment. Wait a moment. I'll, I'll just jot it down here. Uh, uh, Dr. Christian, have you a pencil? I have a fountain pen. A good one, too. Mm, thank you. Uh, yes, now, now... Buy uh, Cupid vending machine. Cupid vending machine? Well, uh, I never heard of it. Yes, what is it, Danny? It's something new and a sure winner. Now, look. Every day, thousands of people get married. To be married, you have to get a license, and to get a license, you have to go through a lot of red tape. And yes, yes, yes. With the Cupid vending machine, you simply put your money in a slot, push a lever, and out comes your marriage license. Hey, you've got something there. Well, it's the greatest invention in the world. You put your dollar in the machine and get a wife. Yeah, but it, but it isn't legal. Okay, then we'll just reverse it. You put your wife in the machine and get a dollar. You can't oh. lose. Oh, well, 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 well. <laughs> Dr. Christian, we're ready now. Everybody in the living room. Don't forget now, the minute Danny gets through, you make your speech. Where's the present? Louise has it. She'll bring it in. Ladies and gentlemen, you've all heard the expression about a prophet being without honor in his own country. Well, that isn't true, because we're here to honor one. Danny Bond. Danny! Well, in some ways, I might be a great prophet, but as a speaker, I'm a total loss. <laughs> Since I've been in town, I've been asked over and over again how it feels to be a success. Well, it feels great. It feels great because I've been able to prove to other people and to myself that I can put it over. And I'm going to go on keeping putting it over, too. When I go back to New York, I'm starting out to make $10 million in 10 years. And I'll get it. Thanks. <laughs> well, Danny, we hope you get the $10 million, but not the 10 years. <laughs> <clears throat> Friends of River's End, I have been chosen... Pardon me, just a moment. Well, what, what is it? What, what's the matter? This, this gentleman wants to see you, Danny. Are you Dan Bond? That's right. From New York? Yeah. Where'd you get that car you're driving? Why, I... I, I bought it, of course. Oh, you did, huh? I've seen some pretty dumb clucks, but you aren't even smart enough to change the license plates. What are you talking about? What's the matter with the car? Nothing the matter with the car. It's the guy who's driving it. He stole it from a parking lot in Yonkers. Stole it? Oh, I'm afraid you've got the wrong person. Why, this young man is a very successful broker on Wall Street. Broker on Wall Street? <laughs> That's one for the book. Hey, you know who this guy is? Now, wait a minute. Can't this be settled someplace else? I'll say it'll be settled someplace else. I've got a warrant for your arrest. <laughs> didn't do it. I know he didn't. Everybody knows he didn't. Then what do they keep him in jail for? Well, that's the way the law is. There's nothing to worry about. Dr. Christian went over to the county seat this morning to talk to the lawyers and see about putting up bail. But why does Dr. Christian have to put up the bail? Danny has plenty of money. Why, he's rich. Well, I don't understand very much about such things, Eloise, but I do know it's going to be all right. Besides, Dr. Christian is a good friend of Judge Coven's. That's bound to help a lot. Do you think Dr. Christian will be able to get Danny out? Oh, I feel pretty certain of it. But even if he doesn't, it's only a couple of days till the trial. Danny won't be there long. I went over to see him yesterday. You did? What did he say? Nothing. He hardly talked to me. Just sat there. When I asked him something, he'd answer, and that's about all. Judy, Danny's changed somehow. Well, you wouldn't expect him to be his old self under the circumstances. I don't mean that way. He's been different ever since he came back. I haven't noticed any difference. Oh, he isn't any different when he's with a crowd, having fun and making wisecracks. But when we're alone, well, he just doesn't act like he used to. How do you mean? Oh, I can't explain exactly, but he always seems as if he were anxious to get away from me. Oh, you're just imagining things. No, I'm not. The night before the party, he started to tell me something. And then all of a sudden, he changed his mind. I couldn't coax it out of him. Well, a man has a right to change his mind. I know, but... But I had a feeling he was going to tell me he'd met someone else. Someone he likes better. Oh, listen. If a man wrote to me every week for two years, I'd say he was still pretty interested. Judy, can you keep a secret? That's part of my business. I work in a doctor's office. Promise me you won't tell anyone? Not even Dr. Christian? Yes. 
Well, before Danny went away, he asked me to marry him. Of course, he was poor then, didn't have anything. That didn't make any difference to me, but it did to him. He asked me if I'd wait for him. He said he knew he'd make good and he'd come back for me and... Well, is that anything to worry about? No, but since he's been back, he hasn't said a thing about it. Oh, Judy, do you think he really intends to marry me? Well, uh, why don't you answer? Well, Eloise, that's a pretty hard thing to say. I don't know what's in Danny's mind. He seems very fond of you, but... I know. You feel the same way as I do when you're afraid to tell me. He doesn't care for me anymore. Oh, now, don't start crying again. Here comes somebody. I'm... I'm not going to cry. I haven't any more tears left. Well, back already? Dr. Christian, did you... I had a long talk with Annie and his lawyer and everything will be fixed up. So you can go to him this evening and be happy. Any calls, Judy? Uh, Roy Davis wants you to phone him. He'll be at the store until 5 o'clock. Dr. Christian, the day... Oh, my say... goodness, I've got to talk to Roy right away. I should have called him this morning. I forgot all about it. Uh, you want along, Louise, because I'm going to be busy for quite a little while. But I only want uh, Some to... other time, Louise. I've got something on my mind now, that, so... Uh, but you run along. Everything will be all right. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Eloise. Uh, goodbye, Eloise. Uh, oh, Judy, uh, get uh, Roy Davis on the phone right away. Yes. Never mind that call. What? I only wanted to get rid of her before she started asking questions. Oh, is it that bad? Yes, it's pretty bad. Daniel refuses to accept bail. Refuses? Why? Well, he won't say. He won't talk at all. I spent two hours with him and couldn't get a thing out of him. I had to get back then in time for the office hours. Well, I'll go and see him again tomorrow. But in two hours, he must have said something. Yes. He admitted he stole the car. What? Well, there was nothing much use to denying it. The owner of the car is here and identified it. There's no question about that. But I can't believe it. Well, there it is. They'll send him to prison. His lawyer believes that we can get him off with a light sentence. The only thing is the prosecuting attorney is trying to hook him up with a gang of car thieves. <gasps> Danny won't talk, won't deny it, even refuses to take the witness stand on his own behalf. Dr. Christian, do you suppose he could be a member of a gang? Ah, oh, no. How do we know what he's been doing in New York? Only through what he's told us, that he's been in Wall Street and, and they found out that isn't true. Then how did he get his money? How is he able to dress the way he does? I and don't know. I don't know. And why doesn't he talk? Maybe he's afraid to. Afraid of what the gang will do to him. Oh, he's not a gangster. Well, even if he isn't, how is he going to look to the jury? Yes, I know how it would look. It's an open and shut case for the prosecution right now. Armstrong will send him up for... Wait. What's the prosecutor's first name? Uh, Philip, isn't it? Philip Armstrong? Yes, that's it. Of course. He used to be a patient of mine. A long time ago when he lived here in River's End. Judy, look in the files. Get out the whole medical history of Philip Armstrong and his family. His, uh, his medical history? Yes, yes, hurry. I think I've got an idea. The next scene of our program takes place in Roy Davis' drugstore, where two girls have dropped in for hot chocolate. Mmm, good, isn't it? It would be if my lips weren't so chapped and sore I can hardly eat anything. Well, why don't you do something about it? The chapped lips, I mean. Well, honestly, the first cold wind that blows, my lips get so chapped that nothing seems to do any good. Vaseline camphor ice would help instantly. And it'll prevent chapping, too, if you use it before you go outdoors. Maybe I ought to get a stick while I'm in here. Why don't you? It costs only ten cents. I guess I will. And while I'm about it, I'll take home a tube of Vaseline jelly, too. Three days later, Jean and Marion meet on the street. It has been snowing off and on all week in River's End, and today the wind is blowing a gale. Hello, Jean. Hello. Gee, I nearly ran into you. <laughs> Some wind, isn't it? <laughs> but I'm not afraid of getting chapped lips anymore, thanks to your reminding me of Vaseline camphor ice. <laughs> We take you now to the old courtroom of River's End, where Danny Barnes is on trial for stealing an automobile. Court has just convened after the noon recess, and Dr. Christian is about to be called as a witness for the defense. 
<clears throat> you may resume, Mr. Armstrong. Yes, Your Honor. Call Dr. Christian. Dr. Paul Christian, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Uh, be seated, please. Now, uh, Dr. Christian, when you testified this morning, you said you knew the defendant, Daniel Bonds, rather well. That's right. For a period of about 15 years. Yes, sir. But during that time, have you ever known him to display criminal tendencies? Well, I... I wouldn't exactly call it a tendency. He only did it once and... Did what? Why, uh... Well, it, it hasn't anything to do with his automobile business. It happened a long time ago I'm and asking I... you what he did. Well, I'm, I'm sorry I mentioned it. I didn't mean Will to... Will you please answer the question? What did he do? He took some money from a bank. A bank? You mean he robbed a bank? Well, yes. What bank? Well, answer the question. What bank? His penny savings bank. He took the money to buy candy. <laughs> that, uh, that may seem very amusing. But has it ever occurred to you, Doctor, that a person who takes little things will also take big things? No, I... I hadn't thought about it. Well, it's true. A man who takes anything, little or big, is a thief. And on proper consideration, I think you'll admit he's a thief. Do you trust people who take little things? Yes, sir. Oh, you do? Who, for instance? Danny Barnes? No, Judge Colvin's there. The other night at the party, he took my fountain pen. Oh, oh, oh you, well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Paul. I, I forgot to return it. Uh, here, here. Thank you. Dr. Christian, you know, do you not, that the defendant, Danny Bonds, took an automobile? Well, I didn't see him take it. You're evading the question. Danny Bonds was found with an automobile in his possession, an automobile which plainly belonged to Mr. George Craig. The driver's license in the pocket of the car had Mr. Craig's name on it. Wouldn't you say Bonds had stolen the car? No. No, I don't think I would. Well, I certainly can't understand why not. Well, it's just like the time I called at your house when you were sick and asked for a spoon to give you some medicine. The spoon had the name Palace Hotel on it. Why? You're, you're but I wouldn't say that you stole it. No. That might have been your wife's maiden name. <laughs> Please. Please, Dr. Christian, confine your answers to yes or no. Yes, sir. Now then, did you ever know Danny Bonds to be a member of a gang? Well, I hardly want Was to... Was he ever a member of a gang, yes or no? Yes. A gang organized for the purpose of stealing... Well, I don't know what it was organized for, but, but they... they did steal, yes or no? Yes. What did they steal? Green apples. Uh, that was the same gang of boys your son belonged to. Uh, I treated them all for colic. <laughs> your Honor, Your Honor, will you please instruct the witness to refrain from making irrelevant remarks? Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Christian, uh, suppose you tell the court what you know about Danny Barnes in your own words. Thank you, Your Honor. Lots of times, appearances are deceiving. And it's been that way with Danny Barnes. Two years ago, Danny went to New York. Before he left, he bragged a little about all the money he was going to make there. Well, we all like to brag. When he got to New York, he found out that making money wasn't so easy after all. He found out something else, too. That he was homesick and terribly lonesome for a girl in Riversand. But after all his bragging, he was afraid to come back and admit he'd failed. Afraid he'd be laughed at. Nobody likes to be laughed at. So he stayed on, getting more and more homesick all the time. At the parking place where he worked, the man had stored a car for the window. Well, now if Danny could only take that car for just two weeks... He could go home, home for Christmas. He could go home and be back, and the man would never miss it. And he could make people believe that he was a success. So Danny did borrow it and bought some new clothes and came home for two weeks to see the people and the places his heart was sick for. Oh, of course he shouldn't have done it. But then all of us, all of us has been homesick and... Most of us have been in love. That's all, Your Honor.
We've acquitted him. He's free. Oh, Eloise. He's not going back. He's going to stay right here in River's End. Where's Dr. Christian? He's in his private office. Call him. Call him. Uh, Dr. Christian. Dr. Christian. Yes? Did you call? Oh, Eloise. What's the news? Oh, Dr. Christian, they've acquitted him. Of course, of course, I knew they would all the time. And especially after you looked up Mr. Armstrong's medical history. You did all right (laughs) with that. (laughs) Well, I saw my big opportunity. You know, I got cheated out of making a speech at the party. (laughs) And if you hadn't told them what really had happened... Oh, nonsense. I didn't have anything to do with it. Danny isn't a crook. They wouldn't have... Danny! Oh, Danny! Hello, kitten. Well, I I guess I sure made a fool out of myself. With all the people who have made fools out of themselves, you've suddenly dropped dead. It will be the end of the human race. Anyhow, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to face it. I'll work it out some way. Sure you will. You know, if I had a son your age, I wouldn't worry if he'd made a mistake. I'd worry if he didn't. (laughs) Because the chances are that he'd make a lot bigger one later. Oh, there's something I meant to ask you. Did you make any money at all in New York? Well, I... I might as well start telling the truth right now. Not much, Dr. Christian. No? Well, then here's a dollar. Oh, but I'm not that hard up. What's it for? Well, to drop into that Cupid vending machine you were talking about. Program starring Gene Hersholt, beloved screen actor in the role of Paul Christian, the doctor of River's End, are brought to you each Sunday afternoon at this hour to remind you that there is no more useful family of home remedies than Vaseline products. The most popular and widely used one is, of course, Vaseline Jelly, which is the family standby for first aid treatment of chapped, roughened skin, superficial cuts, burns, scalds, and other minor skin ailments. Keep a jar or tube handy at all times to enable you to avoid the delay in the treatment of minor wounds which invite infection. If the wound is penetrating, such as that caused by a nail, call the doctor at once. Vaseline jelly is 10 cents a jar anywhere in this country. And by the way, mention of prices on this program apply only to the United States. Next week, the Dr. Christian program will come to you from New York City when Gene Hersholt will bring you another absorbing half hour of human drama. Gene Hersholt appears on this program through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox. Arthur Gilmore speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Across the rugged Indian territory rides a tall young man on a mission of mercy. His medical bag strapped on one hip, his six-shooter on the other. This is Dr. Six-Gun. The National Broadcasting Company brings you another episode in the exciting adventure series... Dr. Six-Gun. Gray Madsen, M.D., was the gun-toting frontier doctor who roamed the length and breadth of the old Indian territory. Friend and physician to white and Indian alike, the symbol of justice and mercy in the lawless west of the 1870s, this legendary figure was known to all as Dr. Six-Gun. The town of Frenchman's Ford is a place of strangers. At almost any time of the year, there are more strangers on the streets and in the saloon than there are residents. Depending on the season, you can find cavalry troopers from the post to the west, 
cattle buyers from as far away as Abilene and even Chicago, cow punchers up from the long trail out of Texas, and even such strange fish as me. And who am I? <laughs> I am Pablo, the gypsy peddler. Uh, uh, and this is Midnight, my friend. Midnight, hello. He's uh, a raven, too. He's a stranger. Huh? I'll come back, wait. Huh? Shh. Landlord will hear us. <laughs> As you can see, he is an experienced traveler. Expert. Uh. <laughs> and so, a stranger riding into the town of Frenchman's Ford causes only mild interest and very few questions. I was sitting with my friend Doc Six Gun at his favorite table in the Bull Run Saloon one day. Doc was eating supper and I was drinking lunch as I had been on the road without time for refreshment. A stranger walked in. He stopped at the bar, ordered a drink, Spoke for a moment to O'Shea behind the bar and then uh, came over to our table. Evening, gentlemen. Good evening. I trust I'm not intruding. Why, no. What can I do for you? The gentleman behind the bar tells me you're a physician. That's right. Allow me to introduce myself. Captain Rafe Langdon. Oh, glad to meet, meet you, Mr. Langdon. I'm Gray Matson. Uh, Captain Langdon, if you don't mind. It's a small thing, but uh, I find it of great importance. Oh, I'm sorry, Captain. Uh, military title? That's right. Cavalry. I take it you're retired from active service. That's putting it mildly, Doctor. My commission is in the Army of the Confederate States of America. Oh. Well, we have a lot of men who have fought here in the territory, both sides, north and south. We get along mostly. Of course. Doctor, I wish to consult you on a professional matter, if I may. Of course, Captain Langdon. Uh, Pablo... By a strange coincidence, Doc, having finished my lunch, I must now ask Jose to pour my supper. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you later, Doc. Doctor, I presume you're acquainted with the treatment of gunshot wounds. That's one of the major parts of my practice, Captain. That and delivering babies. Well, I'm not likely to call in your services in that capacity. But as to the first, I require some treatment. You've got a bullet wound? I have. Well, maybe we'd better go over to my office. Excellent idea, Doctor. I'm afraid the stage ride from Chisholm City is not the best of health measures for a wound. Well, that ride isn't very healthy even if you're not carrying a bullet. Well, come on, Captain. We'll get over to my place and see what we can do. Uh, <coughs> well, now, that about does it, Captain. I'll just put the bandage on. It feels worse. Well, that's because of the probing. It'll get better now, unless inflammation sets in. How long have you been carrying that bullet around? Oh, about two weeks. Well, you should have had it looked at. You could have lost that arm. I had other matters to occupy my time. Hmm. Well, do you, uh, you want to keep this bullet, this souvenir? Not particularly, Doctor. I'm not sentimental. It's a funny one. I pull a lot of bullets out of men in this town, but, uh, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this before. It's round. Like an old-fashioned pistol ball. That's just what it is, Doctor. Uh, you're lucky. About a half an inch to one side, and it would have cracked a bone. I guess whoever shot you must have had some kind of old-fashioned gun and could aim well. On the contrary, the weapon was a finely balanced French dueling pistol. Quite accurate. Dueling pistol? How'd you happen to get shot with a dueling pistol? In a duel. Oh? What uh, happened to the other fellow? He's dead. I told you the weapons were quite accurate. In the hands of a competent marksman. I take it you're such a marksman. I think that's evident, Doctor. Otherwise, I'd be dead and you might be treating the other man. Well, that'll take care of the wound. If I were you, I'd give it a rest for a while. Stay in town for at least a week. I don't think that arm will take much more jolting. Not if you want it to last. It'll last long enough. But my plans are to stay in this vicinity in any case. Oh, figuring on settling in Frenchman's Ford? In a manner of speaking, yes. There is something here that I have to settle. Business, I expect. Not business, Doctor. Honor. Captain Rance Langdon stayed in Frenchman's Ford for the next several weeks. He took a room at the hotel above the livery stable and spent his days sitting quietly at the bull run, his arm resting in a silken kerchief, 
uh, drinking more or less consistently from a bottle that he himself brought to the saloon and placed behind the bar. And in the evenings he would sit at the table with Doc with his special bottle of bourbon and they would talk. Why, well, I agree with you, Doctor, completely. I find I can't sympathize with those who continue to fight the Battle of the Confederacy long after the war is over. Why, well, I'm a little surprised to hear you say that, Captain. Why? Well, for one thing, the way you still use your rank. Most of the men I've met who are still calling themselves Major or Colonel tend to die pretty hard. <laughs> Why, it wasn't but four months ago that a big mirror behind the bar got broken in Pickett's charge. Oh, regrettable, Doctor, uh, uh, regrettable. As for my using my military title, it's a point of honor with me. I consider my commission a distinction which I'm pleased to remember. It does not mean that I'm unaware that it's an empty title. I pride myself on being a sensible and civilized man, Doctor. I'm not a moth to go beating against the flame of a lost cause until I singe my wings. I wish there were more men here in the territory with that kind of sense, Captain. Uh, I've been meaning to ask you, Doctor... I had heard that there was an old acquaintance of mine living in the vicinity. A man from my home county. Oh, is that right? Uh, what's his name? Maybe I know him. I was hoping you might. Carver. Carver? Well, now, let's see. I, I knew no one or two Carvers. Uh, well, what's the name of your Carver? I don't know. You don't? You see, I, I've never met him. Actually, he's the son of an old acquaintance. I uh, was especially asked to look him up. About how old a fellow would he be? Oh, young man, probably about 25. Mm. Well, most of the fellows that age in these parts are about punching cows in one of the big spreads to the north. Uh, I ride circuit every now and again. If I run across a fellow named Carver who seems to fill your bill, I'll let you know. Do that, Doctor, if you will. I'm uh, quite anxious to meet him. Any particular message for me to give him if I see him? Oh, nothing in particular. You might just tell him that a Langdon is looking for him. One of the Langdons from Rance County. Captain Langdon continued to spend his time like a gentleman at the Bull Run, consuming his own good whiskey and paying O'Shea for the privilege. About a week later, Doc left to ride the circuit up through the Three Forks country, and I went with him to dispense ribbons and laces and needles in the wake of Doc's pills and bitter medicines. We had stopped at the circle, out past the Arroyo Grande, where a horse wrangler had lost an argument with a half-broken bronc, and while Doc set his leg, the rest of the hands stood around to watch. There, that'll hold you. Yeah, you're doing a good job on him, Doc. Well, I had to be careful when I set that leg. How do you mean, Doc? Why, if I'd set it straight, he'd be out of a job. Yeah? But don't worry, they're both as bow-legged as they ever were. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about all. Uh, unless one of you other fellas cares to oblige me by breaking something while I'm here to save me the trip. <laughs> you're a real car, Doc. <laughs> real funny. <laughs> hey, say, excuse me a minute, will you? I want to tell Cookie to rustle up a can of beans to take out to the night herd. Where's he riding? In the Box Canyon, up about a mile to north. We got a herd of strays penned in there, and he's uh, riding them out to the canyon. Well, I'm heading out that way. Why don't I take his grub out to him? Well, would you do that, Doc? It's real nice here. Who is it? Old Walleye Johnson? No. Old Walleye got himself killed last spring by a longhorn. Oh. And here's a new fella named Carver. Yeah, it comes from the south somewhere. So, oh, you little doggy, settle down for the night. Yo, ho. Hey, I got some grub. Hey, for hush you. now, stranger, hush. Unless uh, you want a herd of longhorns coming out at you. Uh, oh, oh, there. Take it easy, friend. I just got these little critters bedded down for the night. I've been singing them a sweet little lullaby that I made up myself. Now, don't you go riling them now. Sorry, I brought you out your grub. Here. Thank you kindly. Who are you, Mister? Doctor Matson. I just set Charlie Adams' leg. It's right kind of you, Doc, uh, to tote me out the vittle. Well, I wanted to see you. Your name's Carver, isn't it? That's right. Alvin Carver. Some call me Al, some call me Ben. 
Take your choice. And you're from Rance County? That's right. How'd you all know that? Why, I got a message for you. Is that right? I'm an old friend of yours. He's over at Frenchman's Ford now. He comes from your home county. Well, now, I ain't seen nobody from home for four years since I drifted up to these parts. Oh, look out, Doc. Hmm? Look out now. It's one old highbinder looking cross-eyed at me. So now, you little doggies, just settle down slow. Cause there ain't none of us got no place to go. <laughs> well, he, uh, he told me to tell you that he was looking for you. Said I should tell you that he was uh, a Langdon from Rance County. What? That's what he said. Uh, that's his name, Langdon. Rance Langdon. Uh, named after the county, I imagine. No, Doc. The county was named after him. Leastwise, after his granddaddy. You know him, then? No, I ain't never seen him. I wasn't but 16 when I left home, and he was gone then in the war. Oh. Well, anyway, he's looking for you. You know, Doc, beans don't hardly hold their heat at all no more. Carver, what's the matter? Doc, you want to do me a big favor? What is it? Suppose you just forget about bringing me this grub, huh? I don't follow you. Suppose you just forget about seeing me. I mean, when you talk to Rance Langdon. But why? <sighs> Look, Doc. I ain't one of those wild-eyed cowpokes that come up from Texas with their pants dragged down to their knees by two six-shooters. My job is taking care of them crazy longhorns. <laughs> Don't think I ever fired a gun in anger. Except maybe at a rattlesnake or some other vomits. I just plain ain't got the desire to go into no gunfights. Now... You may figure that's kind of cowardly of me. And likely you'd be right. But I just ain't got the guts for it. And I'm not ashamed of it. So you just don't bother telling Rance Langdon you saw me here. All right. But uh, I don't understand this. Doc, like I said, I ain't never laid eyes on him and he ain't on me. But if he does, sure as I'm sitting here eating cold beans, he's going to kill me. Oh, <laughs> later, Doc came back to Frenchman's Ford, leaving behind him a trail of newborn babies, splinted arms and legs, and bandaged wounds. As he sat at his table at the Bull Run, Captain Rance Langdon left the game of poker at the big round table and came over and joined him. Evening, Doctor. Oh, Captain Langdon. <laughs> Have a successful trip? More or less. I only lost one patient. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. One of the Peyton kids, that's Homestead family, about 40 miles from here. I, I couldn't understand it. I still don't know what it was. The child ran a fever, not too hot. Had some headache, complained of stiffness, and her back hurt. And then, just a little while later, she couldn't move. And, and she stopped breathing. Oh, wasn't anything I could give her. I just don't know what it was. Well, it's not the first patient I've lost, and won't be the last. You prefer him to die of something you can understand? I suppose that's it. Uh, Doc, do you recall the errand I asked you to do for me? Oh, uh, you mean, uh, uh, looking for that fellow, what was his name? Carver. Yeah, that's right. I don't suppose you ran across him. Why, no, no. Uh, it's a big territory. Well, you needn't bother about it anymore, Doctor. Oh? I found him. You yeah. have? He's working as a cowhand at the Circle A Ranch. Cook came in to load up supplies, stopped in for a drink here, and uh, mentioned Carver's name. You sure it's the right one? Funny thing. Cook said you'd been at the Circle A. Odd you didn't run into Carver. Well, maybe he was out on the range. Yes, yes, I suppose that's possible. Langdon, why are you looking for this Carver fellow? I told you. I've been asked to locate him. Yes, but why? Does it matter to you? Oh, I was uh, just wondering. By the way, Doctor, I expect to be leaving Frenchman's Ford tomorrow morning. I'd appreciate it if you'd give me your bill for services. All right, I'll do that. Uh, heading back east? Doctor, are you really interested? Look, Langdon, I didn't tell you the truth. I did see Carver. I gave him your message. He asked me not to tell you. He did? He said something else. He said he'd never seen you... And you'd never seen him. Why, that's correct. But that you would try to kill him. I will not try, Doctor. You mean, you will? That's right. But why? 
Has he ever done anything to you? No, I don't think you could say that he's ever done anything to me. Well, then why on earth would you want to kill him? Because I must. That is ridiculous. You'll permit me to be the judge of that. Captain Lang, if you kill a man, you'll have to answer to the law. Doctor, I've killed many men, and the law is yet to be interested in it. You mean during the war? That's different. Yes, during the war, but not solely. Do you recall, Doctor, that when I first met you, I had a bullet in my arm? Sure, a bullet from a dueling pistol. The man who put that bullet there, Doctor, was a carver. Harrison Carver, a cotton broker from New Orleans. Am I to understand that you've been traveling around the country with the sole purpose of murdering members of the Carver family? I've killed four of them. But that's incredible. Doctor, I don't know if you're acquainted with the importance placed upon matters of honor. I have seen some pretty touchy tempers here in Frenchman's Ford. It's not the same thing. Now, I don't feel inclined to go into it further, but don't attempt to get in my way, Doctor. Just as I'm an excellent marksman with a dueling pistol, I'm quite adequate with a modern six-shooter. Now, if you'll give me your bill, I'll see that it's paid before I leave. Good evening, Doctor. O'Shea. Oh, hi, Doc. Listen, my horse is beat. I've been on the circuit for two weeks. You still got that black stallion? You mean the one I took off that gambler from St. Louis for his bill? Yeah, I got him. Lend him to me, O'Shea. Well, sure, Doc, but what for? You just got in from the circuit. Uh, got an emergency case somewhere? I think so. If anybody wants me, they can send it to Circle A. I'll be riding there tonight. <laughs> Montana for to throw a hula hand. They feed in the pool. They wall. Hey, come, son. Carver, who's that? You trying to spook this herd? It's Dr. Matson. Oh, howdy, Doc. Somebody else break a leg? Carver, you better tell me all about it. Whatever it is between you and Rance Lang. He knows you're here. He's riding out tomorrow to find you. Well, I reckon there wasn't much chance of ducking him. Lesson I was just to cut out and run the first time I heard it from you. No well, chances I would catch up with me sooner or later anyway. What's this all about? I don't suppose there's nothing I can do about it now. It's a shame to hightail, though. Because this here's a good job on this spread. Twelve dollars a month ain't never had but ten before. But what's behind this? There must be some way to stop it. Doc, I reckon the only way to stop Rance Langdon coming after me is to sneak up behind him and put a bullet in his head. Like I say, Doc, I ain't got the stomach for it. Now, look here, Carver. I rode all the way out here to warn you, and I think you owe me some kind of an explanation. Why is Rance Langdon after you or any other Carver he can find? I reckon I wasn't the first. Doc, did he tell you who he got? Well, he mentioned a cotton broker in New Orleans. That'd be my pa's cousin, Harrison. He was a nice fellow, Cousin Harrison. He used to give us kids sugar sticks when he came to see us. But why? Doc, back in Rance County, there's always been the Langdon family, and along with them, the Rances. Between the two of them, I guess they was the county. Before the war, they owned every bit of it that wasn't just too poor and stony to grow cotton on. After the war, things began to change a little bit. Some of the families, like us carvers, moved down out of the back country. Before the war, carvers weren't no more account in Rance County than a, a mule in the Langdon Plantation. But I had an uncle started a business in Clayton. Uh, that's the county seat. He did real well. Reckon he made a lot of money. Basewise, after the war, he had enough money to buy a big piece of land from the Langdons. That's all they had. Land. Langdons didn't hold with the carvers. They'd sell them the land at a stiff price, but they didn't hold with it. But that isn't enough reason for a blood feud. There was a girl in the Langdon family. I don't even recollect her name. She took up with one of us cars. She ran away with him, and I... I reckon that started it. I don't see how. Well, I suppose you'd say the Langdons figured they'd been sullied. Anyways, Jarvis Langdon went after the carver that married the girl and killed him. Then one thing led to another. Then that's what started this feud? That's right. Old Jarvis, he swore he'd get every one of the carvers. I 
I reckon he passed it on to Rance on account of Jarvis got killed just before I left the county and come out here. How old were you when all this happened? When that girl went off with the Carver fellow, I reckon I was eight years old or something like that. And he's going to try to kill you for that? I reckon. That's incredible. It's barbarous. I've heard him talk about the, the foolishness of still fighting the war. He's a civilized man. Maybe. Anyways, he's a Langdon from Rance County. I suppose I might as well go in and draw my pay and hit the wind. No, 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 wait a minute. He shouldn't be allowed to run you off like that. Now, look, Carver, suppose you ride in the Frenchman's Ford with me. We'll go to the sheriff's office. Doc, I, I don't reckon I could do that. Well, what do you mean? We could have you protected, have Langdon arrested. He must be wanted in New Orleans for the murder there. I couldn't go to the law. Why not? Doc, I told you I ain't no gun hand. I ain't no cavalry officer, neither, nor a dueler or nothing. I'm just a cowpoke. But on the other hand, I'm from Rance County, too. My family ain't had no honor to speak of. They ain't but hardly had shoes or britches before 15, 20 years ago. But I ain't going to the law on a thing like this, no. I wouldn't give them Langdons the satisfaction. Oh, but you're as foolish as he is. What are you going to do? Just, just wait until he catches up with you and kills you so you can prove your family is as stupid and murderous as his? I reckon it's something like that, Doc. Well, I'm not going to let you. I'm going to swear out an information against Rance Langdon when I get back to town. I'll have the sheriff hold him, and the marshal at Chisholm City can telegraph New Orleans. I wouldn't do that, Doctor. Langdon! Don't move. The boat you make a fine target in the moonlight. I thought maybe you'd try something like this, Doctor, so I rode out tonight. Now, listen Doctor, to me, Langdon. you've already interfered too much with this matter. Now, please leave this to me. You can't gun this man down in cold blood. He hasn't done anything to you. Think, Langdon, think. You're an intelligent man. He was an eight-year-old boy when this whole thing started... What could he have to do with dishonoring anybody? Doctor, you don't understand this at all. The woman in question had no honor or reputation to speak of. She had lost it as thoroughly as possible some years before she married Carver. It's not her honor that's involved, but that of the family. The Langdons of Ranch County. Langdon, you're insane. Even the Apache Indians limit a blood feud to the guilty man. Shooting this boy down is murder. Oh, but I'm not going to do that, Doctor. Well, then, why... You don't understand, Doc. He wouldn't shoot me down this way. That's right. I'm no assassin. He'll have the same chance as I have. I brought along the dueling pistols. They're perfectly matched. You can have your choice of them, Carver. I don't reckon it'll make no never mind to me, Langdon. It's still murder. He doesn't know anything about these weapons, and you... you've used them. Get off your horse, Carver. Now, now you wait a minute, Mr. Langdon. You just wait a minute. Now, what are you going to do, Carver? Beg for mercy? I don't reckon so. I didn't figure to fight nobody. That's why I run off from Rance County. But as long as you brought it to me, I reckon I might as well take you up. Carver, you're crazy. Hold on, Doc. You don't understand. I know. I don't come from Rance County. Now, don't get the idea I'm thinking of any kind of family honor now, Doc. But just before I left the county, it was one of these high-minded, honorable Langdons who took my pa out of his bed in the middle of the night, and I never did see him again. At least why he's not alive. Langdon. All right, doctor. Throw down your gun belt. Langdon. Go ahead. All right. Now, dismount, Carver. Then I'll get down on foot. Just one thing, Langdon. You're challenging me, is that right? Yes. Then I reckon I get the choice of weapons. Is that right? All right. Here they are. Both pistols, primed and ready. Here, take your choice. Let me hold this one, Langdon. Look out with that, Carver. It's a hair trigger. That's all right, Langdon. You see? I got it pointed straight up to the moon. And if I fired it now, I, I couldn't hit nothing but empty air. Could Come I? on, Carver. You're wasting time. It's a mighty pretty moon, ain't it? Looks like I could hit it square if I pulled the trigger. Carver! Carver! Real comfortable, Doc. It's not a bad break. The arm will be good as new in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. 
One more thing. Yes, sir. You don't have to worry about Blinding anymore. The whole herd went over him. Yeah, I saw him go down. Doc. Hmm? Do you reckon it was all right? What do you mean? He was going to fight me with a pistol. And he knew how to use it. I didn't. Yeah. But I did have the choice of weapons. He couldn't complain none if I chose a weapon that I knew how to handle and he didn't. A herd of stampede and longhorns. I mean, Doc, I, I ain't no cavalry officer and I ain't no Langdon of Rance County. I'm just a cowpoke who knows his trade. But I wouldn't want to have done nothing without honor. I've been listening to Dr. Six Gun. Doc Six Gun is played by Carl Weber and Pablo by William Griffiths. Today's script was written by Ernest Kenoy. Heard in the cast were John Barragray as Captain Rance Langdon, Bob Hastings as Young Carver, and William Keene as O'Shea. Dr. Six Gun is directed by Fred Way. This is Bill Rippey speaking. Six Gun, starring Carl Weber as the Frontier Doctor, with William Griffiths as Pablo, the Wandering Gypsy, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. I Fly Anything, starring Dick Hames as air cargo pilot Captain Dockery Crane. Tower requesting landing instructions, please. Over. LaGuardia to 91743. You're number two to land. Visibility seven miles. Wind northwest 290 degrees, 20 miles. Altimeter setting 025. You'll be clear to land on runway 21. Is that you, Crane? That's me, Dockery Crane. What are you bringing into our fair city this time, Crane? Cabbages, kings, or crumbo? No, you're wrong all the way, Buster. I'm bringing in a dent in my rudder, a dram of drugs, and a date with death. You know me, I fly anything. Transcribe, the American Broadcasting Company presents Dick Hames as a fast-moving, hard-hitting, romantic air cargo pilot, Captain Dockery Crane in I Fly Anything. My name is Dockery Crane. And my business is the wild blue yonder business, the pickup and delivery business by air. You get yourself a crew, a hangar, a secretary, a teletype machine, a certificate from the CAB, and a great big pile of hope. And your motto is anything, anywhere, anytime, I fly anything. <laughs> I wasn't putting on a rover boy act when I told the tower I had a date with death. I would have preferred a date with a lively redhead. Who wouldn't? Except a guy already married to a redhead. 
But time was running out. Death is one date you shouldn't keep waiting around too long. Hey, June. June answered, will you? Doc, Curry, can't you see I'm busy? Where's Buzz, for heaven's sake? Well, he's checking the loading. Oh, come on, June. I gotta finish his flight plan. Well, step on it, oh. will you? Hello. Oh, yes, sir. Just a moment. Dockery, it's Mr. Vandermeer from the International Health Organization. He wants to know how soon we're taking off. Mm, 20 minutes. As soon as we're loaded. 20 minutes, sir. Yes, I'll tell him. He'll meet you at the plane, Doc. Well, well, I've got no room for him. This is an overseas flight. Look, I got a crew of seven, you and the cargo. I'm only flying a DC-4, not a trolley car. Take it easy, Lindbergh. He's only coming down to give you your official instructions. Oh, well, that's better. And besides, who said there was any difference between a DC-4 and a trolley car? Except a pair of wings. <laughs> you can say that again, June. At least a trolley car collects nickels and dimes for every trip it makes. We wouldn't even make that much for this hop. Hey, I thought we were all real happy to get a load that was important for once. And the heck with the dough. Yeah, the heck with the dough. That's the story of my life. Oh, the truth is, baby, this darn flight is so important, it's... It's got me a little scared whether I can pull it off or not. I guess when so many lives depend on you, it does scare a guy a little. Huh? A little? Look, June, I haven't been so scared since the time my mother caught me with a cookie jar. That's where my father kept his money. Is the cargo board, Buzz? Check. How about the crew? Board. Where's June, Doctor? Mm, filling a thermos bottle. She likes her coffee over the ocean. She's queer that way. Hey, you seen Vandermeer of the International Health Organization? He's supposed to be here for the takeoff. Now, hold your horses, baby. Here he comes now. Hello, Captain Crane. Hello, Mr. Simpson. We're ready, Mr. Vandermeer. Uh, stuff's aboard, sir. Good. Here are your official papers, Captain. Now, Dr. Hernando Carillo is in charge overseas, mm -hmm. and we'll turn the cargo over to him. I don't have to tell you how serious your mission is. I think we know, Mr. Vandermeer. Full cargo of chloromycetin isn't for laughs. I mean, there's a typhoid epidemic. And luckily, it's still restricted to the island of Mallorca. If it spreads to the Spanish mainland, it'd be a catastrophe. How long would the flight take you? Well, if June doesn't take all night getting that coffee, we should get to Lisbon, Portugal in the morning. Refuel, and then it's just a short hop to the island of Mallorca. Well, here's the coffee. What are we waiting for? You. What'd you have to do? Go to Brazil for it? <laughs> Up you go, lady. First stop, Lisbon. Come on, Mr. Vandermeer. Yes. I'm going up front, Doc. So long, Mr. Vandermeer. Goodbye, you two. Have a good flight. Well, is there anything else, Mr. Vandermeer? No crane, no farewell speeches. Just get there. It's important. Don't worry about it. If there's any way to set a plane down on Bayorca, you know me. Anywhere, anytime, I fly anything. I keep telling myself. <laughs> Emergency flight 91743 USA. Emergency flight USA calling Lisbon, Portugal. Approaching at 4,000 feet from northwest. Landing instructions, please. Over. Lisbon to emergency flight. Lisbon to emergency flight. Come in, USA. Come in. Landing instructions, please. Requesting landing instructions. Over. This is Lisbon. This is Lisbon. Storm warning. Storm warning. Clearing fail for you. Prepare for emergency landing. Rain squad, prepare for emergency landing. Lisbon Tower. This is Air France, flight three. I'm in trouble. Can't see. Lost the field. Over. Lisbon Tower to Air France, flight three. Fly east at 3,000. We will give you compass reading in five minutes. Say, listen, are you the guy who says I can't take off a Bayorca? Captain Crane, can't you see what's happening? You almost didn't make the landing yourself. No. The wind has risen. Two planes overturned right here on the field. Emergency calls are coming in from all over the area. I cannot let you pull out of here for Bayorca. You'll never make it. Look, what do you think this is? A $5 an hour sightseeing bus I'm flying? There's an epidemic on Bayorca. My plane is loaded with four on my seat, and those people are dying. You don't have to lecture me. I know people are dying on Bellorca. My own mother and father live on that island. Your crew is willing to take the risk? Yes. Just pray the emergency landing lights are still working on Bellorca, Capitan. Good luck. <laughs> Uh, 
How long has he been circling overhead, Bianca? Almost ten minutes now, Dr. Carillo. A young man with courage, that Captain Crane. He should have stayed in Lisbon until after the storm. It's madness for him to try landing here in Bellocca. Oh, if only they can get the landing lights working in time. It's pitch black. Uh, Bianca, those two men coming this way, do you know them? Those two men? Uh, no, no, Dr. Carillo. Excuse me, I, I know you are waiting for the plane, but are you Dr. Carillo? Yes. Oh, but... I am so glad, Doctor. We heard you were coming to the island. What can I do for you? My my friend here, his wife, she has come down with typhoid fever. How long ago? Several hours. He brought her down here in his car. We heard you were... Uh, Take me right. to your car. Bianca, when Captain Crane lands, tell him I'll be back in a moment. All right. This way, Dr. Carillo, that black car over there. <laughs> Now, I'm sure you both want to get some sleep. Uh, besides, the funicula is already loaded and it's being held for myself and Bianca here. I do not like to keep the funicula waiting the too what? long. The funicula? Haven't you ever heard of it? Oh, what? sure, sure. There's an Italian song we used to sing when we were kids. Funicula, oh. funicula. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that got to do Very with the... Very simply. A funicula is a little car or bus suspended from wires. That's the only way to get up to the village on top of the mountain. Well, what do you know? I, I think we had better go now, um, uh, Captain Crane, I wish we could thank you in some way. Well, there is something. Uh, yes. I'd, I'd like to ride up in the funicular with you. I want to take a look at what's happening up in the village. I'd hate to go back without at least one look at the sick people. Of course you must come up and see the hospital. But, Dr. Carillo, you have not forgotten the poor man we have to take up to the hospital with us. What happened to the guy? Typhoid? Uh, no, 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 no. It, it was uh, an accident. Badly burned. He is all bandaged up and waiting in that car you saw outside. But first, Captain Crane, I must inoculate you against the fever. And then we will all go up together. Well, Buzz went back to the ship and I to the trolley on wires. The ride in the long black car to the funicular wasn't much fun. The guy in the bandages right up to his nose must have been unconscious. But once we got inside the funicular, I took a second look at Bianca. Funny. Somebody must have heard me say I'd prefer a date with a redhead instead of with death. But I hit the jackpot, because here I was sitting next to a redhead and heading up the mountain to a whole village of death. You have never ridden in a funicular, Capitan? No. Certainly not with anyone like you. The closest I ever got to a funicular was a ride on the shoot to shoots in a place called Coney Island. <laughs> you know, they tell me American men are very aggressive, Capitan. Is that true? Well, um, first let me ask you a question. Are you related in any way to Dr. Carillo? Related? Well, I mean, uh, are you his wife, sister, sweetheart, cousin, maybe? No, just as a sister. In that case, how aggressive do you like your American men, Bianca? <laughs> I think you have answered my question. You don't have to... Uh, 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 Dr. Carillo, the, the man in the bandages... Uh, go on with your conversation with Captain Crane. I will tend to our friend in the bandages. The minute we reached the chateau being used for a hospital, I forgot about Bianca. Forgot about being tired, forgot about everything, except how glad I was that a couple of guys named the Wright Brothers had invented airplanes and that a guy like me had learned to fly one. And the fellow who made me feel that way especially was a male nurse, the only professional in the place until Dr. Carillo walked in. Dr. Carillo, Bianca, you don't know how glad I am to see you, how badly you are needed here. 
And you, you must be Captain Crane. Yes, I am. Captain, do you have any idea what typhoid fever does to people? The way it races to a town like fire, like a terrible fire. And you brought help. Chloromycetin, at risk to yourself. Every one of these people would remember you, Captain. Carl, some of the chloromycetin was sent up here the moment the plane landed. You have given injections? Yes, Dr. Carillo. The moment it arrived. Most of them have had some care. Most of them are asleep. I see. And now, Carl, tell me about my daughter. I'm afraid she's not too well, Dr. Carillo. The fever is high. Uh, Your daughter, Dr. Carillo? This morning, after working without sleep all night, she came down. I would like to see her, Carl. Here she is, Doctor. Her chart, Carl. Fever. Mm. Pulse. I see. She had a shot of the new chloromycetin just a little while ago. Yes, yes, of course. Shall I wake her, Dr. Carillo? No, 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 no. Let her sleep. The poor child needs all she can get. There, you see? We have awakened her. Dr. Carillo, she... Dr. Carillo? My my father? Where where are you, father? Right right here, dear. Right here beside you. Oh, Oh, no. No, you... You are not my father. Father? Where are you? There, there, there. You are feverish, dear. I'm afraid. Please... Please, someone, please. Dolores, try to control yourself. Of course, this is your father. Would I lie to you? No. No. You are Bianca? Yes. Bianca, I know you. But him? He's not my father. Dolores, Dolores, Uh, Carl tells me your fever has risen. uh, Now, you be a good girl. I will give you a sedative. You'll get your sleep. No. No, I won't let you... You are an imposter. Dolores, it is all right. Mm. If you don't want your father to give you a sedative, no, I will... Please, please, somebody. My father, he was supposed to meet an airplane from America. Yes, yes, that is it. He, he was supposed to meet a Captain Crane. What did you do with him? Dolores, I, I'm Dockery Crane. Dolores, this is your father. He met me at the field. Those people wouldn't lie to you. Bianca, I think you'd better show Captain Crane to a room for the night. I will stay here a while with the No, no, please, Captain Crane. Don't leave me. Captain, I am sorry to expose you to this, but fever is a terrible thing. Good night, Dolores. No. Uh, you get get a good rest, and I'll see you in the morning. I hit the bed and caved in like an empty sack. But I couldn't sleep. I couldn't even shut my eyes. I hadn't even thought of counting sheep when... I heard my door opening slowly. I saw the figure come staggering toward me. And for a second, I was sure the fever had gotten me. Then I jumped out of bed and caught her just as she was about to keel over. Get the captain to cry. Dolores. Dolores, you're a sick girl. What are you doing here? Captain Crane. Here, here, let me put this blanket around you. Captain Crane, don't, don't say a word. I don't have much time, and you must believe me. The man you met is not my father. There is something wrong. I, I know I'm ill, but please, please believe me. Ask him, ask him my mother's maiden name. Ask him where she was born. That will prove I'm right. If he is my father, he would know my mother's maiden name and where she was born. Please, please. All right, all right, Dolores. I will, I will. But now you must get back to bed. You're sick. And my mother's name was a bonnet. She was born in Geneva. Ask him, ask him. But why? Why should anyone want to impersonate your father? For what? The the drugs. Maybe for the drugs. I don't know. I can't tell you, but... Everything here since the war, everything here has different value. Chloro, chloro my seat and brings a great price on the black market. Maybe, 
Maybe. But, but what would they have done with your father? If what you're saying is true, where's your father, your real father? I was hoping you might know. Maybe they hurt him. Maybe they brought him here as prisoner. The man in the bandages. Oh, what, what man? Captain Crane, what man in bandages? Captain Crane. Thank heavens I found you, darling. Captain Crane, you should have called me immediately. In a case like this, overexertion may be very serious. Bianca, take take her back. Come on, dear. I'll help you back to your bed. Yes. Yes, I, I will go now. Dr. Carrillo? Yes, Crane. Doctor, this whole thing, I'm not used to being so close to an epidemic. Would you like a sedative, Crane? It would put you to sleep. That wasn't what I had in mind. Dr. Carrillo, Dolores asked me to put some questions to you. I think I owe it to her, sick as she is. I hope you don't take offense. Yeah, I'm used to feverish patients, Craig. Doctor, what was your wife's maiden name? Her maiden name was Ibanez. And she was born in Geneva. And I loved her very much. You know, Crane, if you don't get some rest, you might suddenly come down with typhoid. I stood there in the middle of my empty room feeling like a jackass who just tried to pass himself off as a racehorse at Hialeah. Nobody likes to be taken for a sucker, least of all yours truly. And Dolores had kicked my pride right in the seat of its pants. She'd said something about the chloromyce seat in the black market. She'd hinted that I'd gone to all this trouble just to be played for a patsy. I couldn't take that idea of beating my brains out all the way back to the States. I opened the door to the hallway slowly and shut it fast. Maybe I was wrong, but I could have sworn Carl had ducked behind the statue in the hall the minute he saw my door opening. There was a ledge about a foot wide outside my window. It'd probably lead to another window down the building. I knew I'd have to take the ledge if I wanted to check Dolores' story. I wanted to find the man in the bandages, the man who might be the real Dr. Carrillo. I'd gotten off the ledge into the main room of the place without being seen. There was nobody around except typhoid patients. Most of them were asleep. Some were moaning. At the back of the building was a narrow staircase, probably used by the servants in the chateau a long time ago. I was about halfway up, my head on a level with the upstairs floor when I stopped. Bianca and Carla just come out of one of the rooms. What do you think, Bianca? I don't like it. But if that's the way it has to be, well... How will we get rid of him? Have him buried with the rest of the epidemic victims. The bodies are quarantined. Nobody will know. As soon as they were gone... I got to the door of the room they just left. It was dark. Pitch black. The shades were drawn. I don't think I'd have seen him except for the white bandages. Uh, who are you? Uh, I've got to find out who you are. Go away. Please. Leave me alone. Look, whoever you are, you've got to listen to me. I'm Dockery Crane. I'm Captain Crane. I flew the ship in tonight with a claw on my seat. You're lying. You're a thief. And the murderer of sick people like the others. Go away. Please, please. This is to help you. You've got to tell me. Are you Dr. Carrillo? Uh, um, am I Dr. Carrillo? I, I don't know myself any longer. Tell me. Am I Dr. Carrillo? Look, I'll prove to you I'm not lying. Dolores came to me earlier. She tried to make me believe that something was wrong. That the man posing as Dr. Carrillo wasn't her father. Now, is there? Yes. You fool. Can't you see what they've done? And they lied to me about the sick woman in the car. And then... And then, then you are the real Dr. Carrillo. Yes, yes. What have they done to Dolores? What have they done to her? I'll help her whatever way I can. I promise you that. I think that Bianca and Carl, my own assistants, to think that they would do this just for money. To rob the sick for their own profit. What lost soul? How, Dr. Carrillo? How are they doing this? What does it have to do with the chloromycetin? Look, I almost killed myself on seven other men flying the stuff in here. Carl, 
Carl is supposed to prepare the drug. Instead, they steal it and sell it. Listen, listen. Listen to me, Dr. Carillo. My friends are down at the landing field. I have a crew of seven men. I'll get to Captain them and then... I'll... Craig, did you not learn as a child not to disobey doctors' orders? Why, you I big warned bo- you that if you did not get some rest, you might come down with typhoid. And I'm afraid that I was right. <laughs> Carl, give me a hand, quick. When I came to, it wasn't a bump on my head that bothered me. I had bumps before. It was the fever and chills running through me in the spot on my arm where the phony doctor must have injected me with typhoid germs instead of antitoxin. By the sounds around me, I could tell I was on the main floor, but in a room by myself. I got out of bed and fell flat on my face, but somehow I made it to the door. Nobody around. Maybe they hadn't expected me to come too so fast. I sized up the big room full of fever patients and picked out a big guy who didn't look as sick as the rest. Are, are you asleep? No. A fever, I, I can't sleep. Look, look at me. Do you recognize my face? Of course. I will always remember it. Huh? Earlier tonight when you came in with Dr. Carillo... You are the American pilot. Thank you. I think I don't have much time. I need your help. The man I came in with is not Dr. Carillo. What? Don't talk. Listen. Listen. He's a black marketeer. Stealing the drugs I brought from America. The real Dr. Carillo is a prisoner upstairs. I need your help. They've given me the fever. Is this really true? Yes, I swear it. But... But what, what can we do? Any one of us alone doesn't stand a chance. But if somehow we could spread the word among all the men in this place. We're half dead, but we're also half alive. My wife, she's from the village. She is a cleaning woman here. Yeah. When she stops by my bed, I will have her spread the truth. Yes, yes. My husband told me, and the American told him... Spread the word. Pedro's wife, yes. The American told them, spread the word. You must. You must. I know you are weak. We are all weak. But together we are stronger than they are. All of us, dear. All of us. Tell the American. We are ready. We are ready. Eighty, a hundred. I don't know how many are here. My my wife is a good woman. They're waiting for you. Good. Tell her. To you are very sick. So is so is everyone else here. We'll get well together. Not at all. So tell your wife. In a half an hour, all of us, everybody, into the main office. about that. Been in a coma for 24 hours and all that's on his mind is a payload. June. Buzz. Hey, relax, sonny boy. It's 24 hours since you stormed the Bastille. June, what? How? Yeah, yeah, you're half dead, but you want to know, did I get a return payload in Barcelona? How did you know? Because I know you well enough to know it's not my great, big, beautiful pair of eyes you're interested in. Why, June? How could you say a thing like that? (laughs) You know, I'm always interested in a great, big, beautiful pair of eyes. Yeah. 
Well, your dreams are coming true, lover boy. You got a payload back of 12 of the most beautiful pairs of eyes you've ever seen in your life. No kidding. Man, oh man. A dozen Spanish dancers, maybe, huh? A dozen Spanish cows, Captain Crane. Oh, well, one thing's sure. If we run into bad weather going back, we'll have the best darn milkshakes you've ever seen. You have been listening to The Fifth in a new series starring Dick Hames as air cargo pilot Dockery Crane in I Fly Anything, with George Fenneman as Buzz and Georgia Ellis as June. And there goes the teletype with next week's cargo load. Doc, an urgent on the teletype. A man by the name of Brad Barton wants to know if you'll fly up to the timber country of northern Minnesota and pick up a passenger. A passenger I can pick up on any street corner. Yes, but for this one, you'll get $15,000. For fifteen thousand dollars, I'd even be the passenger. <laughs> Tell him, sure, anything, anytime, anywhere, I fly anything. I fly anything. Starring Dick Hames was produced by Frank Cooper and Cy Fisher in association with the American Broadcasting Company. The script was by Abe Guinness and Arnold Pearl. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. This transcribed program was directed by Dwight Hauser. This is Lou Cook speaking. This program has come to you from Hollywood. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Many an exciting case crosses the desk of our detective friend, Mike Shane. Right now, there's something special on that desk. Bending over it are Mike, his assistant, Phyllis Knight, and Inspector Faraday. Shh, watch. Mike frowns grimly. Then slowly, carefully, he turns the next page of Lear magazine. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Mike, where did they get that picture of you? Oh, no. A day from the life of Mike Shane, San Francisco's sophisticated sleuth. Oh, anything for a story. If they were going to write about me, why didn't they interview what me? What are you kicking about? It's publicity. That super sleuth, that maestro of the clue, oh. that glamour boy of detectives. Yeah. Hey, hey, here's a picture of both of us. Hmm. Handsome detective inspects scene of society murder. Oh. The willowy damsel on his left is Mike's current heart in... Hey, current... I like that. Sure, sure. It seems Mike is a wizard with the ladies. But read all about it on page seven. I'm packing my bags and heading for the mountains. <laughs> Spare the suitcase. This may be a client. Oh. Hello? Yes, this is his secretary. I'm sorry, he's busy right now. Who is it? Oh? Oh, yes, mm. yes. When? Who is it? Shh. Tonight. 7.30. Well, I'm sure he'd be delighted to come. Honey, honey, yes. I'd be delighted to what? what? Shh. Certainly. Certainly I'll tell him. Thank you very much, Miss Melton. Goodbye. Now what have you got me into? Your magazine story is paying dividends already, Mr. Shane. You and I are going to attend one of the exclusive parties of Miss Sherry Melton. Oh, no, not that sob, sister. But, of course, she gives such different parties. And her newspaper column, why, she might write you up, too. Yeah, well, I can skip that. <laughs> Kids, I don't like this setup. I don't like it at all. You can say that again. No, Mike, you don't understand. I'm invited to the same party. You? Huh? Yeah, she called me up. I told her I liked parties, but being inspector of homicide, I never know about my evenings. Then she said I had to come because she was going to recreate a murder. Oh, one of those things. Mike, I'm leery of this sort of stuff. Something always goes wrong. What do you mean? It seems someone always gets hurt. Well, but why is she doing it? What's her reason? What goes? Not what, darling. Who goes? And the answer? We do. You know, 
know something? This is a real party, and it's oh. such an attractive house. Don't you think so, huh? Uh, my collar's too tight. I, <laughs> I told you I can't wear a tuxedo. I feel like a pallbearer. Ah, like... Mr. Shea. Uh -oh. Why, you're much handsomer than in that magazine. <laughs> you should wear a tuxedo on every case. <laughs> uh, Miss Melton, this is my... Uh... <clears throat> well, this is Miss Phyllis Knight. How do you do, Miss Phyllis? Oh, yes, yes. Well, come on into the lounge. I want you to meet everybody. <laughs> you know, uh, the party tonight is just a mad inspiration. The other day, I was having lunch with Freddie. Oh, you know Freddie, the senator from Kansas or uh, Florida or someplace. And, and I said, darling, I'm going to give a party and... Oh, wait, here, here's a man I want you to meet. Uh, Sherwood. Yes, my little butterball. Uh, Miss Knight, this is Sherwood Armstrong. Oh, the mystery story writer. How do you do? <laughs> Rather bored up to this moment, but now I see possibility. Uh, 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 Sherwood, <laughs> before you ask her out onto the balcony to talk over her story ideas, you better check with Mr. Shane here. <laughs> I'm glad to know you, Mr. Armstrong. Wish I could say the same, sir. I've always admired your ability, and now you're... Good taste. Oh, in, uh... go away with you, you wretch. <laughs> I want these people to meet somebody really important. Well, I'll be back. Oh, uh, there's our man, the one with the big glasses and bushy hair. Hmm? Uh, Dr. Kaler. Yes? Dr. Kaler, Michael Shane and Miss Phyllis Knight. How do you do? How do you do, How do, you do, do Mr. Shane? Uh, Dr. Kaler studied psychology in Vienna, and he writes all those fascinating books on dreams and why people commit murder. Oh, Miss Melton, please. Of course, we've all heard of you, Doctor. One of our best criminologists. Mike, you must read some of his books. Mm, yes, I must. Uh, Sherry, oh, Sherry, uh, may I see you a moment, please? Oh, Ray, I almost forgot you. Uh, Ray and I used to work on the same newspaper in Chicago. Uh, look, darling, I want you to meet a publisher. Dr. Kaler, I'd love to read some of your books. You must tell me which one to start on first. You are very kind, madam, but I'm afraid you would find them very technical and perhaps dull. Oh, no, no. If I can't understand what you mean, I'll ask Mike to explain it to me. He's a wonderful student, you know. You should see his library. You oh, really should, Doctor. Huh? He's got a complete file of Esquire. Faraday. Well, I was wondering where you were. Oh, oh get you. Tuxedo and patent leather shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, Doctor, how are you coming with that next book? Very well indeed, thank you. Well, then you two know each oh, other. Oh, sure. Huh? Dr. Kaler's helped me out with several cases. Now, jealous, are you? Oh, of course I'm not. Hey, wait a minute. Miss Melton's trying to say something. We are now going to have a buffet supper. <laughs> After that, I have a surprise for you. I won't tell you what it is, but I'll give you a hint. It's murder. <laughs> Quiet, everybody. Quiet, please. I brought all of you upstairs to this bedroom because we're going to play a game. Oh, I don't care what Faraday says, Mike. This is going to be fun, huh? Now, I mm. want four of my guests to pay particular attention. Inspector Faraday. Yes. Mr. Shane. Yes. Dr. Kaler. I'm ready. And Sherwood Armstrong. <laughs> uh, Sherwood, will you look around this room and tell us what you see? <laughs> Besides people. Well, yeah, uh, a double bed. Mm -hmm. right. Nightstand. Mm -hmm. Telephone. Mm -hmm. Two chairs and a bureau. <laughs> yes. Well. Does uh, does anything about it look familiar to you? No. How about you, Dr. Taylor? It's a complete mystery. Inspector Faraday? Well, the arrangement and spacing of furniture does look familiar to me. Reminds me of the bedroom of a man who was recently murdered. You're right, Inspector. The bedroom of John Hines. Yes. Oh, oh yes, yes. I've arranged everything to duplicate his bedroom. And tonight, we're going to reenact the murder. Mike, that killing's never been solved. As you all know, I like to give unique parties. So I've invited four famous crime experts here tonight to give us their own solutions of this unsolved mystery. Mr. Shane, do you know the details of the case? Well, fairly well. It, uh, it happened about two months ago. John Himes was a rich old miser. He was found shot to death in his bedroom with the doors and windows locked from the inside. The only suspect was his secretary, and uh, he had a watertight alibi. Is that right, Inspector? It is. All right. Now, you, Dr. Taylor, will be John Hines. Oh. Uh, lie down on the bed, please. But, 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 <laughs> dear, oh, Melvin, now, I... hurry up, hurry up. Don't be so shy, oh, Doctor. All right. <laughs> and, and you, Sherwood, you will be the killer. Oh. Stand outside the door till we call you. <laughs> this is very exciting. Yes. Now, as Inspector Faraday tells us what happened that night... Dr. Kaler and Sherwood will, wa will act it out for us. Now, if you please, Inspector. Well, it's about midnight. John Hines is in bed, probably asleep. 
Doors and windows are locked. Somebody comes to his hall door. All right, Sherwood. Hines thinks it's his secretary. He gets out of bed, goes to the door. He unlocks and opens it. The killer enters. At first, there's no struggle, no outcry. Oh, careful, Dr. Kaler. Hmm? Put on your glasses. You can't see where you're going. Of course not, madam. Neither could Mr. Himes. If he had worn his glasses, he would have seen it was not his secretary. Correct, doctor. The killer advances into the room, demands the old man hand over the cash he has hidden in the house. The old fellow refuses. The killer insists. He raises his gun and then... <laughs> what Mike! A... Mike! <laughs> We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane and Phyllis Knight in just a moment. Simply because your automobile engine is rated at a certain horsepower doesn't mean it's delivering that rate. Worn or burned out spark plugs, for example, can actually cut down the horsepower of your engine even at full throttle. You see, high compression engines demand complete instant firing. If any of your spark plugs are worn or improperly adjusted you get a weak, sputtering fire which fails to ignite all the gasoline. So serious is this loss that engineering tests prove faulty spark plugs can waste one tankful of gasoline out of every ten. So, friends, if you're not absolutely certain your spark plugs are firing properly, why not play safe and have your Union Oil Minute Man check them? The performance of each separate plug is accurately measured on a scientific tester, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minute Man will clean and adjust them to the proper setting. If they're burned or worn out, he can furnish you with a new set. Union Oil Spark Plug Service takes but a few minutes and costs but a few cents, a cost you'll soon save in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minute Man ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. And remember, next Monday night, Michael Shane comes to you one half hour earlier, 8 o'clock instead of 8.30. An unsolved murder is being reenacted at Sherry Melton's society party. Suddenly, at the very climax of the scene... Mike! Mike! Everybody stay where you are! Who fired that shot? Armstrong did. He had the gun. I saw him. Don't be ridiculous, Ray. I was just faking a gun with my pipe. Please, is anyone hurt? Oh, no, no, only your dignities. Four famous crime experts, and they don't know a fake gunshot from the real thing. What? You mean yes, it was a phony? Of course. I slapped this yardstick here on the bed pillow. Oh, oh for heaven's sake. Very say. amusing. A perfect example of mass psychology and suggestion. Now let's get on with the crime. You've been shot, Dr. Kaler. So stretch out on the floor. Yes, perhaps like this beside the bed. Oh, that's perfect. You make a very convincing corpse, Doctor. <laughs> and now, Inspector, if you'll just go on. Well, there's nothing more to tell. The killer didn't find the money he was after, so he slipped out of the house again. A perfect crime, eh? Well, if the police couldn't solve it, I can. Are you all right? Right? Oh, at least I will in my next book. Oh. Oh. That's where a writer has it all over. The oh, we'll solve it, Mr. Armstrong. In fact, just this evening, I got a fresh angle on the case which I can't tell anyone yet. Wow. That means a neat headline. Sherry Melton's party gives police answer to a puzzling murder. Oh, always the news, Hawk Ray. But meanwhile, let's play my game. Hmm? You four masterminds have 30 minutes to solve the mystery. You're each to go to a different room so you can't compare notes. In 30 minutes, we'll vote who has the most exciting solution. And the prize? Champagne, of course. <laughs> Up, Mike, we've got just ten minutes to oh, go. Oh, honey, of all the dimwit stunts, this is it. Come on, come We on. can spend all night dreaming up solutions, but none of them will be right. Crimes aren't solved by slapstick. It's just a game. Oh. Think up something really dramatic. I want you to be brilliant tonight, Mike. We've got a famous criminologist and a mystery story writer. Show them what we can do. Oh, we? <laughs> what was that? Mike, huh? what was that? Sounded like outside. Come on, come yeah. on. Mike, it's an accident or something outdoors. Let's go. I'm coming, too. Well, it can't be an auto smash-up. There's nothing on the street. Oh, it sounded closer to the house. Anyway, maybe here on the ground. 
can I help, gentlemen? I don't know, Doctor. We've got to search the garden. i got a flashlight in my car. So have I, Inspector. I'll get it. Okay, so let's spread out. Search both sides of the house. Right, I'll take the left wing here. No, no, Angel, not you. Look. But, Mike, I want to. No, no, you're not going to prowl around through bushes in the dark. Now, go on, go on, beat oh, it. All right, you old worrywart. Who's that? Answer me. Who is it? An elk looking for his lodge. Oh, Faraday. Well, did you find anything on your side? Nah, too dark. Ray was supposed to bring me his flashlight. I got tired of waiting. Well, come on. Let's go get our own flashlights. Mike? Inspector? Where are you? Coming, coming. Maybe we're just chasing our own tails. This is another one of that woman's party gags. It isn't. It isn't, Faraday. Huh? What I just found doesn't belong at any party. Found what? On the running board of Faraday's car. A dead body. Stand back, everybody. We can't see what we're doing. Hmm. Looks like he was knocked out first and then strangled with his own tie. Oh, but who would want to kill Ray and why? And what was he doing on my running board? He said he was going to get the flashlight from his car. Well, that's fairly simple, Inspector. Miss Melton says that's his sedan right behind yours. Looks like a riddle. But it's the same make, model, and year. Well, sure, he thought he was getting into his own car. Did, uh, did any of you people see uh, anybody come near this car? Not me. Only this night. We were all looking for the cause of that crash. Oh, oh, I forgot. I found the cause. Huh? H- here's what's left of it. Mm. Mm. Looks like a table lamp. An expensive one, too. It was at the end of the hall upstairs. Somebody must have thrown it out the window. The cook found it in a flower box. That's it. Smashed on purpose to get us outdoors. But, but why? I'm the only person Ray knew in town. I invited him here to the party so he, well, so he wouldn't be lonely. I invited him to, to his death. No one saw the killer. No one has a motive. Where do we go from here? First off to the telephone. I got to call headquarters. Uh, just a minute, uh, Inspector. Phil, stay here and see that nobody touches the body. All right, Mike. Now, Faraday, what is it you know about the murder of John Himes? What is it the killer's afraid of? Huh? I don't get you, Mike. Did you take a good look at Ray Rogers' body just now? Of course. No, no, you didn't. Not a good look. Ray Rogers was just about your height. He had the same stooped shoulders, same gray hair. Holy jumpy. And he was getting into my car. Exactly. Somebody made a mistake, Inspector. Somebody wants to kill you. This is the window right here, Mr. Shane. You can see it's still raised. Mm-hmm. The lamp fell into the flower box on the ground floor. Yeah, but it's so smashed up. And you've handled it, I guess fingerprints are out. But we know that the killer was here on the second floor. Miss Melton, can you place everybody at the moment you heard the crash? Well, I, no, I, I was in my bedroom fixing my hair. And where is your bedroom? Uh, through this door here. Oh, but Sherwood, you were in the room across the hall. Take it easy, Sherry. You put me in there because of the contest. I was cooking up a solution for the murder. Uh, I mean, of John Himes. Well, how about you, Dr. Kaler? You were in the next bedroom down the hall. I cannot oblige, madam. I also was deep in thought. Well, I, I guess no one saw the man then. The inspector and Mr. Shane were downstairs, so were all the other guests. As a writer of murder thrillers, I'd say the man came here with no idea of killing. Hmm? Ray was strangled with his own tie, hmm. so the man was without a gun. You assume the unknown, Mr. Armstrong. The victim was strangled, which is a masculine technique in murder. Therefore, a clever woman with a strong arm might choose that very method. Yes, yes, a red herring. That's very clever, Dr. Kelly. Uh, Miss Melton, I know you're famous for unusual parties, but why did you decide to reenact a murder tonight? Why, why it was just an inspiration of mine. Th- then Sherwood suggested we do the case of John Himes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I interviewed the old man once, and yes, I even, even covered his inquest for my paper. I see. Sherwood Armstrong suggested it. When we entered your, your contest... You asked all of us if the room and furniture looked familiar. You, Mr. Armstrong, said not at all. Well, that... that was just an act. Sherry and I knew you'd made sketches of the actual scene, and we wanted to trip you up if we could and and get a laugh. But why did you pick the particular murderer of John Himes? I knew him. He was a fan of mine. Read all my books. So you and Miss Melton both knew him. That is hardly a crime, Inspector. I, too, knew Mr. Himes. We were members of the same club. However, it is disturbing that they should choose that particular unsolved crime. 
As a psychologist, I know the subconscious desire of every killer to confess his murder. Some return to the scene, some even talk about it to strangers. The criminal subconscious feels cheated of the drama, the notoriety which comes with his confession or capture. Look here, I don't like the drift of this talk. Well, I apologize, my friend. I'm always going off into a lecture. I'm sure neither of you is guilty. None of us is. We have no motives. Ah, here come my boys. Well, it's about time. You ready, Mike? All set. Honey, get your coat. Are we leaving? Yes, we are. The answer to Ray Rogers' death isn't here. It's in a house that's been padlocked for two months. place is dusty. Did you expect John Himes' ghost to meet us with a vacuum cleaner? If I remember right, this is the bedroom. Yeah, it is. We left everything in place. Nothing's been changed. Uh, the old guy was a miser, all right. Not enough furniture for a dollhouse. Inspector, you told us tonight you had a new idea about this case. What was it? Uh... That's the blood stain over there, Mike, in front of the telephone stand. Inspector, what was it? Maybe it's our solution. Don't bother him, honey. Hey, there's the print of a shoe here on the edge of the blood. Yeah. The killer made it. Wore tennis shoes. We tried to trace it. How about fingerprints? All identified. Well, except for one. Probably an old print. Maybe some visitors. Couldn't match it up with our files anyway. You said his secretary lived with Himes. You sure of his alibi? Positive, Phil. Nice young fella. He got a phone call in the afternoon that his uncle was dying down at Carmel. He got to Carmel in the evening, and it turned out to be a fake call. The murderer just wanted him out of the way. Well, he could have sneaked back that night and... No, no, he had witnesses. In fact, he telephoned long distance about midnight to tell Himes he'd be back in the morning. Yeah, I remember it now. The operator said somebody answered the phone but didn't say a word. Just hung up. Yeah. We figure the murderer picked up the receiver to hear who was calling. He cleaned the receiver afterwards and put it back. That's when he stepped in the blood. Uh, it doesn't add up, though, Inspector. There's only one shoe print. Now, he couldn't possibly stand here and reach over to the phone on that table. It's too far. Well, does it matter? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me try something. If I put one foot on the blood stain here and then my knee on this chair, I can... Yeah. Now I can reach it. Say, come to think of it, that's where we found the stray fingerprints. Right where you got your hands right now, on the back of that chair. Okay, now we're clipping coupons. That fingerprint belongs to the killer of John Himes and Ray Rogers. All right, but whose print is it? The inspector doesn't know. Well, we'd better know, and in a hurry. The murderer tried to get Faraday once tonight. He'll try again, and the next time, who knows? <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the advantages of Union Oil spark plug service. Now, as a featured part of this service, the Minutemen will also inspect your ignition cables. These are the small, thin wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. Naturally, if any of them are defective, even brand new spark plugs won't receive enough juice for proper firing. In other words, a faulty ignition cable will leak electricity. So for a complete, accurate check on your car's firepower, have the Minutemen service your spark plugs and ignition cables. You'll notice the increased power and snap in your engine as soon as you drive away. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. It is midnight. Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are at headquarters. Mike and Phyllis are bent over a desk studying a police file. No luck, kids. Huh? Boys, recheck those fingerprints. None on record. But we've got to have it, Faraday. Your life may depend on it. All right, there are. 130 million people in the United States. Shall I ask every one of them to mail me their prints? Oh, easy, Inspector, easy. Well, we're stymied. That's all there is to it. Well, we'll keep on trying. Phil and I have been going through the coroner's report here. So far, nothing new. The bullet entered skull immediately below right ear. Death was almost instantaneous. Deceased fell to floor in position shown in photographs. 
The eyeglasses held in his left hand were crushed and embedded in his palm. Hmm? In the opinion of the doctors... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it. What was Himes doing with the eyeglasses in his hand? He was nearsighted. Oh, we covered that at the party tonight, Mike. He probably never put his glasses on. That's why he mistook the killer for his own secretary. Why do we have to assume that? Why not the opposite? Opposite? What do you mean? Well, perhaps Himes was taking his glasses off. So what? Does it make any difference? Does it make any difference? Look, Faraday, look. All we need to get this killer are three things. A pair of tennis shoes, a set of fingerprints, and an address. Mm, that's all. Just sit down and write ourselves a letter to Santa Claus. No, no. We'll get the fingerprints from the police files. But we just looked. Not everywhere, Inspector. We'll get the address from the phone book and the tennis shoes at that address. Well, the party doesn't sound quite as lively as it did a few hours ago. Mike... That paper sack, everybody will know their shoes. Carry it like a bottle of champagne. Shh, quiet, quiet. Here comes our hostess. Well, at last. We thought you'd never get back. My guests want to go home. Oh, they can shortly. Where are they? In the bar, most of them. Sheer escapism, gentlemen. Personally, I prefer this book of poetry. Shakespeare's sonnets. How nice. What's wrong with a copy of Sherwood Armstrong? Any luck, boys? Well, I think so. How about it, Inspector? Dr. Kaler, you're an expert on fingerprints. I have in these cards two sets of fingerprints. Will you examine them and tell us if they're identical? Most oh, certainly. Hmm. This world here and the lines. Yeah, they're identical. Do you recognize them? No. Mr. Armstrong, do you recognize them? But I... No, I don't. And Miss Melton? Why, no. But I'm not an expert. May I ask where you got these prints? From the back of a chair in the bedroom of John Hines. Oh. The second card is from the file of honorary members of the police force. Oh, I mean, isn't that strange? You were about to say, Miss Melton, that you, too, have been an honorary policeman for the past three years? I, uh, yes. Oh, but surely you don't think that I... I never did like the idea of your parlor entertainment, Miss Melton. When I came here tonight, I expected that something might go wrong. Or at least that the murder of John Himes might be present. Now, just a minute, Inspector. I think I you're going... I told to... you people I had a new angle on the murder. Actually, I didn't know a thing. It's an old trick making the murderer think you have the answer. He'll stampede and give himself away. Which is exactly what happened. The killer tried to remove the inspector, but he made a mistake out there in the dark. He got the wrong man. Wrong man? Now, I have here in this paper bag a pair of tennis shoes worn by the murderer. May I, uh, may I ask you, gentlemen, what size shoes you wear? A number nine. Also a nine. I see. But uh, the night you killed John Himes, you wore an eight and a half, Dr. Kayla. The night I... Oh. Sir, this is a joke. Is anyone laughing? The sole of this left shoe shows traces of blood. The blood of John Himes. The blood you stepped in when you answered the phone in that bedroom. But no, they are not my shoes. I do not play tennis. You bought them because they were noiseless, Doctor. We found them in the closet in your room at your club. And the fingerprints are from your honorary police card. You convicted yourself, Doctor, when you reenacted the crime. You pointed out to us that Himes mistook the visitor for his own secretary because he hadn't put on his glasses. The crime was so vivid in your memory that you unconsciously repeated it to the last detail, your own subconscious was what trapped you, Doctor. <laughs> Golly, Mike, I wish that magazine had waited a few days. Well, they really have something to write about. Hmm? Mike Shane outwits famed criminologists. Well, I'd say the honors go equally to our friend and companion, Inspector Fowler. Oh, oh, I don't do. know. But all I did was to smoke him up with a big wise act. No, it gets me, kids, is why Kaler did it. He hardly knew John Himes. He had no motive. He told us the motive, honey. His own vanity. The great criminologist commits the perfect crime. He, uh, he, 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 it's like a case out of the, the last book he published. Mike Shane, you didn't tell me you'd read any of his books. Oh, every one of them, honey. And I can show you a book at my apartment he wrote back in 1937, and on one of the pages I scribbled, someday this man's going to commit a murder. Oh, and I thought I was the only one who suspected him. What? Huh? Oh, now look, Angel. Why, you were draped on Kayla's arm all evening. What, Dr. Kayla, how clever of you. 
Shakespeare's sonnets. How <laughs> utterly wonderful. Oh, I was just playing up to him. I knew. Oh, oh, oh you did. <laughs> How? Mike Shane, I suspect any man who parts his hair in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> This is Mike Shane again. And this is Phyllis. Both reminding you that next Monday evening we'll be on the air one half hour earlier. Same night, same station. Remember, won't you? Mike and Phyllis at 8 o'clock next Monday. Good, Good night, night, all. all. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Incorporated, starring Joan Blondell and Dick Powell. We present the first in a new series of half-hour comedy detective dramas, complete in each episode, yet featuring the same principal characters in situations of adventure, thrills, and romance. To begin at the beginning, as is customary and proper, the saga of Mary Vance, who may be described as a career woman, and Dennis Murray, whose occupation will be explained later, began of all places on the placid campus of Cornell University. The exact place was the reception room of Mary's dormitory, the time just a little while ago. And so you see, Miss Vance, because of your cousin's untimely death, your late uncle's detective agency now belongs to you. Well, that was awfully sweet of Uncle Mike, but what do I want with a detective agency? After all, I'm a lawyer, or I will be if I can scrape up enough money to finish my course. You will then sell the agency? Certainly. Your Uncle Michael made quite a name for himself as its head, and the business should be worth a considerable sum. Well, the next move is New York, huh? Yes, you'd have to go in any event in order to settle the estate. The sale can be arranged later. How soon must I be there? Uh, right away. Mr. Jones, I'm almost in New York right now. I beg your pardon? Is the seat taken? I don't see anyone in it. May I sit down? As long as you paid your fare, I don't see why not. You don't mind if I sit on your books and magazines? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. There you are. Thank you. No, oh, I see you're reading the case of the missing thumb. Like it? Why, did you write it? Oh, no, no, no. Just read it myself a few weeks ago. How nice. Well, it's not a bad mystery, but it falls off toward the end, don't you think? I don't know. I haven't gotten that part. Want to know who done it? No, I don't want to know who done it. I just want to read my newspaper in peace. Do you mind? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, how's Superman doing today? Yeah. See for yourself. Thanks. You're welcome. Oh, not Superman. What a president he'd make. Oh, my. Uh, these streamlined trains are certainly quiet, aren't they, huh? I uh, said these new trains are not at all noisy, are they? No, and I wish I could say the same for you. Waiter, is this the only... 
only seat left in the diner. Yes, I'm, I'm sure a gentleman will mind you sitting at his table. Oh, what could be more pleasant than gazing at a fair lady over one's mashed potatoes? Of course I don't mind. Thank you. You're very welcome. Have a menu? Thanks again. May I suggest the macaroni au gratin? It'll take the wrinkles out of your tummy and put them under your chin. Waiter, I'll dine when the car is less crowded. But, ma'am... Besides, I'm allergic to drafts, and there's certainly a big one blowing through the car right now. And so we leave the diner and we're back in the club car, where our beautiful friendship had its beginning. And look... Don't you want to lie down and play dead? Oh, come, come. We've three hours of travel ahead. Why not break down and get conversational? I'm not on the make, honest. Said he with a leer. Really, I'm not. Now, what's wrong with a little conversation to make a train trip shorter? Nothing, I suppose. My name is Dennis Michael Murray. What's yours? It's, it's Esmeralda. Esmeralda Higgins. Esmeralda Higgins. Well, it's a pretty name. Thank you. Are you going to New York to stay? No, just visiting. Are you planning anything definitely? I'm five feet three inches tall. I weigh 118 pounds. I smoke occasionally, drink less occasionally, and I study law at Cornell. A lawyer? You? <laughs> What's funny about that? Well, if you'd said anything else, a model or a nurse, even a lady barber, but a lawyer. <laughs> What's wrong with my being a lawyer? Well, you're not the career girl type, that's all. Oh, so you analyze character, too. Sure, sure. You're the maternal type. I can see mother love shining out of those beautiful blue eyes. You know, the thing for you to do is to marry some nice fella, set her down in a rose-covered cottage... And raise dozens of children, I suppose. Sure, that's better than raising dozens of affidavits. You know, your kind of thinking went out with the horse and buggy, Eran. Believe me, that's where I wish you were right now. So if you'll pardon my back, I'd like to look at the scenery. Well, Miss Higgins, we've come to the end of our journey. But that shouldn't end our friendship, now should it? I don't see why not, Mr. Mulligan. Murray. Oh, no kidding, Esmeralda. Let's be friends. I'm taking a cab. Can I drop you somewhere? No, thank you. Well, maybe I can drop your baggage off where you're going to stay. How's that? You do that to me, really? Well, that's awfully sweet of you. I'd be glad to. Just tell me where to go. I would, but I don't use profanity. Goodbye, Mr. Mulligan. Dear Mom, it's been a bad day. I'm sorry, madam, but if you want us to trace your husband, you'll have to come to our offices and make the usual arrangements. I know, madam, but uh, yeah, yeah, until five o'clock. Yes. Advanced Detective Agency. I'll see if he's in. Pardon me, but I'm here to see Mr. Parker. A second door to your left, please. Thank you. Come in. Now, please don't worry, Mr. Parker. Our service has always been satisfactory, hasn't it? Yes, I know it's important. It's just as important to us. I'll have my best operatives there. Goodbye, Mr. Bentley. All right, young lady, what's your experience? Well, not very much, I'm afraid. What? There's a fine how do you do. Well, I'm sorry, Miss... Miss... Uh, Vance. I'm Mary sorry. Vance. I'm sorry, Miss Vance, but I'm afraid you won't... Mary Vance? No, not Mary Vance. Mm -hmm, positively. Well, how do you do? I'm Parker, the agency manager. I hope you'll forgive me. Of course. I, uh, I gather you were expecting someone. I was. We're a little short-handed right now. The agency has more business than it can handle. Well, this is good news. Ordinarily, it would be. You've heard of the Bentley Emerald? Mm -hmm, even in Ithaca. Well, old P.J. Bentley is giving it to his son's bride-to-be as a wedding gift. She's Gloria Van Dusen. Oh, sure. Sure, the well-known glamour girl. Exactly. The reception's tonight after the wedding, and the Emerald will be on display along with the other gifts. We've been commissioned to see that nothing happens mm, to it. Sounds like quite a feather in our cap. It is, it is. His is the biggest account we have. Of course, the police will have their people, too. But old P.J. Bentley is eccentric enough to have no confidence in the police and rich enough to get away with it. And that's why we're in a jam. A jam? I'm afraid I don't understand. We're in a jam because I haven't a single operative available. At least not for that kind of an assignment. I need a clever woman. I've even had to try the employment agencies. Matter of fact, that's where I thought you were from. Oh, I see. Well, our attorney tells me you're going to sell the agency. Yes. Yes, I am, Mr. Parker. Good. Uh, Mr. Parker, you say you're stuck for a woman operative for the Bentley affair tonight? Oh, yes. And it's very important? 
You you shouldn't pass up this job. That's right, but uh, I... And you need a fairly intelligent young woman who looks well in evening clothes, who can pass for a member of the smart set, who can be trusted to keep her eye on the emerald. Is is that correct? <laughs> you sound as if you were applying for the job. I am. You're what? Applying for the job. Do I get it? Oh, please, Miss Vance, you're joking. Mm, I'm not joking. After all, I own this agency. I must have its welfare at heart. But you don't know anything about this kind of work. But this is a crisis, and I think I can help. You're not a detective. Oh, I know that, but I've studied quite a bit of criminal law, and I think I'll I'll do just as well as somebody you'd get from an employment agency, if you've got someone. Now, Miss Vance, I must insist that you... Now, just a minute, you... Mr. Parker. I own this agency, and I'm in a better position to insist than you are. And that's just what I'm doing. Okay, Miss Vance. You're the boss. You'll need a license, and I'll assign one of our men to stand by and keep an eye on you while you're keeping an eye on the Emerald tonight. He's not the type for this kind of a job, but he'll have to do it. We'll manage. I hope so. Yes, sir? Send in Bingo Doherty. Hey, Miss Vance, them newspaper guys said they'd give you a big play this afternoon, didn't they? Uh, when you got your license, I yes, mean. Yes, Bingo. I never saw so much gallantry in one place before. Made it, made it. They sure went to town. Too bad all that valley who's going to be wasted. Yes. Uh, look, Miss Vance, are you really going to sell the agency? Why don't you run it? Now, do I look like a gumshoe? No, Bingo. I'm studying to be a lawyer. The agency wouldn't be any good to me, and I wouldn't be any good for it. After all, it's, it's no business for a woman. Yeah, I guess you got the right idea. I know I have. Only, gee, it's kind of shame. Your Uncle Mike run the joint for 25 years, and the name of Vance and the detective business has been like a, well, like a institution. In other words... I know, Bingo, I... but that's the way things work out sometimes. Yeah. Ain't life sorted, Miss Vance. Well, Bingo, this is probably the most expensive wedding reception of the decade. Yeah, <laughs> there's enough champagne here in this joint to float a battleship. Say the least, hey, Bingo. You know what I think? I think we ought to separate, mingle with the guests, perhaps. We don't want to look too obvious. Oh, now, wait a minute, Miss Vance. You ain't going to leave me alone with all these stuffed shirts, are you? <laughs> don't forget you're doing a pretty good job of stuffing your own shirt. Yeah, and this starch collar is killing me. Hey, suppose you wait here and keep an eye on the bride's presence while I sort of drift around and mingle with the upper crust. Okay, Miss Vance. Oh, say, look at Murray of the Headquarters Society detail in the soup and fish. <laughs> ain't he got the savoir fairy? Who? Over there by the pillar, the good-looking guy. What? I know that man. I met him on the train. Is he a policeman? Detective sergeant and a good one, too. Well, well, well. Pardon me, Bingo. And don't forget your own savoir faire. Huh? Oh, 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 sure. <laughs> Gee, if the guys at Barney's Bar could get a gander at me now, they'd swear I was getting, uh, class conscious. Hmm, made it, made it. May I have this dance, Miss Higgins? I'd be delighted. Oh, it's you. That's right. Shall we? But can I lose? <laughs> well, I never dreamed we'd meet again, at least so soon. It is a small world, isn't it? Sergeant Murray. Yes? Uh, who told you I was on the force? Oh, I know all about you, Sergeant. For example, you're on the society detail. <laughs> well, I, I guess I may as well break down and confess. Yep, I'm always assigned to these society affairs. The inspector thinks I look good in tail. He's right there, but... One tail would be enough. Sweet child. And you're here to guard the Bentley Emerald, aren't you? That's right. Hey, what do you know about the Emerald? I also know that Mr. Bentley thinks the police force are incompetent and immaterial. Oh, he does, huh? Now, Sergeant, don't stop dancing. People are looking at you. Well, let him look. And how is it that you're so familiar with Mr. Bentley's opinions, Miss Higgins? Oh, not Higgins. Vance. Mary Vance. You see, Mr. Bentley hired me to keep an eye on the Emerald. In person. He hired you? Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. Vance, you... You wouldn't have any connection with a Vance detective agency, would you? I own it. You? <laughs> Woo, from mouthpiece to gumshoe in 48 hours. Oh, lady, you change careers more often than I do shirts. What's wrong with my being a private detective? No, now, don't stop dancing, Miss Pinkerton. I mean, Miss Vance. People are looking. Really, Sergeant, I think you're afraid of a little competition. Oh, sure, sure. I'm afraid to pieces, but not of competition. Now, look, Esmeralda. The name is Mary. All right, all right, Mary. Now, kidding on the square. Go back to your law books, but fast. Oh, now you think the law is good is a good career for a woman. Well, it's better than the racket you're getting into. 
crime isn't romantic. It's it's ugly and sordid. It's rotten. Is that all, Sergeant Murray? No, that's not all. You get yourself all mixed up with some really bad boys, and your pretty head won't be worth a nickel. Now, take a guy's advice and go back to school like a good little girl. Would it be too much of a strain for you to mind your own business? Okay, okay. Let's dance. People are looking. Well, that's better. Don't holler when you get hurt. I won't. And don't you pout if I make you look bad. It's a deal. Incidentally, now that you're a working detective, you might as well know the kind of playmate you're taking on. What do you mean? You see that man near the French window? You mean that tall, distinguished-looking man with the gray hair? Yep. That tall, distinguished-looking man is Soap Jennings, one of our better jewel thieves. No. Yes, he usually works the European pleasure spas, but the war killed that. And that man in the corner there... He reminds me of my English professor. Well, he's none other than High Pockets Harry Miller, also a dealer in hot ice. You mean they're criminals? Yep. They're probably after the emerald. Wouldn't be a bit surprised. Well, then why don't you arrest them or something? Because I haven't a thing on them yet. You know, they don't look like criminals. I mean, they... Of course they don't. That's why they're top notches. But neither of them would stop at murder, believe me. Excuse me, just a minute, please. Where are you going? Just a part of my nose, if you don't mind. Well, hurry back. What happened to the lights? Turn on the lights. The emeralds, it's gone! What? It's stolen! Hey, 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 you know what? Well, looks like they got to the emerald. Murder, murder! Hey, you see my boss, Miss Vince? Nope, she disappeared just before the lights went out. Disappeared? Yes, and so have two of the slickest jewel thieves in the country. Come on, Bingo! has passed since the theft of the famous Bentley Emerald, and the vast ballroom is the scene of excitement and confusion. No one, however, knows of the disappearance of Mary Vance and the two uninvited but nonetheless to be reckoned with gentlemen from the underworld. That is, no one but Detective Sergeant Dennis Murray and the redoubtable Bingo Dorothy. Well, Bingo, did you talk to the gateman? Yeah, I conversed with him. Did he see anything? Plenty. Two cars pulling out of the driveway and going like bats out of... Uh, Hades. Oh, that crazy girl. She's chasing two of the most dangerous jewel thieves in the country. But that ain't it, Sarge. What ain't it? Well, uh, what you said. She ain't chasing them. They're chasing her. Are you kidding? Well, the gate man says the face car what pulled out had a dame at the wheel, and the car that was following her had two guys in it. But that can't be, unless... 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 Unless what, Sarge? Bingo. You don't think Mary would swipe that piece of green glass, do you? Hey, if I thought you meant that, I'd load a boom on you. Okay, okay. Let's go. Where? Well, after that nitwit boss of yours. Get my car, Bingo. Make this an express stop, will you? Lovely. <laughs> Tenth floor. Say, where'd you get the shiner? I got caught in a jam. Mm. Would you like some beefsteak? Thanks, kid. I'm not hungry. Okay, lady. Here's the tenth floor. Thanks. Clerk, this is Miss Vance in 1005. I'm not home to anyone, understand? Anyone at all. So sorry to intrude. Who are you? How'd you get in? With this pass key. Well, what do you want? The Bentley Emerald, Miss Vance. And don't try to lift that phone. What makes you think I have the emerald? We know you got it. Let's not beat around the bush, Miss Vance. Miller and I were after the stone, had the stage all set. You just worked faster than we did. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, no? Incidentally, I do want to apologize for the condition of your eye. The darkness, you know. I didn't expect to find someone else reaching for the stone at the same time I did. Gentlemen, I think you're making a mistake. He's too smart, Silk. Let's get tough and scream. If you take another step toward me, I'll scream. Now, just a moment, just a moment. I'm sure there's no need for violence. Miss Vance, let me explain the situation. Uh, do. To begin with, Miller and I went after the emerald on our own hook. You should know that a stone so large and so famous would be extremely difficult to dispose of. Consequently, we've been operating as what might be termed contractors. Contractors? Yes. We were hired to obtain the emerald and for a very handsome retainer, too. You stepped in and almost robbed us of our commission. Ah, oh, the world's a cruel place, isn't it? Yeah, for some people. 
Get to the point, Silk. Miss Vance, we aren't the kind of men to lose a large sum of money with a smile. I suggest that we cut you in and split the proceeds three ways. Oh, you cut me in? Exactly. To dispose of the emerald, you would eventually have to do business with our employer, who happens to be the most important fence on the East Coast. <laughs> He's a good man to have for a friend. A bad one for an enemy. And I'm only to get a third. Is that all? Well, on this deal, yes. But I think you're a clever girl. We ought to be able to work together. And do well, too. And if I refuse? Then Mr. Miller here will be forced to apply his own method of persuasion. Oh. Well, I think you boys have something there. It, it's a deal. But I want to turn the stone over to your boss personally. Excellent. You are a clever girl. Good evening, folks. Hey, it's that uh, right. uh, 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 Papa's got a nasty old gun that might explode and go boom. Right in your puss. Funny man, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, now you two step over to the corner and face the wall. That's right. And you, young lady, come over toward me. Say, why did you pick up that black guy? It's a Lulu. I think you're clever, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you stand right here by me while I give these gentlemen the once-over. Toting any artillery, Silk? I never do. Sure, sure. But this time, you were a little out of your territory. Yes, and you're a long way from yours. Drop your gun, Sergeant, because I got one right in your back. What? Are you in with these... Oh. Oh. Good work, Miller. Did you have to hit him with that thing? Come on. You better not lose any more time. Yeah, let's get going. <laughs> Just a moment. Ah, gentlemen, come in. Thanks, Mr. Lazor. And who is your charming companion? We'll tell you about that in a minute. Tell me first, did you get the stone? In a roundabout way? Yes. You see, Miss Vance here beat us to the emerald, but we were able to persuade her to join forces with us. At no additional expense to you, I might add. Excellent. Oh, she's a very clever girl, Latour. On our way here, she was also instrumental in preventing our arrest. Incredible. Meaning what, Mr. Latour? I mean that you are as clever as you are charming. Where is the emerald? Miss Vance has it. Miss Vance? Of course. There you are. I confess that I am baffled. What do you mean, baffled? Miss Vance, why you should steal the Bentley emerald, prevent the arrest of my associates, and then so very obligingly bring the stone to me is more than I can understand. Well, I, I decided after talking to these gentlemen that I'd like to join forces with you. Especially since you are a detective. She's a detective? A detective? Uh, certainly, you idiots. Don't you read the newspapers? What? There's her picture. The story that goes with it. She's taken over the Vans Agency. Hey, what a nervy dame. Well, uh, anyway, we've got the emerald. Yes. And we also have a live corpse on our hands. <laughs> Bingo, where are you? I was down in the lobby keeping my eyes peeled like you said when I seen Miss Vance and them two guys come out. So I figure I'd better follow them. And guess where they went? They went in the back door of Latour's. You know, that high-class jewelry store on Fifth Avenue. Well, I'll be... Bingo, you stay right where you are till I get there and don't let anybody in or out. And don't go in yourself, you get it? Ah, uh, darn that crazy girl. Guinea Police Headquarters. Then I take it we're all agreed? That's, That's right, right, Mr. Lister. All right. We leave immediately for my cottage in Maine. It's right on the ocean, you know. By the time Miss Vance's body is washed in, she'll be unrecognizable. Now, wait a minute. You know, murder's a serious business. Ah, but at this stage of the game, so is exposure. I am sorry we have to do this. Truly, I am. Come on, let's get going. Yes, we can leave by the street door. It's late and no one will see us. We'd better gag her anyway. Good idea. Take care of it, Miller. Right. <laughs> hey, hey, that's the cops. Come on, this way. But the girl. If we're caught with her, we're dead. I know. Wait. We put her in the vault. She'll suffocate. We can dispose of her body later. <laughs> Now, hurry, hurry, out the back way. Let him have it. 
<laughs> All right, boys, the game's up. Come on, up with your hands. Nice work, Bingo. Are you hurt? And, uh, where's Miss Vance? Yeah, where is she, Latour? I don't know what you're talking about. All right, boys, we'll make them talk. Wait a minute. I'm not taking a murder rap. She's in the vault. Get her out, Latour. It's not locked. Just throw back the bolt. Well, well, well. Look at little Miss Pinkerton. Come on, out you go. I think you're smart, don't you? That's what I get for saving your life. Get back in the safe. Oh, all right. Noonan, you, Noonan, you can take these gentlemen down to the station now. All right, Sarge. Come on, get along. Come on. Now, when and where did you get that shiner, Miss Gumshoe? When I took the emerald. And why, if I may be so bold, did you snitch Exhibit A? Because it was the only thing I could do. I saw this high pockets individual getting ready to turn off the lights. I had to act quick. I grabbed the emerald first. And? And, well, I got the black eye in the tussle with Jennings, and, and then I got scared and I ran. I, I don't know why. I got into my car and they followed me. But why did you stick a gun in my back and get me knocked out? Oh, that. Yes, yes, that. Well, I found out that they were only part of a ring. The tour was the big shot, the master fence. That was even bigger than the emerald itself. I had to follow through, and, and then and then you got in the way. Uh-huh. And you might add, it was a mighty good thing for you that I got back in your way. Well, thank you kindly, Sergeant. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. Now, let me tell you something, little Miss Muffet. All you did tonight was to mess up the sweetest little trap ever set by the police department of this great city. Ah, uh-uh, don't be a poor sport, Sergeant Murray. Believe me, I'm not. We've been trying to find the identity of the man above Jennings and Miller for a long time, so tonight we set a trap. A trap? Yes. But the wrong mouse nibbled the cheese. Why do you think I gave Jennings and Miller so much rope? It's because I wanted them to steal the emerald. You wanted them to steal the emerald? Sure. It was a fake. A fake? You mean I took a chance on my life for an imitation emerald? That's right. You don't think we'd bait a trap of the real article? We arranged the whole thing with Mr. Bentley and the insurance company. <gasps> well, of all the things. Uh-oh. Uh, here comes the press. Hi, boys. Hi, Sarge. Hey, isn't that Mary Vance? Hi, Mary. Greetings, gentlemen. Say, by the looks of that shiner, Miss Vance has been a busy little girl. Come on, Mary, spill it. Oh, what happened? Now, uh, uh-oh, now, just a minute, boys. Give us high, will you, Sarge? Come on over here, Miss Vance, and tell us all yeah. about it. Well, how do you like that? <laughs> it looks like Miss Vance is getting all the play, huh, Sarge? Yeah, so it does. Well, that's life, Sarge. In other words... In other words, a guy named Murray is a first class... Uh, 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 uh. Sarge... Temper, temper. I don't mind admitting I had a very anxious night, Miss Vance. You had an ac- anxious night, Mr. Parker. How does it feel to have your name on every front page in town? Yeah, Miss Vance, you were in the limelight, all right. It hurts my eyes. Too much excitement, eh? Well, you can relax now. After last night's business, you'll have no trouble at all getting some good office for the agency. Mm-hmm. Come in. Well, am I intruding? Not at all, Sergeant. Good. I'd like to take you to lunch. Really? As a tribute to my ability? Mm-hmm. Frankly, no. As a tribute to your luck. Stop kidding yourself, Mary. You're not a detective. You never will be. That's not what the newspapers think. Yeah? Well, if I hadn't been around, the only newspaper headline you'd rate today would have been an obituary. How a great... I, uh, hear you're going to sell the agency. Why? I don't know where you got that impression. But, Miss Vance, we... Are you kidding? I had intended to sell it, but you men who think all women are helpless nitwits give me 12 kinds of a pain. Not only am I going to keep the agency, but I'm going to show you that I can outsleuth you in every direction, including spades. Goodbye, gentlemen. I'm going to lunch alone. Ain't she the spit of her Uncle Mike? Yep. So she's going to be Miss Pinkerton Incorporated, huh? Well, one of these days, she's going to poke that pretty nose of hers into something and get it caught. And I won't be around to unhook it. Or, uh, will I? Supporting Miss Blondell and Mr. Powell were Hanley Stafford, Gail Gordon, Ed Max, Elliot Lewis, Frederick German, and Sarah Berner. Story by Carl Foreman and Charles R. Marion. Music composed and directed by Lenny Kahn. Miss Pinkerton Incorporated was conceived and produced by J. Donald Wilson. This is Art Gilmore speaking. Listen in next week to Miss Pinkerton Incorporated for the story of the man who became obsessed with the urge to kill. Starring Joan Blondell and Dick Powell.
me some more coffee, will you? And swish off the radio. It jars my nerves. What's the time? Uh, just on 11. Oh, oh, thank goodness I don't have to be at the studios this morning. I brought you the papers and the post. Well, there's an article in this one about me. Oh, is there, Miss? Mm. Oh, here it is. Love and career can mix, says screen star Helen Desmond. Oh, a lovely picture <laughs> of you. Uh, where are the letters? Here you are. Oh, I wonder who this is from. Oh, whatever's wrong? This letter. This letter. Read it. Read it. <laughs> BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dutton, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. Threat to kill. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. Is Dr. Morell there? Oh, he's engaged at the moment, I'm afraid. Who is that speaking? My name is Digby, Hell Digby. Now, can I help you? I'm Dr. Morell. You're famous, Miss Frail. Oh, yes, I, I am Miss Frail, though I don't know about being famous. Oh, I've heard about you as well as Dr. Morell, of course. Yes, of course. Well, I'm speaking from the Zenith Film Studios, and I was wondering if Dr. Morell could come out and see me. At the film studios? If he could. Oh, I love it. I've never seen a film being made. Well, get Dr. Morell to bring you, Miss Frail. We'll give you a test. A test, Mr. Digby? A film test. You'll never know. He may make a film star out of you. Oh. Oh, Mr. Digby. Seriously, Miss Frail, I'm in trouble. Only your Dr. Morell can get me out of it. I've got to see him. Mm, well, I know it's impossible until late this afternoon. How late, Miss Frail? Name your own time and I'll send a car. I might arrange it for five o'clock, Mr. Digby. Yes, I think that will be all right. Come in. Dr. Morell for you, Mr. Digby. I couldn't be more pleased to see you, Doctor. Good afternoon. Okay, Miss Curtis, and don't let anyone disturb us. Very good, Mr. Digby. By the way, Dr. Morell, isn't Miss Frail with you? Uh, no, uh, there was rather a lot of work for her to do. Oh, too bad. She'd have enjoyed looking around the studios. We've got a couple of interesting pictures on the floor. I'm sure. Still, when there's a lot of work to be done, eh? <laughs> I expect she calls you a bit of a slave driver, too. What was that? Oh, just my little joke. That's what they think I am here. Indeed. For a moment, I... Never mind. Anyway, nobody's ever wanted to kill your Miss Frail. I don't quite follow... Now that's the threat that Miss Desmond received this morning. Helen Desmond, you know, our biggest box office bet. I am not well informed on public entertainment figures. Someone has threatened to kill her. That's why I've asked you here. Isn't this a police matter? Oh, they're keeping an eye on her. They... The trouble is they don't take it very seriously. You can't blame them. They suspected some publicity stunt. Well, Helen... Miss Desmond is in a dreadful panic. She's convinced that someone means to do her in. What is your own opinion? Well, I feel a bit uneasy about the whole thing, which is again why I thought of you. How was this threat conveyed to Miss Desmond? Well, she got a letter this morning, anonymous, of course, from the, the wife of some fan who'd seen all her films and fallen in love with her. I've got it here. What do you think of it, Doctor? This was delivered to Miss Desmond's private address? Yes. Her ordinary fan mail comes to the studio, of course, and it's handled by the publicity department. Well, for Pete's sake, that was quick of you. Well, since her private address would be available only to her friends, it should narrow the field. Definitely. It's possible for an ordinary member of the public to obtain her address, but, but very unlikely. It's a closely guarded secret. Now, this must have occurred to the police. Yes, maybe. But I tell you, they think it's a publicity stunt. Why, well, it didn't occur to me until you sparked the idea. It's a most viciously worded letter. I can understand Miss Desmond's apprehension. She's scared stiff. She's due to work tomorrow, but she won't come to the studio whilst this is hanging over her. She knows it'll hold up the schedule, but she couldn't care less. I tell you, Dr. Morell, they're an ungrateful lot. You build them up from nothing, and then they turn round and spit in your eye. Why, then, do you go to the trouble, Mr. Digby? Well, what else can I do? The public wants stars. You've got to give them what they want. That's how I built up Zenith Films. Uh, would you say Miss Desmond has a wide circle of friends? <laughs> of course. She's in the money. You understand? I understand, Mr. Digby. And there are some of the studio employees. Mr. Digby. Uh, what is it, Miss Curtis? I thought I told it's you. It's Mr. Kavanagh. I don't care. You think I'm standing for this, Digby? Oh, what the devil's the idea? I'll tell you. 
as if you didn't know. Can't you see I'm in conflict? I don't care if you're in perda. This has got to stop. All this publicity for her and not a word about me. What are you Look at the evening headlines. Oh, Mr. Kavanagh, please. Look, Helen Desmond receives threatening letter. Film star Helen Desmond's death threat. Threat to famous film star Helen Desmond. Now listen, you Aren't I one of your stars, too? Aren't I co-starring with her in this picture? This isn't any publicity stunt. Helen's been threatened. Are you kidding? This is your handiwork. It smells of it. I didn't even know the press had got hold of it. The newspapers have been full of stuff about her ever since you... Well, everyone knows about you and her. Get out. I'm going. But if there isn't more of me and less of her, I quit. Contract or no contract. I said get out. Perhaps that'll make him realize I'm not going to be kicked around. Oh, Mr. Kavanagh, you shouldn't have burst in like that. Why should she get all the breaks? It's quite true what Mr. Digby says. Miss Desmond's life has been threatened. Don't make me laugh. What's eating the great profile? Go oh, shut up, Ashton, and get out of my way. Forgive me for breathing the same air. I'm going to get on to my manager. What is all that about, Miss Curtis? Oh, he's convinced this threatening letter business has been worked up for publicity. Everyone in the studio is talking about it. Isn't it a publicity stunt? No, Mr. Ashton, truly it isn't. Mr. Digby's worried stiff about it. That's why he's called in Dr. Morell. Dr. Morell, eh? Yes, he's in there with him now. That was why it was so awful when Mr. Kavanagh burst in. I wanted a word or two with Mr. Digby myself. That scene they're shooting tomorrow has got to be rewritten. I'll have to work on it tonight. Well, if you don't mind waiting, Mr. Ashton, I, I daren't put my nose inside until Dr. Morell's gone. That's all right, I'll wait. So he's called in Dr. Morell. Wouldn't mind being able to overhear what they're saying. Well, that's the sort of thing I have to put up with, Dr. Morell. Do you know what that swollen-headed moron was doing a couple of years ago? I can't say I'm particularly interested. Well, I'll tell you. Playing small parts in a third-rate rep. And look at him now. And by the way, you can ignore his insinuations about <laughs> Helen and me. He just shows the sort of mixed-up kid he is. I don't quite follow. Well, you see, he's jealous of her success. I rather gathered that. And at the same time, he's half in love with her. Are his somewhat confused feelings reciprocated? Well, she's not jealous of him anyway. There's no need. She's worth a dozen Ronnie Kavanaghs at the box office. Whether she's a bit keen on him, too, I wouldn't know. He's attractive to women. Don't ask me why. I'll refrain from doing so. <laughs> Doctor, will you go and see her? You can calm her fears, and at the same time, you may learn something that will put you on to whoever wrote this. I shall call on Miss Desmond this evening. Thanks a lot, Dr. Morell. Thanks a lot. I'll phone Helen that you're looking at 6.30, eh? Very well. But so long, Doctor, and thanks a million. Uh, goodbye, Dr. Morell. Goodbye, Miss Curtis. What a marvellous-looking man. Don't you think so, Mr. Ashton? Just your type, eh, Miss Curtis? Get me Miss Desmond at her flat, Miss Curtis. Yes, Mr. Digby. And uh, Mr. Ashton is here to see you. Oh, I'll see him when I've spoken to Miss Desmond. Yes, Mr. Digby. He won't be long, Mr. Ashton. Thanks. Penny for your thoughts, Mr. Ashton. Eh? Hey? You had a funny expression, then. I was only thinking that it isn't Helen Desmond who ought to get bumped off at Ronnie Kavanagh. What luxurious flats, Dr. Morell. Just where one would imagine a film star to live. I'm glad that you're suitably impressed. Dr. Morell? Yes. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Morell. Oh, no, I'm not Mrs. Morell. Uh, this is Miss Frail, my secretary. Oh. So sorry, Doctor. Please forgive me. Oh, it doesn't matter in the least. Will you come this way? Miss Desmond, Dr. Morell. Hello there. And Miss Frail. Oh. oh. Good evening, Miss Desmond. Can I get you a drink, Doctor? Uh, not just now, thank you. I was just trying to open this bottle of perfume. The stopper seems to have stuck. Shall I try, Miss Desmond? I'm sure Dr. Morell has strong hands. Allow me. You're very kind. What a fascinating-looking bottle. It's just arrived, made specially for me. How exclusive can you get? Mm. It must be terribly expensive. Have you done it, Dr. Morell? Oh, how wonderful of you. Mm, you had omitted to remove the seal. Had I? How silly of me. Aren't you going to try it, Miss Desmond? I'm sure it must smell marvellously. Put some on your hand. Oh, thank you. There. Oh. Why oh, don't you like it? Oh. Oh, yes, it's just a bit strong. It's strong? Of course it's strong. It costs the earth. Have a sniff, Doctor. Uh, perfume doesn't appeal to me, although I'm sure it's delightful. From one of your admirers, no doubt. How did you guess? You say it arrived only today. That's right. Why? By post. I don't see... I'm interested in what people know your private address. 
You mean that horrible letter I got this morning. That's what I'm here for, to allay your fears, and at the same time discover the writer's identity. I feel much safer now you're here. How wonderful it must be, Miss Frail, to have a job like yours. Do you think so? I'd give anything to change places with you and have such a marvellous boss. If people only knew the ghastly life I have to lead. Oh, I should have thought it was rather fun. Fun? Treated like a piece of merchandise, exploited by sharks like Hal Digby. I thought your employer was quite agreeable. Rather more than Mr. Kavanagh, for instance. Ronnie, oh, I suppose he was throwing one of his temperaments again. Oh, was that what it was? Well, it's just an act. He's not really like that at all. He's vain, takes himself too seriously, but you have to in this racket. After all, the women throw themselves at him. Do you find him attractive? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Why? I was wondering. He's mad about me. You, you weren't thinking that he... Oh, no, he may be jealous because I'm bigger box office than he is, but he... It occurred to me uh, that his emotions might have become mixed to the extent of warping his mind. You mean, Doctor, each man kills the thing he loves? That's not a bit like Ronnie. I know he wouldn't play a filthy trick like that on me. Now, that rat Ashton, he's got a warped sense of humour. Ashton? The writer on this picture I'm making, Ted Ashton. He hates my soul. Why should he hate you? One of these highbrows. Doesn't think much of me just because I can't say his dialogue. Can I help it if I'm not an actress? What do they pay me for? But you're a star, Miss Desmond. Biggest box office Zenith ever had. But they don't queue up to see me act, but because I've got what it takes. Oh, yes, I see. And I give it to them on a plate. Has it occurred to you, Miss Desmond, that since this letter was sent to your private address, it might have come from someone among your friends or acquaintances? You mean... But of course you're right. It isn't someone I don't know at all. It is more likely that was to cover up the writer's identity. But if he or she was that clever, would they have made the mistake of not writing to the studio? Ah, you see, Miss Desmond... The criminal can't help himself. Some inner compulsion, some subconscious force impels him to give himself away, to bring about his own self-destruction. Thank you, Miss Frail. What Miss Frail means is that the letter had to be addressed to you here for it to have had the required effect. If it had gone to the studio, you might never have received it. That's true. My fan mail comes in sackloads. I never see it, and I don't suppose the publicity boys bother with it either. Well, if they had seen this letter... It would have been kept from you to save you unnecessary worry. Oh, Dr. Morell. Oh, what is it, Miss Desmond? Oh, doctor, help me. I, I feel faint. It's the shock. Lean back on this couch. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Oh, uh, shall I get you something? A, a drink of water? No, 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 no. Just you stay by me, Doctor, and I'll be all right. Let me take your hand. Such steel like strength, and yet it could be so gentle. I can feel your strength. Flowing into me. Mm, and she says she can't act. Realizing it's someone who knows me makes it seem so much more horrible. Uh, we can't be sure of that. Uh, you may have had servants who gave your address away to a complete stranger. Yes, I've had scores of dumb fools like the maid I've got now. Uh, business people may have inadvertently passed it on to others, or some tradesmen. It still isn't inconceivable that some unknown wrote to you for some stupid joke. Now you're just trying to comfort me. I can reassure you, for obviously, if it is a stranger playing a joke, you're, you're in no danger. Now I'm sure it's someone I know. Then equally, you may be reassured. How do you mean? They've threatened to kill me. Can you think of any friend or acquaintance whom you would suspect? People don't go about murdering just for nothing. If there is anyone who might have designs upon your life, all you have to do is to name them. Steps can then be taken to deal with whoever it is. Well, I... Um, I... Can you think of anyone you know whom you seriously believe wants to kill you? The way you put it, I, I suppose not. There you are, Miss Desmond. You've nothing to worry about. Oh, thank you, Dr. Morell. You've made me feel better. You can have your hand back now. <laughs> there is a 24-hour police watch being kept on you. A purely precautionary measure. It'll be the same at the studio. Do you really think it's all right for me to work tomorrow? You will be equally well guarded there. Oh, I don't know. If you promise to see me safely there, I... Well, uh, really, Miss Desmond, uh, that isn't necessary. Oh, if you don't, I won't stir an inch. I'll only feel safe if you come down, too. Oh, very well, I'll, I'll accompany you. Uh, meanwhile, you can relax and 
sleep well. I will, Doctor. I'll dream of you. Good night, Miss Desmond. Good night, Miss Desmond. Come in. It's Dr. Morell, Mr. Digby, and Miss Frail. Hello there, Doctor. Good morning. Uh, this is Miss Frail. So, Miss Frail, you've come for your test after all. Oh, Mr. Digby. Uh, Miss Frail insisted upon accompanying me this time. I didn't realize how interested she is in uh, behind the scenes of filming. Or was she afraid of leaving you alone with that man-eater? You're just her type. <laughs> well, I, I left Miss Desmond in her dressing room. If it hadn't been for you, she wouldn't have been working today. You've certainly been a comfort to her. Eh, Miss Frail? Mr. Digby, Mr. Cavanagh's on the phone. He says it's very urgent. Cavanagh? All right, Miss Curtis, put him on, if you'll excuse me, Doctor. Uh, Digby here, what's on your mind now? What? Uh, where are you speaking from? Okay, I'll come right away. Well, what do you know about that, Dr. Morell? Well, what is it? Ronnie Kavanagh's had a threatening letter now from the husband of some woman. Ronnie Kavanagh? Sounds quite an intriguing development. It's in his dressing room. I'll have to go and talk to him, if you'll excuse me. Dr. Morell, what are you going to do? Do? About this. Precisely nothing, my dear Miss Frail. Well, don't you think there's anything to it? I had been anticipating something of this nature. It is the typical reaction one would expect from an individual of Kavanagh's temperament. You mean... It requires only the smallest amount of perception to realize that he wrote the letter to himself. But why? That will appear obvious to Mr. Digby. You really think so? A curious coincidence, don't you agree, that he should receive a letter couched in terms similar to Miss Desmond's? Only in this case... It's the jealous husband who threatens him. Just a gag of his to get some publicity for himself, eh? Well, of all the stupid idiots. He hasn't been over-original, shall we say. Oh, didn't I tell you, Doctor? They're nothing but a persistent headache. This is what it's really like behind the scenes, Miss Frail. Having to cope with a bunch of conceited, temperamental bones. Oh, and I've always admired Ronnie Kavanagh. I thought he was much better than Helen Desmond. Uh, no doubt, Miss Frail, you would. Well, I'll have to go and placate him anyway, or he'll come charging up here like yesterday. If you'd wait here, I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. Very well. What an extraordinary way to behave, Dr. Morell. I've already explained it's no more than I expected of him. I wasn't thinking of Ronnie Kavner. I meant Miss Desmond. I think she's awful. Dr. Morell. What? Do you see what I see in the waste paper basket? What is it? This cardboard box. It had that perfume in it. The strong stuff Miss Desmond used last night. That means he sent it to her, Mr. Digby. Indeed? It must be. She said that it had been made exclusively for her. Most interesting. And what do you deduce from it? Why, that Mr. Digby's in love with her, too. Well, I imagine you can hardly take it for granted in these somewhat exotic circles in which we find ourselves uh, that the gift of perfume necessarily has anything to do with love. Oh, no, perhaps not. Oh, dear, I thought I'd made an important discovery. And all that you've discovered is that the office cleaner omitted to empty the waste paper basket this morning? Oh, oh I thought Mr. Digby was... Oh, he's, he's gone down to see Mr. Kavner. Oh. He won't be long. Oh, excuse me, that's my phone. What is it, Doctor? Have you got a cold coming on? What makes you think so? You were sniffing. Yes, Mr. Digby, I'll call him. Uh, Dr. Morell, quickly, please. Something's happened. It's Mr. Digby, Doctor. He sounds very upset. Hello, Hello Dr. Morell here. You're in her dressing room? I'll come straight away. What is it, Doctor? Miss Desmond. She's disappeared. I had a word with Kavanagh, Dr. Morell. Said we'd go into this letter business just to placate him and... Then I looked in here to see how Helen was. You left Kavanagh in his dressing room? Yes, he's still there. But Miss Desmond must be somewhere. Well, I waited, and then when she didn't turn up, I, I phoned round the studio. No one's seen her at all. I, I began to panic. Oh, she was perfectly all right when we left her, wasn't she, Dr. Morell? That was a matter of half an hour ago. She was rehearsing her lines for the scene she was going to do. I've got a funny feeling about all this. Oh, she can't have got far. She left the top of the bottle of perfume. Ooh, it's strong. I should have insisted she wasn't left for a minute. But none of the dresses will work for her. She drives them all up the wall. There are no signs of any struggle. Struggle? If she had been attacked and spirited away, there would be some indication. Besides, she'd have screamed out. Oh, she certainly would. Which suggests that either she knew her assailant or someone could have crept in behind her. I'd given her a sedative earlier on. It might have had a delayed action effect. 
She might have dozed off in her chair. Dr. Morel, the wardrobe. What is it? The door's opening. Helen, it's... It's her. <gasps> They've tied a scarf round her face. Let's get onto the couch. Oh, Dr. Morel, is she... She's all right. Oh, she might have suffocated. She's coming round. Oh. She's opening oh. her eyes. What happened? Dr. Morel, what, what you're, happened? You're quite safe, Miss Desmond. You're okay, Helen. What happened? I remember I was going over my lines, and then I must have dozed off. We think you may have fainted oh. the strain of what you've gone through. Oh. Eh, Mr. Digbeam? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, that's it, Helen. You, you just passed out for a few minutes. Uh, we came oh. in a moment ago to find you unconscious. Oh, but you're all right now, Miss Desmond. Just stay quiet for a while. Oh, my head feels so muzzy, as if it's been in a sack. Now, relax, Helen. Just, just take it easy. Where are you going, Dr. Morell? I'll be only a few minutes. Oh, come back soon. I feel scared when you aren't with me. Come in. I'm Dr. Morell, Mr. Kavanagh. I saw you in Digby's office yesterday afternoon. Uh, has he sent you about this threatening letter I've had? Uh, not exactly. He told me you're investigating Helen Desmond's. I am. But the threat you've received sounds so much more dangerous. I recommend that the police be called in. The police? Oh, but uh, that is... Uh... Uh, they will probe the matter. Uh, uh, Dr. Morell, I, I might as well come clean... I sent the letter to myself, a sort of joke, you understand? Not in very good taste, I suppose. Not particularly. So let's forget all about it, shall we? I mean, I'm sorry and all that. Just as you wish. How about Helen? Or is that all a fake, too? One of Digby's bright ideas. I rather fancy it's genuine. I wonder if uh, Ashton wrote it. He hates her, the writer, you know. I've heard of him. As a matter of fact, I thought they were quarreling just now. She was telling someone to clear out of her dressing room. Get out, I heard her say, and don't ever come back. She actually said that? I didn't hear the other chap's voice, but I'll bet it was Ashton. His office is just along the corridor, if you're interested. Why not ask him? Thank you, Kavanagh. I will. Come in. Hello. You're Dr. Morell? And you are Mr. Ashton? Portrait of a screenwriter with nose to the grindstone. I hear you've been called in on the Helen Desmond business. Uh, that is so. And the best of luck. Cheap publicity stunt, if you ask me. I wouldn't put it past someone trying to do her in. You don't sound very charitably disposed to her yourself. Can't stand the sight of her, and she knows it. She's a fake and a phony. And I spend my life ruining my dialogue so that she can speak it. Listen to this, Dr. Morell. These are her lines for the scene they're shooting this afternoon. Stay away from me and never come back. Get out and never come back. <laughs> What's so funny? Well, I, I was smiling merely because that's what Kavanagh overheard her saying just now. What of it? He thought she was quarreling with you. Typical of him not to realize he was rehearsing her lines. The only lines he ever thinks about are his own. Thank you for your information, Mr. Ashton. You've been very helpful. smart of you, Dr. Morell. Not to let Helen know what had happened to her. I thought it wiser. Oh, she'd have gone off into terrific hysterics. The end of any work today before she'd even started. Uh, that was what I foresaw. We'd never have got her onto the set if she'd realized she'd been attacked. <laughs> Dr. Morell thinks of everything. Well, how about a cup of tea, Miss Fred? Oh, yes, please. I'd love some. I meant to ask you when we came back here. You too, Dr. Morell. Uh, thank you. Uh, get some tea for us, Miss Curtis, will you? Oh, and get me stage three, Mr. Harris, on the line. Yes. Well, I suppose the next thing, Dr. Morell, is to call in the police. You really believe that is necessary? But we daren't risk a repetition of what happened just now. If we hadn't been there, she'd have suffocated to death. I think we can now prevent it from occurring again. How? Oh, excuse me. This will be Harris from the set. He's the assistant director. Harris? Uh, Mr. Digby here. How's it going? Is Miss Desmond okay? Fine. Oh, just to check that we're keeping the schedule. She's okay. Good. But you were saying, Doctor, you, you were on to something. Dr. Morell, you know who it is. I can tell by that look on your face. Is that so? Well, I... Now, look, for Pete's sake, who is it? You see, Mr. Digby, uh, jealousy is an emotion that can assume several forms. 
one can be jealous of someone for a variety of reasons. It is argued by some, in fact, that without jealousy there can be no love, an argument invariably favoured by those who are themselves of a jealous disposition. But then again, uh, there are those who are envious of another's success. An actor, for instance, who, because he is vain and petty-minded, and uh, these two characteristics go together, uh, cannot bear to see another person overshadowing him in the same profession. Ronnie Kavanagh. So it was him all the time. Shh! He hasn't finished yet. Then uh, there exists another kind of jealousy, uh, perhaps the most difficult to comprehend and therefore to root out. Uh, that of someone whose mind is unbalanced, who becomes filled with a hopeless, insane jealousy festering within until it finally erupts into an act of evil, stupid violence. The tea, Mr. Digby. Uh, thank you, Miss Curtis. The sort of jealousy which you entertain for Miss Desmond. Insane, unreasoning. But Dr. Morell, I... I am addressing you, Miss Curtis. Me? What, what, what have I... You! It was you who wrote that threatening letter and who attacked Miss Desmond. <laughs> yes! Yes, it was me. You? Miss Curtis! I did it! <laughs> I did it! I hated her. I always have done. She had everything. All the men were in love with her. I didn't try to kill her. I don't know what I meant to do. I just had to hurt her in some way. Poor Curtis. You know something, Dr. Morell? I couldn't help feeling sorry for her. I am gratified to hear it, my dear Miss Frey. It is the proper attitude to have towards someone suffering from such a deranged mind. Mm, frankly, I wasn't thinking of that so much as... As uh, your dislike for Miss Desmond, is that what you meant? It's all wrong of me, I know. But I felt that she deserved everything she got. All that luxury and glamour, and even then she wasn't happy. Which means that she too, and others like her, need understanding. I just can't agree. How can you waste a moment's sympathy on someone who's, who's so bogus and vulgar... That dreadful perfume she used. It was that which enabled me to lift the threat that was terrifying her. Whatever do you mean? I thought I'd made it clear to you. You know, Dr. Morell, you never tell me anything. Oh, perhaps you weren't in the office when I explained to the others. It was the overpowering perfume Miss Desmond was wearing that gave Miss Curtis away. It was on her as she came into the office when you and I were there alone. After Mr. Digby had dashed off to Ronnie Kavanagh. I smelt Helen Desmond's exclusive perfume clinging to her then. Oh, so that was what you were sniffing. Well, how else could she have come by it, except by being in close proximity with Miss Desmond? Oh, that was very clever of you to have spotted it. Now, if that's Miss Desmond asking you to have dinner with her tonight, I shall say that you're out. Hello? This is Dr. Morell's house. Oh, Mr. Digby. Oh, how awfully kind of you. Oh, Mr. Digby, I'd love it. Thank you so much. Yes, goodbye. I hope that doesn't mean that you're about to leave my employ to become a film star, Miss Frail. No, thanks. I've seen all I want of film stars. No, Mr. Digby's making me a present of some lovely perfume. <laughs> That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Helen Desmond, Rosalind Knight, Miss Curtis, Cecile Chevro, Ronnie Kavanagh, John Horsley, The Maid, Annette Kelly, Mr. Ashton, Norman Wynne, Hal Digby, John Sharpley. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgman. Sal Hepatica and Vitalis present... Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, 
guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you in the public interest as part of the constant fight for a better America by Bristol Myers, the makers of Sal Hepatica for the smile of health and Vitalis for well-groomed hair. Sal Hepatica, Vitalis. And tonight, the case of the money machine. Who is it? Let me in, Joyce. I got him with me. It's... Is he all right? He won't... He won't get violent or anything. Well, of course he's all right. Uh, sit down, Frank. Take off your coat. Can he understand, Emil? Take off your coat. You hear me, Frank? I understand. I was worried sick. I still am. Worried? Now you just sit there, Frank. You don't have to talk. Oh, did it go all right? Yeah, yeah, there was nothing to it. I slipped in the back door of the asylum, got him out of his room, and here we are. Didn't take an hour. Be sure they won't miss him before morning. Oh, look, Joyce, I told you I used to work in the joint three years ago. I took care of cases like him. Oh, I know, but won't he's, they... He's just any... like a lump of, of putty or something. You set him down and he stays there. <laughs> He doesn't look crazy, I'll say that for him. No, he, he lives in a state, something like that. They got a lot of them like him. Always seem to be seem to be thinking about something a million miles away. Frank? Frank. Now leave him alone. He's all right. Give him a pan of water after a while. We'll keep him in the back room until we hook up with the carney. A pan of water? Like a dog? I don't want him cutting himself on any glass, kid. He's a little money machine. I still wonder if it'll work. No carnival wants a guy working. You ought to be in a hatchery. Well, who's going to know? He'll be a sensation, I tell you. We used to turn him on all the time when I worked the hospital. Turn him on? Yeah, sure. The, the doc explained it one day. He, he's got a mind for figures, see? That's why I thought we'd build the act as a lightning calculator. You like it? Ask him something, Amy. You know, just like you were a square in the crowd. Oh, sure. He likes it. Uh, all right, Frankie. Uh, here's one for you. You ready? <laughs> Look at the way his eyes light up. Go on, ask him. Ask oh, yeah, sure. Uh, multiply, Frank. Three, six, nine, two, one, eight. Got that? Three, six, nine, two, one, eight. Times four, oh, three. Got it? Times four, oh, three. All right, boy. What's the answer? The answer is one hundred and forty-eight million seven hundred and ninety-four thousand eight hundred and fifty-four. Gresham is here, Chief. Oh. Well, go right in, please, sir. Well, thank you, Miss Miller. Hello, Mr. Gresham. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah, this is Mr. Harrington. Hi, Mr. Gresham. Mr. Harrington. Oh, do you want me, Chief? Uh, yes, stay if you will, please, Mr. Right. Uh, you're with the State Hospital, Mr. Gresham. That's right. Mm -hmm. I know you're familiar with the institution. Yeah, yeah, that's for the chronic insane, isn't it? We have the heavier load of the state's incurables, yes, Mr. Harrington. Mm -hmm. I've been in charge of protection out there for the last year. Oh, yes, yes, we know. I know you're busy, so I'll make this brief. When the attendants checked roll this morning, we found one of the patients missing. Uh-oh. Yes, go on, Mr. Gresham. Well, naturally, finding him again is part of my job. Mm -hmm. However, I wanted you to have a full report, too. Yes, yes, we'd like to have. Uh, take this down, would you, Miss Meyer? Right, Chief. A man or a woman, Mr. Gresham? A man. His name is Kent. Frank Kent. I'm not a doctor, Mr. D.A., but I, I do know his history. Uh, which is what? Well, without using technical terms, Kent is... Uh, well, uh, off in another world is one way to describe him. Mm -hmm. Go on. He's seldom violent. 
In fact, you're seldom aware of him at all. Yes, well, could he become violent, Mr. Gresham? My answer would be yes. Most of them could, if the right things happened. Yes. However, you can get more exact dope from the doctors. Mm. You got a description of him? Oh, I know Frank quite well. He has a unique ability, actually. Something I've never run up against before. A unique ability, did you say, Mr. Gresham? That's right. He has a head for figures, mathematics. Hmm? <laughs> He's amazing, Mr. Harrington. He can add, subtract, multiply, all in his head. And all in a matter of seconds. No matter how complicated the numbers? Well, I've never seen him stumped yet. Yes, there are cases on record like that. Some of them phenomenal. Yeah, how did he uh, escape, Mr. Gresham? Sometime last night, his door was opened from the outside. Uh, maybe some other patient. No, Mr. Harrington, that's literally impossible. There are too many doors to get through. And you have no idea where he might be now? I know Frank's habits, Mr. D.A. I think perhaps I can trace him. Where I need your help, though, yes. we want to know who opened that door. Ready, Mr. Hudson. All right, folks, give me a number. Any number, just shout it out. You, sir. Beg pardon? All right, now. Five, nine, six. Thank you, sir. Five, nine, six. And you, sir, will you supply the second number? Anything at all, sir? Beg pardon? All right. Times three, eight, four. Got that? We're ready, Mr. Hudson. Times three, eight, four. The answer, please. The answer is 228,864. Thank you, lightning calculator. All right, folks, the show on the inside will begin immediately. Don't miss this amazing demonstration. There's plenty of room on the inside. Follow the metal master into the tent. Thank you, friends. The show is about to begin. Come on, let's go, Harry. Abel, who's taking tickets? Oh, when will I get this flap shut? Gee, the tent's filling up. I told you he'd be a sensation, didn't I? Now we can make real plans. Where is he? Oh, he's all right. He's just changing into his costume. He's been doing it all week. Well, get him out and on the platform. If we turn this crowd over fast, we can talk plans before dinner. What do you mean, plans? Well, you think I'm going to waste my time on a carny lot all spring? But you just said... They could play it's... class dates, George. Maybe even a first-rate nightclub. What? Metal acts are big. You know that. I might even teach him some routines. Come on, help me get him going. Well, I still say we ought to stay right... Well, what? Who are you? My name is Gresham. I'm just sitting here in the trailer talking to Frank. Yeah? Well, uh, look, buddy, we don't allow nobody to... Wait a minute. How'd you know his name? Frank, who is this man? I'll handle this, Joyce. Mr. Gresham is my friend. Be quiet, Frank. All right, let's have it. I'm from State Hospital. I've come to take Frank home. In the morning when you awaken with a dull, headachey feeling because you need a laxative, you want relief, fast relief. And you get fast relief when you take gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. Sal Hepatica, taken before breakfast, brings gentle, speedy relief Usually within an hour. But if it's not until much later in the day that you feel miserable and logy because you need a laxative, well then, too, you want fast relief. And for fast relief, take sparkling sal hepatica one half hour before dinner. Get gentle, speedy relief before bedtime. Yes, for really fast relief, anytime, morning or evening, take sal hepatica and avoid laxative lag. That feeling of discomfort that continues for hours until the ordinary slow-acting laxative brings relief. What's more, because sal hepatica is antacid, it will also sweeten a sour stomach. Anytime you need a laxative, take sal hepatica and get gentle, speedy relief. Morning or night, get feeling right with gentle, speedy sal hepatica. <laughs> We 
We'll just use this desk here in the hospital boardroom, Harrington. Uh, did you bring that diagram, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. Right here, Chief. I marked the location of Frank Kent's room uh, right mm, there. Uh, here we are. Here's the corner right here. Mm-hmm. Now, if you ask me, he went out through here and right in this door here. Yes, and directly to the kitchen. Mm. Yes, from here it would be easy to get out into the yard. Sure, if you have help. Yes. Yes, I want to go over that with Gresham. Uh, what did his office say, Harrington? Well, I told the guard that we're over here in this wing, Chief. Mm-hmm. He said he'd tell Gresham as soon as he comes in. But he's not here now? No, and he hasn't been since last night. Well, it's my fault, actually. I should have made sure he kept in touch with us. Ah, he'll be back, Chief. In the meantime, we can try to figure out what happened. Yes. Well, it narrows down to this. Kent's been gone over a week. He's ten days now. Mm-hmm. Gresham can't find a trace of him. And there's nothing turned up at missing persons, either. I checked again just before we left to come out here. Mm. Well, all right, let's assume this. If a fellow patient couldn't have released Kent... And that holds because they were all locked up, too. Yes, exactly. Then the next guess is an employee. Chief, you mean one of the nurses or doctors? No, no, not necessarily. It might have been a guard. At least someone who knows these passageways very well. Yeah, and knows where Frank's room was. Yes, that's right. And finally, someone who wanted him out. Well, it couldn't have been a relative. His record doesn't list any. Well, nevertheless, somebody helped him, Miss Miller. Our job is to find out who and why. Don't worry about Frank Gresham. Joyce will bring him right back here to the trailer. As soon as the show is over? I promised you, didn't I? You don't want that audience to riot, do you? Well, all right. Can't be much longer. Well, it sure was a surprise to me, I'll tell you that. Do you care for a drink? No, no, thanks. Uh, what was a surprise? Finding out Frank was in a nut house. I hope you know I wouldn't have had anything to do with him if I'd known. You'll still have to answer some questions. As I explained, there's some doubt about how Frank got out. And you got me. He turned up here in the carny, and I hired him. That's all I know. Mm-hmm. You've always been with the carnival? Yeah, for years. What makes you ask that? When I was standing in the crowd outside, I asked some of the other performers about you. None of them seemed to know much. Oh? You ask at the front office? Not yet. I imagine the district attorney will see to that. The DA? I told you his disappearance could have become very serious. Oh, sure. Well, tell me, how did the uh, how did the DA find him here? He didn't. I did. Oh. Then he don't know you found him yet. Not yet. My job is to see that he gets back. Sure. Well, you can count on me, Gresham. Like I said, he turned up and I hired him. That's about all I know. He looks thinner than when he was at the hospital. Has he been well? You got me. He seemed to want to be alone, so I didn't bother him much. I see. They're taking a long time. The crowds are crazy about him. He'll quit in a minute. Joyce handles the questions for him. <laughs> Amazing. I, I, I had a hunch I'd find him in a place like this. That's why I looked in that magazine. Billboard? Yeah. Yeah, you tell me. Hey, you know, it's hard for me to believe. What is? Oh, that he could, well, have a couple of screws missing. He's such a simple guy. His mind isn't. He's sure nuts about figures. You, uh, sure you won't have a drink? No, not now. It's just cheap whiskey. I don't usually go for drinking myself. Take a bottle like this. Simple-minded jerk. How do you like it now, huh? Come on, you lousin up the chair. Come on, Frank. we got to change with Hey, Don't just stand there. Help me do something with him. That's my friend. You keep out of this, Frank. Joyce, lock the door. What did you do to him? I hit him with the bottle. Now, will you lock the door? Mr. Gresham is my friend. I think if I'm Shut hungry, up. you'll... I don't want to hear another word out of you. Joyce! I'm locking it. All right, all right. Now put Frank in his closet. What? You heard me. Put him in and lock it. Go on. Not now. I want to stay with my friend. Go with Joyce, Frank. Go on. Come on, Frank. In here. Please? Hey, my Frank, please? Frank, get in there. You want a belt in the teeth? No. He's your friend. Yeah. 
And don't make any noise. Any more orders, mastermind? Now, don't get smart. Smart? When you just hit him over the head? You think I'm going to let him take Frank back after all my work? He'll only find you again, Amos. I told you this was no good. Oh, look, this creep was on his own. All I got to do is change my name. And Frank's, too. What happens when he comes to? You going to keep hitting him the rest of his life? I don't have to. Why not? Do you think he'll ever come a... What do you mean? The rest of his life is over, kid. He's dead. I'm sorry, Harrington. I I was so shocked when you told me it was Roy Gresham, I I didn't get all the facts. You know how you feel, Chief? I couldn't believe it either. Uh, Harrington, you said he died from a blow on the head? Yeah, yeah. Doc hogan has got him downstairs in the morgue now. Mm-hmm. Where was his body discovered? In a boxcar. What? Yeah, in a boxcar on the railroad side, Miss Miller. Switch out about ten miles out of town. His death occurred there? No, I doubt it, Chief. There weren't any signs of fight or anything. It's, it's more like somebody killed him and then threw him in the empty car. Yes, well, we'll know more when Dr. Colgan's through. Uh, how about his effects? Everything was on him. Keys, identification, billfold. Uh, how much money? About $40. Stuff's all coming up in an envelope. Jewelry? Yeah, watch, ring, the usual. I see. Well, robbery is pretty well ruled out then. I think so. Yes. Get the state hospital on the phone, William Smith. Oh, sure, right away, Chief. I asked Gresham if Frank Kemp could turn violent. And he said if the right things happen. Yes. I wonder if they did. Haven't you even got him into his tuxedo yet? He goes on in another hour. Amo, I'm scared. You what? All right, shut the door. The door. Never mind, Frank. I wasn't talking to you. I said shut the door. Yes, Amo. Now, there's nothing to be scared about, Joyce. You saw the papers this morning. They barely mentioned that bum from the hospital. I mean here. This isn't a carny anymore, Amo. This is a nightclub. Hey, you're telling me. Forty bucks a night. The police will be looking for Frank. Don't you see that? More than ever now. So what? So what? When they find Frank, they'll know about that... that man. Ah, you think I'm a dope? You think I ain't got that squared away? Joyce, shut up. Look, kid, who was looking for Frank? Gresham, wasn't it? Mr. Gresham. Shut up or I'll throw you in the closet. What if they do find him? But who... Who will they think killed him? Me? Or a nut who escaped? You mean you're going to tell them Frank killed him? Mr. Gresham... I'm telling nobody nothing. Chances are it'll be a long time before they find us. But if they do, what then? They'll assume Frank conked them. It's natural. Mr. Gresham is dead. We know that, Frank. You're my money machine, kid. And I'm keeping you turned on full. Listen now to some good grooming advice. Every Jane and Judy and Alice goes for guys who use Vitalis. They have handsome, healthy-looking hair when they give it live-action care. So be one of those well-groomed guys. Well-groomed and Vitalis-wise for live-action care of your scalp and your hair. Get Vitalis. Do more than just keep your hair well-groomed. Keep it neater in a natural, healthy-looking way with live-action Vitalis Care. Vitalis and the 60-second workout wakes up your scalp. You actually feel the tingling difference, and she'll see the difference in your hair. Yes, be one of those well-groomed guys. Well-groomed and Vitalis wise for live-action care of your scalp and your hair. Get Vitalis. Yes, get Vitalis. Oh, 
when the doctor out of the hospital calls, let me know, Miss Miller. All right, I will, Chief. I've asked for a full report on Kent's condition. Uh -huh. At least if we understand his illness, we'll know what to expect. And where to find him. Yes, I'll get that. Oh, all right. Maybe the doctor. Yes. Chief? Harrington. I got news. Yes. Where are you? About two miles from that railroad site. Oh, where Gresham's body was found? That's right. I found mm -hmm. a carnival playing a field out there. A carnival? Yeah, yeah, Chief. This falls right into our lap. Remember that half a ticket stub we found on Gresham? Yes, yes. Did you trace it? Yeah, sure, through the printer. Gresham got it when he paid admission to this carny last night. A carnival. Of course, of course. Well, for sure, you can just about guess the rest. Yeah. Frank Kent was in the sideshow here until this morning. Yes, who with? Oh, a guy named Emil Hudson. Oh, and a dame. Emil Hudson. Yes, yes, it means plenty, Harrington. His name is on the personnel records of the hospital. Huh? Yes, he used to work there. Oh, brother, this is really narrowing down. Well, all right, let's finish it then. Uh, can you get a lead on where they are now? Uh, well, well, see, we're, we're stymied there. Yes? Looks to me like the three of them pulled out for good. <laughs> Joyce. Sit still, Frank. I'll fix your tie. Mr. Gresham... Don't I... keep mentioning him, Frank. He's my friend. Yeah, yeah, I know. Mother, I want to introduce my friend. What? He wants me to walk to school with him, Mother. May I? What are you talking about? If I walk with my friend, they can't laugh at me. Not if I'm with him. Sure. <laughs> sure. Now, hold still. You go on in half an hour. Don't laugh at my friend, Mother. Please don't. There. Now you look okay. Mother? Look. Now snap out of it, will you? You're laughing, Mother. Don't. What? Stop, I said. Frank, let go of me. Frank, Stop no. it. Stop Frank, it. Help. 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 Don't laugh. Get him all excited for. I you nuts. Relax, I said. Relax. Don't hurt me, Mother. Don't. Wait a minute. Slam the door, Joyce. You want the manager to come in here? You stay where you are. Now listen to me, Frank. We go on in a minute. And you're going to do a show. Mother. Now think, Frank. Think? Numbers. Nothing but numbers. Eight times eight. I... Uh, Tell me. Eight times eight. Tell me. The answer is 64. All right. Eight, nine, six, five times four, six, nine... Yes, thank you. Yes, that's right. Yes, I have that. Yes. That's right. Yes, thank you. No, that's all we need. Right? Chief, nothing so far. Me neither. That's all right. We're finished. Finished? What? Yes, almost finished, Harrington. Get your things, Miss Miller. You too, Harrington. You got what we want, Chief? Oh, I'm sure of it. Now let's go. Quite a change for me, Harrington. I don't get to nightclubs very often. No, me neither, Chief. Not even on a visit like this. Oh, Chief, he's coming out on the floor. Oh, yes, I see. Now All right, Harrington. You'd better take your station over by the wall. Right. See you in a minute. I hope so. have a problem? This gentleman has a problem. May I have the numbers, please? Are you ready, calculator? Ready? Six, seven, nine, six. Repeat that, please. Six, seven, nine, six. Multiplied by seven, eight, nine. Times seven, eight, nine. The answer, please. The answer is five million three hundred and sixty-two thousand and forty-four. Oh. Oh. I thank you. May we have another question, please? You, sir? 
Yes, I have a question. Go right ahead, sir. The human calculator never fails. Uh, may we have it quiet, please? Go ahead, sir. My question is... Who killed Roy Gresham? What's the Gresham? Was my friend. What's the... Wait a minute. Who killed him, Frank? Tell me quickly. Emil, stop him. Stop they put him. sister on right behind Frank? Him. Emil killed him. Emil hit him. Shut up. All right, boy. Just stand where you are. All right, just stay at your tables, ladies and gentlemen. This is all part of the show. Uh, Brophy is at the door, Miss Miller. See that he takes charge of Frank, He's all right, Chief. He isn't moving um, out of his chair. Let go of me, you clown. What are you trying to do? Hey, my can stop All right, it. take them out the side, Harrington. Come on, both of you. This show is over. One good thing, Chief. Yes. Frank is back in the hospital. He certainly is, and under good care once again, Miss Miller. Yeah, so are Joyce and Emil. Under our care. Real special. Yes. Joyce didn't stand up very well under questioning, did she, Harry? No, I'll say she didn't. She even handed us the bottle Emil used to kill Gresham. Complete with fingerprints. Well, Chief, actually, you didn't need Frank's statement at all, did you? No, Miss Miller, but it helped to unnerve both. Joyce and Emil. That, and it gave them no chance to get together on their stories. And that's why she broke down so readily. Oh, it was a cinch. After that ticket stub led us to the carney, all we had to do was phone nightclubs until we found one that had just booked a mental act. Yes, Emil boasted that he'd put Frank into a nightclub, Harrington, and some of the carnival people were only too glad to give us that suggestion. Yes, yeah, some suggestion. We find them waiting for us. Well... Frank sure got a mind, all right. I'm glad he's got a good care now and in a place where he belongs. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy tonight to join the San Francisco Junior Chamber of Commerce and station KNBC in naming our first honorary Mr. District Attorney. He is 15-year-old Alvin Julian of Sequoia High School in Redwood City, California. Alvin, at great personal risk, lowered himself into a narrow drain pipe to rescue a 13-month-old baby that had fallen 10 feet into the pit. Our first honorary Mr. District Attorney, Alvin Julian. Information on how you can become an honorary Mr. District Attorney can be supplied by the station to which you are listening. You know, ladies and gentlemen, in each of us somewhere there exists fear. A clever criminal realizes this, and often he can twist that fear into tragedy. We encounter such a man in next week's highly dramatic case of Scared to Death, and I urge you to join us for it. Until then, thank you... And good night. The next time you have a headache, take bufferin because bufferin acts twice as fast as aspirin. Here's why. You see, no tablet, no powder can relieve pain until the pain-relieving ingredient enters your bloodstream. Bufferin, with its exclusive formula, gets into your bloodstream twice as fast as aspirin. That's why it acts twice as fast as aspirin to relieve pain. So for fast pain relief from headaches, neuritis, neuralgia, get Bufferin at drug counters everywhere. B-U-F-F-E-R-I-N. Bufferin. The names of all characters in the ninth dramatization are fictitious and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role... Len Doyle as Harrington and Vicki Vola as Miss Miller, with music by Charles Paul. The program was produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert J. Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. And remember, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health, Vitalis for well-groomed hair. Sal Hepatica, Vitalis. Fred Utell speaking for Bristol Myers, who invites you to tune in again next week for... Mr. District Attorney! Murder at midnight! What's 
Which way did he go? That way. Down through the garden. The storm. It's so dark you can't see. Dr. Rudd. There. There at the bottom of the terrace. Professor Labard. Labard, why I... Oh, good Lord. What is it? He... He must have fallen down the steps, broke at his neck. He... He's dead. <laughs> Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Kabbalah. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story by Robert Newman is The Kabbalah. A rambling house on the outskirts of a small university town. And in the house, a room that seems more like the cell of a medieval alchemist than the study of a college professor. Its walls lined with ancient volumes and astrolabes and... Other curious instruments. Bent over his desk, Dr. Rudd does not hear the knock on the door at first. But when it's repeated, he says... Come in. Alan's going, Father. He wanted to say goodnight to you. Oh, yes, Alan. Good night. I was terribly sorry to hear about the decision of the Board of Trustees, sir. I mean, they're refusing to give you a grant to go on with your research. Oh, that... Well, it doesn't matter. I've about decided to give up the whole project anyway. Your book? Yes. Father, you're not serious. I I thought you were almost finished with it. I am. All but the last chapter. I just can't seem to write that without additional research. And without the last chapter, why, the rest of the book is meaningless. Well, isn't there anyone you could talk to about it, sir? Anyone who could help you? I doubt it, Alan. I think I know as much about the occult as anyone in the world. Except perhaps one man. Who was that, Father? The man I studied under at the University of Paris. And I haven't heard from him in over ten years. I'm not even sure that he's still alive. <laughs> Too bad this is the 20th century, not the 12th. How so, Dr. Rudd? Oh, it would have been very simple then. A pentacle, a pair of corpse candles, and I could summon up someone who would make things very easy for me. Yes, right now I really believe I would sell my soul for the help I need. Father, you mustn't say things like that, even as a joke. Well, you're right, Pablo. And no one knows it better than I. Well, good night, Alan. See you in the morning. Right, Dr. Rudd. Good night. I'll walk you down to the road, Alan. Oh, fine, dear. Really depressed, isn't he? Father? Yes. Not that I blame him. Four years of work. The definitive book on occultism, the supernatural. <gasps> Alan! Yes, I see it too. Someone or something lying in the road. Come on. so strangely. He looks like an Arab. wonder what he's doing around here. Anyway, he seems in a bad way. Here, I'll carry him into the house. You run ahead and tell your father. All right. In here, Alan, in my study. All right. They put him on the couch. What's wrong with him? Well, it's hard to say, but I think it's just exhaustion. Oh, Oh, his pulse is very weak. Barbara, call Dr. Stevens. Of course, Father. I... He's opening his eyes. Where? What is this place? Now, it's all right. You're among friends. We're sending for a doctor. A doctor? Oh, you're kind, but it's too late. 
Allah stretches his hand out for me. Nonsense. All you need is some food, rest. No, and... no, I, I'm dying. But if you are indeed friends, one last request. Will you grant it? If we possibly can. I am a Hajj, a Sufi. I come of a long, ancient line. Will you see that I get proper burial? Oh, yes, of course. I have no gold, <laughs> money, but... <laughs> He's fainting. Loose this robe, Alan. Right. Mm. Uh, say, he's got something hidden here. A uh, parchment scroll. The Kabbalah. You, you've taken the Kabbalah. It's all right. No, no, you must not. It's a curse. Into the fire. Destroy it. If you use it... Uh, uh. Father? Yes. Yes, he's dead. May his soul rest in peace. funeral? Huh? Our Arab friend? Oh, uh, yes, Alan. Partly. And partly about this. this. This parchment he had hidden in his robe. It seems to be a form of the Kabbalah. That's right. That's what he called it when he got so excited. Wanted you to destroy it. But the Kabbalah is just the science of letters and numbers, isn't it? Mm, it's much more than that, Barbara. It's the science of the mystical attributes of letters and numbers. The basis for almost all occultism. But this system is different from any I ever saw before. Different? How? Well, this particular system tells how a question can be written out, the letters changed into numbers and manipulated. And when the numbers are changed back into letters, they will answer the question. Listen, Professor, what do you say we try it? Try it? Sure. Of course, it's a lot of nonsense, but, well, why not? Oh, we're all right. There's paper and pencils on my desk. What are you going to ask, Father? Oh, something simple, something we can check. Me? I'm going to ask something really practical. Okay, Professor, let's go. How are you coming, Father? Almost finished. Now, let's see... Zadek, Mem, Vav. Great Scott. What is it? Look at this. Here's my question. Will we have any visitors today? Mm-hmm. And here's the answer. Two visitors. Professor Laborde and someone else. Professor Laborde? Do you remember my telling you yesterday that there was one person in the world who could give me the help I needed to finish my book? Yes, that man was Professor Laborde. Father, you you don't really believe it, do you? I don't know. Well, I've, I've told you I haven't seen or heard from him in ten years. But just hmm. the same... Dr. Rudd, look. Hmm? Look here, I got something, too. What is it, Alan? Well, here's my question. How can the professor get the money to continue with his research? Yes. Here's the answer. Call Mark Endicott. What? Of course. Oh, why don't you, Father? He's always been interested in you and your work. Well, I just never thought of it. I'll go in and call him right away. Well, Father, did you get him? Yes. Yes, it's... It's very strange. In what way? He said that he's been thinking about me a good deal lately, and... He's driving out here this evening to see me. There. That's the answer to your question. Two visitors. Professor Laborde and, and someone else. Well, he must be the someone else. You think so? Oh, of course. Somehow, I don't. Well, what do you mean, sir? I don't know. Except that I don't like it. Kabbalah's a 
washout after all. What makes you say that? Well, 11 o'clock and no sign of either Laborde or Endicott. I can't understand it. Endicott definitely said that he was driving out here and that he was leaving immediately. He probably changed his mind because of the storm. It's still pretty bad out, isn't it? Yes, but it's not like him. You think he'd phone us and let us know? Oh, perhaps that's he now. Hello? Yes? This is Professor Rudd speaking. Who? Oh, yes. What? But that's impossible. I spoke to him only a few hours ago and... Why? I can't believe it. You're sure? Oh, I see. But thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Who was it, Father? That was Mark Endicott's attorney. His attorney? What did he want? Mark Endicott was killed at about six o'clock this afternoon. Killed? On his way here, an auto accident. His attorney called to tell me Endicott had left me a $5,000 bequest for research. What? Father... The Kabbalah. It said you were to call him for the money to continue your work. It didn't actually say he was coming out here. No. Wait a minute. You mean, you really think that... I don't know, Alan. But I do know that if I hadn't called him, he wouldn't have started driving here in the storm. He wouldn't have had the accident and been killed. And I probably wouldn't have gotten the money. But, Father, if it's true, if it has some sort of supernatural power, what about Professor Laborde? It did say he was coming. Oh, please, Bob, I told you I don't know. Endicott was my friend. Now he's dead. And somehow I feel as if I... Father, the door. Yes. Yes, let's... Let's see who it is. Great Scott, Professor. If it is Laborde, do you realize what this means? Yes, sir. If it is, why, well, the thing's priceless. Absolutely priceless. Why, well, I don't... I beg your pardon. I'm sorry to trouble you, oh, but... Come in, Professor Laborde. Come in. We've been expecting you for some time now. An ancient manuscript which can foretell the future. A dead man and a visitor from the dead. As the clock strikes twelve for... Murder! And now, back to Murder at Midnight. And the Kabbalah. It's just a moment or two later, and Professor Laborde is being shown into Dr. Rudd's study. In here, Professor Laborde. Barbara, will you take the professor's things? Of course, Father. Thank you, my dear. You're very kind. But there's something I do not understand, Dr. Rudd. When you opened the door, you said you had been expecting me. Since early this afternoon. But that is impossible. Completely impossible. I mean, entirely by accident. I had no idea you lived here or anywhere near here. I lost my way in the storm, uh, knocked at your particular door by chance to, to ask for directions. Nevertheless, we've been expecting you. But excuse me, how could you have been? Alan. Yes, sir? Show Professor Laborde the Kabbalah, will you please? Right, Professor. Here you are, sir. Kabbalah? Look at it, Professor. Tell me what you think of it. <laughs> Interesting. Very interesting. Of course, I cannot be sure without examining it thoroughly. But it appears to be even older than the black grimoire. And its form resembles that of the key of Solomon. Professor Laborde, it's my belief that it is the key of Solomon. What? But it can't be. It's been written about for centuries, of course, mentioned in hundreds of works from Trismegistus down... But there's never been any proof that it ever actually existed. And still, where did you get it? From an old Arab who came here last night and died here. The main thing is we tested it. Tested it? Yes, Yes, we asked two questions. The answer to one of them prophesied your coming here. And the other, well, 
That came true, too. But this is beyond words. If it's true, then it's the most priceless discovery that has ever... Professor Rudd, may I try it? Use it to ask a question to? Well, I... I don't know, Professor Laborde. I... Uh, please. For years now, ever since I began studying the supernatural, there's been something. One thing I've always said I'd give my very life to know. If it can tell me that... You must let me, Rudd. And you must let me do it while I'm alone. Well, all right. Ah, good. Come on, Alan, Barbara. We'll wait outside. It's 20 hours. Hmm. He's been at it for quite a while. Yes. If he doesn't call us in another minute or two, we'll go in. I'm probably being very silly, but I don't like this, any of it. Why not, Father? I don't know, but... What's that? Uh, Professor Laborde, come on. Professor Laborde, what is it? What's happened? What... What are you doing? He's burning something in the fire. Oh, Father, it's his hands. He's holding them in the fire, burning oh, great them. Great Scott, Professor Laborde, stop. Stop. Have you gone mad? Fire. Only fire can burn my hands clean again. I asked. Now I must pay. Laborde. Let it go. Let go. I am coming. I will pay. Professor Laborde, come back. Quick, Alan. Okay. Which way did he go? That way. Down through the garden. The storm. It's so dark you can't see. Dr. Rudd. There. There, at the bottom of the terrace. Professor Laborde. Laborde, why... Oh. oh, good Lord. Well, what is it? He... Oh, he must have fallen down the steps. Broken his neck. He... He is dead. Gently. Yes, sir. Father, are you sure that... Yes, Barbara, I'm sure. He's dead. But what made him do it? Go running out there that way? It, it must have been something to do with the Kabbalah. He was going to ask it a question. Yes, Alan, it has something to do with the Kabbalah. And, and standing there with his hands in the fire, as if he were trying to burn them clean. Father, what was the question he asked? What answer did he get? I think... Perhaps I can guess. The old Arab, he warned us, remember? He said it was accursed, evil, that if we used it... Wait a minute, Dr. Rudd. Hmm? Laborde said he'd give his life to know the answer to that question, and now he's dead. Yes, Alan, that's what was in my mind, too. That and one more thing. Do you remember what I said just before you found the old Arab in the garden? That I'd make a pact with the devil, sell my very soul for the help I needed to finish my book? No, Father, you're not serious. You don't mean you really believe I've it. I've lived too long, my dear, seen too many strange things to disbelieve anything. If the Kabbalah is everything we think it is, if it is the key to the future, to all knowledge, if it can answer any question we put to it, then there are only two sources from which it can draw its power. One good... And one evil. And... And you think... If God had wished us to be able to foresee the future, we should be able to foresee it. On the other hand, if it's evil, well, there's usually a penalty involved. Laborde. He said something about pain, too. Who, who must be paid, and how? There's only one way to find out, through the Kabbalah itself. Give it to me, Alan. No, please, no. I'm sorry, Barbara, I must. There's no need for you to stay here, or Alan. No, Father. We'll stay, both of us. Very well. Then, here goes. You're 
shivering, darling. Are, are you cold? Shall I build up the fire? No, Elma. I'm not cold. What was that? It sounded like the outside door opening. Oh, Maybe I... Father. Father, uh, what is it? Are, are you finished? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm finished. And... And what... Look. Here's the question. Who must be paid? And how? And... Here's the answer. Turn around, and you will see. Father, the door, the door behind us, it just opened. Yes. I don't dare turn around. You needn't. Right in front of you, there on the wall. Look. Something black, like a stain, a blot. But it's spreading, moving. Like an octopus. Or like... It's shadow. It's... It's coming toward us. What... What in heaven's name is it? Whatever it is, whatever happens to us, no one shall ever again be cursed as we've been cursed. The Kabara, give it to me. Father, what are you doing? What I should have done when I first saw it. Destroy it. Throw it into the fire. It's coming closer. Closer. Professor, isn't there anything we can do? Anything that... <gasps> Father, look. The parchment burning. They are on the wall. The shadow of the Andions. In the shape of the crooks on Sata. The first cross. Good Lord. The shadow, it's wavering. Drawing back, retreating. I'm going to turn around. See what... No, wait. Wait until... All right. Now... There's... There's nothing there. The board? The board? Dr. Laborde. Someone just came in. Who's there? Who is that? Oh, excuse me. I, I'm terribly sorry. I'm looking for someone. An old man with white hair and white beard. His name's... Holy smoke, there he is. Dr. Laborde. Dr. Laborde. I can't answer you. He's dead. Dead? Who are you, anyway? Well, an attendant at a private hospital in town. We've been taking care of him ever since he got to this country. Nervous breakdown. He disappeared this afternoon, and he'd been talking about you so much lately that I had a hunch he might have come out here. Talking so about me? But he said he had no idea I lived here. Of course he knew. I told you he wasn't right in the head. That was one of the signs. Father, if it's true, if his mind was going, that would explain what he did. Burning his hands, running away like that. You mean the Kabbalah didn't have any occult power? What about the money from Endicott? Oh, just a coincidence. And what just happened? That shadow we saw on the wall? Well, it was only a shadow. It could have been just our imagination. Yes, Barbara, it could have been. But somehow, I don't think it was. <laughs> professor stands next to the body of his friend, staring at the fireplace where the secret of the ages has gone up in smoke as the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. again when death whispers from the darkness in an unknown tongue and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Dr. Rudd was played by James Van Dyke. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leder.
by experts. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, whose books have been translated into 17 languages and have sold over 10 million copies and author of the recently published detective novel, Below Suspicion. Good evening. This is John Dixon Carr. Each week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective story writers. Tonight, our guest expert is the noted mystery novelist Craig Rice. In keeping with the spirit of the holiday season, Miss Rice, herself a witty and humorous writer, has selected a hilarious and suspenseful comedy mystery by Joseph Roscoe. And now we present Carl Eastman in The Case of the Missing Mind. Again, Mr. Andrews? Doc! Aren't we the troublesome patient? Oh, Doc, you got to believe me. It's all a mistake, a terrible mistake. You see, Doc? What's your angle, huh? I tell everybody the truth, the honest truth. So I'm a lunatic? What am I doing in a nut house? <laughs> now, now. Now, look. Our nice cousins are coming to visit. All the way from Two Forks. So let's be a good boy and watch our excitement curve, hmm? Good boy, huh? Just wait till they show up. I'll tell them the way I got Shanghai here. They'll sue you for a million. They'll sue everybody. Meanwhile, if your hallucinations persist, those fantastic tales, that alleged man you murdered... But it was all real, I say. You got cotton in your ears. All that abracadabra, the Latin and the princess, Alibaba. There was no Alibaba. I never said anything about Alibaba, just Aladdin and the princess. I can't help it if nobody believes me. It's true every word. Now, calm down there, or I'll be forced to put you in a straitjacket again. Now, we wouldn't like that at all, would we? Of course not. Pleasant dreams, Mr. Andrews. And remember, this is not the Arabian night. No. No, all this... All this can't be happening to me. Not me, Kenny Andrews. Everybody's known me before. I always know the right time. But I tell this story, they look at me queer. So it does sound screwy. So it's my fault? My golly, the three fans fired, I swear it. Listen to me, someone, listen. All right. Only two weeks ago, everything's normal, see? Like always, I'm doing the best I can with an angle. Only the best wasn't so hot the last few months. I've been up the creek, the horses were dogs. My one unhocked suit was all ripped and torn by a certain Broadway bookie. That is important. Keep your eye on that suit. I was absolutely from hunger, sitting in the lobby of a cheap hotel in the 40s, when, lo, this strange-looking character walks into my life. Good morning, friend. Do you ever dream? Just like that he began, the strange-looking guy with the purple hat. Do you ever dream, my friend? I'd noticed this character before, shadowing me for days. On Times Square, I buttoned my shoe. How do you do? There he is. I lose him in Schubert Alley, and he's the man right behind me when I'm putting a slug in the automat. And now here's Mr. Queer sitting beside me. Do I ever dream, he wants to know. What is it you dream when you dream, my friend? I am interested in wish fulfillment. Say, listen, pal, are you for real? What's the idea telling me anyway? Go take a long drop. I'd like a word with you. You see, Mr. Andrews, How'd I... you know my name? I am a mystic, sir. I know all. Oh, yeah? Maybe you know where I was born. Two Forks. And now about your dreams, sir. Say, who are you, anyway? Oh, call me Aladdin. Huh? Caught you kidding. Aladdin? Yes. Would you like to try my magic lamp? The guy is strictly from a nightmare, I figure. But let him talk. Look who's selling who to Brooklyn Bridge. Answer, friend. You begin to rub my lamp the wrong way. Now, look at Mr. Aladdin. Suppose you scramble. Please, Please, fellow, put up your hands. Reach for the moon. Suddenly, the crazy little guy had me covered with a little green gun. Reach! 
I, 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 what is this? It's the cup, you fool. Do you throw away good fortune when it seeks you out? For the last time, sir, what is it you dream when you dream? The theme that keeps returning. Your heart's desire. Like a nightmare. Watch your step, Kenny, I says to myself. You're dealing strictly with a query. Humor him or you're a dead pigeon. Oh, okay, sure, bud. I get you now. I, I, I always dreamed that, that somebody suddenly handed me 50 grand and a beautiful princess. Ashkenazi! My gosh, I, I hardly get it out of my mouth when it happened. You've got to believe me, you've got to, I tell you. This weird character in the purple hat, he whips out a huge envelope, he counts out $51,000 bills, he hands them over to me, he shouts, The princess, my friend, will come later. And he disappears out of the hotel. On my honor, on my mother's grave. That's the way it all started. I warned you my story would sound like a hophead's fantasy. I don't blame anyone looking at me sideways. I, I even examined my own head listening to me tell it. Such things don't just happen. A strange character in a purple hat. A green gun. And there it is. Fifty grand. First, I don't believe my eyes. A guy like me, sharp, knows what time it is. He's strictly from Missouri. Still, them greenbacks look like the real McCoy. I stumbled over to the bank on the corner and up to a bank teller. I had to find out. Uh, would you kindly uh, mind breaking this bill for me like a good fella? Well, uh, let's... Uh, uh... The guy stared at the bill. Stared and stared. And then at me, suspicious. Uh, say, say. Goodbye, Kenny Andrews. Ten years stretch. A thousand dollar bill? Well, uh, I... He's casing it, but good. Easy, Kenny. Keep that heart still. Keep that heart still. Keep that heart still. He'll hear you. Here it comes. Yes, I... Uh, <laughs> you know, we don't get these very often at this branch, and... Uh, <sighs> uh, how would you like to have your change, sir? Clean! It was clean! 50,000 cabbages! A minute ago, I couldn't crash an edict stand, and now I'm king! My head spun round and round. I nearly passed out. Next thing I know, I'm spread out on a bed back in my crummy hotel room. I feel in my shirt. It's still there. I count the bills again. All there. Passports to heaven. Hold on to that green. Hold on. All the money in the world and the world at your feet. First, buy a new suit. Don't answer. Get rid of these rags. It's sweet at the Waldorf. Ignore it. You're not here. Don't talk. It's yours. The guy in a purple hat, he came over to you. So it's magic. So what? I heard of such a thing. I read of such a thing. You're such a wise guy. Maybe I'm dreaming. No. No, not that. No. No, please. The one time in my life. <laughs> Hello. It is real, my friend. Oh. Mr. Ladden? You are not dreaming. Oh, wonderful. You were thinking of buying a new suit. I am? I, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I yeah. am. You are not to do so. This is the only condition. You must always wear that suit. Disobey and the penalty is death. You are being watched. Remember. But everything else on heaven and earth is now yours for the asking. Happy joys, my friend. You see? This gets screwier and screwier. But Aladdin's my boy, see? No questions asked. Who cares about front when you're healed with 50 G's? Clothes make the tin horn, but when you're a prince, <laughs> that's how all my troubles began and headed me for this joint. When I can't resist anymore and go and tell the strange events to the boys along Broadway, they give me the quick brush a -roo. was unnatural. Am I dreaming, I says to myself? All right, if I am, I'm going to get rid of the silly sequence. The rags must go. I enter a ritzy dog shop. <clears throat> my good man? Yes? Uh, I was just torn to shreds on the stock exchange. You know, the highly boily Ah, uh, I see, sir. Yeah, you know the bulls? I <laughs> understand, sir. A new suit. Yeah, I want to order about a dozen. And I want them out of this world. Something with a little dash supreme. Yes, sir. Well, now, if you'd like to consider these numbers here. But just then, my eye caught something looking in at me through the window. It was another eye. 
It had a mad stare. And over it was a purple hat. And a pocket was aiming at me against the window. And without seeing it at all, I knew it was a little green gun. These charming summer worsted, sir? Look, pal, uh, what are you showing me suits for? Who said suits? I said overcoats. You said overcoats? With a fur collar. A fur collar? In July? Are you mad, sir? Why not? If I gotta wear a coat to cover my past, it might as well have a fur collar. I always visioned me in one, but only in my wildest dreams. So, next with a lot of haberdashery and gloves and this and that and a walking cane, I'm ready for anything. I'm out to live, see? Come what may. Even a dog catcher. That night in Manhattan finds me slumming at a private table in a midnight casino. The classiest spot in town. Where before I could never even afford the bar. You are the monsieur? I already had a few quickies all over the stem. By now, I am a god. Champagne, Charlie, and a bottle for every lady in a joint whose escort can claim a purple hat. All eyes were upon me with admiration, including the most gorgeous little number at the very next table. Uh, big pardon, monsieur. It's the way to smile at me, very polite. You forgot to check your coat at the door, monsieur. It is a rule of the establishment. Oh, yeah, we'll see about this. Call the head waiter. I am the head waiter. Oh, yeah, huh? Go drop dead. Gentlemen, please. That luscious brunette with the creamy shoulders sitting alone at the next table. Pierre, your manner. You disappoint me. But he's wearing an overcoat. Silence. Of... Why do you not take this gentleman's order? But uh, it is a rule of the house. Uh... Oh, rules are for the riffraff. Can you not see he is perhaps an eccentric millionaire? That he is moreover to be my guest. Oh, so, princess. In that case, Princess, a thousand pardons, your Imperial Highness. Go ahead, say it. Tweet, tweet. Kenny Andrews got the DTs. All right, don't swallow it then. But will someone please solve it for me? I am lonesome, young man. Won't you join my table? So this is the princess I was foretold. We made it a twosome, this royal doll and me. We killed three bottles, never taking our eyes off each other. Each was too entranced. Now what are we doing? We're sailing along 57 toward Park Avenue. Her head on my shoulders. Oh, can you shine? In a sky blue limousine, driven by a little midget. You hide me a little midget. Be kind to me, babushka. She is a Russian, it seems. Princess Julie, from a branch without the heads cut. And she gives off like a rose. Promise you will be very kind. Where are we going, princess? <laughs> you silly goose. Don't you remember? Oh. We are on our way to my apartment. <laughs> Sit closer. <laughs> More vodka, my darling. Mm. It is the champagne of the Volga. Sure, why not? <laughs> and what about some delicious joyva? What's that? Oh, joyva is the love candy of the Orient. Open your mouth, my little Kenusha. Oh, it's wonderful stuff. <laughs> oh, this ain't happening. This ain't really happening, is it? Oh, hush, my life. Go on, tell me more of your philosophy. Hey, where was I, Princess Baby? Angle. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's all a matter of angles, see? I'm full of them, Your Highness. In this town, if you're sharp, cut your wits, never give a sucker an even break, one can rise to millions. Uh, now, take him two forks. Two forks? Who is two forks? In Oklahoma, where I was born. Ah. <laughs> Out there, they don't even know what time it is. If I stood out there, your worship, I'd commit suicide. Mm -hmm. I ran away when I was 12. More vodka, Kenusha. You tell me about it. I must know all about you. Naturally. I live with my Uncle Iggy, see? Well, a poor yokel, he spends all his time digging, mm -hmm. digging in his backyard. <laughs> but what? Wait! <laughs> Can you tie that? <laughs> How quaint. Go on. You, my, my cousin, Your Excellency. Just as dopey. Joe and Fanny and all the rest. Mm -hmm. it, the cows give milk today? <laughs> it stifles me, get it? There's no room for a smart guy with a niche in a place like that. You listening? 
Yes, drink up, my love. So I get my first angle. I organize a cousin's club, elect myself treasurer, buy me a ticket to New York, and shake the dust forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, pretty good, huh? Mmm, <laughs> your grace. Your grace, uh, the, the room's turning sideways. Oh, come closer, my heart. Hmm? Kiss me again. Hmm. Kiss me. Hmm, it's hot in here. Then why not take off your overcoat, Kenyusha? Oh, no, 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 I'm, I, I'm all right now. Say, Princess. Hmm? Whose cane is that over there by the piano? It's not mine. No, no, my sweet. It is my husband. Hmm? Some music. You what? Oh, don't be alarmed, Kenny. She's out of town. Oh, I hate him. Oh, I hate him, the beast. He abuses me so. Oh, he does, huh? Oh, Babushka, why am I telling you all this? Because always in my lonely life I am looking for someone. In my dreams I have seen him and he has caressed my chin. Uh But the days go by and the years and he does not come. And yet, always I know that Someday, oh, <laughs> and tonight it happened at the midnight club. One blind. Oh, you're right, man. Do, do, do you feel that way too? Oh, Kenny, you do love me. Oh, do I? Oh, princess, I, I'm crazy about you, your honor, <laughs> with all my heart and soul and. It's a great privilege I never visioned. I, I'd do anything for you. You'd do anything? Anything, just to have you. Would you commit murder for me? Murder? Would you commit murder for me, can you? Well, what's that? Shh. Speak low. This is a speaker. My husband. Hmm? It's his knock. Your husband? I, I, I thought you... Would you kill for me, can you, sir? Well, he, he, he's got his key to the door. Then my gun. Take it. When he opens the door, shoot. Yeah, but, but, Do you love me, Kenyusha? Do you want me? Huh? Oh, my heart, think only that monster stands in the way. The, the door, it's open. He's coming in. The, the, there he is. What are you waiting for? Shoot, shoot. shoot. Uh, what do you dream when you dream, my friend? You killed him. My golly, it was him. Mr. Owen. Hey, Chief, you know the guy we've been getting complaints about all day with Aladdin's lamp? That raggedy bum with the fur coat in July? Casey, I want him picked up and put in a cage. He's right here now, Chief. He wants to see you. Oh, my gosh. Okay, wild eyes. I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to give myself up. Casey, don't go away. I don't want to be left here alone with this lunatic. What's up? He says he just bumped off a guy a half hour ago. What? Who'd he bump off? Aladdin. Aladdin? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that a hot one now? <laughs> I don't know what made me do it. I-, I killed him in cold blood. I-, I don't know what come over me. But she's absolutely in a clear, I tell you. And I'm willing to fly alone. Hold on there. She? Who is she? The princess whom I was doomed to meet. The princess? Why, sure. Now, I don't th- give me any more of that Arabian Nights. What the devil are you wearing a fur coat in July? I think you're crazy. I'm beginning to think so, too. Shut up. Stop shaking. Now, what about that 50 grand fairy tale? It's gone. After we killed him, we ran out of her apartment. I felt in my shirt and it was gone. We killed him. Where's the princess? She had an appointment with a hairdresser. What? Sit down. You mean that murderous... What co- murderous? I absolve her. I turned her head. For well, once in my life, I'm going to act like a man. I killed him. But I can't stand it anymore. My, my conscience has been haunting me. It's like a nightmare. You expect me to swallow that hocus pocus? What do I look like? Then don't swallow it, but please solve it for me. Where is the corpus, if any? Why are dead and to be? All right, let's go. But if you're dragging me along on a wild goose chase, I'll put you away in a padded cell. Now, come on. <laughs> It's 
Vacant. Bare. No one even lives here. Where do you see a body? Can't understand. My gosh, officer, I was just here, but now it's empty. Hey, what are you trying to pull on Can me? I help you, gentlemen? Who are you looking for? Who are you? I'm Mrs. Podolsky, the janitor. Well, who lived here last? You know a Princess Julie? A Princess Witch? <laughs> I'm afraid, mister, you got the wrong building. No one's been living in this apartment for the last six months. What about it, Pierre? You're the head waiter in this nightclub. Do you ever know or wait on such a dame? A princess. A princess Julie. Yeah. Uh, but no, monsieur, inspector. She is utterly unknown in this establishment. That's a lie! You remember Don Well just a couple hours ago. <laughs> My fur coat. She was sitting at the next table and... Yeah, you... do you know this eccentric jerk here? Huh? Take a good look at him. Monsieur, I have never before seen him in my whole life. Get back in my car, you. You're headed for the judge. Miss Princess Julie. No, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. I remember something now. She gave me a piece of paper somewhere. A phone number. Here, look, look, look. The phone number. Her hairdresser's where, where I was to call her. Instead, I gave myself up. Honest, look. Let's see. Here, here. There's a phone in that store. Go ahead, call it. Ask for her. See if I'm crazy. All right. Kenny, just one more chance I'll give you. But if you're giving me the business again, I'll tear you limb from limb. Come on. Hello? Hello. Uh, is this a hairdressing parlor? What's it? What number do you want? Who is this? Describe a ravishing brunette. Shut up. Uh, this is Inspector Ross, Police Department. Is this a hairdresser's... My dear fellow, this is a private sanitarium for the insane. What? Dr. Bennett speaking. Tell him her teeth are like a pile. Tell Shut him... Shut up, you... <clears throat> Sorry, Doc, I guess this is just a bum steer. You see, I got a prisoner here that told me that a Princess Julie... What? What's that? What's your prisoner's name? Uh, Kenny Andrews. Kenny Andrews, that's him. Don't let that man away. Get him right back here. He's an escaped lunatic. What? Well, I'll be... Now this makes sense. Look, Doc, give me your address quick. I'm delivering him myself in person, and it'll be a pleasure. Is the princess there? What do they say, huh? What do they say? <laughs> Brother, you're going home. Let me go! Let me go! Is this your man, Doc? Yes, that's him. He escaped from here two days ago. You're a liar! I never seen you before in my life. Now, damn it. Give me a hand, quick. Now, let me alone. What are you doing? I'll, I'll bust you. What? Hey, please, this is a terrific... Thank you, Inspector. It's lucky for the community you found him. Yeah, and am I glad to unload this baby. What a ride he took me for. What an imagination. Oh, he's definitely a schizophrenic, poor lad. Too bad. Well, of course, we'll just keep him here under observation until he's committed elsewhere. You notified his relatives? Yes. They're on the way now from Oklahoma. They hadn't seen him since he was a child. I hope they won't ask for his release. That would be tragic. It'd be bloody murder. Why, he's a menace. I'm sure glad you're taking him out of circulation. And that's my story. See, the whole truth. I swear it, it all transpired. Listen to me, someone. You don't believe it, then at least solve it for me. Let me out, you hear me? Open this door and let me out. Just wait till my cousins get here. That sawbone's a liar. I tell the honest truth to him, a lunatic. I'm Kenny Andrews. I always know the right time. What am I doing in the hospital? Thanks, they shouldn't have it to a dog. Open up, I say. Let me out. You again, Mr. Andrews. Aren't we the troublesome patients? You just wait till I get here. Your cousins are here That's now. You just Let's wait. calm down so, so they won't dollars. get frightened. Uh, so we can so go home with them dollars. to Two Forks. So Otherwise, we'll dollars. spend the rest of That's our it. life here. Hmm? Hmm. That's the boy. Hmm. This way, please. Kenny is ready to see you now. Oh, am I glad you guys came. If you only knew... You! 
What is it you dream when you dream, my friend? The Latin. You're dead. No. Cousin Joe, alive. Huh? Promise you will be very kind, can you, Chuck? Princess Julie! Oh, you're on there. No, Cousin Fanny, you're crazy. But my golly, what is this? Am I still seeing things? Hey, hey, you two been taking me for a sleigh ride? Oh, no, Cousin Kenny, how could we? Yokels like us take a sharp guy like you? Not your dopey cousins from Two Forks, Kenny. The cow's giving milk today? Oh, my golly, what's your angle? I, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. You will, Kenny. You remember Uncle Iggy? Huh? Digging and digging in his backyard. For what, Kenny? Wimes. Right, Uncle Iggy. Died two weeks ago. You know from what, Kenny? What? Heart shock. Huh? You know what give him heart shock, Kenny? He struck oil in his backyard and became a millionaire overnight. Huh? You know who he left his six million to in his will, Kenny? Who? You. Huh? But you're not going to enjoy it, Kenny, because you're a non-compass menace, get it? You're crazy. And that's where we come in, Kenny. You see, his will also reads that when you die or go crazy, the fortune's to be split among your other cousins. You always did suspect you'd suddenly do one or the other, Kenny. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This has all been a frame-up. Sure, sure, I get it, everything. I've been framed. You wanted to make people think I'd gone haywire. So you put up this whole, this whole mishmash. How did you know where to trail me? Easy. For a smart guy with a niche, only one place for him. New York. And we met up with a certain bookie, the rest was easy. Oh, I got a headache. I got things pounding in my ears. That, that gun I plugged you with. Blanks. That waiter at the casino. Cousin Georgie. The Sawbones. Cousin Hank. The Midget. Cousin Lou. The Janitor. Cousin Bessie. Oh, this should happen to me. To me, you crooks, you swindlers. You admit it. You stay there and admit it all. Why not? What have we got to lose now? Who to do such a thing to your own cousin? <laughs> <laughs> you remember the Cousins Club, Kenny? Well, oh. now you angle your way out of this, baby. <laughs> Come on, Fanny, you weep. Let's go. Make with the paper dolls, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, listen, your robes. You can't pull this on me. Never, you'll never get away with it. You'll see. You think you're pretty slick, huh? Wise guys. Make with the paper dolls, huh? No. God, will never keep me here. Not Kenny Andrews. Such a thing shouldn't happen to a dog. What do I do? Spray me, someone. Listen to me. All you punks, tune in on my story. Do something. What are you just sitting for? This thing's funny. Help me. Advise me. But cry it out loud. Give me an angle. <laughs> And so the curtain falls on the case of the missing mind, which was chosen by guest expert Craig Rice. Miss Rice is the author of Having a Wonderful Crime. Next week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of a New Year's Eve masquerade party with death as a guest in disguise, selected for your approval by one of the foremost leading mystery writers of the world. Until then, this is your host, John Dixon Carr, hoping you'll be with us again next week at this time. Case of the Missing Mind was written by Joseph Rusko. In our cast were Carl Eastman, Ann Shepard, Bill Zuckert, Ralph Camargo, and Bert Cowland. Music under the direction of Emerson Buckley, composed by Richard DuPage. Murder by Experts is produced and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. Bill Tonkin speaking, this is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Transcribe. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure... Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Hello? Is it Mr. Wolf? If it's for me, I'm not here. Hello? What if it's a case? 
If it is, tell him no. I will not. Hello, hello. Confound you, Archie. Do as I say. Uh-uh. Hello? Hello. Is this Mr. Wolf's resident? Yes. Is this Mr. Wolf? Uh, yes, yes. Mr. Wolf speaking. Oh. Well, now, yes. What kind of trouble, miss? Give me that phone, Archie. No. Hello? Uh, sorry, I had to turn the radio down too loud, you know. Oh, uh, may I see you right away? Well, I... Uh... Oh, I see you $1,000 for the retainer fee. Yes, 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 indeed. I'll take the case. Come right over. The address is 601 West 35th Street. I cannot, Mr. Wolf. I just cannot come there. Well, where do you live? I am staying at the Paul Hotel, room 304. Hello? Boss, that was a shot. Hello? Hello? Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. We have usually referred to this story as the case of room 304. The girl on the phone had a decided foreign accent. I wasn't quite able to decide what nationality she was, but it sounded like French. Anyway, there was what sounded like a shot, and then dead silence for a second or two. Hello? 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 Well, Archie, another woman? Bah! Mr. Wolf, I heard a shot, and then the line clicked off. Trouble. Women always trouble. I said I heard a shot on the phone. Indeed. I'm going over to her hotel and see what goes on. By all means, Mr. Wolf. Yeah. Huh? Huh? Now that I've been insulted to the tone of being called a radio... I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf, but we needed the money, and this was $1,000. If you'll excuse me, I have to attend to my orchids, Mr. Wolf. What about the girl, the shot? Hmm, fascinating, isn't it? You figure it out. Okay. I've got to get over there. Room 304, Paul Hotel. So long, boss. Good luck, Mr. Wolf. Please phone me from time to time. <laughs> Door's open. Oh, hello. Uh, who are you? Archie Goodwin. Now it's your turn. I'm Jay Bream, pilot for Jan Airlines. You seen. Yeah, I guess you have. This girl's been shot. Oh, that's all? Yeah, dead. Real dead. What do you know about this? I don't know anything. Say, who are you? Looks like you're in a spot, pal. You better start digging, haven't you? I got here a few seconds before you did. I I knocked on the door. The door was partially open, so I pushed it wide. Go on. Well, there was no answer. I I couldn't see anyone, so I came in, and there she was. You know her? Yes. Why do you think I came here? That's what I'm trying to find out. Look, what right have you got asking me all these questions? What's it to you? Did you ever hear of Nero Wolf? Of course, who hasn't? Like I said before, I'm Archie Goodwin, Wolf's assistant. Now, would you rather talk, or should I call the police? I've told you all I know. Who is she? Helen Rennie. French? I don't know. European, anyway. Why'd you come here tonight? I have a dinner date with her. You mean you did have? Yeah. Let's turn her over. There. Hmm. Had an automatic in her hand. Yeah. I never saw it before. Hey, hey, I, I wouldn't use the phone. The fingerprint. It's okay. I'll use this handkerchief. Who are you calling? My boss. Oh. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. Archie, I thought you were Nero Wolf. You sound very much like him. Please, boss, be serious. Oh, but I am. I'm here at the girl's apartment, the one who called me. She's dead. Beautiful? Yes, was very beautiful. She would be. Hmm. How did it happen? Shot. Neat round hole in her right temple. She's married and looks like she shot herself. When I turned her over, I saw a wedding ring on her finger and a thirty-two automatic still in her hand. Are you alone? 
No, a fellow named Jay Bream, a pilot. He was here when I arrived. No one heard the shot? Apparently not. No one showed up yet. Very interesting. Uh, what do you do now, Mr. Wolf? Should I call Inspector Kramer? No, say nothing to anyone. Get over here at once and bring Mr. Breen, the pilot, with you. Goodbye. <laughs> That's all you know about it, Mr. Breen? That's right, Mr. Wolf. Just like I told Mr. Goodwin here. The whole thing sounds... Hey, I just thought of something. Pray tell, Archie. It can't be suicide. Oh, and why not? How can a dead woman hang up a phone? <laughs> you finally arrived at that, Archie. Amazing. Of course she couldn't. She was murdered. Murdered? Yes, Mr. Breen. But I, I thought she committed suicide. Please, Mr. Bream, it'll be better if you don't think. Where do you stay? 321 West 19th, apartment 5. And your job? I've 10 days vacation. Started yesterday. One thing, Mr. Bream, I suggest you don't leave town. Furthermore, talk is not advisable. I strongly recommend that you adopt precautions. Yes, sir. Show Mr. Bream to the door, Archie. Yes, sir. Right this way. Good night, Mr. Wolf. Good night. I didn't want to tell you in front of Mr. Breen, but I found this in her purse when I sent him for a sheet to cover the body. Hmm. Thousand dollar check. Made out to Mr. Nero Wolf. Well, boss? I think it's time we phoned Inspector Kramer. Should I? Who else, Archie? Who else? My apologies. I forgot how heavy that phone really is. Archie. Oh. Um, do you want me to talk to the inspector? I'll do the talking. Should I hold the phone for you? You can get me some beer. Inspector Kramer. One moment. Here you are. Is Nero Wolf, Inspector? I think you had better go over to the Paul Hotel. Yeah, why? I believe you'll find a dead woman there. A dead woman? What is this, a gag, Wolf? I'm afraid not, Inspector. Well, how did you know about it? Have you been over there? Telepathy, Inspector. I'm too busy today to listen to nonsense. Telepathy. Don't give me that kind of stuff. If I find a body, I'll lock you and Goodwin up. You watch your blood pressure, Inspector. Never mind about my blood pressure. One thing, Inspector. Yeah? Would you hold off the press for the present? Why? What are you holding back, Wolf? Will you stop your idiotic jabbing to what I ask? Okay. By the way, Wolf, I suppose you know the girl's room number. Naturally, Inspector. It is room 304. So, hurry. Oh. <laughs> Dear Inspector Creamy, so fond of me. Archie. Yes, sir? I suggest you call the bank in the morning and find the person who is handing Miss Renee's account. Try to bring all her canceled checks over here. And what if they won't hand them over? Then Kramer will get an order issued to do so. Simple? Coming. Well, where's Wolf? Where do you think he'd be? In his big chair. Good evening, Inspector. Hmm. I expected you before this, Inspector. What kept you so long? If I told you I had a flat tire, would you believe me? <laughs> now start giving, Wolf. What did you know about the dead girl? Inspector Kramer, do sit down. Relax. Nervous tension is such a deadly thing. Now listen here, Wolf. Would you like some beer? Most soothing, you know. Come on. What's the dope on this case? Fill the inspector in on the details, Archie. I was here talking to the girl over the phone. It was a shot, and then I went over to her hotel and found her the same as you did, dead on the floor. And the phone was placed back on the hook. Come on, Wolf. There's more to this than that. Let's have it. Really, Inspector? Who was she? You don't know? I mean, what do you know about her? Now get this straight, Wolf. I... Please, Wolf. What's this all about? A girl's been shot. Her name is Helen Rennie. What's the dope? Did you have a ballistics report made on the gun? Well, not in this short time, but I will. How did you make out your report? Well, suicide, naturally. But Archie was talking to the girl on the phone at the time she was shot. So she chooses to kill herself talking to your assistant. Why, you big, flat-footed... Inspector, precisely how can a dead girl hang up a phone? 
Why, she... Uh... You see, Inspector, quite impossible. And now I suggest you make out your report, murder. Murder? Well, tell me, why is it you're always mixed up in these cases? That, Inspector, would be as difficult to answer as it would be to convince Archie of the danger of the female of the species. Oh, what's the use? No one ever answers my questions. I give up. Oh, Inspector, I do hope you will bring the girls' cancer checks tomorrow if they don't turn them over to us. What? The Inspector is just going, Archie. Please see him to the door. I'm not helpless. Good night, Inspector. Good night. Please, boss, can't we have just a little air in here? You've been out all the morning, isn't that enough? Gonna get me an oxygen tank to use in here. Did you contact the bank regarding the girl's account? I did. I finally talked to the head of the accounting department. He told me about our personal agent here, Mr. Renfrew. He was handling all our financial affairs. Went to see Renfrew. What did he have to say? Very little. But he seemed very upset when he learned of her death. I didn't tell him how she died. He said Helen Rene was here buying technical equipment for her government in Europe. Technical equipment? What kind? Laboratory stuff. Did she make any definite purchases? From the Arrow Company here in town, a Mr. Paul Morio is the head man of this Arrow Company. Mr. Renfrew, her agent, gave us quite a bit of an argument about coming over here today. Said it was very irregular to show bank statements. But he finally gave in. I didn't need the inspector's help. What time do we have the honor? He said he'd be here at noon. Noon? You know I'll be busy at that time. Well, I didn't think you'd let... Archie, you never do. Your lunch will keep just this once, Mr. Wolf. Not this once, nor any other time, Archie. You know I have lunch precisely at noon. Not after, not before. Understand? Yeah. I surmise you have the address of the Arrow Lab Supply Company? Yes, sir. You want me to go have a talk with Mr. Morio who runs the place? Sometimes, Archie. Your conclusions are fantastic. I'm leaving. Uh, one thing more. And? After you return from your visit with Mr. Morio, would you be so kind as to entertain Mr. Renfrew until after my lunch? And don't stand there with the door open. Sorry, boss. I'll go out through the coal chute. Do forgive me. <laughs> Oh, uh, Mr. Morio in? Yeah, I'm Morio. My name's Archie, Archie Goodwin. What can I do for you, Goodwin? I'm Nero Wolf's assistant. You've heard of Nero Wolf? I don't get around much. Tell me about him. How should I answer that? Any way you like. Nero Wolf's a detective. Did you ever hear of a Miss Rene? Stop shadow boxing, Mr. Goodwin. What's on your mind? I understand you sold Miss Rene some laboratory equipment. Is it a jail term? Now listen, Mr. Goodwin, I have a nice, respectable business here, so what do you want? Spill it. When did you last see Miss Rene? Two days ago. Talked to her since? Once on the phone. What time was that? Yesterday morning. You called her from your office here? No, from my hotel room. Now look, let's quit playing cat and mouse. Why all the questions? Miss Rene is dead. Dead? Who did it? Now, wait a minute. You don't think I had anything to do with it? What makes you think anyone did it? It'd be the only reason cops would get into it. You know, Mario, I'm beginning to wonder just how long you've been in the lab supply business. You know what a retort is? And don't tell me it's a snappy comeback. Now, what's the matter, Goodwin? What's eating you? Look, Mario, I came here to find out something about Helen Rennie. Just what sort of equipment did you sell her? It was heavy stuff, heavy chemical work. Where is it? We don't have samples, just pictures. Yeah, we ship it direct. Oh, so the purchaser never sees what he's buying. That's right. Did I see what she purchased? I'm afraid not, Goodwin. Besides, what difference would it make? Did Miss Rene see what she bought? No, I already explained that. Now, I'm busy, Goodwin, so if you don't mind... Okay, I'll run along. Good afternoon, Mr. Morio. I'm sure we'll meet again soon. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. Yes, Archie? Just left the Arrow Lab Supply Company, and as far as I'm concerned, something's rotten in Denmark. Indeed. This guy, Morio, who runs the company, doesn't sound like a legitimate lab supply man. I think he's running some kind of a racket. What makes you believe that, Archie? Just not the type to be in a legit business. Things just don't jive. And she didn't see what she bought. You believe, then, that he would have reason to want Miss Rennie out of the way? Yeah. The guy made me see red. I wanted to take a poke at him. Archie, you're an idiotic hothead. He said it was all heavy lab stuff she bought, and it was too late for me to see it. Forget it now. Get over here as soon as you can. 
Immediately? Immediately. Have you forgotten you have an appointment with Mr. Renfrow at noon? Goodbye. Coming, coming. Hello, Mr. Goodwin. Mr. Renfrow... Well, well, who's this? My goodness, come in. Yes, uh, come in, my dear. Thank you. Mr. Goodwin, I brought my secretary along. I hope you don't mind. Mind? Why, Mr. Renfrew, how could anyone object Mr. to... Mr. Goodwin, uh, Miss Bennett. Oh, Miss Bennett? First name? Jean. Do you always use this approach, Mr. Goodwin? Only at noontime, and my name's Archie. Well, this is a happy surprise. Please sit down, Jean. Allow me. <laughs> Thank you. Well. Wasn't it Mr. Renfrew you wanted to see? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Wolf will be down shortly, Mr. Renfrew. Please be seated. Thank you. Is something wrong, Mr. Goodwin? Not a thing, Miss Bennett. Not from where I sit. I don't believe a word he says, miss. His judgment concerning women is not to be trusted. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. You're so kind. Mr. Wolf, Miss Bennett. How do you do? Mr. Wolf? Uh, Mr. Renfro, I presume. Yes. Now we can uh, get down to business at hand, Mr. Renfro. Yes, yes, by all means. I don't understand why we couldn't have discussed this on the phone, Mr. Wolf. The whole thing is highly irregular. Of course, I know you're trying to do your duty, but... Uh... I prefer not to discuss the dead girl's business affairs on the phone, Mr. Renfro. You should appreciate that. Yes, yes, I, I see. Now, uh, <clears throat> what is it you wish to know? How long have you known Helen Rene? Mm, about a month. When's the last time you talked to her? Yesterday. What time? Why, about 2.30. I called her from my room. She was here on government business. You uh, brought the cancel checks? Hmm. Uh, here you are, Mr. Wolf. Hmm. Quite sizable amounts, Mr. Renfro. Very interesting indeed. Yes? Yeah? You see, Miss Renee made some very large purchases, Mr. Wolf, and of course they were all quite legitimate. Hmm. Would you mind if I kept these checks overnight? Well, uh, I... Thank uh... you, Mr. Renfro. By the way, was Miss Renee right or left-handed? Why, uh, left-handed, Mr. Wolf? Why? Just inquisitive. Now, if you will excuse me, Miss Bennett, Mr. Renfro, I have a very urgent appointment. Well, if I could be of any more service, don't hesitate to call on me, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, sir. Oh, dear. Poor Miss Renee. I hope the person who did this dreadful thing is dealt with properly. Indeed. I, uh, I must run along now. Yes, this way. Must you go too, Miss Bennett? <laughs> Good day, Mr. Wolf. I must, then. Good day. See you soon, Miss Bennett. Well, boss, what do you think? Isn't she a beauty? I'm sure I'm not a fair judge, Archie. Do you happen to know where the Mario Warehouse is? Why, yes. It's at the other end of town near the river. It... Oh, no, not again. Nine o'clock tonight. Okay, okay. I suppose you want me to take a gander at what's in the warehouse, break in like a burglar? Archie, if your mind were free of women, I do believe you could reach phenomenal heights in this your chosen profession. Bunch of old tubes and glassware. I hope Wolf knows what he's doing. I don't. All right. Stand where you are and reach. What's it? Flip the lights on, Joe. That's better. Now, sing up and tell me what you're doing here. I beg your pardon. I'm a little deaf. I couldn't hear you. I said, what are you doing here? Oh, Ellen. I was supposed to meet her here. Makes sense, will you? You think I can? Uh, what's the matter, Mac? Visit this. Yeah, and this bird refuses to talk. Well, then knock it out of uh, You two talk it over. Don't bother telling me how it comes out. Uh, wait a minute, you... You ain't leaving. All right, you win. This night is just full of surprises. Ain't it? Let's see what you're told. Hey, who do you think you're shoving around? Just full of questions, ain't you? You know, someday you're going to end up by getting into trouble. It's illegal to push people around. I guess you better understand. Hey, are you kidding? Get the point? Now, get up. Now, talk. Why, you... You're still in a play, huh? Uh... He's out like a light, Mac. What are you going to do with him? You won't do any more snooping around here. You know something, Mac? You've got an awful disposition. 
I'm actually scared of you. You're that mean. Yeah. I'll dump him outside. Hey, boss. It's me, Archie, remember? Archie, these interruptions are detestable. Can't you see I'm busy? Is that you, Archie? I've been busy too, boss. Look at my face. I had an accident. From your appearance, I'd say that someone else had been busier. All right, Mr. Goodwin, as long as you insist upon interrupting my meditation, start at the beginning. Mr. Wolf, I arrived at the warehouse. I went inside. I saw a lot of packing cases and a bunch of old glassware, worn out junk. Two men jumped me. I came to lying in the alley. I staggered to a cab and made it home. End of story. Archie, your repertoire of words is most astonishing. And your description of Morio's warehouse is without doubt most enlightening. I thought you'd like it. And now, Archie, I suggest you get Fritz to give you a piece of beefsteak for that eye of yours. And after that? I've arranged a gathering for five o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Then I shall repair to my bed to suffer in silence. You should be more careful on these nefarious expeditions. You might get hurt sometime. Yes, I've been a careless fellow, Mr. Wolf. Good night. <laughs> Good night, Archie. Pleasant dreams. Mr. Wolf, I'm glad you called me early. I was just about to leave town for a couple of days. Uh, what is this conference about? Not at this time, sir, if you please. I'm glad you could come along, Miss Bennett. Well, I'll be happy to assist in any way I can, Mr. Goodwin. Archie. Right. Well, good evening, Mr. Morio. I knew we'd meet again. It's no fault of mine, Goodwin. Please come in. Come in, Mr. Morio. You don't want to keep the rest of the guests waiting. What do you want with me? Do I want? Nothing. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Morio. Sit down, sir. Take the red leather chair. For special guests, Mr. Morio. Yeah. Now, gentlemen, you're probably wondering why I asked you here. Naturally, you know it has to do with the death of Helen Rene. Yeah, well, we... Uh... Mr. Morio, I understand you and Miss Rene had some business transactions that involved quite a sum. That she purchased laboratory equipment. That's right. Archie told me that your warehouse contained nothing but second-hand junk. It was a shame, Mr. Morio... That this shipment was delayed by a shipping shortage. Otherwise, you might have gotten away with it. Is this why you called me over here? It is immaterial to the case at hand. Actually, I'm only interested in Helen Rennie's murder. Hey, wait a minute. You don't think I did it? Didn't you? No. Mr. Wolf, I admit everything you said about the equipment. But I've had no part in any murder. I see. Mr. Breeding, you are a pilot of Warflyer. If you had shot the girl and wanted it to look like suicide, in which hand would you put the gun? Why, uh, her right hand. Indeed. Where did you first meet Miss Rene? Boarding the plane at uh, Orley Field, Europe. Mm-hmm. Mr. Renfrew. Now look here, Wolf, this has gone too far. I won't be put through any third degree. So if you'll excuse me, I, I have to get to the dip. Sit down, Renfrew. Well, I... I... Mr. Renfrew, I'm astonished. That anyone would be as amateurs as they were in this case. I don't understand. Could it be that you killed Miss Rene and attempted to make it look like suicide because she was about to tell me that through forgeries, her bank account was $50,000 short? Well, what reason would I have to kill her? You told me yourself you phoned Miss Rene from your hotel the day she died. Yet there was no outgoing calls charged to your account. Oh, this is nonsense. Ridiculous. She suddenly became suspicious of you. And you are probably the only person here who knew that she was left-handed. Well, what does that have to do with it? She was shot through the right temple, Mr. Renfrew, while talking on the telephone. With a gun in her left hand, wouldn't it be awkward for her to twist her arm around her face and shoot herself? In your excitement, you forgot you had shot her in the right temple. And what else do you know, Mr. Wolf? That you once worked in Europe where you met Miss Rene, arranged to represent her in this country. Only you would know how much she had in the account here. I've heard enough of this nonsense. Yesterday, you made a statement. Quote, I hope whoever did this dreadful thing is dealt with properly. 
Only the police, the Nazi and I, knew Miss Rennie had not died naturally. How did you know that? Unless you are the murderer. Don't make a move, any of you. I was forced to eliminate her. She accidentally learned about the shortage and she became most unreasonable about it. Phoned you about it. Oh, dear me. So utterly weary of these melodramatics. Put up that gun. I've spent 15 years sweating, trying to get enough money to live the way that I want. And now I have it, and neither you nor anybody is going to take it away from me. I'll kill anyone who tries to follow me out of this house. All right, Miss Wolf, stand back. Mr. Renfrew, don't, please. I will take that gun from you and... Oh, Miss Renfrew. What the... Well, Inspector, you certainly arrived at the proper time, even if you are late. What do you mean, late? I've been standing out there listening to Renfrew for five minutes. Boy, that's too close. Glad he missed you, Inspector. Well, good night, Mr. Wolf. You're not so fast, Mr. Morio. I suggest you hold Mr. Morio here for swindling Miss Rennie and her government. And, uh, Archie. Yes, sir? Do you know how to care for a person who has fainted? I certainly do. Then look behind you. Your pretty Miss Bennett has collapsed. I'll get it. Hello? Is this Miss Jean Bennett? Yes. Sergeant Goodwin there? Well, well, yes. Just a minute. It's for you, Archie. For me? Mm -hmm. No one knows I'm here. Hello? I thought I'd find you there, Archie. How'd you know I was here? I figured that by the skill you expressed on reviving a patient from a deep faint. Archie, on the way home, I want you to stop by the delicatessen and uh, pick up the following things. Ham, beer, cheese, olives. My boss. How do you know you were here? Pure deduction. That's why he's called the world's greatest detective. Really? Come here. Yes. Archie, you shouldn't do... Oh. Archie. Archie, you listening to me? Oh, well, guess you didn't hear a word of it. <laughs> Good night, Archie. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Virgil Reimer was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Lucille Alex, Val Brown, Bill Johnstone, Hal Gerard, Betty Lou Gerson, Vic Rodman, and Ed Bailey. This is Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Just listen to the stars on this Sunday's big show. Jimmy Durante, Ethel Merman, Milton Berle, and Gordon McRae. Plus, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra. Your MC on the big show, of course, is the glamorous Tallulah. And you're invited. And on Theater Guild on the Air this Sunday, you'll hear the comedy The Man in Possession, starring Rex Harrison and Lily Palmer. Don't forget, hear Ethel Merman on the big show Sunday on NBC. Patient's name, Sophia Howard, age 10. Remarks, if there's anything wrong with this patient, I hope it's contagious. It'll be one epidemic the world could really stand. It's the private practice of Dr. Dana. Starring Jeff Chandler and brought to you each Sunday afternoon at 5 Pacific Standard Time. Another story from the colorful career, the private practice of Stephen Dana, M.D. That's right. I'm Steve Dana. 
You never know how things are going to turn out, I guess. I started out by trying to do something for Sophia Howard. But when it was all over, I found out I hadn't done a tenth as much for her as she'd done for me. I suppose the whole thing started two days before Christmas. Although at the time, it might as well have been two days before Columbus Day, as far as I was concerned. Because it looked like my Christmas had gone completely sour on me as of ten minutes before. And that left me with a very unpleasant chore to perform. So I called Gorsi, my nurse, into my office. Yes, Doctor? Gorsi, you know that plane reservation I made? Plane reservation? Well, yes, Doctor. You can unmake it, if you will. Unmake it? Cancel it. Oh, well, yes, Doctor. But, Doctor, you don't mean you, you can't go. You are unpleasantly accurate, Gorsi. That's exactly what I do mean. Oh, then you're not going back to your hometown for Christmas. Well, let's not rub it in, Gorsi. Let's just cancel the plane reservation. Hmm? Well, yes, of course, Doctor. But, but what happened? Oh, Mrs. Williamson's pretty bad. I just had her taken to the hospital ten minutes ago. Oh. May have to operate. In any case, I'm going to watch her pretty closely the next few days. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, Doctor. Uh, thanks. So am I. Um, you, um... Do you want me to stay in town? I mean... You mean if I said yes, you'd never forgive me. Now, Garcia, on your way. <sighs> Thank you, Doctor. Uh, but is there anything I can do for you before I go? No, I... Yes. Suppose you put in a call for me to Dr. Tracy. Dr. Dr. Carol Tracy. Yes, Doctor. I certainly will. It had just occurred to me that I was in a fair way toward getting in a pretty bad mood. I couldn't think of anything more likely to snap me out of it than talking to Trace. Yeah, her voice sounded just as good to me as ever. Uh, interested in the general subject of dinner tonight? <laughs> you know, Steve, just about every time I suddenly realize I'd like to talk to you, you call up and ask me to dinner. It's wonderful. Maybe that ought to prove something. Maybe. In any case, I'd like to have dinner with you very much. Fine, I will pick you up at seven. All right. Oh, uh... Incidentally, how's your shoulder for crying on these days? Well, that's an interesting question. Why? It looks like I'm stuck in town over Christmas. Oh, Steve, why? One of my patients went bad. I'm awfully sorry to hear that. So let's make it a good dinner tonight, huh? We'll give it a try, Steve. Yeah. I had a hunch it wouldn't take much of a try with Trace. And after an old-fashioned piece and a fine dinner, my morale was pretty high. That is, until the conversation came around to Christmas again. Now, Steve, I've been thinking about you missing Christmas at home. Well, naturally, I'm not too happy about it. I think it would have hit me harder a few years ago. Oh, don't tell me you think you're outgrowing Christmas. Mm, no, it isn't that. But I think Christmas, or rather, the way they celebrate Christmas now, is getting sort of away from the original idea. Oh? Cigarette? Mm, thanks. What do you mean? Well, take Christmas cards, for instance. Mm -hmm. I can remember not so long ago when most of them had pictures of Santa Claus or holly or Christmas trees, something like that on them. Now a lot of them have a sphere of light on an airplane riding Merry Christmas in the sky or just a big cold greetings. Yeah, I've noticed that, too. Another thing. When the subject of Christmas comes up, a lot of people throw up their hands and get a horror-stricken look on their face. If the whole occasion was something that shouldn't happen to them. But, but don't you think that that's... Just sort of a surface thing, Steve. Down inside, they haven't changed much about Christmas. Maybe. I don't know. But even so, I wish they'd realize how ugly things like that really sound. Of course, you realize I'm the original sour grapes guy. <laughs> I'm talking like this to try and convince myself I'm not going to be missing anything by not going home. I know. I've got a job you're doing. Convincing myself? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so. But, uh... Suppose I get off the soapbox for a while and you tell me about the Christmas you're going to have. Well, it's going to be a very wonderful Christmas for me, Steve, I know. My aunt and uncle live in a farmhouse up in New England. My sister and I are going to fly up there tomorrow. Farm's just outside one of those wonderful little towns. Complete and... with red brick buildings and a white steeple, huh? Uh, and snow all over. To say nothing of a big Christmas tree. An old-fashioned green one. And a turkey almost as big. <laughs> oh, you know what my Christmas is going to be like as well as I do. Yeah, Will uh, this be your first Christmas up there? No, no. We've been going up there every year for a long time. It's all like home. Oh. I'm not afraid of that uh, you can't go home again business. <laughs> From the book of the same name? Mm hmm. The guy who wrote that book proved this point pretty eloquently, it seems to me. Yeah, he did. Now, 
Oh, I'm not afraid of that. You can't go home again, business. Minister, you, you're in a strange mood. Yeah, I guess I am. Just my end of the year mood, I guess. Look, uh, I've been glooming around long enough. Suppose we... I don't know as I'd call it glooming, Steve. You know, I wish you could come up to that farm with me. You know, I'd like to, Trace. Come on, let's dance, huh? So we danced, and it was a good evening again. The next morning, the day before Christmas, I went over to Hayes General to call on Mrs. Williamson, a patient of mine who had gotten bad. She was no better. It looked like there wasn't much doubt about my operating anymore. I had a strong hunch when it would be. Yep. I'd be spending most of Christmas Day in surgery. I went back to my office, and it seemed pretty deserted without Gorsi. Funny thing about Gorsi, I always missed her at times like this. There weren't many patients, and I was through about noon. I started out the door. Wasn't sure where I was going, but it didn't matter, because before I'd gotten very far, the phone called me back. Hello? Hello? Trace. Hello, Steve. I thought you'd left on the plane this morning. That's what I mean. I can't go home again, either. Well, why not? I seem to have two emergency patients on my hands. So, I put my sister on a plane. I'm stuck here. Well, I, I'm sorry to hear that, Trace. I am, too. I know how you must be feeling. It's worse than I thought. Well, look, where are you? Pershing Heights Hospital. That's where my patients are. You want me to come over and keep you company? I'm fresh out of patients for the moment. Oh, I'd love it. Now I can cry on your shoulder. Okay, I'll see you in an hour or so. <laughs> Well, all of a sudden, that made two of us with no Christmas. It probably wasn't too noble, but I found myself feeling a little better about things. I was just about to leave my office and go over to Pershing Heights when I noticed an envelope half tucked under the blotter on my desk with my name on it in very familiar handwriting. I opened it. Yeah, yeah, it was from Gorsi. Just Merry Christmas, Doctor, on it, and down at the bottom of P.S., don't forget to get a haircut before Christmas. <laughs> That's what I like about Gorsi. Always trying to take care of me. And after looking in the mirror, I could see she had a point. So I went over to the barber shop I always went to. It was a small one with only one barber named Henry. I don't know why I kept going to him particularly. He, he wasn't the greatest barber in the town or anything like that. He was tall, stoop-shouldered, one of the thinnest people I'd ever seen. The kind that seems to be mostly bones. Now, he'd always had a slightly sour outlook on life, and today, even though it was the day before Christmas, was no exception. Getting trimmed up for Christmas, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Gonna have a big Christmas, huh? No. Uh huh? No, huh? No. Uh -huh. Well, you're the lucky one, I guess. Am I? Yeah, yeah, love. You're the lucky one, all right. How so, Henry? Because you're not having a big Christmas. Me, I'm having a big Christmas. Four kids. That's a big Christmas, Doc. Yeah, I guess it is, but you don't like it, huh? Why should I? Price is what they are. Yeah, or... there's always that, I guess. I don't guess, Doc. I know. Hey, hey, easy. No, sorry. Yeah, spend all year just holding your nose above water. Maybe you put away a few bucks, maybe you can't. So what happens? Uh, along comes Christmas. Along comes Christmas. One kid's got to have a wagon, one's got to have a big doll, one that cries. Other's got to have a tricycle. You, uh, you said there were four kids. How about the fourth one? Little stove that cooks. Oh. So we get them the things, we use up a few bucks, we run up bills... We spend months trying to get them paid off. Just about the time we do know what happens. Well? Yeah. Along comes Christmas again. No, Doc, you can have it, the whole thing, you know. Like I say, Henry doesn't have a particularly sunny outlook on life. But I must admit he sort of fitted into my mood at the moment. I got to Pershing Heights Hospital about two that afternoon. There were only two people in the waiting room. 
One was a little girl of about nine or ten with two pigtails and an awful lot of freckles who sat very quietly over near the windows. The other person, of course, was Trace. She was not looking very gay. I went over to her. Hello, Steve. Hello, Trace. What happened? My sister and I just started for the airport. We were approaching an intersection. The car ahead of us was going pretty fast, I guess. Anyway, two people got off the street at the corner. The man and his wife, apparently, and this car in front of us hit them. I stopped, of course, to give them the first aid, so uh, they're my patients. Mm-hmm. Well, how are they? Well, they're still unconscious, both of them. But it doesn't look like a skull fracture in either case. Probably simple concussion. So, I'm standing by. Well, that's too bad. Is there anything I can do? Yes. What? Take me to dinner tonight. <laughs> That'll have to do for our Christmas, I guess. I think it can be arranged. Well, Dr. Tracy. Yes, nurse? I'm going off duty now. Oh, any change in the patient? No. All right, the other nurse will keep me informed. Yes. Um, that, uh, that little girl across the room. Yes? She's their daughter. What? What? I didn't know that... Yes, she came in about an hour ago, asked if they were here. Oh, thank you, nurse. Yes. Come on, Steve, we'd better go over. Yeah. Oh, I'm sitting here. I didn't pay any attention. It never occurred to me. She wasn't with him at the time? No. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Tracy. This is Dr. Dana. How do you do? I'm Sophia Howard. Hello, Sophia. Uh, I'm your parents' doctor. I, I didn't know you were their daughter. How did you find them? The people at the corner told me that there had been an accident and described who was in it. So I knew it was Mother and Daddy. They were to meet me at that corner, and I was a little late. I've been looking in the window. Are they... They're getting along all right, Sophia. I'm afraid you can't see them right now, though. I know. That's what the nurse said. But I know that they'll be all right. I'm sure they will. Because I've been praying. Oh. Uh, you uh, live around here, Sophia? No. Where do you live? Well... That's rather hard to say. What do you mean? Mother and Daddy are missionaries. We've lived in Africa ever since I was born. Missionaries? Yes. We just got off the boat this morning. Do you have relatives around here? No. We're just passing through on our way out to some place in China. I see. But I guess it will have to wait a few days before we can leave. It shouldn't be very long, dear. A... What will you do in the meantime? Wait. Oh, but this is Christmas Eve. I know. Have you any plans, Sophia? No. Do you? Yeah. Would you like to have dinner with us, dear? Why, thank you very much. I'd like to. If I wouldn't be a bother. I'm pretty sure you won't be. Where are we going to have dinner, Steve? Well, yeah, I hadn't given it much thought. I... Wait a minute. I hadn't fixed up my apartment because I was going away. I don't even have a tree. Oh, yeah. Sophia, you've never had a Christmas in this country, have you? No. Well, then it's high time you had one. Trace, can you leave the hospital? No, I think so. They'll get in touch with me if there's any change. Okay, you and Sophia go on over to your apartment. I'll be along in an hour with all the trimmings. <laughs> Well, if it had been an award in my book for the person least likely to be running around buying Christmas trees and a turkey from the delicatessen, I'd have given it to myself. But here I was doing just that. It looked like a fine turkey, too, all cooked and still steaming. When I got to Trace's apartment, I noticed she'd found some holly somewhere and had the place looking very Christmassy. Sophia was sitting there taking it all in with those big brown eyes of hers, looking very interested, and yet... I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but she looked sort of vaguely disappointed about something. Well, I set up a tree and we decorated it. Then Trace put the food on the table and the three of us ate like we were starved. Afterward, we just sat there at the table, not saying anything for a while. The candlelight flickered over that serious little freckled face between us. Finally, she looked up at us. I want to thank you for having me to dinner. It was very nice. I wish that Mother and Daddy could I'm glad you enjoyed it, dear. It was a wonderful dinner. And the tree is very beautiful. We never had any trees like that where we were. Daddy would always fix up a bush to look like one, though. I guess Christmas is just about the same everywhere. 
I don't know much about that. I've never seen one like this, with snow and... Well, you probably know as much about Christmas as anyone, Sophia. Christmas stories and all well, things like that. They're the same everywhere. I only know one Christmas story. Oh, well, tell it to us. Oh, you probably know it, too. Well, you tell us, and we'll see. Come on. Well, all right. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field. What? Uh-huh. Keeping a watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praying God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Sophia knew a Christmas story, all right. The Christmas story. There wasn't much to say after that. And then pretty soon, Sophia went over to the window and stood looking out. Trace and I both knew she was thinking about two people not conscious in the hospital. When she turned around again, her eyes were dry. And I noticed a sort of disappointed look in her face. Sophia, what is it? Not anything, Dr. Dana. Come on, dear, tell us. Well, no. You'd think it was silly. No, we won't. What is it? Oh, I know I'm too old, really. And I know better. But you see, well, this is my first Christmas here, and... Because I lived in Africa all my life, and I didn't have time today, and then after the... The accident, I went right to the hospital and came up here. So I never had a chance to... Oh, but I know it's silly. Chance to what, dear? Well, I... I, I've never seen Santa Claus. I've never even seen a make-believe Santa Claus. Santa Claus? Sure. I know it's silly. No. No, Sophia, it isn't silly. Pretty silly of us not to have thought of it. Look, look, just sit tight, both of you. Where are you going? To find Santa Claus. Steve, isn't it too late? In quarter of ten. Where can you get one? All the stores are closed. I don't know, but I'll get one somewhere. Yeah, it sounded easy at the time, being Christmas Eve. Of course, I realized the real Santa Claus was busy, but I thought I could find a representative. An hour later, though, I wasn't so sure. I hadn't seen a one. I was standing on a corner scratching my head when the answer came to me because I was scratching my head. Henry, Henry the barber. Sure, it was pretty incongruous, but, well, he'd be doing me a big favor, and yet, well, maybe it wasn't so incongruous. Maybe I'd be doing him a big favor. I got his home address out of the phone book and went over. He was still up. So, if you're out of your mind. Yeah, Henry, maybe I am, maybe I am, but come with me anyway. You don't really mean it, do you? You don't really mean you want me to go traipsing over to somebody's place with you and play Santa Claus for some kid who should have been in bed two hours ago? Yes, Henry, I mean it. That's just what I mean, and I think you'll do it. I talked to him. I told him about Sophia, about her parents in the hospital. Maybe, maybe I laid it on pretty thick. I don't know. But I kept talking, and finally he held up a hand. That was a dirty trick, Doc. What was? Throwing in that part about the hospital and the freckles. Yeah, maybe it was. Oh, come on. Let's go. We got in my car and started back. And then discovered we'd overlooked one small detail. 
No Santa Claus suit. And then I remembered the Santa Claus dummy standing in the lobby of my office building. The night watchman let us in, and after I talked to him a few minutes, he promised to uh, look the other way. But when Henry saw the Santa Claus suit on the dummy, he shook his head. Well, Doc, it was a nice try. Oh, come on. So what if a Santa Claus suit doesn't fit perfectly? Fit perfectly? Doc, I'm not asking for a perfect fit. I'm just saying that's no fit at all. That suit was made for a guy about five feet six and 200 pounds. So look at me. Six feet tall and 130 pounds. Doc, you gotta admit that well, is. Well, let's, let's try it anyway, Henry, huh? So we tried it. And Henry was right. It was an awful fit. The sleeves hit him halfway between the wrist and the elbow. The pants came about to his knees. But in between, the suit ballooned around him like a tent on a scarecrow. Yeah, he was some Santa Claus. But he kept the suit on, and we drove back to Trace's apartment. She took one look at Henry and tried to keep a straight face. And then she motioned over to the Davenport where Sophia had fallen asleep. Yes, she is. But uh, what am I supposed to do? She's asleep. Come on, go on over to her and wake her up. Well, uh, what'll I say to her? You'll think of something. Mm. Doc, I've always given you good haircuts. I don't deserve this. Come on. Uh, all right. Hmm. Sure has a lot of freckles, huh? Sophie, huh? Sophia. Uh, Sophia. 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 Yes? Uh, wake up, Sophia. What? What? Why? It's a Santa Claus. Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, understand you wanted to see me. Yes, I did. So much. It was very nice of you to come. Oh, well, that's all right. Are there many Santa Clauses like you? Well, um, yeah, yeah. I see. You don't work for anyone in particular, then. Not exactly. Is... is that why your suit doesn't fit you very well? Uh, yeah, I guess so. But wait a minute, I said I didn't work for anyone. That wasn't quite true. What do you mean? Why, we all, I mean, all of us, Santa Clauses, we work for the same boss. We're sort of representatives of his. Who is your boss? Why, um, Santa Claus, I guess. Yeah, the real Santa Claus. Oh. And uh, as for my suit not fitting, it's not, uh, it's not supposed to fit. It isn't? No. You, uh, see, it means something when it doesn't fit. It does? Well, what does it mean? Why, it means, uh, well, it means that it's just sort of a symbol. This coat and pants, uh, see how they hang on me? Well, that means that it, well, it isn't the outer stuff that, matters so much, it's what's inside. I... I didn't realize that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got to go, Sophia. I'm very glad I met you. And thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, that's quite all right, Sophia. Uh, Doc. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll show you to the door. Was I, uh, okay, Doc? You were very okay, Henry. Uh, I want you to know how much I appreciate it. Oh, that's okay, Doc. I didn't really mind. <laughs> sure has a lot of freckles, huh? Sure does. Funny. Kind of reminds me a little of my second oldest kid. Oh? Uh, maybe it's the pigtails. Maybe. Hmm. Well, I'll be getting along, I guess. Um, Doc. What? Uh... You suppose they'd mind very much uh, over at your office building if we, uh... Well, if I didn't get the Santa Claus suit back to them uh, until day after tomorrow? No, Henry. I don't think they'd mind at all. So Henry left, and I went back inside. Trace and Sophia and I sat around a few minutes more. Once again, I had the feeling that something was missing. And I still couldn't put my finger on it. It's getting pretty late, Sophia. Ten minutes to twelve. Feel like going to bed? What do you mean? Why, here. Yeah, you're going to stay here tonight, and then tomorrow we'll see what arrangements... Oh, that's very nice of you. But I don't want to be in the way. There's an extra bed, so don't you worry about it. Well, 
All right. Thank you. Uh, excuse me? Sure. Well, what do you think of it, Sophia? Of what? Oh, the dinner, the tree, Santa Claus, the Christmas. I thought it was very nice. You know, I just figured out what's the matter. You've never thought that Christmas applied to you specifically, have you? You've never thought that all of this, well, included you. I don't know. Our Christmases have always... Sure, you've always been on the giving end instead of the receiving end. You and your parents have probably spent all your Christmases doing for others. We try to. I thought that was the way Christmas was supposed to be. Sort of... Well, for others. Oh, it is, it is. But don't you see, honey, you're included. Why, people like you, the ones who give, they are Christmas. They're what Christmas is all about, really. Can you... can you understand that? I think I can. It does make it a little different than I thought. And better. Why, sure. And all the Christmas trees and turkeys and presents in the world are... What... What's the matter? The, the presents. We, we never even got you a present. Oh, I didn't expect one. I know, but... I don't think you have to worry about a present at the fire, Steve. I have one. You do? Yes. I think you'll like it better than anything else. That was the hospital that called the fire. It... It was? Yes. Your mother and father are both conscious now. They're going to be all right. They know you're here, and they said not to worry about them. You can see them tomorrow. Oh! Oh! She just stood there, with her lips moving and tears in her eyes. But they were happy tears. We realized then what a strain she'd been under all along, how beautifully she'd held up. Trace and I looked at each other... And then we looked away. Trace took Sophia's hand and led her into bed. I stood looking out the window, thinking a lot of things. And finally, when I looked around, Trace was by my side. You went right to sleep. Must have been good now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny, Trace. What is? We were the ones who were going to give Sophia Christmas. The way it ended up, she gave Christmas to us. We thought it wasn't going to be Christmas at all for us, didn't we? Just because we weren't going to have all the material things. It was a long time ago we felt like that. It was a long time ago. There it is, Trace. Good night. Uh huh. Merry Christmas, Trace. Merry Christmas. And there you have The Private Practice of Dr. Dana, starring Jeff Chandler, Betty Lou Gerson was Dr. Carol Tracy, Mary Lanson was Gorsey, Marlene Ames was Sophia, and Henry was Bob Young. Tonight's story was written by Bob Wright, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Oh, pardon me. Huh? You know where I might find Mr. Richard Diamond? You want to hire him? Yes. Well, stop being Sebastian, friend. Come in, come in. Thank you. You're Mr. Diamond? Well, any resemblance to the Irish washerwoman is purely intentional. Do you always do your own laundry? Always. Keeps my petty cash from looking too petty. Sit down, Mr. Uh... Baxter. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Clay Baxter from Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Was a man, I guess, to be in his early 50s. Straight up, he crowded six foot three, counting the two-inch heels on his handmade boots. Looking at him, I thought of an old Remington print and suddenly felt like singing a course of Home on the Range. 
I'd like you to come to Oak Mulvey with me, Mr. Diamond. Well, why, Mr. Baxter? My brother was killed yesterday. The sheriff and the coroner said it was an accident. I don't believe it. How did you happen to look me up? I raise cattle, Mr. Diamond. I do a great deal of business in Chicago and New York. I wanted a detective with experience, someone with a good reputation. Bless you. I called a friend on Wall Street, and he recommended several men. One of them was you. I checked your background. I'm satisfied. Oh, good. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. Chicken feed. I'll pay it, and if you catch the man who done it, I'll give you a thousand dollar bonus. Oh, well, no, I, I can't leave right away. It'll take me at least five minutes to get my affairs in order. <laughs> Yeah, I can certainly see you appreciate a buck. <laughs> Mr. Baxter, I appreciate a buck like a Texan appreciates Texas. Texas? Never heard of it. How was your brother supposed to have been killed? Thrown from his horse. Skull fracture. And you don't believe it? I do not. Why? Too good a horseman. Well, it could have happened. Well, if it did, he'd have taken the fall right. Might have busted something, but wouldn't have killed him. Anything else? His wife. My brother was a wealthy man, Mr. Diamond. His wife will inherit everything. Ranch, cattle, all worth about eight or ten million. You think she had something to do with his death? You tell me, Mr. Diamond. I called Helen, told her I was off to Oak Mulgee, promised I'd send her a couple of Navajos or whatever they had out there. Then I took Clay Baxter over to my flat and threw a few things into a suitcase. <coughs> Oklahoma's dry. So's Richard Diamond. Might get arrested. I don't want to leave it here. Wouldn't make any difference if it was empty, would it? No. Got a couple of glasses. A fifth usually adds up to a full evening, but that's only when Clay Baxter isn't around. When he poured one for the road, the water line receded six inches. I had a quick one, and he finished it. <sighs> How'd that soldier? How do you feel? Oh, lively. Why don't we forget the plane? You just start running for the window and I'll climb on. <laughs> Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Population 17,091, according to the last census, and very hot in August. Baxter's station wagon's waiting at the airport, and the driver took us into town where I was introduced to the local law. This here is Sheriff Billings. How are you, Sheriff? Jim, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective from New York. Howdy, Diamond. Howdy. Private detective, huh? Oh, I've been called other things. Still ain't satisfied, huh, Clay? Not yet. And you ain't either, and you know it, Jim. How about it, Sheriff? You think Mr. Baxter's brother was killed deliberately? Coroner says it was an accident. Hit his head on a rock. That ain't what Mr. Diamond asked. Well, Will Baxter was a pretty good rider, but he could have been thrown. Yeah, All the evidence says he was. Could see plain where his horse bolted. What could have made his horse shy? Snake, maybe. Not that horse, and you know it, Jim. Well, maybe stepped in a chuck hole. He was limping right bad when he got back to the barn. No signs of anyone else near the body? Well, when I got there, some of Will's boys had already ridden out. Who found him? A couple old miners, Luke and Phineas Merriweather. Well, let's go out to the ranch, Mr. Baxter, and take another look at the spot where your brother died. Will Baxter's ranch is 40 miles from here, Mr. Diamond. Maybe you'd like to go out to my place and freshen up a bit first. <laughs> You go ahead and shave and shower. I'm going to go build me a drink. Hey, this is quite a place, Mr. Baxter. I'm glad you like it. Take a swim in the pool if you'd want, but watch out for the catfish. Catfish? I, I'm a bachelor. Don't use the pool much, and I don't usually have guests. Love catfish for dinner, so I keep them in the pool. I caught a guy once floating bodies in his bathtub. You don't say. Funny, Harvey. I showered and shaved and met Baxter out by the pool where he was feeding his catfish. I watched a pound of liver disappear like leachy nuts in the Tong War. And we all headed back to town where we picked up Sheriff Billings. Forty miles later, we pulled up in front of the late Will Baxter's ranch. A little different architecture, but just as impressive as my clients. Afternoon, Sheriff. Oh, Wilma. Afternoon, Wilma. Wilma, this here is Mr. Richard Diamond. Wilma Baxter, my brother's wife. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Private detective. Come up from New York. Oh? Well, why don't we all go in the house? It's too hot out here. Uh, Mr. Diamond wants to go out and look at the spot where Will got himself killed. Certainly. Have one of the boys fix you up with some horses. 
When you're done, why not stop back for dinner? Mr. Diamond's eating with me, and he's going to be pretty busy for a while. Now, I'll give you a rain check, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, thank you. I'd like you to tell me about New York. It's been a long time, and I've almost forgotten what it's like. Let's go, Jim. It's getting late. Bye, Mr. Diamond. Nice meeting you. Goodbye, Mrs. Baxter. Seems all broken up, don't she? Yeah. Where was she when her husband got killed? Perfect alibi. In town all day. A lot of people saw her. Mighty fine-looking woman. Mighty. We all rode down to the stables, and one of the hands saddled up three horses, and we started out across the open desert. For a man who had spent all his life riding around in taxi cabs, the experience was just short of agonizing. Just up ahead, Diamond. Swell. Never rode much, did you? No, I always bounce like this. Like to make my money belt jingle. Uh, well, here it is. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. Oh. Oh. Well, here's where they found the body. Now, uh, uh, what did he hit his head on? That rock right there. Mm-hmm. Did you take an impression of the wound to see if it matched? Nope. Why not? Never thought about it. Well, that's a pretty good reason. Anyway, let's dig that rock out and take it back with us. I spent the next minutes limping around looking for something and came up with nothing except a longing for a hot Epsom salts bath. We dug up the large rock and took it back with us to Wilma Baxter's ranch. Ooh. Oh, 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 hey. oh, 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 Diamond, this is Frank Kelly, the ranch foreman. Howdy. Detective fellow, huh? Miss Baxter told me about you. Said you was doing some investigating. Yes, sir. Scientific investigation. The way the city boys do it. What you going to do with that raw? A hopscotch. Oh, uh, on second thought, I, I think we'll take turns on tying the knots in my back. Good warm shower, and you'll feel fit as a fiddle. Well, I got a good start. I'm shaped like one. You'll find it a little bit rough out here, Don. Oh, I'll get used to it, Mr. Kelly. I hope you're right. Ain't much like the big city. Oh? Just what is the big city like, Mr. Kelly? I ain't never been there. Just what I've noticed. Looks like a man can get pretty soft living in the city. Mm, well, I'd like to show you where I was brought up sometime, Mr. Kelly. We never got around to playing cowboy, though. We were too busy kicking each other's teeth out. See you later, Mr. Baxter. So long, sir. I don't think Frank likes you, Diamond. Uh, well, what about Will Baxter's horse? I can take a look at him. Right over there in that stall. Really pulled up lame. Oh, good horse. Never figured to shy at anything. Man, look at that. Uh, his hip's swollen. Yeah, he really twisted something. <laughs> Steady, boy. Steady. Hey, that looks like an infection. Yeah, it's a funny thing. It kind of does. What are you getting at, Mr. Diamond? Oh, I'm not getting into thing, Mr. Baxter. I just said it looked like an infection. Yeah, we better tell Mrs. Baxter or Frank. Have someone take care of it. Tell me, uh, boys, if you jabbed a horse with something, would that make him bolt? Come on, I want to get back to town and talk with the coroner. Now, look here, Jimmy. Ain't my word good enough? Why, sure it is, coroner. But Clay hired Mr. Diamond to do some investigating. And he's doing it. Clay, I tell you, your brother died from natural causes. Uh, I don't think so. But if you insist, I'll show this detective fellow the body. I want the head wound matched with this rock. Okay, but the mortuary ain't gonna like it. They got him all ready to bury. The coroner led me across the street and into a funeral parlor where I took a look at the late Will Baxter. Six years with the fifth precinct homicide and a couple of dozen killings should have conditioned me. But like always, the first look shakes something loose in the middle of my stomach, and I have to keep swallowing hard. Looks right natural, don't he, Clay? Yeah. They do a good job here. Uh, bully for them. And he hit his head right here. Concussion, plain and simple. No other marks or bruises? No. Nope. While the coroner rolled the late Will Baxter into one of the back rooms and made a comparison with the head wound and the rock we'd brought in from the ranch, we went out on the front porch for some air. I lit a cigarette and thought about an old case I'd worked on five or six years before. You got a cigarette? Sure, Doc. Pick you uni all right? Hmm. Funny thing. Head wound doesn't match the rock. Sure doesn't. Mm. Wound is too deep. Rock's round and flat. Nothing sticking up to go that deep. 
Then I want an autopsy. Why? Fracture still killed him? I doubt it. When someone plans a murder, they don't count on one blow to do the trick. Bet there's nothing else that could have done it. Well, nothing you can see. I've met someone here in Okmulgee that I'm pretty sure is wanted for another killing very similar to this. Now, Doc, go make that autopsy and fast. You think maybe you found something, Diamond? You, you think Will was killed deliberately? Maybe, but we'll have to wait for the autopsy. In the meantime, I'd like to go out and visit those two old-timers. Luke and Phineas? That's right, Sheriff. Well, it's my dangerous. Come on, I'll take you out. Uh, you better wait here for the report. Mr. Baxter and I will go on out. All right, you can use my horses, so you won't have to go all the way back to the ranch. Horses? Well, the Merriweather's on the other side of town, out oh. about ten miles, no roads. Oh, horses, ten miles. I mean, never play kick the can again. <laughs> Take the horses, do you, Diamond? Uh, uh, maybe if you could find me a nice, long, thin one. <laughs> Holy Ike. Whoa, 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 stay. That's one of the Merryweathers. Well, let's get out of here. Come on, horse. Now, come on, I'm yellow, and I admit it. Now, it's, it's okay, Diamond. That's just the boy's way of letting you know not to come any farther, unless they say so. Oh, uh, swell greetings. What happens now? Hey, up there. Luke, in here. Aren't you up? It's Clay Baxter. I got a friend here who wants to talk to you. In it? Yeah, Luke? Hey, Baxter, got some friend who wants to palaver. I don't feel like palavering. Better shoot him. Giddy up. Just take it easy. Take it easy. They always act like this. Penny don't want to palaver. I got to shoot you if you don't promote. It's important. About my brother. Penny? Yeah, Luke? It's about his brother, the dead one we found the other day. Oh... All right, I guess. Let one of them come up. Baxter? Yeah, Luke? Send your friend on up. And up I went, leaving my better judgment running off across the desert. I climbed a small hill and found myself standing at the entrance of an old mine shaft. Luke and Phineas and Merriweather stood on either side, shotguns ready, pointed right at my chest. Start talking. Well, uh, uh, gentlemen, my, my name is Diamond. Don't pay no import your names. What do you want? Just wanted to ask some questions about the man you found the other day. You a policeman? Well, kind of. Shoot him. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute. I'm not a real policeman. Then what are you? I'm a, I'm a private detective. Luke? Yeah. What's the matter? It's an honest profession. A fellow's got to make a living. You a real live private detective? Well, I'm a private detective. The real live part I'm depending on. Well, my goodness gracious... Come on in and have some vittles. Huh? Why, mister, me and Finney read all them stories about you fellas. Uh-huh. We filled up one whole tunnel with all detective magazines. You fellas really are something. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Let's see your badge. Oh. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. There you are. Oh, me? Yes, sir. Well, I'll be dogged. Come on in, friend. Come on in, in. I'd like to ask you some questions about this here Dick Tracy fella. Well, one minute I'd face two shotguns, the next I was turned into an honored guest. I had coffee and biscuits with Luke and Phineas and answered enough questions about the private detective business to fill a dime novel of my own. I squeezed in enough questions to find out that the boys hadn't seen or found anything unusual when they discovered Will Baxter's body. Four cups of coffee and a dozen biscuits later, I bid the Merry Weathers a fond farewell and return to Clay Baxter. They loved you? Oh, worshipped me. Hmm. They're starting a Richard Diamond fan club. Oh, well, did you find out anything? No. Uh, well, give me your hand. I'll help you up on your horse. Oh, couldn't I just walk back? Come on, horse. Hold still. Steady, boy. <laughs> Clay Baxter, sitting in his saddle, had leaned down and grabbed my hand to help me up on my horse, and that was when he got it. His horse took out with the wounded man still up and hanging on. I booted my horse in the ribs. Oh! <laughs> I took off after Baxter like citation on a good day. I closed my eyes, prayed a little, and tried to remember every jockey I'd ever seen before. Suddenly, I looked up and spotted Baxter's horse dead ahead, standing still and right in my path. Whoa! Oh! Well, I 
guess it's just my time. If I don't die from this bullet I got in me, I'm going to do it from laughing. <laughs> <laughs> How is he, Doc? Mm, he'll be all right. Collarbone. Didn't break anything. How do you feel, Mr. Diamond? Uh, crippled. Any idea who shot Clay? No. Clay said he thought it might have been the Merriweather boys. Oh, uh, I, I, no, it couldn't have been. Why not? Well, the Merriweather boys use shotguns, not rifles. What about that autopsy, Doc? Well, come on. What about it? You was right. Will Baxter didn't die from a skull fracture. What was it? I don't know what was used for sure. A long, thin instrument. Whoever did it pulled the lower eyelid down, killed Will Baxter by jabbing something through the eye into his brain. Probably hit him over the head to knock him off the horse and then got down and made sure. And then jabbed his horse in the flank to make him bolt. Nasty way to kill him, eh? That's been done before. It's not a man's way of killing. Wilma Baxter was in town all day. When Clay comes around, tell him I borrowed his station wagon. Going out to see Wilma? Going out to her ranch. I want to take another look at Will Baxter's lame horse. And Doc, I want to borrow a pair of surgical probes. I climbed into the station wagon, close to an hour later, pulled up on the side of the road. The gate to the ranch house was another hundred yards up ahead. So I piled out, climbed the tall white fence, and slipped into the barn. Steady, fella. Steady. Steady. The horse's left flank was still swollen, very close to a serious infection. I ran my hand over the spot. <laughs> Steady, boy. There was something still stuck in the flesh, so I used the surgical probes and prayed the horse wouldn't kick my brain out. Whoa. Whoa. Steady, boy. Steady. There. Sorry, fellow. I didn't know you were a vet, Mr. Diamond. Huh? Oh, good evening, Mrs. Baxter. You know, in this part of the country, you can get shot for horse stealing. Oh, not stealing. Just taking this out of your horse's flank. What is it? That's a piece of a long needle. Might be a hat pen or something. I think you'd better tell me what this is all about. Oh, certainly. Your, uh, your husband was murdered. That's impossible. Uh, suit yourself, but he was. Somebody hit him over the head, knocked him from his horse, jabbed this needle into his eye... Then jabbed it into the horse's flank so the horse would pull up lame, look like he'd shied. The killer tried to shoot me this evening, but he missed and got Clay Baxter instead. And who do you think did this? I don't know. The method doesn't fit a man. A woman, then? Well, the blow on the back of the head rules out a woman. Too much force. What have you got left? What I started with. A man. And a woman. Very interesting theory. Mm-hmm. You're uh, from New York, aren't you? I've been there. I thought so. Your face is familiar. I haven't been in New York in at least ten years, Mr. Diamond. Oh, funny. Well, I've got to go out to the Merriweathers. Those two old miners who found my husband? Mm Mm-hmm. They saw the murderer. What? Yeah, that's why I know how it was done. I was out there earlier, and I've got to go back after a sworn statement. Well, why didn't they speak up before this? Afraid. Said it was none of their business. See you later, Mrs. Baxter. Another biscuit, Inspector? Uh, uh, no thanks, fellas. Ten's plenty. Uh, so, uh, Will Baxter was murdered, huh? That's right, and Mrs. Baxter thinks you two saw who did the killing. Gonna lay a trap, huh? Yes, Luke, gonna lay a trap. Mm-hmm. Now, look, I remembered Mrs. Baxter from someplace the first time I saw her. Then when I found out how the murder was committed, I recalled a case very similar back in New York. man was hit over the head, pushed down a flight of stairs, and his brain pierced by a hat pen. A man actually did it, but a woman planned it. The man was caught, but uh, the woman disappeared. Why'd they do it? Uh, The victim was insured. They wanted to make it look like an accident. Well, come on, we better spread out. We should have company pretty soon. The two old-timers took off their coats and gave me some beat-up pants, which I stuffed with pillows and blankets. In five minutes flat, I had two dummies sitting with me at the little table. You think they'll fall for it? Well, you can't tell, but uh, you two go on outside and wait until somebody comes in. 
I just want him to try for one of the dummies. Well, what if he tries for you? Killjoy. Luke and Phineas took their place outside the mine, and I smoked a dozen cigarettes, and then I heard someone coming in, moving quietly up the tunnel toward the light. I played it big. Well, that's, uh, that's fine, Phineas. Uh, now, if you'll just sign this statement. I rolled, and the dummy that represented Phineas Merriweather doubled over from the force of the slug. He shot again, and Luke's dummy toppled. I kicked the lamp out before he got around to yours truly. Two down and one to go, Diamond. I'm afraid I got a big surprise for you, friend. I ain't worried. You should be. There wasn't even close. You're a lousy shot. Yeah? You missed earlier this evening and got Clay Baxter instead. I'll make up for it. No, you won't, friend. Drop it. Uh -oh, uh -oh. You heard him drop it. Oh, okay, all right. Don't you? Wait a minute. Where will I get the light? Yeah. Well, hey, it's a Kelly fella. Yeah, you're getting way out of line for a ranch foreman, Kelly. <laughs> Give it to him, Mr. Diamond. Who had you kill Will Baxter? You know, Kelly, you said something today about getting soft in the city. Wonder just how soft I've gotten. Maybe you'd like to find out. Turn him loose, boys. Yes, sir. Go on now. Go to it, Mr. Diamond. I don't like getting shot at. It makes me real unhappy when anyone runs around killing people. No, uh, oh, go on. Stop him, Gordon. Shut up, Finney, and let them fight. Now, Kelly, why'd you kill Will Baxter? Well, my Baxter talked me into it, promised me a share of the ranch. And for that, you killed a man, huh? It's a big ranch. Oh, get up. to see you leave, Mr. Diamond. I hate to go myself, boys. Love them biscuits. Mm, maybe we'll get up and see you in New York sometime. Hey, Kelly's coming, too. Hmm? Doesn't like being tied with a horse like that, I guess. Finney. Uh, yeah, Duke? Fellas coming, too. Hit him with something. <laughs> sure. Richard Diamond, private detective, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of those fine Fitch products, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rowe. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, uh, things were a little slow at the office, which is my way of saying I didn't have a client or a dime. And I was indulging in my favorite form of athletics. A fast game of snooker pool with Herb Heidi, the bookie at the deluxe pool hall. Heidi was born with a pool cue in one hand and a cue ball in the other, and I was born with an eight ball birthmark. He was trimming me like a Christmas tree, and I was glad when the elevator boy from my building yelled into the door that I had a customer in my office. So I shoved off to talk to this volunteer victim. When I opened the door to my office, I saw him standing there, a dignified-looking white-haired gent, with a strong nose, a weak mouth, and the, the nice middle-class air of substantial citizenry. You're Mr. Rogue? That's right. Do you want to talk business with me, Mr.... Uh... Uh, Grant. George Grant. Yes. Oh, have a chair, Mr. Grant. No, thank you. I prefer to stand. Mr. Rogue... I understand that you have connections with the fire insurance companies, that you are sometimes retained by them to investigate losses which might have been caused by arson. That's right. Go on. Are you interested in the fire at the Matthews Fur Company warehouse a week ago? I could be. That, uh, that fire was arson, Mr. Rogue. Mm -hmm. 
I can tell you some very interesting facts about it. Oh, oh, good, good. That was a pretty important claim, wasn't it? The fire destroyed over $100,000 worth of furs. Huh? Well, start talking, Grant. I, uh, I'd like to have $1,000 before I talk with you, Mr. Rogue. Well, I don't usually pay out that kind of money until I know what I'm buying. I'm not saying a word, sir, until I get $1,000. I've been double-crossed once on this deal, and I don't intend to take a chance on getting the same treatment from you. Just how much did you have to do with this torching, Grant? I don't intend to answer that question. Do I get my $1,000, Mr. Rogue? Well, uh, come back in an hour. You have the money for me then? Yeah, yeah, come back in an hour. And your story had better be good, Grant. I'm a busy man. I haven't time to fool around with crackpots. I'll have the proof. Okay. So long now. Oh, it's four o'clock, Grant. I'll see you at five. On the dot, right? I'll be here. Say, uh, your outfit had the Matthews Fur Company warehouse fire covered, didn't they? Who is this? This is Richard Rogue. Yes, yes, we had it. $160,000 claim. Well, fine. Uh, say, uh, would you pay me 10% of what I saved you on that claim if I could prove the fire was arson? $16,000? <laughs> no. Okay, okay. Save $16,000 and lose one hundred and sixty. I can afford it if you can. Wait a minute. How can you prove arson? Well, I've got a man. He wants to talk. He says he can prove arson. I believe him. I'll give you 10000 for a conviction. I'll take it. Look, send the $1,000 retainer over here, special messenger, right away. It's important. Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Hello, Flynn. Yes, where have you been, Rogue? Well, my source of information has just been eliminated. But the deal's on. What do you mean? Well, he must have known too much. He's been murdered. Well, as I was saying, I, uh... I was as broke as a New Year's resolution when I ran across proof... But the Matthews Fur Company warehouse fire was arson. I called Louis Flynn, who headed up the Fidelity Fire Insurance Company, and made a deal with him for ten grand if I could prove that the fire was of incendiary origin. And while I was talking with him, George Grant, my witness, was killed leaving the building. Well, I couldn't afford to lose a ten thousand dollar fee right then, so I took a fast distance to the home of the late George Grant. I knocked at the door. What do you want? I want to talk with you. You're George Grant's daughter? Yes. You're the police? Uh, yes. Come in. Oh, thank you. I suppose you want to question me about my father's affairs. Yes, that's right. Come in here, please. I can't believe that Dad is dead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Believe me. And if you'll help me, I'm sure we can find the people who murdered him. Sit down, please. Thank you. Oh, uh, Miss Grant, uh, what was your father's business? Oh, don't you know? He was warehouse manager for the Matthews Fur Company. He had been for years. Oh? Did he have any enemies that you know of? No. Dad wasn't the kind of a man who made enemies. He was... Well, he was sweet. Oh, I don't know. There'd been something wrong with him for the last couple of weeks. He wasn't himself. He was worried. And it was all that blonde's fault. Blonde? Yes, Bernice Maxwell. Dad became involved with her. And he was spending too much money on her. Much too much money. Oh, uh... How long ago did he meet this, uh, uh, Miss Maxwell? Oh, about a month ago, I guess. She deliberately chased him. She must have had some reason for it. Dad was no great catch. He... He was just a little guy working for a salary, trying to get along. Oh, you say he's been acting strangely. In what way? Could you break that down a little bit for me? 
But I'll try. You see, for a while he was talking about how he was going to have a lot of money. All of a sudden, he was happy and carefree then. He was gone from home quite a bit. One night he had a meeting here with some rough-looking men. He wouldn't tell me who they were. Yes, go on. Then after the warehouse fire, he was depressed. And he... he talked about... He talked about killing himself. I knew he was in some awful trouble, but he wouldn't talk with me about it. He just kept calling Bernice Maxwell. She wouldn't answer the phone, even. Uh -huh. uh, uh, did your father talk with you much about the fire? No. Uh -huh. But I'm sure that that fire had something to do with his... his murder. I know it did. That Maxwell woman has something to do with it, too. Who do you suppose that is? I think I know. Oh, please, don't go away. I don't want to talk to anybody else. If you stay here, maybe they'll, maybe they'll leave. This is the residence of George Grant? Yes, who are you? Lieutenant Urban, Homicide Squad. Oh. Won't you come in? Uh, hello, Urban. Rogue, what are you doing here? Isn't he a policeman? No. What are you doing here, Rogue? I'm working on a case. Do you know anything about a murder that took place outside your office an hour ago? A little? I see. What are you doing out here? Well, I'm working for a client. I've got a license to do that. You want to see it? If he isn't a policeman, who is he? He's a private investigator, which is a Harvard version of a gumshoe. His name is Rogue. Richard Rogue. It is? Well, he told me he was a policeman. I, I, I wouldn't have let him in. Well, that's not very gracious of you, Miss Grant. Shut up. Miss Grant, did you give this man any information which you should have withheld for the police? Well, I don't know. He he kept asking me questions about... about my fault. I answered them. What do you know about a murder? That murder, Rogue? Who did it? I don't know. How did you get out here so fast? How did you know who the murdered man was? I don't have to answer that. Only well, he'd been up to your office to see you, hadn't he? Daddy? Miss Grant, do you know whether or not your father planned on seeing a private investigator today? Well, I don't know. He, he didn't tell me if he did. I'm getting a little fed up with your ethics, Rogue. Aren't you getting a little out of line, Irvin? You're withholding information. Can you prove it? This man was shot on his way out of your office. What was he talking to you about? Answer me. Did you see him talking to me? Oh, now let's not get technical. Well, let's do, let's do. You're going to take me down to the station and sweat me? Not if you'll be reasonable. I'm not going to be reasonable. So either pull out your cuffs or shut up. Oh, please. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Miss Grant. Believe me, I, I really want to help you. I'm going to take care of the people who are responsible for this murder. Even the cops can't keep you from doing that. Now, wait a minute, Rogue. I'm walking out of here, Urban. I'll see you later. When I deliver the killers to you so you can take a bow for the newspapers. Oh, I was burned like a bride's biscuits and feeling just as tough when I walked out of that house and passed Urban's squad car to my coupe. It didn't do my atomic temper any good when a pasty-faced gunman got out of the front seat of my car and pointed a pistol at me. Hello, Rogue. Get in. We're going places. Huh? Oh. Oh, okay, Junior. But be careful of that thing. It might go off. Where to, Junior? Straight down the street. I'll tell you when to turn. You had a visitor at your office this morning. How much talking did he do? Oh, you mean George Grant? You know who I mean. Well, he doesn't talk much. Why? Who wants to know? The boss. Hey, hey, look out where you're going, Rogue. Well, I'm not worried. I've got the wheel. Let's get this thing out of low, shall we? What are you trying to do, Rogue? Kill yourself? No, it makes me feel safer going this fast. Because you pull the trigger on that heater and you're just as dead as I am. Slow down, Rogue. Hey... Hey, that guy almost crashed us. What's the matter, bully boy? You yellow? I've got a tank full of gas, and this car will make over 100. You're going to kill us both. That's possible. As a matter of fact, it's probable. But you were going to take me for a ride anyway, weren't you? I got nothing to lose. Give me that gun. Hey, keep your hands on the wheel, Rogue. Hey, hey, give, cut it off. Give me that gun, punk. Come on. Get your hands on the wheel, Rogue. You're going to crash Give me that gun, or I'll rip right into that wall ahead of us. You know me, kid. I mean it. Now, give me that gun. Would you let me go? No. Give it here. I'll look. Come on, come on, hey Hey Well, I'll be He's passed out Hey, hey
In the struggle for the gun, I twisted this torpedo's hand around and, well, he pulled the trigger himself with me a contributing factor. He shot himself through the chest, but it didn't look fatal to me. So I drove him to a hospital and left him there. Told them to call Urban. I used the hospital phone to check up on Bernice Maxwell and found that she was a sort of a notorious babe, ran an escort service, which was legitimate enough, but she's had a few sidelines, such as uh, blackmail. I got her home address out of the book and went out there. She lived in a nice enough house out on the east side of town. I rang the doorbell. Yes? Hello, Miss Maxwell. I'd like to talk with you for a moment, please. Who are you? Uh, Let's talk about that inside, shall we? What do you mean, forcing your way in here? I mean business, Blondie. And that's what we're going to talk. Now, let's go in the other room and have a chat. You just lead the way. After all, you are the hostess. If you don't get out of here, I'm going to call the police. Don't bother, baby. I'm the police. And I want to talk to you about a fire and a murder. So just get moving. Come on. A murder? Yes, yes, a murder. Doesn't the fire surprise you, too? Sit down. I don't know what you're talking about. Who are you, anyway? That's beside the point. I want to know what you had to do with the murder of George Grant. You can talk now or later. I've got nothing but time. George Grant? He's dead? Yes, very. He was murdered about five minutes after four downtown on Grand Avenue. And I think you know who did it. I don't. I don't know anything about it. You never heard of him, huh? I knew him slightly. Oh, now, please, Miss Maxwell. You knew him better than slightly. You've been running around with him or giving him the runaround for the last month. You deliberately set a trap for him, didn't you? You mixed him up in that arson job on the Matthews Fur Company's warehouse. I don't know anything about arson. You can't come in here and threaten me. Oh, look, lady, I'm not going to be polite about this. George Grant has been murdered. You had a hand in that murder, and I'm going to get the information out of you if I have to beat it out of you. And if you think I'm bluffing, just keep on dumbing up. Now, who was mixed up in that arson job that Grant was killed for knowing too much about? Look, I'm going to count three. Then I'm going to come over there and slap the information out of you. Look... Look, if I tell you what you want to know, will you fix it with the district attorney to let me turn state's evidence? It depends on how good your information is. You have nothing on me. Now, don't start that again. You almost had your mind made up to be smart. Don't double-cross yourself. Now, come on. Talk. I have everything you need right here in this desk. Wow. Now you're talking sense. Now, wise guy, get your hands up. Huh? Oh, no kidding. Now, look, Maxwell. This is nothing you can shoot your way out of, especially with a toy gun like that. Sit down. No. If I'm going to be shot, I want to be standing up when I get it. This is a silly piece of grandstanding, Blondie. I'm going to take that gun away from you before you nerve yourself into pulling the trigger. Don't. Don't come another step. I'm telling you, if you do, I'll shoot. Ah, You don't think one bullet from that little twenty-five is going to stop me, do you? It won't, Maxwell. I'll just keep right on coming, and I'll take it away from you. And I'll put you in the pen for the rest of your life for attempted murder. I'll be there anyway. If I don't get rid of you, I'll... Don't I'll... be a sucker now. Think of those 13 steps to the death house. I'm coming after that gun, Maxwell. You take one more step and... Well, I hated to slap that gun out of your hand, Blondie, but you didn't want to shoot me anyway, did you? My arm, you're hurting me. Now talk. Who was behind that arson deal? Who was the touch off man? Hold the brain. I can't tell you. I can't. If I don't, they'll kill me. Come on. Come on. I haven't much sympathy for dames like you. You killed George Grant just as much as if you pulled the trigger on him. Now talk, baby. Talk, do you hear? Hey. Hey. Hey, Blondie, come out of it. Come on. Well... Well, I'm a son of a gun. She passed out on me. Hey, Maxwell, come out of it now, will you? Come on. All right, Rogue. Just stay right where you are. Huh? What did you do to Bernice? Well, nothing. I... Did she talk? No, no, she didn't. That's good. How did you get here, Rogue? Well, I, I drove. I... Oh, I, I, I got rid of that little pasty puss gunman you sent after me. Where is he? He's been taken care of. That's funny. That's exactly what's going to happen to you, Richard. Stand still while I get this gun out of that shoulder holster. 
Okay, okay. You're in the driver's seat. You just couldn't have learned to stay out of trouble, could you? Trouble's my business, Bob. Get up and keep your hands in the air. Oh, sure, sure. Well, if you're going to let me have it, this is as good a time as any, isn't it? Time's all right. But I don't like the place, that's all. I'm going to take you out in the country. Well, that's nice to think about. I love the country. You know I'm going to have to kill you, don't you? You know too much. Sure, sure. You couldn't stand a police investigation, could you, Bob? No. You know, you uh, you should have covered me yourself when I left the Grant house. <laughs> you should never send a boy to do a man's work. No. Now, you're yellow too, aren't you? You haven't got the guts to pull a trigger yourself. You've got a lot of nerve talking that way when you're looking down the barrel of this gun, Richard. Yeah, you're a two-for-a-nickel penny at it ten horn, Frenchie. And I'm going to take that gun away from you and make you eat it. Yes? Well, I have plans for you, Richard. I'm going to bend this gun over your head first, and then I'm going to get rid of you. For good. You haven't got the guts. No. Turn around, Rogue. Well, I... I wasn't as bad as I sounded there, believe me. I'm... I'm no hero, and... and usually when a guy has the drop on me, I... I obey orders like a corporal bucking for sergeant. But I didn't have much to lose, and... And for once, I wanted to be hit over the head. Oh, I got my wish and rolled with a blow. Those old familiar stars started to circulate around my indestructible cranium, and, and I started to black out. But I pulled myself back and hung on to consciousness. I didn't move after I fell. I, I didn't have to. You see, I, I fell with my left shoulder in the shadows covering the automatic I'd slapped out of Bernice Maxwell's hand a little earlier. When I heard this character walk away from me, I I got my right hand on the gun. He went over to where Bernice was, just coming around to this world again. I could hear him talking to her. Bernice! Bernice! Get away from me! Oh, it's you, Marcel. Where's he? Hug. He's on ice over there in the corner. You kill him? No, but I'm going to. I didn't want to do it here on your house. Drop that gun, Marcel. I'm taking over from here. What? Drop it! Marcel is over there by the piano! I was a little worried about my future as I stood there behind the cover of that piano and pumped lead at Marcel. But if I could get in a lucky shot, I... I knew I could put him away for the murder of George Grant and the arson job at the Matthews Fur Company warehouse. I'd hit him a couple of times, and his girl, Bernice Maxwell, was screaming at me to stop. But Marcel kept on trying to luck a shot into my anatomy. Stop shooting! He's hurt! Stop shooting! Don't move! Don't move! Either one of you! I still got plenty of blood here to stop you if you do. I'm going to turn you both over to the cops, baby. Yeah. Well, well, this guy will live to hang. Now, here. Yeah, tie him up. Use his necktie. Come on. He needs a doctor. Well, I'll call one as soon as he's secured. Come on, tie him tight now. He's bleeding to death. Shut up. Here now. Take my tie. Here, tie his feet tight. You're really tough, aren't you, Ralph? Well, when I'm mad, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Here's my gun, and here's the gun that's going to send your boyfriend to the chair. Now, you want to go with him, or do you want to tell me all about it? You mean I can still turn state's evidence? Were you mixed up in the murder? No. I don't know anything about that. You know about the arson deal, though, huh? Yes. Okay, baby. Now, start talking. Maybe I can get you a deal with the DA. I'll talk. I'll tell. I'll tell you everything. Well, she sang. Yeah, she sang plenty. And the words were music to my ears. When she was through singing, I tied her up tight and called Homicide to tell Urban where he could pick up a murderer and an accessory before the fact. Then I told him where I'd be later. I called Flynn at the Fidelity Fire Insurance Company and told him to meet me at the home of Paul Matthews, owner of the Matthews Fur Company, in ten minutes. He did, and we went in together. 
The butler sort of unwittingly showed us into the study where Matthews was reading. I'm Richard Rogue, Mr. Matthews. The investigator? The celebrated investigator, Mr. Matthews. This gentleman with me here is Mr. Flynn of the Fidelity Fire Insurance Company. How do you do? Well, I'm puzzled as to the purpose of your visit, gentlemen. Well, I'll unpuzzle you, Matthews. The fire at your fur warehouse was deliberate arson. Oh? Why, why, that's preposterous. It's a nice act, but no go. We're not paying the claim, Matthews. We have absolute evidence that... Let me tell you, Flynn. You made a deal with Marcel Jarnac, one of the West's leading arsonists, to start that blaze, Matthews. But you needed the loyalty of an old employee of yours, the manager of your warehouse, George Grant. Grant was an honest guy. So you and Marcel sicked a dame on him, a dame named Bernice Maxwell. Ah, you convinced now that I know what I'm talking about? No. I tell you what... Okay, then I'll give you some more dope. With Grant's help, you took all the expensive furs out of the warehouse and filled it up with a lot of junk. And then Grant sopped it all down to the gasoline and touched it off. So you want the insurance on $160,000 worth of minks and sables for burning $1,000 worth of cat skin. It was a swindle, Matthews. We're not paying the claim. The cops have the Maxwell woman, Marcel Jarnack, and a pasty-faced gunman who worked with them. They've all talked. You're through. That's the police now, the homicide squad. Show the man, will you, Flynn? Sure. Looks like the end of the road for me, doesn't it, Mr. Rogue? Yeah, yeah, it sure does, Matthews. You know, amateurs like you shouldn't go around uh, mixing up with professional crooks. That's right. Hey, hey, cut it out. Drop that gun. Matthews, hey. Here. Hey, what's going on in here, Rogue? Ah, oh, this guy, this, this Matthews tried to commit suicide. I had to take the gun away from him. That's all I've been doing all day long. Is that living... Well, it was Pasty Puss's gun that bumped George Grant. He and Marcel got the chair. Matthews and Bernice Maxwell got ten years apiece, and I got ten grand reward money for cracking the case. <laughs> yeah, I really had a time with that $10,000. Went to Mexico. Mexico City, incidentally. <laughs> ah, las señoritas. <laughs> Muy simpáticas. Yeah. Spent the month of January there. What a month, January. Oh, as soon as I get time, I'm going to write a book. You know what the title's going to be? I'm going to call it Lost January. <laughs> oh, dear. Incidentally, I hope you noticed that I didn't get my brains knocked out and make my regular visit to my alter enemy, Hugo, tonight. And... Huh? Huh? What's the idea, Rogie? I missed you. Are you mad because I threw that Betty Dame off our cloud? No, Hugo. Oh, but look, Rogie, you made a reservation. On cloud number eight? I did not. Oh, yes, you did. You said it. I said what? You said, see you next week, Hugo. You said it. I heard you. Okay, okay, I've seen you. Good night, Midget. Goodbye, Rogie. Say, Rogie, aren't you going to wish me a Merry Christmas? Oh, sure, sure. Merry Christmas, Hugo. Merry Christmas, Richard. So long. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Imagine that little dehydrated Santa Claus. Oh, well, I love everybody. And God blesses one and all. To coin a phrase. You know what I mean? The Seal Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept the great sealed book in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book 
opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a man who hated his wife because she loved him too much. With a love that even death could not extinguish. A tale called Till Death Do Us Part. the tale till death do us part, as it is written in the sealed book. The story begins in the pleasant suburban home of Chris and Blanche Worthy. It is late at night, and the moonlight shining through the window shows Chris Worthy tossing and turning in his sleep, suffering from a nightmare, a nightmare about his wife. Blanche, I don't need it. Oh, all right. Very well. Your wife is on the phone, Mr. Worthy. Blanche, this is the fifth time you've called me this morning. Chris, your wife is waiting in your office for you. Darling, it looks like rain. I brought your raincoat. Blanche, you know there isn't a cloud in the sky. You've got to stop this coming to the office all the time. Your wife is on the phone, Mr. Worthy. Uh, Blanche is waiting in your office for you, Chris. Darling, I've come to drive you home. Mrs. Uh, Worthy is on the phone, sir. Chris, is there Wait, something I can do? Your wife is waiting on the phone. Oh, no. No, no. Why won't you leave me alone for a while? Leave me alone. Chris. Chris, darling, wake up. You're having no. another nightmare. What? Oh, Blanche. Oh, you were having a nightmare, no. dear. I awakened you. Oh, yes, yes. I remember now. It was all so real. Can I get you something, darling? No, it isn't necessary. Perhaps a glass of warm milk might help. Please, Blanche, I don't want anything. Well, now, don't you think you'd better see a doctor, dear? Uh, You've been having these nightmares for several weeks now. A doctor can't help me. Blanche, we can't go on this way. Can't go on what way? What do you mean? I've never been able to tell you, but I will now. I can't stand living with you. Can't stand living with me. But, Chris, I love you. Yes, I know, I know you love me, but it's an inhuman love. Your love is so overwhelming, it's smothering me at every step. I must have a divorce. No, Chris. I'll never give you a divorce. For two years I fought to get you. Did everything to prevent your marriage to Anne Ballon. I have you now. And I'm going to keep you. Even knowing how I feel about you? Yes. My love for you, Chris, is greater than my pride. Oh, please, darling, let's not say any more. You'll feel better in the morning. I'll never feel better. Not while we're together. Blanche, when I get dressed, I'm going to move to a hotel. I'm leaving you. Darling, you're being ridiculous. Please go back to bed. No, I can't live with you and I won't. I'm leaving you for good. Oh, Chris, you're funny. Oh, darling. <laughs> Your wife is outside, Chris, waiting to see you. Oh, no, not again. I'm afraid so, Chris. I can't go on this way. Day after day, she phones every hour, comes down here to see me. Well, now, perhaps you had better see her, Chris. Maybe you can reach an amicable agreement with No, her. not with Blanche. Martin, there's only one way out for me. I must leave town, disappear. Leave town? What's your business? That doesn't matter now. Nothing matters but to be free. I'm leaving the running of the business in your hands. 
Yes, but where are you going? I haven't decided yet. All I know is it's going to be someplace far away. Someplace where even Blanche can't find me. Come in, Chris. Hello, Tuppy. Glad you remember me. I sure do. You were the best tackle Yale ever had outside of myself. (laughs) Well, what are you doing in Texas? Looking for a job? Looking for a job? Are you kidding? What about that flourishing business you've got back in New York? I've left it and everything else behind. My name is Richard Keller now. Chris, you haven't gotten into a jam. I mean, the law isn't after you, is it? No, Tuppy, the law isn't after me. It's a personal matter. Oh. Well, sit down. Tell me about it. Tuppy, I'd rather not talk about it. Not just now. Sure, Chris, I understand. Can you give me a job as Richard Keller? Can I give you a job? Why, this company's dying on its feet for men like you. You're hired. Oh, this is room 313. Will you send up a waiter, please? Oh, and the morning paper. Thank you. service. Come in. Hello, darling. Blanche. Yes, darling. How are you? I changed my name. I traveled all over the West before coming here. Never told anyone where I was. How did you find me? Oh, I love you, Chris. No matter where you went or how far it was, I'd find you. What do you want? Oh, I want you to come home. No, never. I'm not coming back and that's final. But Chris, I'm your wife and I love you. Oh, just give me another chance, darling. I'll do whatever you want me to if you'll only come home. No, it'll just be the same thing all over again. No, it won't, dear. I'll change. Really, I will. Do you remember your objecting to my calling you every hour at the office? Well, I promise I won't anymore. You mean that? Yes, Chris, I do. Won't you please come home? All right, all right. We'll have another try at it. But this is the last time. Oh, Chris... You'll never regret it. Gentlemen, this is to inform you that your order, the 25th, was shipped. No, I... I'll answer it, Miss Nelson. Hello? Hello, darling. How are you? Blanche! Oh, just a minute. Are we all, Miss Nelson? We'll finish the letter later. Yes, Mr. Worthy. Blanche, this is the fourth time you've called this morning. The one thing you promised you wouldn't do. But I only wanted to know if you wanted me to drive in and pick you up. Oh, I'm sorry, dear, if I've upset you. You say that every time you call. I see now that I'll never be rid of the sound of your voice till death parts us. Death. Please, darling, say you aren't angry with me. You know I love you. Chris. Chris. Till death do us part. She were to die. I'd be free. Free. I could answer the phone. I know it wasn't she. Hello? Oh, darling, what happened? We were disconnected, dear. Oh. oh, Chris, I thought something might have happened to you. No, I'm all right, dear. I'm sorry I spoke so harshly to you before. Oh, you know I don't mind, Chris. It's your nerves. You work too hard. Yes. You know, I think I need a vacation. What do you say if you and I go away for a few days? Oh. Go to the seashore? Try some deep-sea fishing? Oh, Chris, darling, it'll be Thank you.
now to continue the story till death do us part, as it is written in the sealed book. Having made his plans with care, Chris Werby has taken his wife Blanche to the seashore for a holiday. And in a rented motorboat with fishing tackle spread about them, they are now far out from shore. Just Chris and Blanche. I think we're far enough out now. I'll shut off the motor. Ah, looks like a good spot. Oh, Chris, it's wonderful out here on the water. And I have you all to myself here. That's what you've always wanted, isn't it, Blanche? To have me all to yourself. Yes, darling. Oh, Chris, look. There's smoke coming out of the engine hatch. The boat is on fire. Yes, you're right. Flames are shooting out of the hatch. The whole boat is catching fire. I should have to swim for it. Oh, the gasoline tank is liable to explode any second. But, Chris, you know I can't swim, and we're a mile from shore. I'll keep you afloat until another fishing boat comes to our rescue. I'll jump first, and then you follow. But, Chris... It's our only chance. Chris, I'm frightened. Someone on shore must have heard the explosion and seen the smoke. Why don't some boats come? No boats are going to come for you, darling. Chris, what are you saying? When the boats do arrive, they're only going to find me. Chris, you wouldn't let me drown. Oh, wouldn't I? I tried to reason with you. And when that didn't work, I ran away. Oh. But you wouldn't let me alone. Well, this is the only way I'll ever be free of you. You can't do it, Chris. You can't. I love you. It's the only way I can get rid of you, so we're parting now, forever. Oh. This time, you won't follow me. I won't let you go. I won't. But you will. No. Don't break that grip. You've been a millstone around my neck long enough. There. Please, don't let me go. Save me. This is the end, do you hear? I'm free. I'll never leave you. I'll be oh, She's gone. I'm free. Free at last. Forever. <laughs> Excuse me, Chris, but there's a Miss Ballon to see you. A Miss Ballon? Ann Ballon? Yes. Oh, show her in. All right. Anne. Chris. Anne, it's wonderful seeing you again. Oh, it's been five years. Six? You left Owensville in 1938. Six years. Good deals happen in that time. Yes. Oh, I've just learned that you lost Blanche a year ago, Chris. I want you to know how sorry I am. Oh, thank you, Ann. But tell me, how's everyone in Owensville? Well, you might have paid us a visit. Owensville is still only a hundred miles away. Well, I've always meant to return for a visit, but after the way I broke our engagement and married Blanche, I was afraid you'd oh, feel... Oh, Chris, you mustn't feel that way. I got over that long ago. Well, how long are you in town for? I'll have you know I am now a resident of this fair metropolis, as of yesterday. I have a job here. Well, and it's wonderful. You may not know it, but you're going to see a good deal of me. In fact, don't be surprised if I propose to you again. Mighty soon. <laughs> house a new bride ever had. Well, if you'll carry me across the threshold, Mrs. Worthy, <laughs> you can see what it looks like inside. <laughs> I should be delighted to. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris, it's a lovely present. But you shouldn't spend all that money. What are you talking about? We were married one week today. <laughs> oh, Chris, I'm so glad we found each other again at last. We're going to be so happy together. Why, Sidney Rand. I thought I recognized you. How are you, Chris? Why, I haven't seen you since you left Owensville. Good to see you, Sidney. How are the folks back home? Oh, fine, just fine. I suppose you heard about Ann Ballon. What can you tell me about Ann Ballon that I don't already know? Well, I guess this will come as a shock to you, Chris, seeing you were engaged to her once. Ann died last month. What did you say? 
Ann Ballon died a month ago. <laughs> That's impossible, Sidney. You're wrong. Chris, I wouldn't joke about a thing like that. I was at the funeral myself with Sam Morris. But that couldn't be. Oh, it all happened so sudden. They never did find out what it was she died from. It certainly was a shock. Anne was so young and beautiful. Now she's dead. It couldn't be. It couldn't be. Chris, what's the matter with you? Chris, why are you so... Dead a month. But Anne came to New York just a month ago. And she married me. She's alive, beautiful, everything I've ever wanted. Oh, Sidney's wrong. They buried someone else, another Anne Ballon. Yes, that must be it. Anne's home, waiting for me, waiting for me. Anne! Anne, where are you? Anne! Anne, answer me, Anne! I was at the funeral myself with Sam Morris. Sam Morris. Yes. Operator? I want to put in a long-distance call to Owensville, Pennsylvania. I'd like to speak to Sam Morris. I don't know his number, but... Hello, Sam. Sam Morris? Yes, yeah, speak it. Uh, who's this? Chris Werby. You remember me, Sam. I used to live right next Why, door... Of course I remember you, Chris. How are you? Oh, fine, thank you. Sam, I, I, I want to ask you something. Sure, what is it? How, how's Ann Ballon? And Ballon? Yes. Well, didn't you hear, Chris? She's been dead for over a month. Are you sure? Am I sure? I was at her funeral. But, but Sam, couldn't they have buried someone else by mistake? Well, hardly, Chris. I saw her in the coffin just before they laid her way in the family plot. Chris! Chris! Are you there? It couldn't be, and they laid away. It couldn't be. There's someone else lying in the balance plot. Must be someone else. Must be. I'll drive out there now. I'll find out who it is. to continue the story till death do us part as it is written in the sealed book. After driving frantically for hours, Chris has reached Owensville, his hometown, and on the outskirts of town at the entrance to the ancient cemetery, he is arguing with the old caretaker who has come to the door in nightshirt and trousers. But I tell you, I have to know tonight. Can't you understand? I only want to know if a girl by the name of Ann Ballon is buried here. Look, mister, it's almost midnight. I can't go looking through any records now. You, you, you'll have to come back in the morning. Please. I'll give you $20 if you look it up for me uh, now. Uh, $20? <clears throat> All right, come in. Thank you. Uh, what did you say that name was? Ann Ballon. Uh, let's see. B, B, yeah, here we are. B, and Ballon, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she, she's here. 
Buried in the Ballin family plot, interred June 26, oh. section 15, plot 5. Can't be. Can't be. Yeah, what'd you say? I must see that grave opened. Uh, you'll have to get a court order for that, mister. I want to see it now, tonight. I'll give you $500 to open that grave. You must be crazy, mister. It's against the law. Listen, I don't want the body. I merely want to look at it. Would $1,000 make it worth the risk? Eh. Uh, Thousand dollars? Yes, a thousand. You'll never make an easier thousand. We'll be finished by dawn. Well, well. Uh, thousand dollars, huh? <clears throat> All right, I'll do it. I should reach the coffin. Blast that moon. Anybody comes past this graveyard, they can see us. You don't have to worry about anyone being around at three in the morning. Keep digging. We shouldn't be disturbing the dead. Rest in peace. That's what the minister always says. There, I've reached it. The coffin. Quick, quick, help me clear all the... Clear all this earth off it, so I can open the lid. All right. Anything to get this over with. Hurry. Hurry up. There. There, that's enough. All right, now hold up the lantern. I'll open it. All right. There you are. Now go ahead. There. It's unlocked. Well, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and open it. All right. Stand back a bit. It's... It's empty. Yes, empty. Empty. I knew she couldn't be buried here. She's alive, do you hear? Anne's alive! Anne! Anne, where are you? Here I am, Chris. Oh, Anne... It's good to feel you in my arms. Oh, why, Chris, you act as though you never expected to see me again. Well, there was a moment when I thought I wouldn't. You remember Sidney Rand, don't you? Sidney Rand? Well, yes, of course. Well, last evening as I was coming out of my office building, I bumped into her. And she started telling me all the news of Owensville. And then she told me that you'd been dead a month. That I'd been dead a month? Yes. Then when I got home, you weren't here. Well, darling, it was only my running out of gas that kept me from being home when you arrived. Well, I should have known it was something like that. But I got panicky. I called Sam Morris long distance, and he too said you were dead. I must have gone haywire after that. For I took the first train to Owensville. Chris, you didn't. Yes, I'm afraid I did. Went to the cemetery where your family's buried. And there I found your grave. Yours. Mine? Yes. And the tombstone had your name on it. And Ballin. What did you do then? I paid the caretaker to help me dig up the coffin. And when we opened it, we found it empty. <laughs> Anne, what is it? Why are you laughing like that? Anne! Chris, Anne Ballin is dead. Anne, you don't know what you're saying. You're Anne Ballin. No, Chris, I'm not. Look deeply into my eyes, darling. Don't you recognize me? Recognize you? Yes. Don't you know who I am, darling? Do you remember that day at sea? I told you I'd never leave you, remember? No, it can't be. You're Anne, you're Anne. Close your eyes, Chris. Just listen to my voice. Don't you recognize me, darling? Blanche. Yes, Blanche. Blanche and Anne's body. Because mine was lost at sea. No, it can't be. It can't be. But it is, Chris. I couldn't come back in my own body, so I killed Anne to get this one. You killed Anne? Yes, Chris. And then took her body. I did it so that you and I could be together again. No. Forever, darling. Together. Forever. Yes, forever. No. Oh, no. I'll never leave you, darling. Never. 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 (laughs) And that is the tale of Chris and Blanche Werby, Till Death Do Us Part, as it is written in the sealed book. 
when Chris was sure that Blanche had indeed returned to him, even from the grave, he tried to escape by seeking death himself, throwing himself into the sea from an ocean liner. Weeks later, his body was cast up on the shore, tightly clasped in the dead arms of the body of a woman, later identified as Blanche. So they are buried now, side by side, together forever. Keeper of the book, before you close the great volume, show us the tale we tell next time. This one. Yes. The amazing story of a man who stole millions and then found he had to steal himself a new face so he could protect those millions. But who discovered that his new face brought with it murder and sudden death. A tale titled... The Man with the Stolen Face. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Wheaties presents Dangerous Assignment. On stage tonight from Hollywood, Dangerous Assignment, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to involve my trying to poke a hole in the Iron Curtain with just one weapon, a little white pill. Morning, Commissioner. Steve, Bill Sorensen was arrested in the Balkans the other day. Bill Sorensen? He and I used to be roommates at the Naval Academy. I know. That's why you're elected. Elected to what? Sorensen was arrested on charges of espionage. His trial started today. He's confessed to a lot of things, among them being a member of Naval Intelligence. What? Now, look. If Sorensen were a member of Naval Intelligence, that's the last thing in the world he'd ever admit, Commissioner. I know. Now, Steve, we think Sorensen's under the influence of a certain drug. We think it's a new one that makes you say anything you've been told to say. Now, if we're right, if that's the drug that's being used, here's the antidote. This little white pill. Sounds like a lot of ifs, Commissioner. I know, but that's all you've got to work on, Steve. All I... Hey, now, wait a minute. You're not trying to tell me I'm supposed to go over to the Balkans and give Sorensen this pill, are you? Yes, he's being held in a jail in the city of Zava. Hmm. <laughs> Look, isn't there anyone who can help me? Yes. Here's a torn page out of a book, Steve. 
Take it to the Vinesh Bookshop in Zava. You'll find help there. Now, Steve, get over there. Administer the antidote to Sorensen, and then get him and yourself out of there if possible. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. Dangerous Assignment will continue in just a moment. But first, a word from Frank Martin, the Wheaties man. Say, speaking of Wheaties, breakfast of champions. If you've got a small baseball player around your house, the kind who comes in from the corner lot barely in time for supper, we've got a message for him. It's from Jackie Robinson, pride of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and a Wheaties fan. My advice on training, Jackie Robinson says, is to start young, get lots of Wheaties, nourishing, swell eating. And you bet they are. Wheaties, nourishing. Vitamins, minerals, food energy. You can't beat whole wheat for nourishment. And you can't beat Wheaties for whole wheat. For kids, for grown-ups. There you are. Whole wheat flakes with milk and fruit. This champion recommends them. If you've got a growing-up champion on hand, dish them out. And have some yourself, huh? Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Now, here is Dangerous Assignment. Starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. Yeah, this is a job I'm going to love. I can see that already. Steve Mitchell, armed with a book page and a pill, saves the day. But the only thing that's worrying me is who's going to save Steve Mitchell. It's Tuesday when I get to the Benish Bookshop in Zarva. I flash the torn book page to Benish, and he leads me into the back room. Here you are, Mitchell, the floor plan of the prison. Study it carefully. <laughs> hey, brother, this makes Alcatraz look like a country club. Now, here is the cell on the third floor where Sorensen is imprisoned. On the floor, directly below, is the courtroom where his trial is being held. Yeah, and here's the nearest outside door on the ground floor below the courtroom. Yes, at five o'clock this afternoon, there will be a truck outside the door. But it can only stay there for three minutes. The trial will continue all afternoon. If you and Sorensen can get to that door around five, you can make your escape in that truck. Well, you told me how to get out of the place, but you've omitted a couple of small details like how am I going to get into the place and how am I going to slip this pill to Sorensen? How you give him the pill will have to be up to you, Mitchell. But this camera and these forged identification papers identify you as an employee of World Photos. And you will be given admittance to the trial. I see. Uh, Look, have you any idea what Sorensen found out that they didn't want him to know? I do not know. But you had better get over to the prison, Mitchell. You have no time to lose. Remember, the truck will be waiting outside the gate at five this afternoon. May I have your attention, please? Quiet! Please. Thank you. Allow me to introduce myself to the press. I am Colonel Mitro, commandant of this prison. Now, I have gathered your reporters and photographers together in order to examine your papers. Uh, You, sir, I will start with you. Me? Yes, your papers, please. Ah, Here they are. Mm. So... Yes, they appear to be in order. One moment while I check my list. Uh, Yes, your name is on it. Here is your pass, which will admit you to the trial. Thank you, Colonel. One moment, please. What's the matter? Matter? (laughs) Nothing is the matter. Hmm? I merely wish to inform you that one of your colleagues is here. My colleagues? Yes, another representative of World Photos. Oh, oh, I see. Well, it's a pretty large outfit, Colonel, and I... uh, There she is over there. Miss Travnik. Oh, look, don't bother. You called me Colonel Mitro? Yes. Here is a colleague of yours, Miss Travnik, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, really? You will excuse me now. I must examine the rest of the credentials. Uh, You over there, may I see your face? Your face looks familiar, Mr. Mitchell. I believe we have met before, haven't we? I uh, don't know, have we? Perhaps in Vienna last year. Um, yeah, yeah, perhaps. 
How long have you been working for World Photo? Oh, not very long. How about you? Five, six years. Strange. We should have run into each other several times, both working for the same company. Well, it's a, sort of a big outfit, you know. Yes, but even so... All your papers are in order, ladies and gentlemen. And now, if you will follow me, I would like to conduct you on a brief tour of our prison. We want all of you people to see what a model prison this is. How every comfort is provided for each prisoner. In our spotless kitchen down there at the end of the hall are prepared tasty and nourishing meals which... Uh, <laughs> here, you will be able to see and judge for yourselves. Krupa. Uh, yes, Colonel? Krupa, show the people the fine food you are carrying on that tray. Uh, yes, Colonel. There. As you see, ladies and gentlemen, it is quite a tasty lunch. Uh, to which prisoner are you taking this tray, Krupa? Uh, to the self-confessed spy and enemy of... Uh, the enemy of... Uh, enemy of the people, Krupa. Enemy of the people, Colonel. Yes. You see? We show mercy even to confess spies like this Sorensen. You may go now, Krupa. Hey, thank you, Colonel. And now we will resume our tour. On the right, you see the administration officers. Notice how clean and efficient. And on the left... Hey, Krupa. Yes? Uh, would you like to have your picture taken? My picture? Oh, but of course, that would be nice. Your servant of the people carries food, the enemy of the people. Here. Now, just hold it a second like that. Yeah. There. Oh, now, thank wait, you, wait, wait a minute. I want a, one of you without the tray. Here, I'll take it. Huh? That sure looks like a good lunch, Stu. Hot tea. I'll just set the tray on the floor. And I have a... Oops, no. Oh, please be careful, oh, sir. That's okay. I just spilled a little tea into the saucer. Up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I hope it is all right. The colonel would be furious if anything happened to that specially prepared lunch. Specially I... prepared? Why... I thought these were the kind of meals you served all the time, even to the enemies of the people, Krupa. Uh, why, why, did you, yeah, yes, of course, I forgot. Mr. Mitchell. Huh? Oh, Colonel Mitro. Mr. Mitchell, may I inquire what you are doing? Why, just snapping some pictures of Krupa here. Uh, no harm was intended, Colonel. It is the firm policy of this prison that all members of the press will stay together. Under my supervision. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry, Colonel. Well, let's resume the grand tour. We finish the tour, then go into the courtroom to wait for the trial. I'm sweating it out, wondering if Sorensen has drunk the tea I'd slipped the pill into, and if so, how long before the antidote will take effect. Then a husky guard leads Sorensen into the courtroom. They sit him down about six feet from me. I have to keep my camera covering part of my face because of Sorensen is still under the effect of the drug and spots me, he'll probably spill all about me. A gent with a face like a vulture starts hammering questions at Sorensen, and his answer sounds like he's reading them out of a book. Is that not true? Yes. Now, Mr. Sorensen, it is also true that you own a marine construction company? Yes, it is true. Now, this company undertakes the construction of various piers and also repairs boats? Yes. But actually, this company is but a front for your espionage activities directed by you? Yes, that is true. Now, uh, tell the court the exact nature of your espionage activities. I spied on ship movements at the waterfront. Mm -hmm. I also kept records of, uh, uh, of troop movements. I, Go on. I... I spy Go I... on. No. Wait a minute. I. What am I saying? I. No, th that's not. That's not true. I. I've never done any spying. A prisoner will confine him. Oh, I'm not a spy. I'm the question. I run a legitimate business. I've never engaged in this. Order. 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 Hands off. Take the prisoner. I tell you, I'm not a spy. <laughs> The courtroom's in an uproar. The guards yank Sorensen out of his seat. And just then our eyes meet. Sorensen droops one eyelid for a second and then turns to go. The antidote has worked. He's okay now, and now is my chance. 
I shoulder my way through the crowd into the hall. A lot of people are milling around. I get to Sorensen and the guard just as they reach the elevator. What do you want? Step back. Sorry, busted. <clears throat> Come on, Sorensen. Let's get to the elevator fast. Okay, Steve. No oh, brother of mine, glad to see you. What happened? Steve? They had your drug bill. I slipped an antidote into the tea they brought you. Look, our only chance is to get to the ground floor and out to the truck at the gate before they sound the alarm. Here we are. Good. The hall's deserted. They're probably still milling around upstairs. Come on. That door down at the end of the hall, Steve. Does that lead outside? Yeah. There should be a truck waiting there for us. Here we are. Oh, great. It's locked. What? Yeah. And it was supposed to be open. Steve. Huh, Steve? Somebody's unlocking the door from the outside. Yeah, brother, we better get lost. All right, here they are. My guard and another one with him. Come on. Soldi, yes, both of you. We will not hesitate to shoot. So, you would escape, huh? But the little plan did not work. And now you will have a cellmate, Mr. Sorensen. Wheaties now. Are you with them? All over this big, wide country, people are going to be shaking the Wheaties into the cereal bowls tomorrow morning. All over the country. In big houses, little houses, penthouses, ranch houses. Because all different kinds of people, no matter what they do, know that a good breakfast can help them do it better. If you're going to do the ironing tomorrow, or if you've got a tough day ahead, do it better all morning with the help of Wheaties for breakfast. Yep, first you need your Wheaties. Farmers can farm better, drillers can drill better, plumbers can plumb better with a better breakfast. You start with these likable little flakes of whole wheat, and you work better all morning long. Crisp, and they're crackling with energy. Fresh, and they're bouncing with nourishment. Just pour the Wheaties into the bowl, sugar them, cream them, strawberry them if you want to. See if you don't feel the difference. Tomorrow, start with Wheaties and work happy. Now, back to Dangerous Assignment and Steve Mitchell. We have done well, Varys. We have captured not only Sorensen, but the man who was helping him escape. The colonel will be pleased with us. Run, tell him at once. I will hold my gun on this, too, while you're gone. Very well. Well, thanks for the try anyway, Steve. That's okay. I'm sorry it didn't work out. But it will, Mitchell. Huh? Go quickly. Hey, what do you mean? Hey, wait a minute. Don't tell me you're the boy that they told me would help me inside the prison. Yes, when you grabbed Sorensen from me at the elevator, I was not expecting you would hit me so hard. What? That is why it took me so long to get down here and open the door for you. Oh, brother, now I've seen everything. But you must hurry. The truck is waiting for you over there. Yeah, I see it. Okay, guard. Thanks a lot. One moment. Huh? He hit me. Again? I must have some reason for allowing you to escape. Hurry, you have not much time. As soon as they discover you got away, they will set off the alarm. Well, okay. This is a pretty poor way to show my appreciation, but thanks. Anyway, (coughs) come on, Sorson. We spot the truck outside, dive into it, and roar through the prison gates. A siren splits the air, and the gates clang shut behind us. We turn into the highway, and I jam the accelerator down to the floorboard. Get down, that's machine gun. What about you? Sure give a lot for an automatic pilot, Miss Buggy, right now. See? I'm okay, just a little broken glass in the face. There. We're out of sight for a little while now, but they'll be coming after us. We've got to ditch this car and take off to the city on foot. Listen. They're coming after us, all right. Hey, wait a minute. Those low-hanging trees on the side of the road. Steve, watch it! Tree trunk ahead! I see it. You know, Steve, I thought we used to get into scrapes when we were plebes at the Naval Academy, but they didn't hold a candle to this. Yeah? Well, midshipman, you better come up with an operation plan right now as to where we're heading. You got any ideas? Yeah, my fiancé's brother. He's a black market operator, has a hideout in town. Well, lead the way. Steve, I've stumbled onto something hot. There's a Navy task force cruising in the eastern Mediterranean heading this way. You mean one of ours? That's right. And sometime tonight, they're going to run into some mines. What? How do you know? Well, the other day I spotted a fishing boat down at the waterfront. It looked phony to me, so I did a little snooping. It was a mine layer. I got close enough to pick up a little of their conversation. 
Their plan was to lay a few mines in the path of the task force. Afterward, they could always claim they were floating mines from the last war. Oh, great. Look, have you any idea of where they laid the mines? Well, from what I picked up, I think I could locate them on a chart, but somehow we've got to get word to that task force, Steve. Mm. Yeah, that isn't going to be easy. Here we are, Steve. Who is there? Sorensen. Sorensen. Quick, come inside. Okay, come on, Steve. Travnik, this is Steve Mitchell. He arranged my escape. But where is Eva? Eva, what do you mean? Well, I, I thought she would be with you. Why? Well, she said she had worked out a escape plan for you. What? She went to the jail posing as photographer. She had little red truck with Wait her. Wait a minute. Eva Travnik. Yes, yes my, my sister. Uh, Sorensen's fiance. Holy smoke, that's the girl I met in the prison. She was posing as another representative of world photos. She was what? Yes, yes. She had little red truck, and she was going to try and arrange an escape. Steve, I'm going back there. They'll hold her as your accomplice. No, you're not. Eva's in trouble. I tell you, I'm going back. Don't be a fool. Get out of my way, Steve. Look, if anyone goes back there, it's going to be me. Well, you, but you can't... Look, be... you've got to plot the position of those mines on a chart and get word out somehow. I'll see what I can do about Eva. But how can we get word out? They've probably got the telephone switchboard tapped. Yeah, and they probably got the depot covered, too. Wait a minute. Hey, why didn't I think of it? Travnik's plane. What? Like I told you, Travnik here's a black market operator. He does a lot of flitting around undercover. He's got a little plane stashed out at a cow pasture just outside of town. Yes, yes. You see, Mitchell, I do not approve of the government in power here. So unknown to them, I make them pay me for the privilege of remaining in power. Well, if we could get out of here by plane, we might be able to contact the task force by radio. Travnik, I guess it's up to you. Look, you say you like to make the government pay you. Well, this would cost them plenty, but I'm afraid there wouldn't be any dough in it for you. Yeah, that's what bothers me. But... Uh... Men once told me there were other things in life besides money. Perhaps this will give me a chance to find out if he was right. Very well. I will try to get you out. Good. Write down the location of the cow pasture where you've got the plane. Sorensen, get out a chart and plot the position of those mines. You're going to go after Eva? I'm going to try. You two, get out to the plane and get it warmed up. And if I'm not there in one hour, well, don't wait for me. I take back streets and cut across fields. Twenty minutes later, I get to the road outside the prison. They've set up a searchlight and a roadblock. And there are a long line of parked cars and trucks. The guards are checking them one at a time. I spot Eva's red truck, the third one back from the roadblock. I've got to act fast. Then I see a lieutenant in a heavy overcoat standing on my side of the road. I ease over. Oh, uh, Lieutenant. Who are you? One of the reporters covering the trial, Lieutenant, there's a body over here. A body? Where? Show me. It's uh, in the bushes. But I don't see any body. What is it? Right here, Lieutenant. It's going to be yours. I slip on the Lieutenant's coat and cap. Then I run over to Eva's truck and jump onto the running board. <gasps> what do you... Wait. It's Steve Mitchell. Yeah. Pull out a line and head for the roadblock. But they will stop us. Maybe not if they don't get a good look at me. Come on. All right. Keep going slowly. Straight ahead. Oh! All cars and trucks are to be checked. Colonel Mitro's orders. Oh, forgive me, Lieutenant. Proceed. Speed up. You know how to get to that cow pasture where your brother keeps his plane? Yes, Steve. Okay, head for it and don't spare the horses. There it is. They've moved it out of the barn. Come on, hurry. Eva! Eva, you okay? Yes, Bill. Get in, get in. Get Call in. Okay. Come on. Come on. All set? Yeah. Yeah, let her go. Hey, look ahead of us. On the field. Police cars. They must have followed you here. Oh, great. Four of them blocking the runway and a grove of trees behind us. That's it, brother. We're through. Here's why it's Wheaties, breakfast of champions. What are you doing tomorrow? Going to the factory? Getting to the shop early? Or just taking it easy with three kids and a house to clean? 
If you've got things to do tomorrow, start tomorrow with Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions. They're whole wheat flakes, and they give you whole wheat energy. Vitamins, minerals, proteins, too. All the good, work-speeding nourishment that whole wheat has to offer, you get in Wheaties. That's why, with milk and fruit, they help make a better breakfast that helps you do a better job. So look, tomorrow, next day, as soon as you can, get Wheaties onto the breakfast table. Be good to yourself. Have a bowl of Wheaties and feel the difference in the morning's work. Now, here is the conclusion of Dangerous Assignment. Steve, what are we going to do? We can't take off. And who says we can? But those police cars are blocking the runway ahead. <laughs> Some people just go the other way, that's all. Full what? engine? Left, brother. Hey, what the... Hey, you're turning the plane around. Certainly. Now we catch it. Hey, you're heading right for those trees. Watch out. Oh, brakes. Uh, and right, brother. So... Look, there's a clearing in the trees. Well, certainly. In my business, one must prepare for such emergencies. Now, left, rather. Hey. Well, what do you know? Another cow pasture on the other side of the grove. <laughs> this one I call my emergency runway. <laughs> well, I got to hand it to you, Travnik, but we're not off the ground yet. Uh, hold on. It's going to be bumpy checkoff. Steve. Steve, look back there. Gun flashes, they're shooting at us. Get down, Eva. Bill. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, the hole in the wing cuts down wind resistance, I suppose. Yeah, we're liable to collect more than the hole in the wing if you don't get this baby airborne soon. Eh? No sooner spoke than ditch. Boy, you better head for the coast, Travnik. Yes, yes, I agree. The sea air will be welcome change right now. Steve, I plotted the location of those mines, but how are we going to get in touch with that task force? Hand me that microphone, Travnik. Yes, sir. Here you are. Steve, what frequency are you going to try? That was I was trying to remember. There's a, a an aircraft voice circuit that they always guard. Four one something. That's right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's four one. Um... Uh, four one four five kilocycles. Yeah, yeah, I'll tune to it. How are you going to call them? If we address them as U.S. Navy Task Force. They'll think it's a trick. I know. We don't have any idea what code name they're using. Uh, wait a minute. Huh? We'll tie it in with the Naval Academy somehow. What do you mean? Well, the name of a building or yeah, that's it. Look, Bill, you and I room together as plebes in Bancroft Hall. Maybe that'll work. I'll give it a try. Plebe to Bancroft Hall. Leave the Bancroft Hall. Over. I hope they're within range so they can receive us. I'll try it again. Leave the Bancroft Hall. Leave the Bancroft Hall. Over. Bancroft Hall, please. Hey! Bancroft Hall, please. Identify yourself. Over. Steve, they picked us up. Yeah. Leave the Bancroft Hall. If you've got a Navy register aboard, look up Steve Mitchell, class of 1935. But first, take this message. Mines, floating mines, at latitude 37 degrees, 3 3 minutes north, longitude 1 8 degrees, 2 6 minutes east. Repeat and over. Bankrupt Hall of Cleave, latitude 37 degrees, 3 3 minutes north, longitude 1 8 degrees, 2 6 minutes east. Emergency turn 9, emergency turn 9. Oh boy. They must have been right on top of those mines, Bill. Yeah. I heard someone give an emergency turn signal. Oh, brother, that's too close. You know the frequency of the Zarva radio station, Travnik? Oh, certainly, but they have lousy programs, Mitch. Well, turn her around a bit and see if you can pick up a newscast. I'd like to see how we're doing. All right. You know, I'd sure hate to go through a routine like this every day. You can say that again. But we are safe now, and that is all that matters. Wait, 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 wait. Here is Zarva radio station. Good evening, friends and comrades. This is Colonel Mitro speaking. Well, our old friend. I have been asked by the radio station to make a statement concerning the brazen and treacherous jailbreak this afternoon. 
Rest assured, the fugitives will be apprehended shortly. I'll hold your breath, Colonel. And I am happy to announce that the ringleader of the plot has been executed. A prison guard who turned traitor to the people. Steve! Turn it off, Travnik. That was our friend. Yeah. He was trying to help. And now he is dead. Yeah. And we think we went through a lot. Well, I hope he knows we got away. He must know. Yeah, well, one thing I know. As long as there are guys like him, that iron curtain's going to have a few holes in it. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, is written by Bob Reif, with music by Basil Adlam, and is produced and directed by Bill Carn. Join us again next Wednesday when Brian Donlevy, as Steve Mitchell, embarks on another dangerous assignment. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen next Monday night to Frank Lovejoy and Nightbeat on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Going to bake a pie sometime soon? Make it with Crust Quick, the Betty Crocker pie crust mix. You know it's a tender, flaky crust that's at the bottom of every delicious pie. Sure as you use Crust Quick. And so easy. Just add water to Crust Quick. Mmm, and what pie crust? Tender crust, tasty crust, rich, short, lovely crust. Just like Betty Crocker makes. And you can make it. Just add water to Crust Quick. Crust Quick, the Betty Crocker pie crust mix. Tomorrow, Perry Como sings at the Supper Club on NBC.